How would you like to return to Earth? Alice's heart beat faster within her chest at hearing Tenor Braille's words. Earth. It had been so long. It felt like years even though it had really only been weeks. Returning was exactly what she wanted. To go home. To see her parents. And her brother. To reassure them that she was alright and not dead. She wanted nothing more than to open her mouth and shout that she would love to go. Dot, which was why she hesitated. Dot, standing in the desolate military compound with monsters roaming about and her friends frozen in a stasis field, Alice stared at the gentle smile on the angel's face. Dot, and she scowled. Her excitement at the mentions of Earth vanished with a single thought. Dot, there had to be a catch. Dot, Tenebrail wouldn't just offer such a thing. In the first place, Alisa had been brought to this crazy world to hide her from other angels. So why would she ever be allowed back? There was something fishy about all this. Tenebrail wanted something. And that something was probably not something that Alisa wanted. There was also the possibility that Tenebrail was yanking her chain. Just mentioning the possibility might be some psychological tactic. To what end, Alisa wasn't sure. Tenebrail was a jerk but that much of a jerk. No. This had to be a genuine offer wouldn't it be nice? Tenebrail said, moving closer. How long has it been since you've had a proper shower? Clean water with a nice hot towel waiting for you after. Maybe a chance to restock on your spent ammunition or collect some item that you think will aid you here. Here Alisa said flatly. You're offering a temporary journey then. I can't let you remain there on a permanent basis. You've seen Archangel Ardril's deviant actions in the name of setting things right. If you remain for long, you'll surely be noticed. You'll draw the attentions of more Archangels. I doubt they would be so willing to correct you in such a direct manner, but they will be more than willing to offer divine inspiration to someone in the right state of mind to be less than pleasant toward you and there remains a distant but possible chance that a seraphim might catch wind of you. Trust me. Neither of us wants that. So temporary, chaperone trip only. There we go. That's the catch. A temporary trip to Earth. She would probably be watched the entire time and, if she tried to contact her family and friends, Tenebrail would probably whisk her back away before she could get a single word out. But that didn't answer the why of the trip. She didn't stink so badly that Tenebrail wanted her to shower right away, did she? Alisa discreetly sniffed only to find herself unable to smell anything distinct. Just a slight metallic scent in the air. Dot, but the temporary nature of the trip was only part of the catch. Tenebrail wouldn't just offer a vacation to Earth for a spa and manicure. Not even if Alisa had just finished trudging through the bog of eternal stench. If the angel truly felt offended by a smell, she would probably wave a hand and vanish it into thin air. No. Tenebrail wanted something. Something that she couldn't acquire for herself. What is it? Just tell me and stop with all this roundabout nonsense. What do you want? Must we get into all the dirty details now? You've been wearing that relic's hide for a few days, only taking it off while sleeping. Wiping yourself down with a rag is no substitute for a nice long bath. I'm not about to leave for a bath Alisa said, scowl deepening. It did sound nice. Very nice. But. I'm not just going to abandon Iorulan and the Draken in the middle of an enemy fortress. Even if this wasn't a temporary trip, my conscience would have a lot of issues with just up and leaving. Tenebrail stuck a finger out, nudging Iorulan with a finger. The stiff form of the princess rocked back and forth on the draken's back. They aren't going anywhere. Not soon. You've got time for a bath and a quick trip down a dark alley. Are you? Alice's fingers tightened around Ardril's staff. She wasn't quite sure how she had managed to use it against Ardril, but she sure as hell wasn't going to let Tenebrail attack her. Are you trying to get me killed? Kill you? Never. In the blink of an eye, Tenebrail had crossed the short distance between them. Her arms wrapped around Alice's shoulders in a gentle embrace. 
Although you've caused no small amount of trouble, I cannot believe I managed as long as I had without you in my existence. Alisa went utterly still, hardly even breathing with the angel's chest pressed against hers. Several seconds went by before she realized what was going on. A hug. It was a hug. And it was weirding her out. Not just the physical contact, which she wasn't really used to in general, but that strange warmth that angels exuded. Normally, it was hardly worth mentioning. Right now. With Tenebrail fully pressed up against her, maybe it wasn't the angel's glory. It might just be embarrassment forcing her into blushing speaking of that trouble you've caused, Tenebrail said softly before Alyssa could ask more about her eyes. There's just one itsy bitsy little problem. Really a tiny thing. But something I need a small bit of help with. Aha. Uh -huh. Alyssa, still a little stunned from the sudden hug, wasn't sure what else to say you remember that guy you weren't supposed to kill. The one who was to stab you. Every night. Well, do you remember what I said immediately after you killed him? Alyssa blinked. That had been a fairly hectic night. Lots had happened. Meeting an angel and being sent to some weird world among them. On a line-by-line -line basis, she couldn't remember anything specific. So she shook her head originally, before you mucked things up, he was supposed to live for a few months before killing himself by hanging. Now, I've been dashing back and forth between here and Earth, puppeting him about, making his body interact with the important people he was supposed to interact with. But, in a few hours' time, he runs across someone in a dark alley while fleeing from your law enforcement officers. That someone might get, a little hurt. And die. And I don't think I can, no oh come now, Alisa. Be reasonable. You want me to go kill some random innocent person? Alyssa said, pulling away from Tenebrail. Without a broken leg, she had all the maneuverability needed to put distance between herself and the angel. Absolutely not. I can't even believe that you would suggest that. How many people have you killed today? What's one more? These people Alyssa said, waving the staff around were planning to use mind-controlled ants to commit genocide. You're asking me to, what? Kill some poor homeless man in an alley because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I can't even, aren't you creating selfish, arbitrary justifications for your own conscience? Tenebrail took a step closer, smile still just as gentle as could be. This murder was in self-defense. This murder was because the person was bad. This murder was because he was planning something that you didn't like. At the end of the day, someone is dead. Several someones in today's case. Alyssa hesitated. It was different. Self-defense was justifiable. In, mortal courts. For an angel. What did Tenebrail expect her to do? Just lie down and let the likes of the taker send her to an early grave, all mortals do the same. So don't feel bad, Alyssa. And angels are different. Alyssa shot back of course. An angel would nev, uh, trailing off, Tenebrail glanced to the side, to where Iorelan was still frozen in the stasis of fractal lock. After staring for a moment, she started laughing. Amazing. Or inspiring. What a terrific and horrid occurrence. An angel harming a mortal. So why not go do it yourself if it is so important? The words tasted like ash on her tongue, but that didn't stop her from saying them. Clearly you can harm humans. Or you can lie, whichever one. Both, probably. I. I can't. I don't know how. What do you mean? You tried to get me to point my gun at Sid way back when. You have watched plenty of people kill other people. You clearly know, I can't. The smile disappeared, replaced with a grinding of her teeth. Clenching her fists, Tenebrail looked away. The moment I try to consider an action that would directly lead to me harming a mortal, it's like, every thought I have turns to static. I don't want to harm most humans, but there have been times where I just shut down completely until an event passes, 
unable to do anything but carry out my duties. I don't have a choice. The angel blinked twice. A tremor in her wings ran from the tips to her spine. Her smile slowly returned, though it wasn't quite as happy as it had been when she had hugged Alyssa which is why it needs to be you. Take solace in knowing that not a single soul has been judged before the throne since, a long, long time ago. Which is another great reason why you shouldn't feel bad about carrying out my little task. All you need to do is come up with a flimsy justification that will let you sleep at night. The angel paused a moment, reaching back behind her to pull out another little black book. This one, instead of having a black bookmark, had a thin golden ribbon stuck between the pages. Would it help if I offered excerpts from his history, she said, opening the book. Not to the bookmarked page, but several pages prior to it. He was a soldier in your government's army. Noble of him, ah, but he stole and sold essential radio parts on the black market before eventually deserting, leaving three of his comrades to die in, stop. Just stop. Alyssa shouted. Why do you even need to kill him anyway? The books automatically update themselves. We learned that from your experiment with Iorulan. Just ignore him and no one will know. That is true, here. But look at this. Tenebrail turned the book around and flipped forward to the golden bookmark. Alyssa just shook her head, shoving it away from her. I can't read that. The light in Tenebrail's eyes died momentarily as she blinked. Right. Sorry. Well, the other day when I gave you the time of Iorulan's death, I was watching the book intently. At first, there were no changes. But as you started acting, killing monsters and those people and even contacting various people, the book started altering. Events changed until everything in the book aligned with the outcome. Even flipping back a few pages shows no sign that Iorulan was ever supposed to die. You changed the book of this world. This book, Iosfiel's book, is different. Back to the page of that night, it still says that she is to collect and process your soul at the time you were supposed to die. It still says that the man I've been controlling like a puppet is alive. Nothing has changed. Alyssa sat down. Right in the dirt. It didn't matter where. Even with her leg healed and the pain gone, she still felt exhausted. Talking with Tenebrail, talking about all this death, wasn't helping. So she sat cross-legged and just sighed. The staff was too long to hold on to properly while sitting on the ground and she wasn't about to let go of it in Tenebrail's presence, so she had to rest it across her lap. After one more sigh, she looked up to the angel. Tenebrail had moved as well, floating in the air as if lounging on an invisible fainting couch. What does that mean? Your book, the book that records events here, changes. But Earth's book doesn't. Earth is mildly unique in that it was the first world that the throne enacted its plan upon. Every other world, those granted to us dominions, is generally designed in likeness to Earth. Each is different but you might find common events occurring in the histories of them that mirror Earth's history. Frowning, Alyssa glanced toward the frozen form of the Draken indeed. Earth had its own age of legends. Dinosaur fossils are a remnant of the most ancient parts of it, but much of the various mythologies and religions stem from legends as well. That is why you have likely heard of many of the relics, the monsters, here. Humans never interacted with living dinosaurs Alyssa said, wondering if she had been more correct in likening the Draken to movie dinosaurs than she had originally thought. And I'm pretty sure the same goes for Harpies and Gorgon as well, if they were ever real on Earth. True. Which leaves us with a puzzle. Without going through you, I would never have been able to save Iorulan that night. I, can't heal her myself Tenebrail said, glancing to the side. Not unless I am ordered to. Maybe I could have tried knocking down a building, but it would have turned out the same in the end. You, however, I can tell information to that will change the book. You, I can heal without hesitation. You can change the book all on your own without a word from me and yet, your continued survival hasn't changed Iosfiel's book in the slightest. 
That's nice and all Alice said after several seconds of silence, but this is all the circumstances. None of it is the why or the how. Unless this is a long and roundabout way of saying that you don't know. Yes. We need more information. When I brought you here, you had no agency. I brought you here without regard toward your own will. All your actions that have changed my book were under your agency. I believe that is the primary difference. Unfortunately, as much as I would like to, we cannot use this as an opportunity to test whether or not you taking agency will result in alterations within Earth's book. Here, there are no angels aside from myself, and Ardril, apparently. Earth is flooded with principalities and other minor angels who will notice should something not go according to plan. Alison narrowed her eyes. Back to this topic again. Argue all you want, I am not going to go kill some random guy. But if the Seraphim find out, it won't be good for either of us. You told me that the Seraphim were vegetables. What were your exact words? I'd have a more engaging conversation with a wall. I also told you that angels could not harm mortals. She glanced over and stared at Iorel and then to the staff resting in Alice's lap. I don't know how that happened. I cannot even offer a theory. But, after all this unpleasant business is dealt with, I plan on tracking down Ardril and getting my answers. Shifting her positing from the floating lounge to standing straight, Tenebrail looked down at Alyssa. Shall we get going? It is a bit early, but I did promise a bath and ammunition. Gritting her teeth, Alyssa gripped the staff. She didn't want to attack Tenebrail. Strange as it was, Tenebrail wound up being more of an ally than the enemy Alyssa had initially viewed her as. Annoying, yes, but at least she wasn't hostile. Since she wanted to ruin whatever plan there was, she and maybe Iosphile were the only two angels who didn't want Alyssa dead. But this. She might have become a killer. Some might even call her a murderer. But she was not going to kill someone for happening across someone who was already dead. Although, maybe he could die I have a few questions, first. Several, in fact. First, why do Iosphiel and Ardril think your world is messed up when you literally cannot change what is written in that little book of yours? Doesn't that mean that keeping monsters around, making yourself into some kind of deity, and even winding up with a whole village named after you was all preordained within the book? And secondly, if you can't take any actions that would result in the book producing errors, how could you tell me that Iorelan was going to die? For that matter, how am I here? I clearly wasn't in the plan yet you were able to bring me here. The last one is easiest to answer. We were on Earth. I don't believe that I am beholden to Iosphiel's book the way I am to mine, so I was able to take you. As for the previous question, and this might be related to how I was able to bring you to Nod, my book doesn't predict you. You have no entries in the entire thing. Not even now. So, even though it did change what was written down, the book didn't say that I couldn't tell you. It didn't think that speaking to you would change Iorelan's fate and allowed it. MHM. And the rest. I'm, less certain about that. I can only assume that the way it is today is the way my world was always intended to be, though my fellow angels clearly disagree. And what about Ardril? Was the Society of the Burning Shadow according to the book? Because from what I've seen, it looks like she created it. I would say that it must have originally included everything that she has done, except for the little problem of her harming a mortal. With that in mind, we have to assume that she might be more like you than like a proper angel. I'd have to know exactly what she has done here and what she plans here and compare current events to the book. I haven't noticed anything changing that didn't involve you, but I also haven't read ahead in a very long time. After realizing the futility of it all, I decided that not knowing was better. Perhaps it is time you start. Indeed. Taking a deep breath, Alyssa planted the staff's end into the ground. It didn't weigh much, especially given the gold it was apparently made out of, but holding it out was still a strain after a while. Having the ground take off some of that strain was more than welcome you ready. 
One last thing. Alyssa looked over to Iorulan and to the Draken. I'm not just going to leave them out here for several hours. They might be decently protected within Fractal Lock, but all it would take is for someone to happen by and use Desecrate spells. We already know that the Society of the Burning Shadow called for reinforcements. Pulling out the book with the black ribbon again, Tenebrail flipped through it, running a finger down each page before moving on to the next. Snapping the book shut, she flicked her glowing eyes back to Alyssa. Nothing should happen to them within the few hours we'll be gone. We just discussed this. Your books either change or are outright wrong. Alyssa sighed, shaking her head. And if Ardril comes back, they could be in even more danger. She could manipulate someone into hurting them or just do it herself. Although her face didn't change much, the tips of her wings twitched. I, don't deny the possibility. But I don't know that I can do much for them. They aren't going to die soon as far as I can tell and that's all the book cares about. You don't have to. Let me do it. Teach me a spell. Magic. Or is it miracles? Alyssa shook her head. To her, there was no distinction. Both were supernatural effects. There has to be something that we can do together. Let's drop them into a pocket dimension. Or make them utterly impervious to harm from any source, angel or mortal. Or, anything. Alyssa almost said to simply free them from their stasis. With that gone, they could at least run away. But, could they run away if Ardril came back? Alyssa wasn't so sure. Or, or why don't we take them to Earth with us? Earth. I, they're in stasis, so they're not going to do anything. And if they aren't supposed to have their stasis removed for several hours, then they wouldn't interact with anything here. Which means that it doesn't matter if they are here or not here, so you should be able to do that yourself. What are you planning, Alyssa Meadows? Tenebrail asked with narrowed eyes nothing. I promise. I am just trying to keep them safe. I swear I won't try to remove their stasis while we're on Earth if you bring them with us. Alyssa wanted to learn magic and miracles. It was the key to getting home and getting rid of her feathery menaces. But she wanted Iorulan and Aisha's safety more than that. It was somewhat upsetting how much the princess needed rescuing. A rank 6 arcanist, the pinnacle of humanity's magic casters, shouldn't be so vulnerable. Though, Perhaps nothing was invulnerable when an angel was concerned. The gaunt, Iorulan had less of an excuse for. Sure, the species might resist magic, but that didn't mean that she couldn't have used loophole or even just fractal locked herself before being stabbed. Initially, Alyssa had been focused on offensive spells and weapons. From her mundane pistols all the way up to fireballs and spectral axes, she felt like that base was covered. Sure, it might not be the most expansive array of equipment, but it worked. Together with Iorulan and the Draken, she had depopulated a small village. Not a village. A military compound, she reminded herself. Yet, on the opposite end of the spectrum, she had nothing much at all. It might be time to look into more defensive tools to add to her repertoire. Iorulan had a few, mostly fractal nonsense. Fractal lock certainly worked. But it wasn't very practical for most cases. Having a nice shield that she could hold up so that the taker couldn't fling throwing knives at her would change everything. And Iorulan might need some too, if she wasn't just being overly complicated or overly stingy. But that would be a topic to broach when the princess got back to normal. For now, Earth, are you going to do it? Bring them with us. I think I can. The fact that I can think about it at all is telling. Good Alyssa said, turning away for a moment. She looked over the bodies and the destruction, mildly wondering if that hellhound had found any more. Had she done the right thing here? Killing all these people. Even if all her and Iorulan's assumptions about their intentions for the ant hive had been false, they were still holding monsters, people against their will. They had used that smoke to control fairies and manipulate them into warring against Lyria. Did that justify killing them? 
Or was she making excuses like Tenna Braille had said she was, at least they wouldn't be hurting anyone innocent now. An innocent person on earth, however, was another matter entirely. Alyssa was not going to kill him just because a book told her that he was supposed to die. But going to Earth was worth letting Tenna Braille think that she was. Before turning back to the angel, Alyssa called her phone to her hand. She quickly turned on the video recorder, faced the camera upward, and kept it behind her back as she turned. Angels were not omniscient. That was a fact that she had to keep in mind. Tenna Braille's gentle smile greeted her. Alyssa felt her stomach clench. Did she know? No. She couldn't. There was no way that Tenna Braille would let her record the spell that transferred them between worlds. If Tenna Braille knew, she would put a stop to it. Maybe even by taking the phone away entirely. That would be the worst scenario. But until such time, Alyssa tried to match the angel's smile shall we go. The first thing that hit Alyssa was the noise. Tenna Braille's world was quiet. Nearly silent, in most parts. A deserted military compound in the middle of a desert had no noise at all. Even the city, filled with people, didn't have much in the way of sound. People talked, of course. Carriages bumped as their wooden wheels rolled along the ground. The horses carrying the carriages whinnied and their hooves clopped. But none of it could compare to the sounds of a jackhammer tearing up the roadwork outside an apartment window. Just hearing the sound of cubes falling from the refrigerator ice maker into the dispenser sent a pang of nostalgia through Alice's heart. In the distance, a siren from a police car could just barely be heard in the pauses of the road construction. Horns on cars joined the cacophony. The low hum of air-conditioned air coming from the vents only served to keep the sparse moments of silence from being, silent. In other words, quiet in Nod was quiet. Quiet on Earth was deafening. The second thing that hit Alyssa was the air itself. Again, it was nostalgic. The smell had something to it that she couldn't quite place. Pollution, probably, as much as she didn't want to think that. As much as their politics were barbaric and the society was backwards, Lyria really had little in the way of pollution. She wasn't sure what the city did with its waste, there were public outhouse-style facilities, yet no modern plumbing, but it wouldn't surprise her to find out about a whole guild of low-ranked arcanists who used magic to keep everything clean. A janitorial guild. Here and now. Alyssa drew in a deep breath through her nose. It might be pollution but it was familiar. Air that she hadn't breathed in months. After breathing in, she immediately shivered. Not only was the air cool in general, but coming from a desert hot enough to still be sweltering even at nights, she felt like she had just entered a walk-in freezer. Alyssa grabbed both arms at the elbows, rubbing up and down. Only then did she realize that she was missing the golden staff. Her hands were empty. No staff. No spell book here we are Tenna Braille said, voice sounding as jovial as could be. There is food in the kitchen, hot water, and even a soft bed, if you wanted to take a nap. Naturally, you cannot interact with anyone, or leave this room, until we're, where is my stuff? Stuff. Tenna Braille cocked her head to the side. What stuff? Don't play dumb, you stupid angel. Where is the stuff? Where are my and Ireland's spell cards? My guns. Everything I took from you is in a safe spot. I can't afford to let you cast magic around here, so you'll have to make do without for now. Everything. Alyssa said, looking down. She still had the dragon hide armor on and her satchel. Having left her backpack at the cave outside the military compound, that was all she had been carrying. That and her pistols which were gone. Scowling, she shot a glare at the angel don't worry. This place is effectively sealed off. You won't be leaving and no one will be entering. You won't need your equipment. What if some other angel wanders past and wonders why there's an apartment room sealed off from the rest of, where are we, anyway? Chicago. Alyssa blinked, frowning. That's a bit far from home. Your murderer started quite the manhunt. He has evaded so far, but they'll catch up to him eventually. 
and, speaking of, I do need to leave to make some preparations. I'll be monitoring this area for any angelic presences, so don't worry about that either. Should any angel discover you, I'll be here to rescue you instantly. Alyssa couldn't help but scoff. Like Io's file was supposed to keep us safe from our drill. If there is something that I cannot handle, then we're both screwed, as you humans say. Waving a hand, Tenor Braille turned slightly toward the window. Anyway, I'll be back in six hours. Eat some good food, take a nice long bath, and have, wait. Tenor Braille paused at Alice's outburst, turning ahead to her shoulder. Somehow, her wings didn't get in the way of her stare. Alyssa started slowly, still trying to form a plan as she spoke. Since, this apartment is cut off from everywhere, why not free Iorulan from the fractal lock? She wanted to look around Earth anyway. It, ah, uh, can't hurt. Right. True to her word, Tenebrail had brought all three of the Stasis victims. Iorulan was still on Muska's back both unmoving. Aisha was to their side. Both were piled up on top of each other in the middle of the room. A coffee table and couch had been shoved aside to make room for them. Was this an actual lived-in apartment? Or some construct of tenor brails? If the former, wouldn't the people notice their food going missing or tables being out of place? Where were the people anyway, vacation, maybe? And if Tenebrail put everything back to how it was, it was doubtful that anyone would notice. Tenebrail let out a soft chuckle. Free the woman who has half the Observatrum's library memorized, she said, shaking her head. Earth would be in shambles by the time I got back. But, she wouldn't be that bad. I brought her here on your request. You promised that you didn't have anything planned. I didn't. Then you'll be fine on your own. See you soon. But, black feathers exploded out from the angel, filling the small apartment until they started disappearing. Alyssa brushed a hand back and forth in front of her face to get rid of a few that had clung to her. As she did so, she sighed. While it was true that she thought Iorulan might be able to learn something, maybe even how to get here from the other world, it was also true that Iorulan had wanted to see the sights of Earth. Maybe being trapped inside a single room with only a window to look out of wasn't the best way to experience it, but, given her propensity for being skewered through the back, Alyssa was a little worried about her chances of ever being able to come here again. Which was a very morbid thought to have. Shaking her head, Alyssa approached the window door of the balcony. The apartment she was in was on the third floor of a building, looking out over a road that was under construction. While the door didn't open even after unlocking it, there wasn't much of a balcony to speak of anyway. No real reason to go outside. Sure, she could try shouting at the construction workers down below, but what would she say? Probably something that would not only get her locked up inside a sanatorium, but also something that would definitely irritate Tenor Braille. Plus any other angels who wanted the plan to proceed without her distracting some construction workers. Alyssa thought to take a picture of them. Iorulan might be a little upset if she knew that she had been to Earth without being able to experience anything. A picture might alleviate that. Except, her phone didn't appear in her hand when she called it. Patting down her satchel and the dragon hide pockets in a hurry, she started scowling. It's gone. Presumably along with everything else that Tenebrail had taken from her. Had it even managed to record any of Tenebrail's transferal spell, damn that bitch. Her pockets were not completely empty, however. Alyssa pulled out a smooth stone. The red haze was gone, but hopefully that was because the spell had ended during the trip to Earth and not because something bad had happened to Cassita. I'm sorry she said softly. I completely forgot. As soon as Tenebrail gets back, I'll ask her what went wrong with you. It will be the very first thing. No getting distracted with talk of killing people or of going to other worlds. The first thing. It felt a bit useless, talking to a rock. Anyone who saw her would think she was either crazy or crazy lonely. Possibly both. 
but, if some small part of Kassatar could hear her deep within the stone, she wanted the mimic to know that she did care. Unfortunately, there was nothing she could do now. Without even a single spell card, she couldn't try testing anything. Not that she would test random spells on her friend. Dot gently setting the rock on the coffee table next to Iorulan and the Draken, Alisa turned to explore the rest of the apartment. Dot she didn't bother with the front door. Unless Tenebrail was the biggest idiot in the entire cosmos, it wouldn't open. The rest of the apartment wasn't all that large. It had two bedrooms. One had clearly been inhabited by a young girl judging by the decor and toys lying about. The other, as Tenebrail had said, contained a bed that looked great. Alisa didn't dare touch it. Her armor had come through the transportation spell caked with just as much dust and blood as had been on it beforehand. So she moved to the bathroom. A nice place with stylish tile floor and a sizable tub. The apartment's rent must cost a fortune. Lying on the counter across from the tub was a bathrobe. It looked soft, fluffy, and even had her name embroidered on the black fabric. Looking up, Alisa flinched. Like most bathrooms, this one had a mirror. The fact that it took her a full second to realize that she was looking at herself. Alisa shuddered. She looked like garbage. Her hair would double as a nest for rats. Her face was covered in dirt with small streaks of red here and there. She looked thinner yet more muscular at the same time. With working out on the regular being a favorite activity of hers, she had always been well built. Peeling the dragon hide off wasn't the easiest thing in the world. With how much she had sweat from all the fighting and the sneaking about, it was worse than any other time she had removed it. Leaving the priceless armor in a heap on the floor, Alisa stared at herself again. Her breasts had shrunk. At the same time, her biceps looked a little thicker. Her abs had a definition to them that hadn't been there two months ago. Touching at her shoulder, she inspected what had once been a deep gash. There should be a scar there. A reminder of how foolish she had been in challenging the taker like she had. But Tenebrail had taken away her mistake, replacing it with smooth skin. Every other injury was the same, from her burned hand to her broken leg. Flicking her eyes to her face, Alisa scowled. There was something there that hadn't been there before. Or maybe something missing that had been there. It was hard to tell which. Either way, something changed. Something she hadn't noticed until now, looking into a modern mirror with a modern bathroom reflected around her. A hardness to her eyes. A frown where one didn't belong. Or maybe it was her who didn't belong, or maybe it was just the dirt and grime. Shaking her head, Alisa felt a bit ridiculous. A bit overly melodramatic. Cranking the water handle, she got the shower going. As much as she wanted to just sit and soak, she needed a shower first. Wash off all the grime and then fill the tub. No plan sounded better at the moment. She didn't even bother stopping by the kitchen to see what food Tenebrail had provided. Dot actually stepping into the steaming stream of water, Alisa almost started crying. It had been so long. Not just during her excursion through the desert. The public baths in Lyria, while something just couldn't compare. Running her fingers through her hair sent what felt like ten pounds of grease running off her body and down the drain. Dot and then she noticed the shampoo. Pumping a bit more than necessary and not caring in the slightest, she dug her fingers into her scalp, letting the suds foam up until she had a halo of apple-scented soap continually running down her shoulders. Eventually, she decided to switch to a bath. She wasn't quite sure that she felt clean despite spending 20 minutes under the steaming water, but she was tired and wanted to give her legs a rest. After angling the shower head to try to get all the dirt sticking to the walls to run down the drain, she used her foot to put the stopper in the water. Dot sitting down with her head propped up against a small headrest, she let the shower beat against her bare chest. It was a poor man's massage, but it was wonderful. Pure bliss. Only when the water level reached her neck did she reach up with her foot and turn off the water. Alisa closed her eyes, let out a deep sigh, and let the water soak in. She didn't know how long she remained in the water. 
the bathroom lacked a clock and, after getting fully relaxed, she might have dozed off a bit. Without the constant worry that something would pop out of the woodworks and bite her head off, now was the most relaxed she had felt in months. But it didn't last forever. The door made a sound. It wasn't a creaking as the hinges were well oiled. It was the click of the knob not being turned fully before the door pressed open. And it sent a jolt of fear through Alisa. All her relaxation vanished in an instant. Someone else was here. The door wasn't locked. She hadn't intended to stay in the bathroom, but the mirror and the clean water distracted her enough that she had forgotten. Who was it? The homeowner. A home invader. Her stomach sank. Alisa was literally naked. No weapons. She didn't even have the armor on. There wasn't anything she could use within reach either. Maybe the shower rod. Alisa scrambled to her feet, fumbling a bit with standing in the water. It was making a lot of noise, but she wouldn't have been able to hide anyway. Arms above her head, inches from the rod, she froze. For a moment, she thought she was looking in the mirror again. But she wasn't. There were no tattoos down her arm. The breasts were larger. The face was shaped slightly different. It was familiar, but not her casita. You foo tilde don't get up on my account. Alisa closed her eyes. Still knee deep in water, she just about fell over. A handle in the shower wall saved her. You scared me half to death, Alisa said after a moment. But. I'm glad you're all right. I was worried. The smile on Cassitar's face slipped as she glanced off to the side. Yeah. I've actually been fine for a while now. A while. Since you and Iorelan were freeing the monsters she all but mumbled. Thought I'd force myself to make an appearance before Tenebrail told you that nothing was wrong with me. Turning away, she ran a finger over the silver sink faucet. So this is your world, is it? Everything is so smooth. Cassita, and those orbs she said, looking up at the vanity lighting. They've got little bits of hot metal in them. I can tell that much, but they're so bright just from that. Cassita Alisa said again. She stepped out of the tub, dripping wet. Water would get everywhere, but what did she care? It wasn't like this was her house. More importantly. Are you alright? The mimic didn't look back, instead reaching out to the faucet. She started, jumping a little as she turned on the water. It wasn't until Alisa put a hand on her shoulder that she finally stopped paying attention to her surroundings. Cassita didn't turn around, but Alisa could see the way her face fell in the mirror. I was useless. I, don't deny it. When you and Iorelan asked if I would find as much information as I could, I was elated. It was something that I could do, that I was uniquely suited for, while you two went off to destroy buildings. I almost immediately found that basement, then. I don't even know what happened. The next thing I knew, you had picked me up. Iorelan was freeing the monsters. And you two killed everyone without me doing a single valuable thing. I might as well have not been there. Alisa pressed her lips together. This wasn't like Cassita. The mimic giggled and smiled and took everything with a lackadaisical attitude, finding amusement in everything. This, must really be bothering her. Tightening her grip on Cassita's shoulder, Alisa spun the mimic around, wrapped her arms around her, and pulled her in close. A hug. A hug hopefully more comforting than the one Tenebrail had offered earlier. Cassita did wiggle a bit, but Alisa was cheating. The mimic lacked the strength to get away, although, if she truly wanted to escape, Alisa had watched her face through a metal fence dot but the wiggling only lasted a moment or two before they both fell still. With her head on Cassita's shoulder, Alisa couldn't see her face. Not even through the mirror which just showed Cassitar's back and Alisa never think you're useless Alisa said. She wasn't sure if it was the right thing to say, but it felt right. I am so grateful that I met you. And not just because you saved me from risk or from those guys on the breach in Overlook or a hundred other things, which you did, by the way, all on your own. 
I think that I can be completely genuine when I say that you've become my best friend my only friend, really Alisa added after a moment. I mean, I'd like to be friendlier with Iorulan, but, between you and me, I don't think she actually has friends. Or wants them. I think I might have burned some bridges with Oxart and Ounce over that whole fairy thing, though I never really considered them friends to begin with. Psyxa probably isn't going to be too happy to see me after stealing her potions and then leaving her shop half destroyed, even if that latter bit was really Lumen's fault, and, now I'm just depressing myself. I don't have much to look forward to when we do get back to Lyria. Not that there was anywhere else to go. But she said quickly, realizing how what she had just said might have sounded, don't think I would trade you up for them. You're my friend on your own merits. Never doubt that. Silence hung in the air for a long while. Alisa was almost afraid to let go of Cassita, worried she might disappear. But eventually, Alisa felt a pressure against her chest. Cassita pushing her away. There was another moment of hesitation, but Alisa relented, not wanting to cling overly much. She almost expected to see a tear-streaked face when Cassita backed up enough. But there was nothing. Just a blank face without a trace of a smile. Which was sad enough on its own. Then again, Cassita probably didn't cry at all. She could probably make herself look like she was crying, but her form, Alisa had to remind herself, was illusory. A construct built up to project herself onto the world those are all people from our, from my world. Surely you have someone here that you want to see. That question made Alisa wince. Not really. My family, of course. My parents and my brother, even my grandparents and Uncle Earl, but that's family. I have co-workers, or, had co-workers. I was friendly with them, but I've never once interacted with them outside working hours. There were a few people back in high school, but we've all grown our separate ways. I haven't spoken with one of them in, a year at least. I usually keep to myself while at the gym and I attended community college while living at home, going to mostly night classes. Night classes have an overabundance of older people that I just never connected with. So no. I've got no one apart from my family. Something in what Alisa had said put a small smile on Cassitar's face. She wasn't sure exactly which point caused that smile, but she was just glad that something had. Crisis averted for the moment, Alisa took her eyes off Cassita. A large part of her wanted to jump back into the warm water and just soak forever. Pretty much all of her, actually. But she was already out. Just standing there had gotten her at least partially dry. Might as well finish up. The kitchen was calling and, she had to admit, she felt just a little awkward about standing around completely naked while Cassita wore that dragon hide armor. Cassita didn't look wet at all, but she was at least somewhat illusory, so that wasn't surprising. Grabbing the towel off the rack, and after getting over the mild surprise that the towels were quite warm to the touch, Alisa set to drying herself off. What about you? she asked. Any friends or family? I haven't seen you speak with anyone really. Just those waterhole monsters. Mimics don't have much in the way of family. We reproduce without a partner and the child is fully formed on birth, so a parent doesn't need to stick around. None of that crawling around all helpless like you humans do for half your lives. Alisa didn't bother commenting on that snipe. She was too busy trying to wring out her hair. There was probably a blow dryer somewhere around, but that would be noisy and obnoxious, so she made do with the towel alone there was a human, once Cassitar said, turning back to the mirror. Lega was his name. He didn't know I was a mimic, but I suppose you could say that we were friends. At least, we were as long as he thought I was a human. She paused, frowning at herself in the mirror before giving a snide chuckle. Not like her usual giggles. The sad sound of it made Alisa pause in her efforts to dry off. I was naive Cassitar continued, taking no notice of Alisa's lack of movement. Thought it wouldn't matter, that we could be friends despite me being a monster. 
I told him. He betrayed me, tricked me into getting myself trapped. Captured. A few years later and a long story cut short, I wound up at the water hole. That's, horrible Alyssa said, feeling like she should hug Kasatar again. She refrained. In high school, lots of the girls often gave each other hugs, but they had always felt a bit awkward to her. Right now, so soon after she had just let go of Kasatar, she felt that another hug would be more awkward than comforting. So she said instead, I'm sorry you had to go through that. A few years, couldn't you have escaped? Slipped away. Probably. But I was a bit upset with everything. Depressed that all my efforts to be kind to a human wound up, well. I didn't see a good point to escaping. By the time I was in the right mindset to want to escape, I had grown somewhat attached to some of the other slaves. Fo and I were sold to the water hole together. I didn't really want to leave at that point. Slipping on the robe bearing her name, Alyssa looked to Cassita. Do you miss her? Fo. With a wan smile, Cassita shrugged. There was an attachment there, but only a mild one. Free, she'll return to her hive. Even if I had followed her, I wouldn't belong. Not even if I disguised myself as a bee for the rest of my life. She's with her people and I'm happy for her, but I wouldn't be happy to be with her, pretending to be something I'm not. That's... What about right now? Alyssa waved a hand up and down. Are you happy pretending to be a human? I don't mind if you want to be that spider thing. That is your true form, isn't it? You don't have to pretend around me. And I'm sure Iorulan wouldn't mind, Cassitar held up a hand. Let me stop you there. I don't have a true form. It certainly isn't that spider thing, as you put it. I might look like that naturally, but the amount of time I've spent in it is probably less than 10 minutes. Over my whole life. No I might not be one, but, maybe because I've spent so much time as one, I identify with being a human far more than any creature. Even if they scorn me when they find out what I am. Not all of us. I don't. I don't think Iorulan does either. And I bet we're not the only ones. There is no such thing as a unified mindset. I bet there are millions of humans who don't like the treatment that monsters get. Especially ones like you. I mean, wasn't Iorulan talking about a village that worshipped a gaunt? If a whole village can worship a gaunt, I'm sure plenty of people can at least be respectful toward you, if not friendly. They sure do a good job of hiding it. Yeah. And that's just the state of the world. Maybe it will change eventually. In fact, it might have already started to change, with Iorulan and the second prince. Though that was a fairly large might. Iorulan didn't seem to care about much on an empathetic level, basing her cares on how useful things were to her. Bracht, Alison knew less about, but even if he deeply cared for the Draken, he didn't seem like he was much of a policy maker. That job probably resided with his older brother Dot but that was neither here nor there, or, it was there, but Alyssa was here at the moment. It was still worth thinking about. She wanted to do something for the people and monsters of Lyria, and she found herself in a unique position. There was a philosophy about leaving the world better than how one came into it, and that was more literal for her and not than anything else. With her more modern sensibilities, she felt like she was more enlightened than the rest of the people of Not. Then again, she would have to carefully look over everything she did. Thinking that she knew better than all the people with decades of experience in dealing with monsters was how she wound up ruining her relationships with practically everyone except Iorulan and Cassita. If she ever found herself in a position to make policies, she needed, vitally required an advisor. Like that will ever happen, she thought with a mental scoff. Let's get out of here and go sit down. This is exactly what I was talking about the other day, getting to know each other. Since we seem to be stuck here for a while, talking more is a great use of our time. Besides that, the kitchen might contain modern food. 
That thought alone had her stomach yearning to switch rooms to see what she might find I think I'd like that Cassita said, nodding her head after a moment. And you can tell me all about this world while you're at it. I wasn't wholly feigning my interest in all the smooth surfaces. Her smile grew wider and wider. Imagine that. I'm the first monster to ever set foot on this world. The first person to experience it. What a wondrous happenstance. It isn't that great. And we can't leave the apartment without tenor braille. There is more than enough to inspect around here. Like this, for instance. Cassitar took a few steps to the side. What is this? It's so smooth all around and full of water. Alisa blinked before shaking her head with a chuckle. That's a toilet. Now that she was clean, well fed, and calmed down, sitting around the apartment felt awkward. The initial shock of being back on Earth had worn off. It helped that she couldn't actually leave the apartment. The fridge held a seemingly endless supply of anything she could want to eat, mostly fast food. Burgers from just about every chain restaurant in both chicken and beef varieties, chicken nuggets, Chinese takeout, pizza, submarine sandwiches, hot dogs, fries, sushi, tacos and nachos, and even donuts and pretzels. At first, Alisa had felt a bit put off at the thought of eating a burger from the fridge, but the second she had cracked open the cardboard container, a steamy aroma filled the air. It might as well have been fresh from the grill. There were some magical shenanigans going on. If companies could use stasis magic to keep food permanently fresh, the world would change overnight. A fridge that worked the same way as each of these containers, for example. Just thinking about how magic could revolutionize modern society was mind boggling. Food alone would change. There were always articles about how much food went to waste, especially in America. She couldn't actually look any up at the moment thanks to her phone having been taken away, but she knew the numbers were staggering. Milk would never spoil, bread would never grow mold. Removing the waste would increase the distribution. The ability to permanently preserve food alone would end world hunger overnight. There would be all kinds of side effects stemming off from a fridge that applied stasis to its contents upon being shut as well. It presumably wouldn't use electricity. If the entire world stopped powering one refrigerator per household, how much electricity would be saved? Milk didn't need to be kept cold to preserve it with a stasis spell, though people would probably still want to drink cold milk. Glasses with a chill spell could replace that. The rabbit hole just went deeper from there. Electricity couldn't be replaced entirely. Not until magic caught up in the communications department. The internet and even just texting and calling were far far too convenient compared to message. Electric lights were better as well when compared to the light potion or equivalent spell. For local transportation, cars were superior to anything she had seen in Lyria, but they could probably be improved with magic. Longer distance could be revolutionized completely. She hadn't seen any Stargate-like thing that could be used for moving mass amounts of product on Lyria but magic could teleport things. A few years of research on that subject would probably put airlines and sea shipping out of business. It was amazing how much Alisa could think of just off the top of her head. Positing the question of how magic would impact the modern world to a bunch of high schoolers for an essay would probably result in a million possibilities that she would never think of. Of course, the only reason Alisa had thought of what she had was because of how much sitting around she was doing. Which was where the awkwardness came from. It wasn't Cassita, though being watched so intently as she shoved spicy noodles down her throat did make Alisa a little shifty. She had offered some to Cassita, but the mimic's illusory body didn't eat the same way people did. Still, while awkward, that wasn't the worst. It was just that, since being thrown into the other world, Alisa felt like she hadn't stopped moving for a second. First it was exploring outside her house, then getting to Lyria, then all the nonsense between the society of the Burning Shadow and the Water Street Gang, then her trapes through the desert. Chatting with Cassita was nice, but sitting around and twiddling her thumbs while doing so. 
Alyssa felt like she needed to be walking somewhere at least. But she couldn't. There was nowhere to walk. The apartment only had six rooms and two of those were more or less the same room with just a counter separating the kitchen from the dining area. Eyes flicking over to the clock on the wall, Alyssa sighed. Six hours. Was that what Tenor Braille had said? It had only been two and a half and she was already stir-crazy. And almost an hour of that had been in the bath. Shoving the takeout box and chopsticks aside, Alyssa looked back to Cassita. The mimic, sitting on the couch to Alyssa's side, looked happy enough. They had been talking about a great many things so far. From differences between Alyssa's world and Cassita's world, Alyssa's family, Cassita's mischief as a mimic, to some of the less than pleasant happenings at the waterhole and Cassita's time being captured by humans. There was some hate there. Real, unbridled hatred. She tried to keep her tone light, but it always took a slightly sour note when talking about the people who had her in chains. It was subtle and Alyssa could tell that she was trying to hide it, but she wasn't doing a perfect job. Even her eyes held no small amount of hostility to them, which Alyssa found surprising given Cassita's control over her superficial appearance. It was a wonder she still decided to go among humans. Even if she didn't want to be a bee, elves were human enough that she probably would get used to living with them relatively quick. You mentioned a hellhound you were friends with at the waterhole. Alyssa said, changing the subject from the humans to Cassita's fellow monsters. That seemed a more comfortable topic in general. It was far from Alice's intention to rile or upset her friend. At the same time, she still wanted to know about Cassitar's past Selpa, or Salafia, but I preferred the shorter version. She had a fire to her. A tenacity that the humans just couldn't break. And did they ever try? I admired that about her. She and I had a plan to kill all the humans in the water hole. All we needed was the key to her chains. Svoti kept the keys well hidden because of me, but he wasn't perfect. One day, Svoti slipped. I saw it, Mima eyed the shape, and ran straight to Selpa. Only to walk in on the taker wiping Selpa's blood from his blade. Alyssa winced, feeling like she had just shoved her foot into her mouth. That was not how she wanted this conversation to go. Then again. What had she expected? The hellhound had obviously not been there when she freed the monsters. In a place like the water hole, nothing good could have come of someone missing. Cassita continued on, not commenting on or not caring about Alice's flinch, staring slightly off to one side with a hardness to her eyes that Alice recognized. I don't know if they found out about our plan or if they simply decided that she was too much of a liability. Selpa was popular for being so exotic and unusual, but frequently injured many of her customers. Either way, she died. I still think that Svoti must have shown me that key on purpose, knowing what I would find. I'm sorry Alyssa said after a moment, not sure what else to say mhmu fu tilde I was a bit upset with you at having stolen my revenge away, but that didn't last for long. As a mimic, I knew that I wasn't going to get anything satisfying out of it. Poison just doesn't seem like it would be enough for the likes of him, which was my next plan. So I'm glad I saw the corpse. It looked like he died in pain. Her eyes softened as they turned to Alyssa. I suppose I should thank you, not just for allowing me some vicarious revenge, but... I had been worried that Risk was going to end up the same way. I had avoided getting too close to her and I never suggested that we should kill the humans together, too worried that the Taker would find out. The only comfort I did offer her was turning into a member of her species after particularly rough days. And I still regret doing so little for her. Alyssa almost opened her big mouth again, telling Cassita that her actions with Risk might have ended up saving the lizard's life. The thing that stopped her was a fear that such a comment could be taken as definite blame that it had been Cassitar's fault that the hellhound had died. I'm sure she appreciated what you did do she said instead, focusing on what Cassitar did do. Turning into a fellow salamander kept Risk from strangling me, calming her down enough for that. That's proof that she appreciated you. I hope she's recovered.
I'm sure she has. Just taking off her chains turned her from staring blankly ahead to, well, you saw her before she disappeared. A flame salamander lives a long time. As long as she made it away from humans without too many incidents, I think she'll recover. Good Alyssa said, glad that there was some kind of happy ending to that conversation. I met a hellhound she said after a lengthy lull. It wasn't quite what I had expected. I know. That you met a hellhound, that is. You know. Oh. Right. You were awake. Cassitar shifted slightly, leaning over the coffee table to peek into the folded paper box. Yeah she said. What were you expecting? I'm not sure, but it sure wasn't for that hellhound to be so helpful. And friendly. I mean, I thought she was going to hug me for a minute there. She was imprinting, I think. Ah. Uh, I hope that word means something different to you than it does to me. At this point, Alyssa had nothing against the hellhound personally. She hadn't tried to attack, which was a nice bonus. More than that, she had seemed reasonable, if highly suspicious, while talking with Iorulan. But just because she had nothing against the hound didn't mean that Alyssa wanted a human cross giant dog following her around calling her mother. She could already hear Tsheitsa and Downs complaining, not to mention the looks she would get from people in the city. As much as she didn't want to consider it, Lyria needed a threat. A real one. Not those little skirmishes that they fought on occasion with the Juno Federation. They needed an existential yet defeatable threat that put both the humans and the monsters into a state of uncertainty. The threat needed to be great enough that the humans would have to ask for help from the elves and other monsters with the monsters willing to agree. Some singular threat so great that they had to unify and get over their stupid hate for one another. Alyssa was perfectly cognizant that not every monster would join or could be reasoned with but there were enough that could that it was ridiculous that they kept whining about things like mimics and drake and dot a war was about all she could think of that would cause that. The Juno Federation mind controlling monsters seemed like it would possibly work, but it would only increase enmity for monsters in practice. The only other big worries she had heard about were regarding demons and their plague. That seemed like it would kill a whole lot of people. However dot she shuddered at the mere thought that she had considered using a tragedy to further her agenda. Even if it would be good for the world in the long run, exposing innocent monsters and humans to a plague just to get them to unite was a horrid thought. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Literally, in this case Alyssa. Blinking, Alyssa glanced up to Cassita. Sorry. Got a bit distracted in my thoughts. You were saying... Hellhounds like shows of strength. I imagine that she's become a bit infatuated with both you and Iorulan, and the Draken too Cassitar added. Killing all those humans while she was stuck watching would have left an impression. And then destroying the building too. The build, I was fighting Ardril. I know that, but she wouldn't. Right Alyssa said, nodding. Of course the Hellhound couldn't have known. So what is she going to do now? Follow us around. Iorulan, or her clone at least, had mentioned wanting to domesticate the Gaunt to be a monster companion to her like the Draken were to Bracht. A hellhound seemed like a much better companion than a Gaunt. And, if the hound wanted to follow Iorulan around, that was one less thing for Alyssa to deal with. Yes. That was a good plan. Let the princess deal with monsters in the city. Alyssa had her hands full with Cassitar and Cassitar wasn't much trouble at all I think it depends Cassitar said. She might follow you around, or she might decide that you being humans is just too much for her. With us missing from the town, however, she might leave on her own. I feel a little bad about it, poor girl didn't even get to say goodbye. Alyssa didn't feel broken up about it in the slightest. The hellhound would probably be happier returning home or finding a new place to live that didn't involve humans hating her presence every minute of the day. I guess we'll find out when we get back. As much as she had missed home, Alyssa was looking forward to returning to Lyria. Or maybe she was just missing freedom. 
she could hardly call it a vacation to Earth while stuck inside a tiny apartment. Glancing over at the wall clock to see how much time she had left in this admittedly well-furnished prison, Alisa started. More time had passed than she had thought. With good old-fashioned electric lighting, she hadn't even noticed the darkening of the sky outside the window. Tenebrail had said six hours. Time was just about up. Unless she had been extremely precise in her estimate, she could show up any moment now. Alisa expected to glance to the side to find feathers already filling the room. Instead, she stopped on Cassitar. and had a thought I'm not sure that Tenebrail knows you're here. The angel was not omniscient. She could easily have missed Cassitar being a rock. Maybe it would be best if you turn back into a rock. Tenebrail probably won't care, but I'd rather not take the chance that she gets upset and wipes your memory or something equally distasteful. That would be unpleasant, yes. Shall I just go back to being a rock then? Probably for the best to keep as much unchanged as possible. I'm not sure how soon she'll be here. I understand. Just don't leave me behind. Or, maybe, Cassita. I wouldn't have a problem with you roaming Earth, but I think angels would take an exception if they noticed you. And if there is some way to track you back to your world, they'll probably find out about Tenebrail. The whole reason she brought me here is to keep the angels from finding out and destroying that world. Alisa leaned forward, grabbing Cassitar's hands. I'm coming back to Earth one day. Under my own power and with some way to keep angels off my back. I promise that I'll bring you with me if you want to come at that time, but please don't do anything that will get not blown up with me on it, or at all, for that matter. No. That wouldn't be good, would it Cassitar said, looking around with a sigh. Seems a shame to come to a whole new world that no one has ever visited before and not see more than one room. Can't argue with that. I'm a bit upset too. Shall I turn now? Probably for the best. I'm just going to try to clean that dragon hide armor as much as I can before Tenebrail arrives. Nothing exciting. Cassitar didn't say another word turning into a rock on the coffee table. Alisa immediately picked it up and slid it into the pocket of her bathrobe before heading to the bathroom. The outfit was right where she had left it. She started out by picking it up with only two fingers, keeping it at arm's length. She was clean and it wasn't. But this had to be done. Getting it looking sleek and black again would be nice but cleaning the inside was far more important. To start with, Alisa turned on the tub's faucet again. There weren't any washing machines inside the apartment, but even if there were, she wouldn't toss it in. First of all, there probably wasn't enough time. Secondly, while supposedly invulnerable to everything but angelic weapons, soap and detergent might ruin the lining. So she was only going to give it a rinsing. A thorough rinse but a rinse nonetheless. Really, she should have done this a long time ago, giving it a chance to dry out. Still, watching the tub basin turn brown with mud and dirt was satisfying in a way that Alisa couldn't quite put to words. Grabbing a washcloth, she started doing a bit of a deep scrubbing. The exterior didn't need anything other than water and a quick swipe of the cloth. Everything just ran off like it had been treated with waterproofing chemicals. On the inside, she gave extra attention to the armpits and other heavy sweat areas. By the time Alisa was satisfied, a whole hour had passed. With still no sign of Tenebrail, Alisa was starting to get a little nervous. What if something had happened? What if some seraphim showed up and killed Tenebrail? Angels were not omniscient, meaning that it was entirely possible she could be forgotten inside this tiny apartment for, ever, basically. The fridge had an endless supply of food, so she wouldn't starve. Cassitar was pleasant company. But this was still a tiny room. Iorulan and the Draken would be free eventually. Maybe they could figure out a way outside. They would still run into the problem of angels. 
No matter what, staying here in the long term was just not a good idea. Just as she started to get worried about spending potentially the rest of her life in a tiny room with two hungry dinosaurs, Alisa saw it. A black feather. Alisa turned to the bathroom door to find Tenebrail standing on the other side, holding out a snub nosed revolver by the barrel. I hope you're ready to go. I meant to be back a bit earlier, but had to dance around a little guardian. Turning her gaze from the revolver to Tenebrail's glowing eyes without touching the gun, Alisa put her hands to her hips. I'm not shooting anyone. I'm not killing this man. Oh come now Alisa, be reasonable. We don't have time to sit around and argue. Alisa crossed her arms, shaking her head. No Alisa, the angel's voice turned to a far less reasonable tone. Before she could get too angry, Alisa interrupted her. But. I have to ask, does he actually need to die? Tenebrail pulled the small pistol back, frowning as she stared. I've already explained quite clearly and in simple terms that yes, he does. All hints of a good mood had vanished from Tenebrail's words. Where they normally had an almost melodic tune to them, there was now nothing but ice. Since you are asking, I assume that you've got something else to say. Alison nodded quickly, not wanting to raise more ire from the angel. Even with all she had done, all the insults she had thrown at the angel and all the complaints, she couldn't remember Tenebrail being so angry. Only killing the man who was supposed to kill Alisa had stripped Tenebrail of her constant air of bemusement before. Even then, she hadn't been angry. Worried, yes. And that only lasted until she had settled on her decision to kidnap Alisa. Speaking of, did I need to die? That got Tenebrail to blink. She was still frowning, but she did raise an eyebrow. Alisa took that as a cue to continue. It's quite simple. I would say that I'm surprised that you haven't thought of it, except you've already told me that you literally can't consider some options. He doesn't need to die to keep the timeline going, or whatever. Just do what you did to me. There were news reports after I got to your world that claimed I had died. You made a fake body, right? Do that now. Bring the guy back here while leaving his fake body in the alley, then send us all back to Nod. It was such a simple solution. The guy might not be too happy, Alisa sure as hell hadn't been, but it was better than being dead. Alisa didn't have to kill anyone innocent which was a nice plus. The fake dead body could be found by police, thus preserving the future. A perfect plan, if she said so herself won't work Tenebrail said, shaking her head. Reaching forward, she grabbed Alice's hand, pressed the pistol into her palm, and closed her fingers around its grip. Now, if you don't mind, the stupid angel sure knew how to bring down her good mood. Why not? With you. I had possession of Ios Fiel's book. She was the one in charge of collecting your soul, originally. The same isn't the case here. Another principality has authority over this death. If she shows up and finds a body with no soul, she is going to start investigating. I've already got problems with Ios Fiel and now Ardril. I can't just go around tying up every angel that crosses my path. Alisa glanced down at the pistol in her hand. It was her turn to scowl. Can't you? No. Someday, I'll have granted myself the autonomy and authority required to do something like that. But that day is not today. I'm sorry. I know you don't want, so this angel expects to find a soul with this body. You're just missing a soul to give her. You've made a valiant attempt to save this man's life Tenebrail said. The ice in her voice had melted to something somber. Almost as if she were sad that things had to be this way. Alisa honestly couldn't tell if it were genuine or not. I want to do away with these foolish books as much as you do. If we work together, maybe we can do it. But we won't accomplish anything if the astral authority crashes down on us. There isn't enough time to return to Nod, find a suitable soul, and return. If you had mentioned this earlier, we can do it now. All you're missing is a soul Alisa said, getting a little excited. She started moving away from the angel. 
I have one right here. Tenor Braille's eyes widened. Faster than Alisa had seen her move before, the angel clasped her hands around Alisa's. Or, more specifically, the gun in Alisa's hand. You fool. I'm not letting you kill yourself over this. I won't be able to heal you if you shoot yourself in the head. Alisa blinked, shook her head, and tried yanking her arm out of the angel's grip. It didn't but I'm not suicidal. Ah. Uh, stupid angel. Give me my hand back and look. They were still in the bathroom. Neither had moved a step since Tenor Braille appeared. But, in addition to dropping her armor, she had also dropped her satchel here. When, after hesitating a moment, Tenor Braille let her go, Alisa headed straight for the satchel. She set the gun on the ground, rummaging through it. Bits and bobs that she had collected went to the floor as she dug through it. Notebooks, pens, ink vials, a dagger, bullets, magazines, a protein bar that looked a lot flatter than it should have been here. Grasping a misshapen gemstone, Alisa got back to her feet. Can't you just shove this into a fake body? Shoving it into Tenor Braille's hands, the angel had no choice but to accept it. At first, she looked dismissive. Alisa thought she caught her eyes rolling. It was hard to tell with the glow. But the dismissive attitude quickly vanished. She brought the crystal right up to her face, turning it over. It started floating above her fingertips, rotating in the air. Why, how do you have this? Did I owe Svial? No, she couldn't have. Does it matter right now? You said we're low on time. Can you use it or can't you? I might be able to disguise it well enough. Clenching her fist around the gem, she nodded her head. All right. We'll try it your way. If the entirety of creation comes down on us, I will make sure you know it was your fault every second until our obliteration. Just think of it as an experiment. We're testing whether or not someone else introduced to your world can perceive you and how your book reacts to their presence. There are safer ways to do that than muddling about with Earth. Alisa could only shrug and smile. While she was glad that Tenor Braille was listening to her, the smile was a nervous sort. Now that she was actually thinking about it, what if she did cause the Astral Authority to notice Tenor Braille's actions? It could be her fault that the entirety of not wound up destroyed grab the pistol. We'll still need it. Glancing over to the mess on the floor, Alisa hesitated, but eventually nodded. Right. If whatever Tenor Braille had planned didn't work, well, she might not have much choice then. If it came down to one person versus an entire planet, Alisa couldn't, in good conscience, not pull the trigger. Could she? Shuddering, Alisa picked up the pistol, hoping that she wouldn't have to find out. Alisa stiffened as a pair of arms and two pairs of black wings encircled her from behind. All light cut off, save for a faint white projecting on the inside of the wings. It had to be from Tenor Braille's glowing eyes. But the angel didn't say a word. Neither did Alisa. She barely felt anything at all. The first thing she did feel was the air. The apartment had been a fairly average room temperature. Outdoors at night was a bit chilly, even through her thick bathrobe. As the wings parted, Alisa saw the telltale sign of Tenor Braille's teleportation drifting to the ground around her. Each feather disappeared on contact with anything solid until all that was left was a dark alley with a flickering street lamp dot blinking a few times to try to get her eyes back to normal after going through a sudden light change. Alisa took a step away from Tenor Braille dot and immediately regretted moving up. I just took a bath. The bottoms of her calloused feet were scraping against the wet alley asphalt. Couldn't you have let me put on some shoes first? I'm going to cut my feet on a broken beer bottle and die of dysentery. You don't get dysentery from stepping on broken glass. And we have other things to worry about at the moment. Tenor Braille waved her hand to a large garbage bin only a few steps away. That is our target. At first, Alisa thought the angel was joking around. Then she saw it. She had thought that a large bag of trash was leaning up against the bin, but no. There was definitely a man in there. 
eyes better adjusted to the darkness, she could easily make out the thick beard, dripping with water. A bit of cardboard, pinned between the man's head and the metal garbage bin, did little to keep the pouring rain from soaking the man. Alisa hadn't even realized it was raining. None of it was touching her. Glancing up, she could barely see droplets splashing against an invisible shield. The water disappeared as it ran down, making her view completely unobstructed. Looking back down, she couldn't help the grimace on her face. Couldn't the poor man find a bridge or an overpass to hide under, at the very least? Some overhang that would keep him dry as he slept. How could anyone even sleep like this? As of late, Alisa had no trouble sleeping under the stars, but during a monsoon. No way would she be able to do so. And with two people talking right in front of her. She would be awake in an instant, though Tenebrail was probably invisible. She might have done something to turn Alisa invisible too. Dot yet, despite the rain, at least, he looked almost peaceful in his slumber. His face, rugged and weathered, was at peace. If she hadn't known that he was supposed to be shot to death, she might have thought that he was already dead. Do you regret trying to save him now, after seeing what he looks like? No he was pitiful. Tenebrail had said that he had once been in the military. Alice's mother had been in the military as well. Had things been different, she could have wound up in his place. Of course, he stole and deserted. Her mother hadn't. Alisa wouldn't be surprised to find that he had spent a while in prison, military or regular. It had clearly taken its toll on him. She couldn't even begin to guess his age. Late fifties, maybe. He could just as easily be in his early thirties. I feel sorry for him. Oh. How many people at street corners holding up cardboard signs have you driven past on your way to work? How many have you stopped for? Have you ever handed out a dime to any of them? What makes this one so special that you've got to go out of your way to save him? Tearing her eyes from the trash bag and the human inside, Alisa glared at the angel. She, didn't want to answer that question. It brought up disconcerting feelings. I'm not a good person, alright? I think all the, deaths, all the murders I've committed speak to that. But I'm not a psychopath. If you put someone in front of me like this, of course I'm going to feel sorry for them. I might have driven past a hundred homeless people in my life, always trying to avoid eye contact. That doesn't mean my first instinct is to shoot them. Tenebrail didn't say anything aside from a soft hum maybe not will be good for him. He clearly isn't getting what he needs here. If you haven't changed your mind about killing him, I suppose we'll find out. Alisa almost shouted at the angel, but Tenebrail didn't even look her way before she raised a hand partially severing Target's connection to this world. A rather familiar set of symbols rose up around Tenebrail's outstretched hand. It wasn't quite fractal lock, but there were definitely a few similarities. A few subtle movements around the man vanished as the miracle took effect. His breathing which Alisa had barely noticed before, stilled, as did the slight movement behind his closed eyelids. The water running from his form changed the way it flowed. His beard remained as stiff as stone, no longer pushed about by the currents. The ripples in the bag around his body stopped their minor fluctuations with his body's movement and the weight of the rain matter generation Tenebrail said, pointing slightly to one side. Water, carbon, ammonia, lime, phosphorus, salt, she trailed off, sounding almost hesitant before finally finishing, and the rest. And the rest. That doesn't sound very exact. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to hold a soul long enough for an angel to collect it, then remain in one piece until it is buried underground. Now stop distracting me. The glow in the angel's eyes cut off as she closed them. At the same time, the blackish-white light around her fingernails brightened. Weaving she said, simply dot in front of Alice's eyes, a body started to form. The process started with a yellowish goop that quickly wound up surrounded by a white plaster, forming the shape of bones. She recognized the hips, 
femurs, spine, ribs, and skull. Soon enough, Alisa was standing before something out of a high school science class closet. Red started wrapping around the white bones next. Seeing the muscle and the organs in the torso had her feeling a little queasy, but what really made her turn away was the eyeballs. Dark brown eyes with no skin around them almost made her throw up. The noise didn't help much either. The whole process produced one long, uninterrupted squelch. From then on, she couldn't watch. Turning to the alley's entrance, Alisa grimaced a little at the feeling under her feet as she walked a few steps away. The rain still didn't fall on her, but whatever shield was around her didn't stop the ground from being soaked. The street outside the alley was more or less deserted. There were a lot of boarded up windows and faded shop signs. Never having been to Chicago, she couldn't say where in the city she was, but it clearly wasn't a well-kept area. Sirens droned on in the distance. Remembering Tenebrail's words about her would-be killer leading a manhunt, she wondered if they were for him. Then again, this was Chicago. There probably wasn't a single time of the night without sirens. Just about ready to turn back to see if Tenebrail had finished, Alisa hesitated at seeing a shadow rushing toward the alley. Lightning struck a building. For a single instant, she saw the face of the man from all those nights ago. A face that still haunted her dreams on occasion. The exact face that haunted her varied between three forms the blank eyes of the dead body the murderous rage of a man bent on killing her, and that of a father who had lost his son. The face that flashed in the lightning was none of those. It looked alive, but Alisa couldn't detect a trace of emotion on the body's face. Rather, it reminded Alisa quite a lot of those toys that Iorelan had made. Which, she supposed, might be closer to the truth than not. Whatever had become of him, Alisa found herself detached. She had thought that she might feel something. Fear or anger, maybe regret. Without Tenebrail in the equation, him deciding to rob her house had started everything. But she just looked at his lanky walk with dispassion. More interesting were the sirens. They sounded like they were getting louder. It must be almost time. Alisa could already see what was supposed to happen. Her killer would panic at seeing police run down the alley. The victim might notice and try to stop him, or maybe just get in the way. The pistol currently in her hands could belong to either of them at this point, but it was clear who would wind up with its bullets embedded in their chest. Flashing red and blue lights lit up the sides of the buildings. The lights were quickly followed by a pair of patrol cars. As soon as he saw them, he started sprinting straight toward Alisa. Despite herself, she did feel her pulse jump at that just a little. Still, she ducked back into the alley, not wanting to be seen. She was fairly certain that nobody could see her even though she didn't have shards of fractal magic swirling about, but just in case Tenebrail had forgotten, she didn't take the chance are you done yet? The police are here. They really were cutting it close. It looked like Tenebrail was almost done. When Alisa had turned away, the body looked like something from a horror movie. Now it looked like the twin of the man in Stasis. Except, it wasn't quite. Although she had likened him to a corpse earlier, the man in Stasis was definitely alive. This thing was not. It slumped against the trash bin where the victim had been, eyes half open with a vacant stare. This thing was a true corpse. A man whose soul had left, or rather, it had never possessed a soul in the first place. Tenebrail had the soul crystal out keeping it floating between her and the body. It was coming unraveled, turning from a lump of a gemstone into a smoky mist when I put this soul into the body, I need you to shoot it twice. Once in the stomach and once in the left chest area. You need to be up close to leave muzzle burns on his body. So get over here. Right. Alisa pulled out the pistol and moved right up next to Tenebrail. Holding the pistol in both hands. She checked it over, found the safety, and flicked it off. Her would be killer rounded the corner at the same time. Despite running like the devil was at his heels, his face still showed no expression whatsoever. Creepy, Alisa thought with a frown. Even worse than the body in front of her because it was actually moving now. 
With the slight distraction of the walking corpse, Alyssa wasn't as on the ball as she should have been. Tenebrail shoved the mist forward as if it were a solid object. The body took a breath. Its eyes, formerly dead and vacant, lit up with life. There was a brief instant of confusion present on the bearded face. Then it started screaming. A howl of pure despair. One that would give a shadow assassin nightmares. The eyes widened as it started clawing at its face. Fingernails dug into its skin, staining the falling rain red Alisa. Sucking in a breath, Alisa aimed the pistol at his stomach and pulled the trigger. What should have been a loud noise in the narrow alley was a mere pop. Despite having a hole in his chest, the man did not stop screaming. Has he even taken a breath? Gritting her teeth, Alisa aimed upward, right where his heart should be, and fired. Alisa blinked. The screams were gone. The body was gone. The alley was gone. All she could see were Tenebrail's wings, which slowly parted to reveal a rooftop. Black feathers drifted to the flat surface around her where she stood next to a frozen man. The real one. The one in stasis. Blinking her eyes a few times, she found Tenebrail standing at the roof's edge, looking down wh what the hell was that? Quiet Tenebrail said. We are hidden, but an angel might spot us if they look hard enough. Clamping her mouth shut, Alisa slowly walked toward the edge. Her legs were shaking far more than they should be. Heights always got to her, but, those screams. She shuddered, feeling like she might throw up. But she had to see. Near the edge, she dropped to her knees, not caring at all that she was staining the fluffy robe with grime. Two police cars had parked around the alley. Their occupants were out of the vehicles, walking around. Alisa couldn't see any sign of the killer but he had probably run right past Alyssa while she had been shooting the corpse. And the corpse was there. She could see it clear as day, one arm stretching out toward the alley's entrance as it lay face down. One of the police officers ran up to it and flipped it over. He leaned down, putting an ear to the man's mouth as he pressed a finger onto the throat. After a moment, and after shouting something to one of the other officers, he tore open the garbage bag pressed something up against the two wounds, it was a little hard to see what from the angle, a bandage, perhaps, and started performing chest compressions. CPR. Did CPR help bullet wounds? Maybe if the heart hadn't been hit, but Alyssa was pretty sure she had gotten it based purely off how much blood was visible despite the rain in the alley. Dot it wouldn't matter anyway. He wouldn't survive. Already, white feathers were filling the alley. Alice's stomach clenched at seeing them, fearing that Ardril was going to appear. But she didn't. In the middle of the alley, a shorter angel popped into being. One with wild and unruly blonde hair, like she had just woken up after tossing and turning all night. Not the golden color that Iosfiel sported, but an almost regular blonde. If that wasn't enough of a difference, the pink omber down at the ends proved that this wasn't an angel Alyssa had seen before. Her wings were smaller than Io's files as well. Not to mention, she was wearing a pink tracksuit. But only the jacket dot shaking her head, Alyssa watched as the white wings brushed against the corpse. The soul crystallized. Properly, this time. It was no longer a cancerous lump, but a smooth gemstone that wouldn't look out of place on a piece of jewelry. Throughout the entire process, the angel looked half asleep. Eyes half-lidded, she actually yawned before grasping the soul and shoving it into her wings. In the next instant, the alley was empty save for the police, the corpse, and a few fluttering feathers excellent Tenebrail said. Congratulations. Your plan worked. There are still two more bodies to be had, but they won't be for another few days. I assume you wish to do the same thing to them. Save them. As there will be some time, I can collect the souls myself from the dying in Nod, but I will need help killing them after we create false bodies. Alyssa didn't respond right away. Her arms were shaking. Her legs were shaking. It took a bit of willpower to tear her eyes from the alley. When she finally did, she didn't look at Tenebrail. 
Her eyes moved to the man she had saved. Had it been worth it? Almost certainly. The only reason it wasn't an absolute certainty was because of a man who had already been dead. She didn't know whose soul that had been. One of the ones she had collected. A member of the Society of the Burning Shadow. Probably one that she had killed, but maybe one that Aisha had bit. It didn't really matter, did it? He was dead. Those screams though. She had seen and heard a decent amount of things during her time in Tenebrail's world that would have a horror writer salivating. Yet, somehow, she didn't think that she would be sleeping tonight. Even the gaunt and the noises it made as it ate that person weren't so bad. Had it been because he had died? Was death truly so horrible? Perhaps it had been Alice's fault for turning his soul into that lump instead of a proper gem. Or maybe it was from being brought back to life. Perhaps it was life itself that was so horrible. Unless it had been because he had been brought back into a body that wasn't his own. That option made a decent amount of sense. Tenebrail had said that leaving souls in dead bodies caused pain and anguish. A body that wasn't his probably wasn't a pleasant thing to wake up to. Whatever the case, Alisa just shook her head. He was dead now. His soul had been taken by a proper angel at that. Ironically enough, thanks to Tenebrail, he might be the only member of the Society of the Burning Shadow that she wouldn't end up consuming, depending on where those taken by Iosphiel and Ardril ended up. This one, at least, was guaranteed to stay out of her hands. He would go, to the throne. Whatever that was. It took another moment, and some shuffling to get well away from the edge of the building, but Alyssa got back to her feet. She looked Tenebrail in the eyes and nodded her head. We should save them. Unless they are criminals and murderers, I'm not going to shoot innocent people just because your plan says that they need to die. And, if I could make a request, the souls of the bodies that I do need to kill should all be murderers from your world. If that will help your conscience Tenebrail said with a dismissive sigh it will Alyssa said. Her stomach still felt like it had been tied into a knot. But for now, can we just go back to the apartment? I need a drink. Alyssa was not an alcoholic. She really only drank on rare occasions. Her birthday. New Year's. When she went to fancy sit-down restaurants. Things like that. There were a few reasons for that. Price was the big one. Alcohol was expensive. She couldn't understand how people could throw away a significant percentage of their income on drinking a few beers a day, let alone on more pricey drinks. The taste wasn't anything to write home about and she didn't actually enjoy being any level of drunk either. The few times she had woken up with a hangover only served to hammer home that drinking was to be a social only thing, not a casual thing. She wasn't about to disparage other people for enjoying that things they enjoyed, even if she secretly thought that they were foolish for doing so. However, tonight, she was grateful that Tenebrail had seen fit to stock the closet with several bottles of beer. It was cheap stuff, mostly, but Alyssa wasn't going to complain especially not after tasting the vile mixture they called alcohol on nod. That stuff could get her swearing off drinking permanently. Maybe modern tastes had ruined her palate, but she couldn't see how anyone drank that stuff. Yet they seemed to like it. Especially those people at the festival in Teneville. Even when it had been free, Alyssa had passed a mug up more often than not. Uh, thinking about beer was distracting. Or maybe it was the beer that was distracting her. Was there a difference? She shook her head, trying to clear her thoughts. She hadn't had nearly enough to be actually drunk. It was just that thinking about beer was less complicated than thinking about other things. More important things so what do we do now? Alyssa said, looking over the coffee table. Iorelan, Aisha, and Muska were still pushed off to the side. They were now joined by the frozen form of the bearded man who had been unceremoniously dumped on top of the pile. It was getting a little ridiculous. She was once again wearing her fluffy bathrobe, which had been cleaned with a wave of Tenebrail's hand. Tenebrail hadn't noticed Cassita. Or, if she had, she hadn't said anything about it. 
Alisa was just glad that the mimic was still there. She had been a little worried that the mimic would slip away. But her trust had not been misplaced. Take that ounce and height Sir Dotters for the angel herself. She sat across from Alisa with her wings obstructing the television. Not that Alisa believed that the news would be playing anything about the incident at this time of night. There hadn't been a chair there before, there still wasn't one there now. No matter how she figured it, Tenebrail was not sitting on a chair. She sat on a throne. A black marble throne made to look like it had been ripped from a Gothic cathedral. Maybe even her cathedral from Teneville. The back was narrow enough that it could fit between her wings, resting her back without getting in the way. Two tall spires jutted up on either side of her head. If Alisa blurred her eyes a bit, it almost looked like the angel had horns. She sat with her legs crossed, leaning against one of the two open-mouthed lions that had been carved into armrests. Upon first seeing it, Alisa could only roll her eyes. The angel could float in the air without even beating her wings. Did she really need a throne, so what now? Tenebrale. It wasn't like the angel to be distracted. Was something wrong? Alisa started, hand instinctively going for a gun at her hip that wasn't there. But Tenebrale just glanced over and shrugged. Apologies. I was going over everything we did, making sure that I hadn't forgotten anything. I think we should be fine. Ah. Well, that's good. So now. Back to Nod. Soon. I don't want for any of you to be here much longer than you already have been. But I will allow you some time to recuperate. Enough time to get a night's sleep. As much as Alisa didn't think that she would be able to sleep well, a soft bed would go a long way to help. Sadly, Tenebrail shook her head. Not longer than an hour. Besides, your companions will be out of stasis soon. I want them back in my world before then. Can I at least take some food with me? As much as you can carry Tenebrail said with a smile Dam Alisa mumbled, wishing that she had her big backpack with her. Unfortunately, that was back at the cave outside the society's compound. What about this robe, can I keep it too? Maybe she could tie it into a makeshift bindle and increase her food carrying capacity it has your name on it, doesn't it? Thanks. Alisa said. And she honestly meant it, though she did start frowning after thinking for an extra second. I don't suppose you could do something that would make it permanently clean, could you? Because I just know that it is going to get caked in dirt, sweat, and probably blood ten minutes after getting back. Are you calling my beautiful world filthy? Yes. Tenebrail's lips turned to a pout. You are a needy one. I've missed modern amenities Alisa said, entirely unashamed. Having just one garment that wouldn't wind up ruined would be a godsend. An angel send, I suppose there is no harm in it. That had Alisa grinning, though it was something of a sour grin. Once again, she was on a roller coaster. A few hours ago, she had been hating Tenebrail. Now, she was back to actually liking her. Am I being bought with gifts? Though, maybe she should be happy that Tenebrail had taken a risk on Alice's behalf in saving the homeless man. She could easily have said that the plan wouldn't have worked, that Alice didn't know enough about theoretical metaphysics, and insisted on killing him. But she hadn't done so. She had listened to Alice's plan, patiently shot down the parts that wouldn't work, and tried it when Alice presented a solution. For that, Alice could be happy with the angel. Now we just have to do it two more times. Our daughters for the man. Alisa glanced over to the pile of frozen bodies. What about him? What about him? He can't stay here. He must go to Nod. It is far too late to be having second thoughts about that. Unless you intend to kill him, in which case I can eat his soul and dispose of the body. No. No. Definitely not. It's just Alisa paused, thinking. If you put us back where you got us from, he's going to wake up and probably panic. Maybe even fight against me, thinking I kidnapped him. Or something like that. Considering that we left a hostile stronghold in the middle of an expansive desert, 
that probably isn't the best place for a fight. Or rather, Iorilan would kill him immediately if he tried anything. She could picture that scenario clearly enough in her head there is a reason I dropped you off into Neville. You've seen my world. It isn't a safe place. I wanted to keep you alive while I decided what to do about you. To Neville was the best place for that, assuming you didn't stay in your little home. Then you left to Neville and got caught up in all kinds of nonsense. So much for my efforts she added with a grin, cocking her head to one side. Alyssa opened her mouth, about to ask for just that. Being dropped off into Neville, or close enough to it that it wouldn't matter much, would drastically outweigh any benefits of returning to the desert. Except for one thing. Iorilan had wanted to destroy the compound to prevent more of the Juno Federation from moving in. Hard to do that from Teneville. But. Did they really need to destroy it? If they got back to Lyria, it should be a simple matter to order some guards and mags to destroy it. Even if some political red tape bound her hands, Iorilan could hire out people from the guild. Surely they had mags capable of destroying a small and very empty village. Then again, they hadn't spared anyone for Ounce's mission. He was supposed to be paid a bonus if he and his group managed to destroy the fairy commune. But instead of the guild supplying anyone, he had gone to Tzheitsa. Alisa had no doubt that the potion crafter could whip up something analogous to modern C4 or Napalm, which would surely do the job, and she very well might have done just that judging by Ounce's comments about the potions he was carrying, but the guild hadn't supplied anyone else even after she had rebuffed his request for her to join them. The whole reason he and his group had met at the potion shop before leaving had likely been for one last attempt at recruiting her. Or, if not recruit her then to pick up the potions they wanted to use, but Ounce had obviously wanted her to come with them. So maybe they didn't have anyone who could just stand outside the village and blast it with magic. Still, they should be able to get a small group of soldiers to raise the place, even if they had to do a bit more manual labor than magic should allow. And if she couldn't get a handful of men out to destroy the buildings of an empty village, what good was being a princess, of course? Neville was two weeks away from Lyria. The desert was only a few days away. So maybe it would be best to return to the desert in the name of expedience. How much would the Draken reduce the travel time between Teneville and Lyria? Alisa wanted to say that the desert was closer, but was it really? They could have crossed a huge amount of land with the help of horses and Draken. It was hard to tell exactly how much while riding. Either way would probably be a few days. From the desert was just a known amount of days. Alisa blinked, slapped her cheeks, and shook her head. I'm so dumb. If you insist, I won't argue. Not bothering to respond to that, Alisa moved on with what she had been going to say. Can't you drop us off in Lyria? There were dangers there, true. The Taker in particular, but also the occasional attacks from the Society of the Burning Shadow. With so many of their members dead and their orb of mist destroyed, hopefully those would be on pause for at least a few weeks I can put you in Lyria. I can put him in Lyria. The others must return to where I took them from. What? Why? I, the white in her eyes cut off as she blinked. I don't know. But they must. Alyssa stood up. This is that thing again she said, rounding the coffee table to get to the angel. She put a hand to Tenebrail's shoulder. You can do it if you try. Right. Just take us all to Lyria as if you were taking only me. Then don't move them anywhere else. Simple. If only it were. I'm running the calculations as we speak. I won't say that there are no possibilities that will lead us all to Lyria, but I can't see them. A black void has swallowed up the vectors and the equations. Then teach me these calculations. I'll do it for you. Tenebrail raised an eyebrow. Teach you? I. I took a math class in college Alyssa said, turning aside ever so slightly you took math in modern society. And passed, barely. Tenebrail shook her head, sending her black hair flying for a moment until it settled perfectly around her shoulders. 
I might be able to teach you a few simple things, but crossing between worlds, or even moving to a new location on the same world, requires mathematics that your society doesn't have a word for yet, let alone a theory of. Then let's start with the small things. If I can't cross worlds, then so be it, but neither of us will know until we try. Alisa took the opening for what it was, a way to get her foot in the door. It took a great deal of willpower to keep from shouting out. Learning magic from Iorelan was one thing. Doing so would probably be useful no matter what, but Alisa had little confidence in Iorelan's capacity for teaching based of her one experience of learning to draw out spell cards and several comments she had made since then. Alisa had no reason to believe that Tenebrale would be a better teacher but Tenebrale had been the one to move her between worlds. That was something that Iorelan could not do. Apparently because the math was too complicated. Still, this is what she had been wanting since she started her journey to Lyria. That should excuse being over-eager. She waited with bated breath. Tenebrale was staring right at her. Considering teaching. Alisa could only hope you are an extraordinary person, Tenebrale eventually said. And I mean that in a very literal sense. An ordinary person would not be able to have a conversation with me. But to learn to create angelic miracles. I suppose there is no harm in testing. So you'll do it. Alisa said, unable to keep the grin from spreading across her face indeed. We'll begin in seven days time. Seven days. But, apparently, Alice's elation turning sour warranted some amount of chuckling. You didn't think you would be hopping between worlds tonight, did you? Well, no. But, in seven days, I will require your services for a similar event to what we undertook tonight. I will endeavor to set aside an amount of time to see if you have any capacity for miracles. Alice couldn't help but sigh. At least there was a hard date this time. Seven days. It suddenly seemed so far away for today, our time here is quickly coming to an end. So make your decision. To Neville. Lyria. The desert. Or perhaps you wish to see a new corner of my world. The ruins of what the humans call the first city are a sight, I'll stick with Iorel and Alisa said. She really didn't need to think about it at all. Leaving Iorelan undefended in the desert while she was sipping a martini in whatever passed for an island resort in Tenebrale's world would leave a bad taste in her mouth. Would Iorelan even be conscious when the stasis wore off? She hadn't woken up while being healed, but Tenebrale might have done something to keep her that way and what about him? Tenebrale asked, looking to the bearded man. To Neville. Lyria. Alisa followed the angel's gaze biting the inside of her cheek. What to do about him? She had saved his life, but, at the same time, she didn't really want to take responsibility for him. It seemed somehow wrong to think it but, he was a homeless bum who slept next to trash bins. Unless Tenebrale was going to take a personal interest in stopping time whenever trouble struck, Alisa really couldn't afford to have someone hanging off her shoulders. Weighing her down. Dropping him off into Neville might be for the best. He had been a soldier, which meant that he had to have some strength and work ethic. Surely the town could use an extra hand on the fields or shearing the sheep. Maybe putting his soldiering skills to work by defending livestock from harpies. Or maybe he would prefer to go that route from the start. A man with training and the drive might prefer to work for the guild or as a soldier in the Lyrian Guard. No matter what, Alisa did not want him waking up in the desert with monsters all around him. At least not without explaining a few things first. Without turning away from him, Alisa asked Tenebrail, could we unfreeze him? Explain what has happened, maybe give him a chance to shave and some fresh clothing if he wants. We can also test to see if he can see you. I do not think that he can. Glancing to Alisa, Tenebrale shifted which leg was crossed over which. In the alley, he could not perceive us. Were his and your positions reversed, I believe that you would have been able to see me. MHM, so I am truly unique. Alisa thought with a mild frown. That was still a puzzle that was bothering her. 
except, not unique. One of a pair. The man who had seen Tenebrail and had spoken with her was another. There had to be some similarity between them, but without knowing more, Alyssa couldn't begin to guess what that similarity was. Maybe, over the course of their lessons, Alyssa would ask Tenebrail. The way she had stared off into space when talking about him. The way her voice hadn't been quite as steady as it normally was. It had happened a long time ago, but something told her that it was still a bit of a tender topic with the angel still, the other reasons to unfreeze him still apply. If you can get him some clothes and a razor. And bring me my pistol. Just in case. In coming back to the apartment, the revolver had vanished. Alyssa hadn't asked, but presumed that Tenebrail had taken it to be placed wherever it was supposed to be in the plan's version of events all the work we went through to save him and you're going to shoot him. No. Of course not Alyssa said. She was fairly certain that Tenebrail was making a joke. The angel was looking at her with a smile. She still felt the need to rebuff her. It is just in case he does turn out violent. Unless you're planning on freezing him again before he can do anything to me. I can. So long as you remain within this room. However, once we return to Nod, my ability to intervene will be limited. I like you, Alyssa, but don't think that I will be coming to your rescue if you find yourself in trouble. Figured that one out already Alyssa mumbled, though she did appreciate being healed. So long as she didn't die, she could recover. Whether that be through Tenebrail or magic and potions, she would survive. Just unfreeze him and let's see how this goes. Am I dead? Whatever Alyssa had been expecting, it wasn't that. Having asked Tenebrail to hide Iorelan and the Draken to keep the shocks to a minimum, Alyssa tried to present herself as normally as possible. She hadn't run to the bathroom to equip the armor despite wanting the added protection. She hadn't left out three empty beer bottles for him to see. She had even asked Tenebrail to step out of the room for a few minutes, just in case he could see her and had been mildly surprised when the angel complied without complaint. So for his first words after blearily looking around the room to be questioning whether or not he had died, Alyssa had no words. Her expectations included yelling or maybe a fear that he had been kidnapped. Or maybe picked up by police. Or an ambulance that had been worried over his health. What should she even say? Obviously, he wasn't dead. But, at the same time, he kind of was. At least as far as people on Earth were concerned. By now, the police had probably figured out who he was if he had any kind of identification on him. An old military ID card or something similar. They might have to wait for dental comparisons, fingerprints, or a relative or old co-worker to confirm, but they likely had an idea. Alyssa felt a sudden pang of guilt wondering how her own family was faring a month after her apparent demise. Her mother would have come home and found her body. Stabbed, if Tenebrail had prepared a body to match with how she was supposed to have died. She, hadn't really thought about it. Initially, she had thought she wound up on Earth and wouldn't have too much trouble at least getting a message to her parents to tell them that she was alright. Then, as time went on, she wound up increasingly distracted by all the nonsense in the other world, leaving relatively little time to actually think about her parents and her brother. Right now, staring at a man who thought he was dead, she couldn't get the image of her mother cradling her lifeless corpse out of her head. It was an image eerily similar to that of the elder thief clutching his deceased son. What about this man? Did he have any family? Would they be missing him? Given his homeless status, he probably hadn't had anyone close. No one who would give him a spare room in their house, or could give him one. That didn't necessarily mean that they didn't care for him. He stiffened his back, black trash bag crinkling as he moved. Nor he said, cracking his neck back and forth. Hurts too much. You aren't dead. Alyssa should have started with that immediately after he first spoke. The question had just come as a shock. Though your life as you knew it is effectively over. Maybe one day, once Alyssa figured out a way to stay on Earth without constantly being harassed by angels, he could come back with her. 
no sense getting his hopes up immediately over something that was probably a decent way off into the future. Especially when she hadn't even explained about the other world yet. I'm not entirely sure how to tell you, you're one of those government types they talk about in whispers he said, leaning forward. Alisa just blinked. What is he talking about? Her speechlessness before was nothing compared to now you come, find someone with nothing left, and, turn me into an assassin. A spy. Or is this a suicide mission? He chuckled, low and slow. I knew you people wouldn't leave me alone. Well. Go on. What's the mission? What are you, no? There's no mission. I'm not whatever you think I am. Of course you're not. And of course there is no mission either. He leaned a little further forward, winking with emphatic exaggeration. The bathrobe is a nice touch. I'd never expect it. But I guess the movies have done the black suits and sunglasses too much to use in reality, eh? Just, stop Alisa said, pressing a hand to her forehead. Oh tenor braille. That stupid angel was laughing at her right now. She could hear the melodic giggling coming from the hallway. And, was her pocket laughing too? Look. You aren't dead, but the world thinks you are, of course they do. Stop winking. Ah. Uh, maybe it would be easier just to throw him to the wolves and let him fend for himself. Depending on how big a conspiracy theorist he was, and he was obviously a fairly large one, he would probably assume that moving to the other world was some technological advancement kept secret from the general population. Showing him the Draken would just make him think that they were some secret government bioengineering project. If he was really hard set in this narrative he built for himself, Alisa didn't know what she could say that would convince him. Even plenty of magic might be explained away as technology by someone sufficiently set in their ways tenor braille. The angel took a moment, probably to compose herself from all her laughing, but eventually floated into the room. You called. First of all Alisa said to the man, whose name she had intended to ask but hadn't gotten around to thanks to his nonsense. Do you see anything over there? In the hallway opening. He looked, thankfully silent. With narrowed eyes, he stood up and walked over. Alisa watched him with a sinking feeling. A feeling that was confirmed when he stepped right through Tenor Braille. Alice's side, followed closely by an almost simultaneous sigh from Tenor Braille. I told you the angel said in a slightly dejected tone while well, Alice said, hoping to distract herself from the fact that the man was now inspecting the wall paint. Can you give him a cell phone with my number in it? Drop him off in Lyria. He can, the guy was staring at her now. Shifting slightly to address him directly, Alisa continued. You can call me when you get a clue. Tenor Braille responded first with a slight sigh. I suppose I could. But it isn't going to be as full of features as yours. So long as it can call my phone, that's fine. As Tenor Braille reached back into her feathers, did she come prepared to hand out cell phones, Alisa grabbed her satchel from the couch and started picking through it. She pulled out a few bars of money. Not much, but it would be enough to get a room in a cheap place and a dozen meals or so. Anything else and he would have to find a job. Or beg, but Alisa wasn't sure how well that would work in Lyria. Crossing the distance, she dropped the bar-shaped coins into his hands. Money she said before quickly explaining that the gold ones were worth the most and the bronze ones were worth the least never seen money like this before. And I've been to all the shitholes of the world. I bet Alisa mumbled what language are the little letters. Unable to answer, Alisa glanced to the side Enochi and Tenor Braille said as she dropped a phone into Alisa's hands. Not a smartphone. A small brick with one of those green and black displays. It looked more like a calculator than a phone. Except the calculators that she had used in high school geometry looked more advanced than this. Oh well. This must be what Tenor Braille meant by a lack of features. It didn't even have a camera on it. He did not look impressed when she handed it over. Budget cuts hit your department too. 
Alisa didn't respond, sadly shaking her head instead. This is going to be a bit of a wake-up call for you, I think. You can consider it a chance at a new life. Or you could wind up in the streets again. It's up to you. I saved your life, but I don't have to babysit you. What you do is up to you. What's that supposed to mean? Word of advice, avoid dark alleys. And here, take this. She had meant to offer him one of the packaged hamburgers as comfort food while processing his situation. But things hadn't gone as she had planned. So she just dropped the hamburger in his hands, still in its box. It is probably the last one you'll ever get. That made him tense, just a bit. Last one. What was it that Tenebrail had said? Prepare thine self, for this world is not long for thee. She immediately felt a nudge in her side excuse me. That's my line. Tenebrail had the biggest pout on her face. A fake pout, one clearly forced. Turning away, her eyes started glowing even brighter than before. Her fingernails mimicked her eyes as she thrust a hand upward. Four circles spiraled out, forming a triangle with lines of text flowing between three of the circles. The fourth rested in the center. Chris I'll track. I claim thee, blah blah, you can't even hear me. Target, Chris I'll track. Stochastic evasion routes calculated. Evasion impossible. Immediate space world tether severed, as soon as she spoke that line, Tenebrail vanished. The man vanished with her. Aside from a slight rush of air from around Alisa to fill their void, there was no evidence of either having stood before her only moments ago. It probably wouldn't stay that way for long. Tenebrail would be back for her in minutes. Tops. Possibly within seconds I better get things ready Alisa said as she headed back to the bathroom, more for the benefit of the mimic in her pocket than for herself. I'm sure she's going to want to take me back immediately. Cassitar didn't respond, but Alisa didn't really expect her to. She was a rock dot though she had been laughing earlier. With a light-hearted scowl, Alisa tossed the rope to the floor and started getting back into the dragon armor. As soft and fluffy as the robe had been, she honestly felt much better with the thin but tough scales providing a barrier between herself and the rest of the world. Glancing in the mirror, she adjusted the suit. Maybe it didn't look quite as bad as she thought it had back in the palace. It was still just a bit tight and had just a slight gap in the chest, but she projected a fairly imposing presence. Her pistols were missing. The one under her arm and the one at her hip. She had never carried a gun in her everyday life on Earth. Except, obviously, the few times she had been dragged down to the range. But everyday carry. Never. And yet, despite all the dark scales covering her, she felt somewhat vulnerable without them. Especially because she didn't even have spell cards for backup. Tenebrail had better give them all back, Alisa thought with a scowl. And that stuff. Ardril's stuff. Alisa wasn't sure what to think about it. It was a weapon crafted by angels. Possibly one capable of harming other angels, given Ardril had pulled it out when Iosphiel attacked. Angels couldn't, or weren't supposed to harm mortals, so there would be no need to have weapons to fight them. That just made Alisa want it even more. An angelic weapon. Although, she did have to admit that carrying it around wasn't that practical. It was large and unwieldy. Awkwardly shaped as well. Angels could make them appear and disappear at will. That would be a nice trick to learn. Perhaps that would be the first thing Tenebrail would teach her. She didn't know what those lessons would entail, but the thought was making her giddy. To avoid the philosophical nonsense that came from too much staring in the mirror, Alisa grabbed the robe and headed straight for the kitchen. She threw open the fridge and stared dot what to take, what to take, everything. Alisa started with her satchel. She managed to cram in three boxes of Chinese, two submarine sandwiches, and two colas. Unable to fit anything more, she laid out the rope on the counter and started piling things on top. Everything, from beer to chicken nuggets. She piled up one thing after another. Bacon, 
lettuce, and tomato sandwich. She definitely wanted a few of those. Barbecue ribs. How had she missed those earlier? A whole pizza fit underneath everything else easily enough having fun. Alice jerked, dropping a bottle of mustard to the floor. The bottle was, luckily, plastic, it didn't break and splatter everywhere. Without even looking at the angel at her back, she continued plundering the fridge. I don't suppose you'll unfreeze Aisha and let me fill her saddle bags with food. Sorry. Yeah. I figured. You will let me take all this, right? If you can carry it all. Glancing over her shoulder, Alisa winced. She might have to put a few things back. The bathrobe was long, running from shoulder to ankle, but she wasn't sure that she would be able to fold the fabric over the mound of containers with it that high. Sighing, she started placing a few of the less appetizing foods back into the fridge. Poutine. What had she been thinking, as she worked, she looked up to the angel. Tenebrail was looking too perfect, as usual. How did he take being dropped into a whole new world? I can't be sure. There were an awful lot of vulgar words coming from his mouth. Take that as you will. How about your book? Has it updated to include him in future events? Or is he another blank spot like me? That was the first thing I checked she said, reaching behind her to pull the book from her feathery wings. Opening it to the page with the bookmark, she flipped forward a few pages. Nothing in here yet, but it may still be calculating future possibilities. I'll keep an eye on it. It's a long shot, but I don't suppose you could provide me with an English copy of those books. Being able to tell the future would go a long way toward avoiding troublesome situations. The taker put a trap around the next corner. Too bad for him. Alisa could simply go a different route these were crafted by virtues. I lack the requisite knowledge to create them. But you would if you could. I don't think an English version would work either. A single character of Eno Kyan conveys enough information to fill a few hundred books. To decompress my notebook into such an inefficient language as English the book would have to be as big as a galaxy. Approximately. Well. It felt like a lame response, but what else could she say? A single page would be impossible to use, let alone a whole book. She couldn't properly visualize it even. It was just too big. Even if it were stored digitally, that would still be fairly large. Probably. Alisa didn't know much about data storage other than that she had several books on her phone, but they were probably not galaxy-sized books in their natural state. To avoid trying to wrap her head around something she couldn't imagine imagining, Alisa set to work wrapping up the food in the bathrobe. She had seen videos on the internet about turning clothing into carrying devices. Unfortunately, they had been the type of videos that she watched once, thought they were neat, and promptly forgot about. It took both hands gripping every corner and sleeve of the robe, but she managed to lift the food off the counter without spilling it everywhere ready. I think so Alisa said. She had the food, her armor, the satchel hanging from her shoulder, a wocket in her pocket, and, that was it. Tenebrail had taken everything else before they had arrived. Yeah. Ready when you are. Targets, Alisa Meadows, Iorulan, Aisha, Muska. Evasion calculations unnecessary, willing and immobilized targets. Immediate space world tether severed. Confirming existence of multiple universes. Not confirmed. Beginning narrow area not transference across divine vector 359. As she spoke, the triangular magical circle expanded from her outstretched hand. Still lacking her phone, Alisa couldn't do much other than try to memeize it. Unfortunately, this magic circle moved. The text, the angelic script that could hold more information than a book of English text, flowed between the circles. It didn't seem like it was repeating either. Unless she took a video of the magic circle, she couldn't think of a good way to recreate the effect. Simply drawing everything onto a piece of paper wouldn't work. Maybe that would be one of Tenebrail's lessons.
a way to cast magic using glowing lines drawn into the air like the angels used. Dotino Kyan could be exactly why Tenebrail didn't seem too worried about the prospect of teaching Alyssa her style of magic. If she couldn't comprehend all the rapidly moving text, she probably wouldn't be embarking on a solo trip to Earth. The smaller spells that some of the angels had used didn't move. They were as static as the spell cards. If Alyssa could cast those without a card, it would still be worth it. The apartment around Alyssa vanished into nothingness. The conditioned air went with it. Alyssa sucked in a breath as a bit of panic took root in her chest, worried that she wouldn't be able to breathe at all. But fresh air filled her lungs. It was the crisp air of a wilderness without human population or pollution local destination. 3. 1. 1. 1. 8. 7. 2. 9. 5. 6. The cool air rushed away in a heavy gale. A stifling heat moved in to fill the void. Alyssa had to squint away from the bright light of the sun as it started beating down on her transit complete without incident. Welcome back, Alyssa Meadows, to my world. Ah. Uh, I don't suppose you could go adjust the desert's thermostat. It took a few blinks of her eyes for them to adjust to the sudden light. When she could finally see, she found herself standing almost exactly where she had left. Muska and Iorelan were right where they had been impaled. Aisha was a bit to the side, near the toppled building. Time had clearly passed. It had been night during their attack. A flick of her eyes toward the sun had them watering but the blinding light told her that it was late morning. and her sunglasses were back at the cave with her backpack. Are your equipment Tenebrail said, which had Alyssa whipping her head back to the angel. Your phone, pistols, spells, and a small gift. Everything was lying on a black cloth covered table between the angel and Alyssa. Her phone was propped up like it was on display at a shop. The pistols were both pointing away from Alyssa, and looked like they had been oiled and polished recently, all the dirt and grime was nowhere to be seen. In comparison, the deck of cards looked like it had been tossed on the table as an afterthought. Several of the spells were bent and it looked like they had been dragged through the dirt. Iorelan's tome was cleaner, sitting right next to the stolen deck but it clearly retained some of its dirt from Alyssa dropping it. The gift was covered by another cloth, one with white embroidery lining its edges. As soon as she was looking at it, Tenebrail reached forward and pulled the cloth straight up my shotgun. It sat there, just as polished as the pistols, propped up so that she could see it properly. The barrel was whole once again. There wasn't even a small scratch where the sword blade had nearly lopped off the end. She would have reached out to pick it up and fully inspect how fixed it was, but her hands were still full of a food-filled robe. As happy as she was to see her shotgun in one piece and what looked like a few boxes of shells to the side, she couldn't help but frown. There was one thing missing from the table where's the staff? The angel frowned. She opened her mouth, but hesitated in actually speaking. After letting out a small sigh, she held out a hand horizontally over the table. The golden spiral sprouted from either end of her hand, growing long and sharp at one end while stunted with a ruby orb at the other I thought about not returning it she said slowly. It is a holy artifact, after all, not meant for mortal hands. And, if it is in your possession, Ardril may try to retrieve it. I might not be around to stop her and Iosfiel needs to return to Earth for a time to continue her duties there. Not that she did much good this time but she did distract Ardril for a few minutes. Are you sure you want it? Alyssa pressed her lips together. Ardril coming back was a scary prospect. Maybe she would just sneak in while Alyssa was sleeping and take it back, but maybe not. The angel had already demonstrated a capacity for harming mortals. Putting herself in harm's way simply to keep the staff might not be worth it. At the same time, that staff was a major link to angels. A weapon used by angels against angels. If she let it slip through her fingers, she might never again come across one dot with that in mind, Alyssa nodded her head very well. I don't know what you hope to do with it, but I won't keep it from you. It isn't even mine. 
and if Ardril didn't want mortals to get their grimy hands on it, she shouldn't have thrown it at one. Using both hands, Tenebrail slowly lowered the staff down onto the table. With its length, it stretched behind all the other items, reaching from end to end as if it had always been intended to be displayed there. Tenebrail took a step away. Or a float away. Either way, she stretched her wings wide. I'd love to stay and chat some more, but I do need to find Io's file. I need to track down Ardril if possible. I need to find a suitable soul for our excursion in seven days. Plus all my other duties. Busy busy. I'll see you soon. Alisa didn't say a word. She didn't trust herself not to ask Tenebrail to keep the staff. It really was dangerous to keep it. But the time to decide passed before she could think on it any further. Tenebrail's black wings scattered through the air, obscuring sight of the angel just long enough for her to disappear. Alisa started with the pistols. Setting the food carefully on the ground, she picked up one of them and started turning it over. It really looked brand new. There wasn't a ding or a scratch in the metal as far as she could see. She almost wondered if it had received the same treatment as her phone. She wasn't about to try Annihilator on them, especially not without Tenebrail explicitly stating that she had done something to them. And not when trying to call one of them to her outstretched hand failed. Her phone appeared just like it should. The gun did not dot pressing a button on the side dropped the weighty magazine into her hands. One by one. She used her thumb to drop the brass bullets to the table. She knew for a fact that the magazine hadn't been fully filled before. It was now. And, pulling back the slide, she found one extra bullet already chambered. After quickly reloading and reassembling the pistol, she slid it into her holster. Right where it belonged. She then repeated the process on the other pistol, finding it fully loaded as well. There was a small cloth set atop a box where the pistol's barrels had been resting. Before taking the guns, it had made the barrels aim upward, displaying the two guns while also pointing them directly where Tenebrail had been. The angel had clearly never taken a firearm safety class in her life. Removing the cloth, Alisa found one box of ammunition. Enough for four full magazines. Not much considering the rate Alisa had been going through it, but more than what she had before, so she wasn't going to complain. Unfortunately, there wasn't much room in the satchel with all the boxes of Chinese. For now, Alisa swapped the food for the ammo, figuring that she could fill Aisha and Muska's saddlebags with the food once they got out of their stasis. Which should be soon, she thought glancing over at their still forms. Can't come soon enough. Alisa was more than ready to get out of this place. The phone went into her pocket. She barely glanced at it before sliding it in. It was too complex to look through for every little thing that Tenebrail might have done to it, and, besides that, she doubted that Tenebrail would have done anything to it anyway. It was already souped up. Her cards went away much the same. They looked like they hadn't been touched. A quick glance through didn't reveal any new cards, so there was no point in investigating them more thoroughly. She left Iorelan's tome right where it was, intending to return it to the princess as soon as she was able. The shotgun, like the pistols, looked cleaner than when she had pulled it out of her gun safe. Sliding her fingers along the barrel felt only like smooth hard metal. Not a single imperfection. Definitely no mark where the end had nearly been chopped off by the taker's sword. A quick check found it was fully loaded as well. The strap was different. Before, it had just been a belt that would work to sling it over her shoulder. Now it was filled with additional shells, each ready to be loaded at a moment's notice. That combined with the fresh box sitting right in front of the gun, plus the spare shells she had left at Tzheitz's shop meant that she had quite the surplus of ammunition for the shotgun at the moment. Which Alisa wasn't going to complain about in the slightest. Slinging it over her shoulder, she found it nestling into place as if the strap had been adjusted perfectly. Stupid angel, she thought with a smile. Her smile waned as her eyes moved to the final object on the table. I don't like this. Alisa jumped. Her heart hammered against her chest while her hand dropped to the grip of her pistol. 
She had it half out of its holster before her brain finally decided to recognize the voice. Kasatar she said, sighing in relief as she glanced over her shoulder. The mimic stood at a surprising distance from everything, being almost back up against the building the hellhound and shadow assassin had been trapped against. Which was a thought that sent a chill down her spine. She didn't have any way of detecting them active. Kasatar could see them and would presumably warn her, but as much as she trusted the mimic, seeing for herself couldn't be beaten. At the very least, it would make aiming at them far easier. Holstering her pistol again, Alisa grabbed hold of her deck of cards. Unseen sight didn't reveal anything new around her. She wasn't too surprised about that. It had been several hours. Enough for morning to come and for noon to be soon arriving. The shadow assassins and the hellhound were probably long gone by now you don't like this. Alisa finally said. The staff. Any of it. You do realize that there is nothing there, don't you? Nothing here. Alisa turned back. There was stuff here. A black cloth over a table. Some food placed on top. And a golden staff lying on its side. She grabbed the tablecloth between her fingers and rubbed back and forth. It was soft and velvety. Far too luxurious to leave in the desert. She would have to fold it up and take it with her. If nothing else, it would fetch a fair amount of coin from some noble, probably. Unless it only existed for Alisa. Can you not see all this? Selling the Emperor's new clothes might be a more difficult task some of it Kasatar said. All the things you've had before are there like normal. The food as well. But there is nothing under that cloth. Except there is. She shuddered. Dot glancing back to the table, Alisa knocked her fingers against the table. It didn't make a sound. No hollow woody sound, no metallic clank, no stony thump. Stepping back, she lifted up the tablecloth and peeked underneath. The first thing she noticed was a lack of table legs. Looking up, she found no tabletop either. She could reach up and feel the soft velvet of the tablecloth and even press her hand upward into the cloth. Ha. Huh. Yeah. Ha. Huh. And that, thing. Remember how I said that those feathers were strange? You said you might die if you try to mimic them, Alisa said as she let the cloth drop back to its spot. There was a bit of a handprint where she had moved the cloth from the bottom. Running her hand over the top smoothed it back out. Weird but hardly the weirdest thing that she had seen since meeting Angel's well, that thing is worse. Ignoring the mysteries of the table for a moment, Alisa reached a hand out to the staff. She didn't move quickly, but slowly and reluctantly. Despite having been hanging on to it for dear life earlier, the prospect of touching it was somehow unnerving now. Not just because of what Kasatal had said, but just because she feared that the moment she touched it, it would smite her. Or Ardril would pop up. Or something else bad would happen. But Tenebrail wouldn't have given her something dangerous. Even if angels really could harm people as easily as Ardril had, Alisa could at least believe that Tenebrail didn't want to see her dead. She still didn't think that Tenebrail would pop up to save her life unless another angel was the one endangering her. Mostly because interacting with the denizens of her world seemed troublesome for Tenebrail. Biting her lip. She clasped her hands around the golden haft. The metal felt warm to the touch. Much warmer than she expected of metal. Or maybe much cooler than she would have expected for something that had been sitting out under the desert sun for a few minutes. But, other than the eerily warm sensation in her arm, Alisa didn't feel any other effects. No sign of any angel feathers either. Regaining her confidence, she brought it over to her side of the table and rested the end against the ground. Seems all right to me, she said, looking up to the ruby orb. Just try not to swing it at me, all right? Of course not. It really wasn't meant for swinging anyway. It wasn't a bee staff. The ruby orb at the one side made that end far too heavy. Maybe it could be used as a club but she doubted that was its intended purpose either. 
Even though Ardril had thrown it, it was probably more like a magic wand than a martial baton. Now that she was thinking about its weight, Alyssa started frowning. Wasn't gold supposed to be extremely heavy for its size? To the point where a small block was hard to pick up with one hand. For a staff like this to be made of gold, she would probably have to deadlift it just to get it off the ground. But she could lift it up and wave it around with a single hand. It didn't cause so much as a mild strain. Shaking her head, she chalked it up to magic and left it as that. Was it bad that she shrugged her shoulders at so much that would have made her gape in shock a month ago? If she were a scientist, she would say yes, but she wasn't. Puzzling over the enigmas of the universe wasn't her job. Things were the way they were regardless of her understanding what is, a thundering crash cascaded off the buildings, echoing over the village. Alyssa turned just in time to watch the peak of the cross topple forward, falling straight through the partially collapsed roof of the church. What is that, she shouted. Someone else was still here, dismantling the building. The hellhound. Or, oh, wait. What time is it? Pistol out and in one hand, staff back on the table, she pulled out her phone with the other. A tap on the glossy face brought up the clock. Twelve hours already. She didn't know the exact time that Iorelan had cast the spell, but she knew when she had showed Iorelan pictures of Tenebrail. The two times hadn't been far apart. Half an hour at most. Assuming that was correct, then the fractal lock that kept the fairies in their cages and the splitting spell from progressing had worn off. Narrowing her eyes, Alyssa glanced around. The hairs on the back of her neck were standing on end. Am I a bad person for hoping that those fairies were crushed? She really didn't want to deal with them. Especially not while Iorelan was in such a vulnerable state. The fractal lock on the fairies had only been 10 to 15 minutes before Alice's fractal lock on the princess and the Draconheim conflicted Cassitar said after a moment of thought. I feel bad for them, but I don't want them near me either. Yeah. Let's just keep an eye out. We won't have to be here for long. The stasis will be running out soon. As soon as it does, we can get out of this hellhole and get back to the cave. They wouldn't be totally safe there, but, with Iorelan's tome, she might be able to seal off the entrance until everyone had fully recovered. All she needed was for Muska and Aisha to be mobile. The princess didn't even need to wake up right away I'll stick next to you. Don't want to fall under their sway again and wake up finding myself being eaten. Good idea. Wait, can you even be eaten? If they make me want to bring my true self to them. I doubt they would, they would probably try to gnaw on my illusion. But it is possible. Alyssa turned her back to the table and the draken behind it, leaning against it. Only after she put her weight on the table did she remember that there wasn't actually a table there. She didn't fall, but the realization did flip her stomach as if she had just gone down a drop on a roller coaster. She didn't like leaving her back open, but the church was the most likely direction for the fairies to come from if they headed toward her. With Cassitar essentially having a full view of everything around, Alyssa would be counting on the mimic to watch her back do they try to eat absolutely everything Alyssa asked after a minute. Fairies, that is. They're carnivores. I know that much. They use their powers to eat whatever falls under their sway. I think they usually stick to common animals, but I really don't know. The first one I've ever seen was on the breach in Overlook. Like I said, while I have lived among monsters, most of my life has been with humans. Ha. Huh. Strange. Strange. It's just that, we had fairies back home. Mythology, not reality. But from the stories, I would have assumed that they were nice. Like, they're usually the hero of the story, or allied with the hero, as most main characters in fiction are human. They would offer support of the magical variety. A fairy godmother is a fairly common character. Just thinking about it made Alyssa want to find some books or plays from this world. Fictional ones. Plenty of historical fictions from Earth dealt with the slaying of monsters and fantastical journeys to strange lands. 
magic as well. The Odyssey, Boalf, and stories from King Arthur's mythology to name a few off the top of her head. But here, where monsters were a real thing that real people went out and really slate, a story like the Odyssey might well be true here. Maybe a little exaggerated, but she wouldn't be able to tell the difference. What would fiction look like in a world where her fiction was all reality? Did they dream of glass cities and people going to mundane jobs like janitors? The thought almost made her laugh strange Cassitar eventually said, which did make Alyssa chuckle. She almost asked what fiction the mimic knew of when she heard a noise at her back. All her good humor bled away to a nervous tension as she turned. Iorulan slumped forward. Already leaning toward one side, she promptly fell face first into the dirt. Holstering her pistol, Alyssa rushed over. Tenebrail had supposedly healed her completely. Alyssa couldn't actually tell. Tenebrail had fixed everything that Ardril had done, including the damage to the black armor. With the top fitting much tighter on Iorulan than on Alyssa, there wasn't even a slight gap where the two sides connected. Taking care to be gentle, Alyssa flipped the princess over so that her back was against the ground. Her eyes were closed, but she was breathing. There was something, off. Alyssa shook her head and ignored the weird sensation in the back of her mind. Pressing fingers up against Iorulan's throat, Alyssa found a steady pulse. The princess was alive. Undoing just enough of her armor to get to her skin, Alyssa felt around the princess chest. It was a bit invasive, but it was all in the name of health. Where once there had been a gaping hole in her ribs, Alyssa's fingers found a hard sternum. Of course, even if she had found a hole, Alyssa wasn't sure what she could have done. Another fractal lock, probably. She lacked the medical skills to mend more than a scratch. And something told her that burning the wound closed wouldn't have helped as much on the heart and lungs as it had on Alice's shoulder. Just as she started considering slapping the princess, she knew from experience that trying to wake her with anything less was an exercise in futility. Alice felt warm and moist air against the back of her neck. Turning her head, she saw the orange and black tiger stripes of Muska in the corner of her eye. More importantly, she saw rows upon rows of razor-sharp teeth. Alyssa pulled her hands away from Iorulan at a glacial pace. She tried her best to avoid any sudden movements. Hi. Muska. You remember me, right? The only response she got was a blast of warm breath right in her face. It made her flinch, but Muska didn't follow up with a chomp of those teeth. Instead, the draken moved to the side slightly pressing its muzzle right up against Iorulan's face. It made Alyssa a little more nervous with how Muska had nipped at Iorulan back at the palace, but this time, it just nudged and pulled away I swear Alyssa said as soon as its eye turned to her, I wasn't doing anything other than checking that she was alright. A snarling snap made Muska look away, giving Alyssa a bit of breathing room. Aisha's teeth chomped down on thin air. Having apparently expected something solid between those teeth, it immediately let out a deep growl as it whipped its head back and forth, searching for its target. Unable to find anything to attack, it settled on Alyssa, Muska, and Iorulan, making what Alyssa would describe as a confused whine. Carefully, still making no sudden movements, Alyssa closed up Iorulan's armor, stood, and took a step away from Muska. Sorry she said. A lot happened. She was about to leave it at that. Both Draken were looking right at her. They were clearly dissatisfied with that explanation. Alyssa didn't know how she knew. It was something subtle with the way their eyes shifted or their non-existent lips peeled back. As much as she knew that they were intelligent monsters capable of understanding human language, it actually took her a moment to remember that fact. They wanted more. So Alyssa gave them a bit more. Had to put you all in fractal lock until I could heal Muska and Iorulan. We need to get out of this village. Then I'll explain what happened if you want to know more. As far as she was concerned, now that the fairies were free, it was imperative that they leave at once. Iorulan hadn't seemed concerned when Muska chomped down on the first fairy's head, 
but Alyssa didn't want to take the chance that a group of the little monsters would be able to overpower them and take control. Or that they would take control of her, for that matter. She had thrown off one with only a little difficulty, but if a group could combine their powers, she might be in trouble. And Iorulan was still unconscious. What was wrong with her? Had Tenebrail not healed her properly, the princess hadn't slept at all the night before, or day before. Whenever. Was that it? She was so exhausted that her body was taking every scrap of sleep it could get. That was great for her body, but Alyssa wanted out. Can you carry her? Alyssa said, looking up to Muska. Without letting her fall off your back. We don't need to go far. Just to that cave we spent the day in. The draken made a noise. Alyssa wasn't sure how to interpret it. It was a low trill from the back of the throat. Encouraging. Discouraging. Alyssa hadn't a clue. Muska snapped her teeth, not quite lunging at Alyssa. It did make her jump back again. Thankfully, Aisha came to her rescue, putting itself between Muska and Alyssa. They talked. They made noises at each other, staring, glaring. They even paced around a bit as if they were trying to intimidate each other. The whole display made Alyssa more and more nervous the longer it went on. What were they arguing about? What if Muska wanted to eat her? What if Muska convinced Aisha? Iorulan's tome was all the way back on the table. The spells she had on hand weren't enough to fight off two Draken. Not without resorting to Spectral Axe, which would kill them. She would if it came down to it, but that was a last resort. The Draken were not enemies. They couldn't be. Iorulan trusted them. Bract trusted them. Even Alyssa trusted them. Or Aisha, at least. Just as she was considering her chances at making it back to Iorulan's tome in time to fractal lock the two Draken, their argument came to an end. Whatever dialogue they had ended with Muska kneeling down next to Iorulan. Aisha bent, opened its mouth, and clamped down on Iorulan's collar. The dragon scales didn't tear, rend, or break as the Draken partially lifted the princess. In a surprising feat of oral dexterity, Aisha gently placed Iorulan over Muska's back, face down. Her stomach was pressed up against the saddle. At the sound of a clipped chirp from Aisha, Muska stood up again. Iorulan stayed in place. And she stayed in place as Muska started walking. The Draken probably shouldn't do any running or jumping, but it seemed that they were mobile. Muska's slit pupils turned to Alyssa. It let out a slight huff through its nose before turning away. Aisha, on the other hand, approached, coming right up next to Alyssa. Unless they had learned to speak, Alyssa couldn't even ask what they had been talking about. Which was not a bad thing. Alyssa wasn't sure she wanted to know. Thanks was all she said oh, they like you. You foo tilde Alyssa wasn't sure she believed that, but she wasn't going to argue right now. Whatever happened, it got results. Turning to the table, she considered shoving the food into Aisha's saddlebags, then thought better of it. They could do that later. For the short trip out to the butt cave, she could carry it. Rolling everything up in the long tablecloth, Alyssa slung it over her shoulder. Curious, she stretched a hand out and patted at the air. There was nothing there anymore. No invisible table. It had vanished when she took the black cloth. Cassatar disappeared as well during the process, so Alyssa didn't even bother looking for the mimic as she clambered into Aisha's saddle. It was an awkward affair with all the bulk but they were off. At a languid pace to keep Iorulan from falling. By the time they made it to the cave, Alice's back was sore, her arms were straining, and she felt sweaty enough from the desert heat that cleaning her armor had probably been a pointless task. But they made it. And Iorulan had only fallen off Muska once. She hadn't woken up, but she had mumbled something about Tess when Aisha pulled her back onto Muska's back. Alyssa was taking that as a positive sign. As long as they were safe in the cave, Alyssa was content to let the princess rest for a few more hours. Although, the butt, like most butts, was a tall and fairly wide section of rock that jutted up above the relatively flat surrounding desert. 
Alice guessed that it was made of sandstone, but she wasn't a geologist. The cave was up a little hill of brown dirt and it wasn't a very wide opening. To get inside, Alisa had to get off Aisha's back lest she smack her head. When her feet hit the ground, she noticed it. A few sharp gouges in the ground. Four shallow gashes, each about an inch apart. One stride forward and she found another set of marks. It might have been there before. She hadn't been paying all that much attention to the ground during their earlier visit. The only reason she noticed was because she had dropped a box of chicken strips. Aisha bent down and sniffed. Not at the chicken, but at the marks. When the draken started growling, Alison knew that she couldn't deny it anymore. Something was in this cave. Something with sharp claws. Setting the food down, she pulled out her shotgun. It felt good in her hands. Just knowing that it had some stopping power compared to her pistols was a comfort. Turning back to Muska, she held up a hand in what she hoped was a stay gesture. If the interior was dangerous, they could leave. There was some gear in there, but it wouldn't be the end of the world if she couldn't recover it. However, she was feeling a little confident with her refurbished armaments and her monstrous friends. She had a raptor on her side. Glancing at Aisha and nodding her head, the draken bobbed its head right back. They advanced into the cave slowly. It wasn't a large cave, more of a U-shaped hole in the wall. They followed the tracks slowly. The more she looked at them, the more certain Alisa was that they were aimed inside the cave. None were pointed in the opposite direction. Whatever made them was still inside. Before she could peek around the corner to where she had spent the night, she heard it. A crunch. Loud and a bit wet, followed by smacking of a tongue. That was enough for her. Whatever was in here could stay in here. There were surely other, less occupied caves around. She turned to leave, only for Aisha to bump into her. She went sprawling across the ground. It took all her presence of mind to point her shotgun toward where the noise had come from while lying on her side. Her backpack sat with some of Ireland's supplies against the back wall. Its contents, the compass, a flashlight, a first aid kit, a thermos, sunscreen, a whistle, and plenty more, had been spilled all over the floor, dumped out from a brand new hole in the top of the pack. In the middle of all the garbage, a mound of black fur sat. A huge paw shoved a protein bar into the gaping mouth, wrapper and all. It crunched down twice before realizing that it had company. The burning eyes of a hellhound turned to face Alisa. The endless expanse truly lived up to its name. As far as could be perceived, crystal lattice formed into structures. From tall towers to smooth domes, the expanse encompassed all. No matter for how long one traveled, they would never reach the end. Prismatic light of every hue glimmered off the pristine walls. It was a sight that no mortals had seen. Many sections couldn't be seen by mortal eyes. Every so often, sections of the expanse shifted out of existence, folding in on themselves as the landscape surrounding them unfolded. Any mortal caught within would be torn to pieces. And that was hardly the only thing that a mortal would find hazardous. The overpowering brilliance from a million fractal compounds would surely blind human eyes. Blobs of shifting red and green light clung to the towers one moment, only to be replaced with yellows and a hint of octarin. Strange linear forms sprouted from the edges of the fractal surfaces, making the structures appear alive with motion despite being immobile. For the inhabitants of the endless expanse, such a thing was as usual as a door. The city, if it could be called as such, was filled with crystalline buildings. But, except in rare cases, the buildings were filled with nothing. There were no apartments, no homes, no couches, no tables. No beds. No one lived within a single structure within the expanse, mortal or otherwise. Not even a single insect patrolled along the glassy faces of the scenery. Although it encompassed the entirety of existence, only a few places saw any activity. The throne was the largest of those areas. As endless as the expanse, it stood taller than any other structure. Although fit for a mortal of average height, it dwarfed everything with its presence. It was the main hub for meetings between the spheres. 
principalities arrived to deliver their collection of souls to the four-faced cherubim. Virtues attended to the infinite library, going through the books one by one in their ceaseless task. Authorities observed the Ophanim, reporting on the Great Wheel's movements to the virtues. And the seraphim stood around the throne itself, guarding it. Clad from toe to head in golden armor with a white cloth veil obstructing their faces, each one looked identical to the one next to it. Though few in number, each one had six great wings spread to their fullest. They filled the crystal chambers. Even they, the throne's ultimate guardians, were unable to project a more imposing presence than what they had been charged to protect. Ardril turned away with a frown. Despite everything, despite creation itself going awry, they didn't move. She had tried explaining. She had tried petitioning for them to take action. She had tried. And she had failed. With the veil over their faces, she couldn't tell if they even flicked their eyes to her dot with a twitch of her wings, she drifted toward the throne chamber's grand arch. The exit. But she couldn't stop herself from glancing back. Her fists clenched. What would happen if I flew up and shoved one of them? Would they act then? The answer, she knew, was, probably. But they wouldn't act the way she wanted. If they did anything at all, they would view her actions as an attack. A spark of another rebellion. Before she could blink, she would be cut down and sent to the oblivion that awaited. Eyes drifting to the throne behind the seraphim, Ardril sighed. Was it even worth protecting? Without anyone seated on it, the throne became nothing more than a chair. No. Not even that. It was a massive crystalline lattice, the same as any other segment of the endless expanse. Turning, she stared at the others in the chamber. The virtues, the authorities, the cherubim, and the principalities. They were the important ones here. They were carrying out their duties properly. The seraphim were broken. They weren't the only ones, Ardril thought. She had attacked a mortal. There was no point in mincing words. An attack on a mortal would see her obliterated. It was a secret that none of the other angels could ever know. But it had been for a good cause. A just cause. An attempt to stop the destruction of what had taken eternity to set into motion. Exiting the throne chamber, Ardril turned her eyes upward. There was no sky in the expanse. Not as the mortals knew it, anyway. Just more expanse. Outside the throne's immediate presence, often him dominated the vista. They were the size of planets. As wheels were wont to do, they turned, keeping everything in motion. But there was something off about them. They were covered in eyes, but their eyes were hazy and unfocused. They hadn't always been that way. Ardril had fond memories of gazing up on her rare visits to the expanse and watching the Ophanim, wondering what they saw with so many eyes. They didn't see anything anymore. They just turned. Ardril tore away from the tallest spire as fast as she could fly. Being here had once been a comfort, a reprieve from all the horrors of the mortal plane. But now, it was just painful. So she flew. No matter how far she went, the tall spire was always in view. A product of the twisted space of the expanse. Yet it did grow smaller. By the time she reached her destination, her extended thumb at arm's length was just enough to obscure the chamber of the throne Archangel Ardril. I was beginning to wonder if you would be joining us on this day. Ardril touched her feet to the surface of the dome, looking around the gathering of her fellow Archangels. Only nine of them, each representing a world gone wrong. To Ardril's knowledge, none of them had gone quite as wrong as Nod, but that didn't lessen their burden. She wouldn't make light of their efforts and she was not envious of them for having far less work to undertake. There was honor in being tasked with repairing the most difficult world. She sighed slightly, looking back to the one who had first spoken. Archangel Celestial. Currently appearing as an older woman with two spiraling strands of dark hair coming out of either side of her head, she wore a black dress that was reminiscent of Tenebrails. It made Ardril uncomfortable. Averting her eyes, the Archangels did not have a leader, though Celestial might disagree with that notion, Ardril addressed the gathering as a whole. 
I apologize for my tardiness. I've just come from the throne. Oh. Was Whittledwell whining to the seraphim again? Praying for your burden to be delivered to another. The youngest on the dome burst out into a chittering cackle, clutching the hem of her white apron with her tiny hands. At least, she appeared to be the youngest. Why Archangel Kenziel chose the form of an eleven year old human was anyone's guess. Perhaps it was a foolish attempt to make herself more palatable. Ardril had never met an angel with a more disgusting personality. Kenziel hadn't always been that way, but, things had changed. Such a disarming appearance might work on a mortal. Ardril could see through her deception as easily as she could see through the crystal lattice they stood upon. I take it that you have had little success Celestial said turning her red eyes to the distant spire little success would be an improvement over what I've had Ardril grumbled. Kenziel covered her mouth but did nothing to hide her obnoxious snicker. We can't all be blessed with success. Incidentally, she shouted, clasping her hands behind her back, I'd like to report that the issues on Hazer have been resolved. There are a few outstanding errors but I calculate that time will resolve them far more effectively than any intervention of my own. The land's dominion is now fully compliant. Celestial glided over, placing a hand on the tiny angel's shoulder. Excellent work. The dominion's negligence caused Hazer to turn quite sour. I'm impressed you've repaired everything this quickly. The praise made Ardril press her lips together ah yes. If only all our problems were the result of simple negligence or sloth. She shouldn't have said a word. She should have smiled and politely clapped her hands together as the other archangels had done. But she couldn't help it. The smug little grin on Kenziel's face as she looked right in Ardril's direction was too much. Something inside her snapped. A familiar something. She had felt it when everything had been going wrong. In desperation, she had struck down a mortal. The others couldn't know about it. It had only been a short time ago. She had to expend a mite of glory to rebuild her arm, but everything was back to normal. Her fellow archangels were all staring at her now. They couldn't know, but their stares made Ardril uncomfortable. She had explained the situation before, hoping that one of them might have an idea she could use. But they just didn't get it. They didn't understand how bad things had gotten. They couldn't understand. Relics walk hand in hand with humans. They even copulate she said with no hidden disgust. It was the most shocking thing she could think of saying, but even that only got them to glance between each other the Dominion has done something to the process of procreation. Most of the copulations result in nothing, but a few produce offspring. Abominations that should never be. Every minute, the world is thrown off more and more. I need a flood or a cleansing fire, but the Seraphim won't act. Even if they could, how could we possibly petition the throne in its current state? The Seraphim would have to act manually. Even if we could flood the world right now, I fear even that wouldn't be enough. Not so long as the Dominion has a modicum of sway. But if I can't even get a little flood, what hope do I have of resolution? Squeezing her eyes shut, Ardril clenched her teeth. And now there is some mortal running around. Not only can she see angels, but I cannot calculate around her. Everything she interacts with gets knocked out of harmony. When she isn't around, I can start getting accurate calculations, but the moment someone so much as thinks of her, venting felt good. It was a release that she had needed for some time. And yet, Kenziel interrupted with another light giggle immortal. A puny mortal is ruining your machinations. Ardril's hands formed tight fists. What was Kenziel still doing here? She had admitted that her responsibility was over with. This was a meeting for the Archangels still in the process of recovering worlds. And yet, she couldn't just shoo the angel away. She was just speaking what all the others were thinking. Ardril could see it on their faces, the impassive humor hidden beneath their flat lips. A mortal can see me Ardril spoke slowly and clearly. A mortal spoke to me. She didn't pray like the prophets of old, she spoke to me and responded when I spoke back. 
she cannot be predicted. She tears apart miracles with her bare hands. That got a minor reaction, mostly in the way of widening eyes. Celestial actually gasped. But even that was too subdued. They couldn't understand. None of you have encountered anything similar. Have you? As angry as she was, she couldn't help the hope from leaking through in her voice. If one of them had encountered such a thing before, then perhaps they could give tips. Pointers on how to deal with such a situation. But none of them spoke up. Not even Kenziel. The diminutive little angel wasn't even smiling anymore. She just had a finger to her chin as she thought to herself I have not celestial eventually said. Mortal speaking to angels has happened before through the medium of prayer and revelation, but never without preparation. And they have always followed prior calculations. Destroying miracles. She shook her head slowly. I have no experience with such a thing, nor have I heard of a situation like that from anyone else. But I don't know everything. Might I suggest speaking with a virtue? They will know of any similar prior incidents and how they were handled. Ardril jolted. A virtue? Of course. The bookkeepers of the throne would know. They had to. If they could provide no clues, then this was the first time in the entirety of creation that a mortal had interacted with the divine in such a manner thank you. I appreciate the insight. Ardril glanced around at the other archangels. These meetings occurred regularly. And they lasted for days. Every minute that passed created an exponential growth in the errors on Nod. She didn't have time for Nietzsche to give a full report. Her world wasn't even that bad, but she went into every single little detail. And that was just one of them. Even with Kenziel out of the way, there were still seven more besides. Spreading her wings, Ardril glided backward. I apologize for my premature departure, but it has become clear to me that none of you will be able to offer significant assistance toward resolving not and I am unable to concentrate on offering assistance to you while so distracted. If you need me, I will be at the throne for the time being. Waiting just a moment to see if any had an objection and finding no one speaking against her, Ardril took off. The spire in the distance exploded in size as she sped toward it. She didn't slow for anything, not even to apologize as she bumped into the lavender wings of a principality. Aside from dominions, Ardril had never much interacted with the second sphere. An archangel's duty revolved around dominions, their world, and the third sphere angels that assisted with the management and upkeep of the world. Which was one of the main reasons Nod was so problematic. Tenebrail had done something to all the Third Sphere Angels that should have been assisting her. There were no guardians or principalities to be seen except that one. Somehow, Tenebrail had recently converted one to her little rebellion. It was something she should have mentioned to the others, but too late now. It wasn't their responsibility anyway. But, because of her lack of interaction with the higher spheres, she didn't know any virtues. There were a number of them around the throne, all stationed around the bookcases, either in the midst of reading or writing. Both, in some cases. Personalities varied greatly between dominions, principalities, and archangels. Ardril could only assume that the same would be true of virtues. That meant that some of them would be more helpful than others, even if they all had access to the same information. Ardril drifted toward one that had just closed a large tome. If she didn't interrupt their reading, they might be more helpful and less annoyed. The virtue wore a darker appearance, both in terms of skin and the long coat she wore over the skin. That alone almost put Ardril off, but plenty of angels wore black. It wasn't just Tenebrail. She couldn't assume that all of them were fallen angels. Surely the Seraphim would act if one paraded itself about in front of them. As Ardril got closer, she heard the angel mumbling 1 141 mismatch. Error 35. Record alteration. She reached up to the shelf and pulled out a thick tome. Holding her hand out, it floated there, flipping through its pages at a blinding speed. Alteration error resolved. Context missing. 3. 
too. Seven she said as she moved to one side. Another tome was floating there, already open. She pressed a finger to the page and dragged it across. In her finger's wake, text formed. 1-141 mismatch resolved. Great, Ardril thought, she is doing something. Ardril didn't want to interrupt, but, glancing around again, all of them were doing something. Left with no choice but to interrupt one of them, Ardril cleared her throat. Excuse me. I was wondering if you could help me. 417. Expectation failed. Logging memory. Pausing process. Switching protocols, personable. The angel blinked twice, turning a set of golden eyes toward Ardril. Good day, Archangel. How can I be of assistance? Even as she spoke, her finger still ran across the blank tome, filling its pages with texto. Ah. Uh, I've been having a problem involving restoring a world and wanted to know if you could help me. 400. Bad request. Query vague. With what do you request assistance? This was it. Ardril glanced back at the Seraphim, but they hadn't moved. There is a human. A mortal. She can see me. She can hear me. She can touch me. I cannot calculate her and I have extreme difficulty calculating around her. I have witnessed her touching a binding miracle and destroying it with her bare hands. I... I don't know what to do about it, so I thought that such a thing might have happened before and was hoping there might be information you could find that would give me guidance. Query accepted the virtue said. She finished running a finger to the end of the page before allowing the tome to gently close. It floated back up to one of the shelves on its own, disappearing in the mass of identical spines. The Virtue pulled a pair of gloves from within her heavy coat and donned them, doing up several buckles from her wrist to her elbow. Follow, please. Her heavy boots made a clomping noise as they crossed the crystal lattice of the floor. It struck Ardril as a bit odd that she would walk. She clearly had wings, all angels had wings, even the massive Ophanim. But, since it seemed like she was getting help, Ardril wasn't going to complain about some eccentricities. No matter how far they walked, or flew, in Ardril's case, the throne stayed right where it was. The shelves moved by, as did the books. Even the angels standing around the room disappeared into the distance. But the throne did not. Ardril was used to it but it still felt a little surreal after having spent so much time on the mortal worlds. Eventually, the virtue came to a stop. The shelf she stopped in front of was no different to the one before it or the one after it. As far as Ardril was concerned, every shelf was completely identical, and she had a nearly perfect memory. But the virtue didn't reach up to the shelf as Ardril expected her to. She just stopped. Ardril waited a moment, wondering just what was going on in that head. It wasn't until she noticed the Virtue's eyes that Ardril felt like something had gone wrong. The faint golden glow was flickering Virtue. The Virtue jerked to the side, staring with wide eyes. I, I am experiencing an EE error. 5011. Authority required. ATT ATT attempting authentication. 405. Method not TTTTT allowed. Requesting support. Support request received. Ardril threw her head to the side, finding a whole series of nearly identical virtues lined up, all staring up at a shelf. Something was going wrong. Again. Everything to do with not had been cursed. Somehow or another, this had to be Tenebrail's fault. Sabotage, unprocessable entity. Request timeout. Payload too large. LP0. Too many requests. I'm a teapot. Invalid operand. F00F. Forbidden. Lockout. 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 Three of the virtues crumpled. They fell to the crystalline floor as if they were mortals who had perished. Seven more took their place. These ones weren't identical to the long coat wearing virtue. More and more were gathering around. And they weren't the only ones. 
As the virtues continued spouting errors, Ardril found herself crowded away by the gathering, pushed back into a gaggle of guardians, principalities, and a handful of archangels who had all ceased their duties to watch. Only the Seraphim and the Cherubim ignored the proceedings. With every nonsensical error given, Ardril felt her hopes dampen. Something had seriously gone wrong. The original virtue was still standing. Ardril could see her clearly enough thanks to the somewhat bulky coat. What was the first error? Authority required, the library was the virtue's purpose. It existed because of them and they existed because of it. How could one of them possibly lack the authority to access whatever they had been trying to access? The answer came with one final error code and authorized by order of the throne. The gathering of virtues fell silent. The entire room went silent. No more errors. No whispering of the spectators. Not even the rustle of a feather broke the utter quiet dot until the original virtue turned around, looked right at Ardril, and smiled. 406. Query not acceptable. Is there anything else I can assist you with, Archangel? She stared. The other virtues started drifting away, acting like nothing had happened. The ones on the ground were left there. They didn't move. Were they all right? Would they be all right? Why were the virtues just leaving them there, and the others? The principalities, archangels, and guardians. They were just staring. Some at the shelves, some at the virtues, and several at Ardril. Which made her realize that the original virtue was still waiting for a response and no Ardril said. Thank you. Good day. Reverting to previous duties. Switching protocols, information validation. The virtue walked away. Ardril said nothing more, just watching as she headed back the way they had walked. What else could she say? As much as she wanted to point and scream that Tenebrail had clearly broken the library or the virtues, she couldn't. The throne itself had blocked access to whatever information was related to that mortal on Nod. Mortals only lived a hundred years if they were lucky. That one couldn't be older than thirty. Ardril glanced back to the throne, ignoring the third sphere that were still looking at her. The throne. Its glorious presence dominated existence itself. And it had been empty for thousands of years. The hellhound wasn't attacking. So that was nice. That was about the only thing that was nice. Alice's carefully preserved rations from home were gone. The hellhound hadn't been able to open her bag the proper way, so it now had a hole in it. The medical kit had been opened and its contents strewn about. Whatever little sterilization there had been was gone now. The sunscreen was leaking out onto the floor, apparently having been stepped on. Dot and now the black fur ball was eating her fresh from earth food. Dot, uh, what did I tell you? Alice barked as she shoved a compass into her bag. The hole was in the top, thankfully so it could still hold things. Maybe a tailor could give it a patch job when they got back to Lyria. Sit down, right there. Put your hands, paws, whatever they are on your knees. And don't move. You Fu Tilda and you Alyssa said, glaring at Cassita. Just. Ah. Uh, what are you even doing here anyway, she said to the hellhound I found two more people and killed them the hound said tail whipping back and forth excitedly. I wanted to tell you, but you disappeared. Your smell stayed though, so I followed it back here. Alyssa felt her stomach drop at the mention of killing more people, but she didn't say a word against it. She couldn't. The hellhound had acted on her orders. Alyssa had told her to go kill more humans. Biting her lip, she looked down to the mess on the cave floor. So you thought you would tear through my stuff and eat all my food? I was hungry. We didn't get much food in the, right? Of course you didn't. It was a wonder that the hellhound had any muscle on her at all. Maybe she had been captured only recently and hadn't had time to atrophy. Looking at her now in proper light and without the threat of death hanging over her, Alyssa frowned. The hellhound, like a great many of the monstrous species, looked like a person. Mostly. Her face, 
her torso, and her upper legs and upper arms might as well have been transplanted from a bodybuilder. Her extremities changed. From the elbow and knee down, she had fur. Her hands were large paws like that of a dog or a cat. Her tail was thick and bushy as were the tall ears on top of her head. She wore, something. Bits of metal over her breasts and crotch. It couldn't provide armor, so it was for modesty, maybe the society of the burning shadow had forced it on her. Given their use of a cross, they might have the same aversion to undress that most Catholic organizations possessed. If the metal had been attached through piercings or magic, that might be why she hadn't removed it since being freed. She had probably suffered more than just starvation under their hand. Just thinking about it made Alyssa clench her fists. Knowing that, she couldn't be quite as mad about her ransacking the supplies. But still. Did you have to tear it apart to get to the food? Alyssa grumbled. And why didn't you just eat one of those people you killed? Eat people, the hound said, making a face. I'll bite off your head if I need to, but eat people. Well. How novel. A monster that doesn't eat people. Alyssa was starting to think that all of them did. Imagine that. A furry thing with razor-sharp teeth that had been beyond open to violence against humans thought that eating people was bad well, not your head. The hellhound averted her flaming eyes, looking off to the side as she rubbed her knees together beneath her paws. You're not too mad at me, are you? You few foo tilde Alyssa buried her face in her hands, giving a few sad chuckles. Imprinting. That was what Cassital had said. Hellhounds imprinted on strong people. But what did it even mean? Surely the society of the burning shadow had demonstrated strength in capturing the hound. Maybe it was different when that strength was used against the hound versus against the hound's enemies. What's your name? Fila. Fila. I'm sorry if this is insensitive, but don't you have somewhere to be? A village. A home. Family. The dull claws on the ends of her paws dug into the ground. Her ears flipped around, laying almost flat against her head as her face twisted into a tight grimace. The swishing of her tail went still. Alice's hand slowly moved to her pistol. Even Cassitar took a cautious step away. But Fila didn't move more than that. She just stared at the ground, leaking fire from her eyes as her paws clenched then relaxed over and over again. There is no home she said softly. Not anymore. I got caught. They got killed. Sorry. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want. She didn't need to. Alyssa could guess what happened easily enough. Perhaps through trickery, subterfuge, or luck, Fila wound up captured. But the rest of her family had definitely fought back. And they had been overwhelmed. Or maybe they all had been exposed to the Society of the Burning Shadows Mist and the Society decided they only needed or could only contain one hellhound. Sighing, Alyssa moved over to the pile of food and pulled out a hamburger. She really didn't want to waste all her good food on people who weren't her, but she could spare one for a bit of comfort food. And anti starvation food. Have this she said, handing it over. The hellhound promptly started sniffing at it, seeming interested. It's probably better than those things you ate earlier. Those protein bars had been coated in a thin layer of chocolate. Dogs, weren't supposed to have chocolate, were they? Hopefully that wouldn't cause any problems. It was bad enough having a hellhound hang around. She didn't need a sick hellhound. Unless she was an obligate carnivore. The lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, bun, and whatever else was on the burger might not be the best for her either. Alyssa was just about to ask Fila to wait when the hound opened her gaping maw, shoved everything inside including the cardboard container, and started munching down. Snapping her own jaw shut, Alyssa could only sigh again. Well, whatever. If her first reaction was to shove anything that seemed like food into her mouth, the hellhound probably had an iron stomach. After wrapping the food back up in the tablecloth, Alyssa took a seat, resting on the flattest stump in the cave. It wasn't a tree stump. 
It was a sort of platform of rock. The sides were lined vertically with thick tubes of more rock, making it look like a candle that had dripped wax all over. It was probably some kind of stalagmite, but she had thought they were pointy normally. Whatever it was, it was close enough to the cavern wall to act as a chair. That was all she cared about at the moment. Having skipped over a nap on Earth, something she was sorely regretting at the moment, Alisa felt exhausted. Iorelan sleeping on the bedroll she had brought was only making Alisa more tired. With the draken at the cave's entrance and the hellhound not, unfriendly, Alisa wanted to get a few minutes of sleep as well. Of course, she would probably wake up to find the hellhound having eaten every scrap of food in the cave. Out in the desert like this with no easy way to resupply, that would be far from ideal. What to do about the hellhound? Fila clearly lacked anywhere to go. No home. No family. But she couldn't go to Lyria. The people would eat her alive. Probably not literally, but maybe. It would have to be up to Iorulan. The royal family could shelter her like they did the Draken. All that assumed that the hellhound wanted to go with them. She very well might decide to run off on her own. Maybe try to find other hellhounds to get along with. Regardless of Fela's desires, Alisa needed Iorulan to wake up. She had twice checked the princess vitals, even pulling up a quick video on her phone to check that she was reading the heartbeats properly. Iorulan was alive. There was no doubt about that. She just wasn't conscious. It left Alisa with little to do but twiddle her thumbs and alternate between glaring at Cassitar and Fila. Covering her yawn with her hand, Alisa rested her head against the hard rock. It wasn't comfortable. That should keep her awake. But maybe a minute of resting her eyes would help pass the time. Alisa jerked, feeling like she was falling. Her feet moved unconsciously to catch herself from the perceived threat. But that was all it was. Perceived. She blinked twice, wondering what had happened. The cave was darker now. Even though they were around the corner from the entrance, enough light flooded in during the day to keep it bright. But the only light at the moment came from the flames at the corners of the hellhound's eyes. It flickered off the walls, barely enough to illuminate anything. Grabbing her flashlight, Alisa swept it around the room. The food was intact, she was happy to see. Iorelan hadn't moved a muscle, though Muska had come back from the cave entrance and was resting next to the princess. That sight made Alisa a little nervous, realizing that she must have fallen asleep for quite some time. The hellhound, had multiplied. One was curled up in a ball, eyes closed. Every few seconds, a slight tremble would run through her body. The other was upright. Gently stroking a paw through the first's hair. It took Alice's hazy mind a moment to catch up Cassita. The conscious hellhound put a paw in front of her face. Shush Alice dropped her voice to a whisper. Sorry. I take it I fell asleep. You foo tilde are too adorable to wake. Shifting, not quite sure how she should take being called adorable, Alice ignored it. How long? Night only fell a few minutes ago Cassitar said, shrugging. As she did, her form shifted, shimmering momentarily until it was back to her usual. Usual being her guise as Alice's sister, it seemed dot night falling meant that it had been about six hours. Pulling out her phone to double check, she nodded. The last time she remembered looking at her phone had been just before cleaning up the mess the hellhound had made. Roughly seven hours ago. Six hours fit nicely with that. She didn't feel fully rested. A kink in her neck from sleeping upright against the stiff rock had her rubbing at her shoulders. Still, better than nothing. Now that it was night time, it was the best time to travel through the desert. I think our princess has slept long enough, Alisa said, grabbing a water bottle. Taking a quick drink to get rid of that nasty sleep taste in her mouth, I should have grabbed a fresh toothbrush and toothpaste while on earth. She slowly walked over to the princess. She only made it half of the way before freezing. Musk was eating her. That narrow, evil eye tracked her every move. Alisa took in a sharp breath. I'm just going to dump some water on her face and see if we can wake her up. The draken didn't respond. 
Alyssa actually took that to be a good sign. The only times she had really heard Muska make noise had also been the main times Alyssa had feared that she would be eaten. Muska was still staring, but, even though not a scale on its face had changed, Alyssa felt like the stare wasn't quite so intense. Emboldened by the lack of sharp teeth bared in her direction, Alyssa slowly resumed her approach. She made it right up to Iorulan and knelt at her side. After making sure that the princess tome was well out of reach, Alyssa took one last drink from the water bottle. Then she upended the entire thing over Iorulan's face. A waste, but she had more bottles stored away. Plus a few sodas. It got Iorulan sputtering, which was all Alyssa wanted at the moment. T Tess. What do you think? She snapped her eyes open, staring up at Alyssa with violet eyes. A blink turned those eyes black and white. As soon as they changed, she drew in a sharp breath and clutched at her chest, rocking back and forth on the ground. Alyssa went into full panic mode. What's wrong? Iorulan. The princess was gasping for breath. Hadn't Enna Braille fixed her properly? The skin had been unbroken and all the bones had felt firm. Alyssa had confirmed that for herself. So what, it, is, nothing. Iorulan's voice sounded short on breath. Each word came out labored. But her rocking slowed down as she let her arms drop to her sides. I reviewed, my most recent, memories. Pain included. Her breathing was slowly returning to normal. Once she was back to regular steady breaths, Iorulan moved her hands up to her face, pressing her palms to her eyes. This is pathetic. Once again, I am lying on my back with you standing over me. Iorulan's fist slammed into the ground at her side. I am better than this she snapped. Alyssa licked her lips, wetting them as she considered what to say. To be fair, I don't think you could have done anything about. The angel attacked you. So I surmised. Her hand ran down her face, taking some of the water with it. But I could have done something. I got greedy. I had ample opportunity to flee. When the angel first appeared and scared away the guild. When the angel appeared before us. When the angel appeared following our freeing the monsters. When the angel directly acted against us by creating those traps. All of them were warnings. Instead, I pursued. And what did I get for it? A hole in my chest, in my heart the size of my fist. Yeah. It took Tenebrail to put you back together. Alyssa had considered trying to hide that fact from Iorulan, worried that it might inflate her ego a bit too much if she knew that her deity had personally intervened. But it was also the biggest thing that might help Iorulan feel a little better about herself. That and Iorulan would probably figure it out on her own. She was good at putting pieces together like that. Sure enough, Iorulan opened her eyes. They were once again violet as they stared deep into Alice's eyes. Tenebrail saved me, she said, barely audible if not for her, well, I wouldn't have been able to do anything for you. As you said, you had a hole in your chest. I didn't even have a healing potion. Alyssa glanced back to where the staff was leaning against the wall near the food supply. Though I wouldn't say that we got nothing out of it. From the corner of her eyes, Alyssa noticed the princess flinching slightly as she set her eyes on the staff. It was a familiar flinch. One that Alyssa had noticed herself making when swords were swinging. Alyssa carefully pretended that she hadn't noticed a thing. The princess had already mentioned her pride being injured back when speaking with Oxart. This incident has surely driven a knife into that wound. Gouging it further would just be needlessly cruel. Iorulan moved, sitting upright. Hand it here, would you? Be careful. Cassitar spoke up from her position with the Hellhound, even raising her voice despite having just shushed Alyssa. There is something off about that thing. It is unnatural and shouldn't exist. I will take your words under advisement. However, I would still like to examine it. Alyssa held up a finger. If I might make a suggestion first. When Iorulan didn't protest, Alyssa took a breath and continued. Let's go back to Lyria. Right now. 
you can look at it on the way all you want. The princess folded her arms across her chest, glaring we need to warn them that the society of the burning shadow felt bold enough to build an outpost only a few days away Alyssa said, hurrying to explain a few reasons she had thought up earlier. While it has been destroyed, the church toppled when your fractal lock wore off and I set fire to some of the buildings on my way out, and there are no people left alive, there could still be other outposts like it. The ride back will give you plenty of time to examine the staff and I can explain exactly what happened while you were out, some of which you might be extremely interested in. Having planned this part out, Alyssa stood, walked over to the food, and slid the pizza box out from under everything else without hesitation. She had to slip her flashlight into her pocket, but with the light pointing out, it still lit up the cave well enough even without Cassetar making flames in her eyes. You must be starving too. I don't know about you, but I can never think properly while hungry. So I've got a bit of a surprise and present for you, to distract you from nearly being killed. Iorilan did not look impressed. Her arms were firmly crossed and showed no sign of uncrossing. Her eyes were hard and angry. She hadn't smiled. And, once again, Alyssa couldn't help but feel as if there were something off about the princess. The same sensation occurred back when she had been checking Iorilan's injuries, but she had shrugged it off then, assuming it had been because of how the princess face had relaxed while unconscious. But it was happening again. Shrugging it off, it was probably nothing. Alyssa cracked open the pizza box. A hot aroma of cheesy pepperoni grease filled the cave instantly. Alyssa's heart skipped a beat at smelling that for the first time in months. Her mouth immediately started filling with saliva, forcing her to swallow. Iorilan didn't seem to fall under the same sway, but she did raise an eyebrow. Her glare turned to one of curiosity, followed shortly by her eyes turning black and white. They flicked over everything, from the top of the open pizza box to the savory dish of Italian origin stop analyzing everything and just enjoy it. You won't ever get something like this again. Not any time soon, at least. With that said, Alyssa plopped the box onto the ground, grabbed a slice by the crust, and pulled. She almost started drooling as she saw the cheesy strands of melted cheese cling to the neighboring slices. The slice was halfway to her face when she noticed a pair of burning eyes peek over the top of the pizza box. Alyssa rolled her eyes. Not wanting black fur to get all over, Alyssa handed her slice over. She wasted no time in grabbing a second slice and shoving it into her mouth before anything else could interrupt her. Closing her eyes, she savored every little aspect of it. From the tomato sauce to the perfectly cooked crust. I could die happy right now. Who knew a little pizza could fix all the horrors of the world? Once they got back to Lyria, maybe she would send a message to the Tenevel brothers and ask if their tomato plants were working out. If she was still on this stupid world once they had a healthy production going, she vowed to open a pizza parlor. No more adventuring. No more fighting for her life. Just a steady income and good food. Halfway through her first piece, Alyssa found the hellhound's paw reaching around the box for another. Alyssa quickly handed her another one before the fur could get everywhere. Then, she pulled out an extra slice and offered it to the princess. Come on. I'm sure you've guessed with your deductions by now. It is indeed food from my world. You don't want to let the hellhound eat it all, do you? The princess shifted her eyes to Alyssa. She didn't often ask real questions. If she said something with a question mark at the end, it was probably a leading question, not meant for gaining knowledge, but to shift someone else's viewpoint in an obtuse manner. But right now, Alyssa could see the real question in her eyes before she opened her mouth. How? Later. Stop ruining everything with too much thinking. This is a break from our trials and tribulations. Just enjoy it. Quick. Before it gets cold. She practically shoved the extra piece into Iorilan's hands and watched. The princess sniffed it twice as if she hadn't been able to smell it from the moment the box opened. After a moment, she gingerly placed it into her mouth, chewed, and frowned. Did she not like it? 
But, after swallowing, she ate more. So she must like it see. It's good, isn't it? Alisa didn't even wait for the response before finishing off her own piece. The hellhound was looking like she wanted a third piece and even Musk was eating the food. She was pretty sure that she could hear Aisha's footsteps approaching as well, likely wondering what the smell was about. She had competition. Glancing to the bag of food, she wondered if she should grab the soda as well. Hard to have pizza without a good soda to go with it. Iorelan wasn't eating with the same enthusiasm, but she was eating. Exposing her to two of the least healthy foods Earth had to offer in a single sitting might be too much for someone used to a palate of bland food and bland alcohol. No. Pizza was fine for now. Maybe when they stopped for another rest on the way back to Lyria. Although she still had a lot of problems on her mind, the hellhound foremost among them, Alisa could put them aside while she ate. Hopefully the princess would as well. Alisa had to silence her phone. She was honestly surprised that it had taken two days. Chris Altrak, the man she had rescued from certain death, was understandably confused. Unfortunately for him, Alisa was trying to sleep during the day so that she could travel at night. They were almost back to Lyria, so she could meet up with him then. She should have been back by now, but her party wasn't making quite as good a time on the way back as they had on their trip out to rescue Oxart. She blamed Iorelan. The princess had developed an obsession with everything, basically. The stuff. The food. Alisa. And especially Cassitar it's really getting annoying the mimic whispered as they rode along shortly after dusk. She pokes and prods me constantly. Both physically and with magic. I can understand the stuff. And the food. But she has hardly bothered me, so I don't know why she is suddenly interested in you. Yeah. Creepy. I don't know human magic all that well but a few of the spells she has used on me seem to be trying to discover my recent history. Like that retrograde cognition spell. If she wants to see Earth, I have a phone full of videos of the planet. I almost feel bad for her. She was stuck in that stasis the whole time. Maybe we shouldn't have told her. Spare her feelings and also spare me being experimented upon. Alisa shook her head. No. She would have figured it out. Iorelan might not have been able to guess exactly what had happened, but she definitely would have put a few things together. At the very least, she would have figured out that Alisa had visited Earth during her stasis. Alisa had mentioned that she and Cassitar had been trapped in a single room the whole time and that it really hadn't been that interesting, but apparently that didn't matter. The only thing that got the princess to settle down had been mentioning that Tenebrail had been the one who decreed that Iorelan and the Draken stay in their stasis for the duration. Having her god be the one to shut down her travel plans had to hurt which was why Alisa had added a yet to the end of telling her that Tenebrail thought she wasn't ready for a visit to Earth. It wasn't even untrue. If Tenebrail ever did become powerful enough to fully ignore everything in her book or just to hold her own against Seraphim, Alisa couldn't see any reason why Iorelan wouldn't be allowed on Earth. Of course, at that point, Tenebrail probably wouldn't have any reason to keep Alisa trapped on Nod. If Alisa thought that time would come soon, even within a year or two, she might even be content to sit around and see if she could enjoy herself on this world a little more. Tenebrail had been at this for thousands of years. Which meant that Alisa didn't believe she would be ready to fight off the throne for another few thousand. Unfortunately for poor Tenebrail, mortals didn't have that much time well, try not to worry too much Alisa said. I'm sure she'll have princessly duties to attend to once we get back. Those will probably keep her from you for a time. Are you going to let her keep that stuff? Alisa glanced back over her shoulder. Iorelan and Muska had led the way from the moment they had left Lyria, but the opposite was true on their return trip. If Muska moved too fast or started bouncing about, Iorelan would let out a click of her tongue, stopping the Draken nearly instantly. It was one of the main reasons they were traveling so slowly. Iorelan had the staff in her hands, staring at it with her black and white eyes. Every once in a while, Alisa would hear Iorelan cast a spell. 
diagnostic spells by the sound of their names I don't know Alyssa said quietly. She didn't know what the princess hoped to discover by staring at the staff. While Alyssa didn't want to stifle any discoveries, she kind of wished that the princess could hold off for a time. At least until they got back to Lyria. They would have been back by now. Surely the princess had better examination facilities and tools back in her laboratory daughters for letting the princess actually keep the staff. Alyssa would have no problem with it if she wasn't worried about Ardril popping up to take it back. Of course, for Iorulan, the staff going missing was the least of her problems. The dragon in her head was consuming her soul. Or merging with it, at least and Ardril wanted to separate the two. The Archangel hadn't shown up so far. There was no way it would stay that way. Without Iosphiel or Tenebrail constantly hovering over them, Alyssa's sleep hadn't been the best. Alyssa had survived last time thanks to luck. The same might not hold true next time, especially not without angelic support. And Iorulan had even less defenses against angels being unable to see them. Alyssa didn't know what to do about it. But Iorulan keeping the staff would only increase the likelihood that Ardril show up to take it back. And she would probably separate their souls while she was in the neighborhood. She had mentioned the problem to Iorulan, who had merely shrugged and said that she would think about it. She hadn't said anything about her and the dragon souls merging, another thing that had Alyssa worried. Even after speaking with Tenebrail, Alyssa didn't know what a soul really was or what it meant. Perhaps merging the souls wouldn't even be anything bad. The angels didn't like it, but screw the angels. It was, ultimately, a personal problem for the princess. Other than fear of uncertainty, Alyssa didn't have anything to contribute to that particular issue. The only other immediate problem was the hellhound. Fela wasn't anywhere in sight, but Alyssa had a feeling that the hellhound was still around. Her feelings stemmed from the previous night. Fela hadn't been around then either, but still appeared just as Alyssa was unpacking some submarine sandwiches. Then again, the palace was in sight now. Every step made it grow larger on the horizon. The towers around Lyria and even the much lower wall were all visible. They were almost back. And that might have scared off the hellhound. Looking up at the palace, Alyssa couldn't help but frown. There was something different about it. Taking a glimpse through her binoculars, she quickly found the difference. There were violet banners hanging from one of the highest floors almost halfway down the sloped sides of the palace. There was no way those banners had been there before. They were gigantic. A hundred yards, at least. She would have noticed them. They were identical, as far as she could tell to the violet banners that stood outside the city near the gates. Each had a white eye with black designs mimicking the tattoos Tenebrail had on her face Aisha, do you mind waiting for Iorulan for a moment? Get us within talking distance, please. She was tempted to tell Aisha to just rush ahead. At full speed, the Draken could probably cross the fields and make it to the gate in ten minutes. However, Alyssa really wasn't interested in trying to get past the gate without Iorulan there to handle the guards. She could easily see them attacking, not realizing or not caring that Aisha belonged to Bract's group of Draken. If Oxart had given them orders to do so, they might just try to arrest her anyway. Alyssa was really hoping that Oxart had taken some time to think about it and maybe decided that she didn't need to throw a treason charge around. And in the case that Oxart did, she hoped that Iorulan really could protect her. Alyssa had been raised to own up to her mistakes. But owning up to exile to the first city. Or worse, shaking her head, Alyssa waited for Muska to catch up now that Aisha had dropped its brisk run to a slow trot. As the princess grew closer, Cassitar made a small noise. Just a little grunt. A moment later and the mimic was gone. Disguised as something. Maybe a rock in the bag. Maybe she had wrapped herself around the bag itself. We're almost there, Alyssa said, ignoring the sudden absence of the mimic. The princess didn't look up from the staff. Alyssa really had no idea what she was looking for. The golden haft had a spiral to it, but that was it. 
The ruby was a smooth gemstone, larger than any Alyssa had ever seen, but otherwise unremarkable as far as she could tell. Neither the gold nor the ruby had any markings or angelic text to them. I am aware she said eventually. And then she promptly started mumbling under her breath. It was too quiet to hear everything, but Alyssa picked out a few words. Curious. Gold too pure. Should be fragile. Soft. No magic detected there are large purple banners hanging from the sides of the palace. It was slow, but Iorelan finally looked up. Even as she tilted her head, her eyes lingered on the staff until the very last moment. Once those black and white eyes hit Alyssa, she blinked, turning them violet. She immediately sagged in her seat, slumping slightly. Alyssa started, worried that the princess would fall right off Muska's back. But she didn't. Iorelan put a hand to her forehead, closing her eyes, but remained steady. Are you all right? Not this again, she grumbled. Does your trinket say I'm going to keel over? No I just, I am fine. Tired, is all. I've been abusing my companion to try to glean more information lately. It is taking its toll. Don't push yourself too hard Alyssa said, putting on a wan smile. I'd hate for you to fall unconscious. It would mean that I'd have to wake you up again. Poor Tess. I don't know how she manages. Iorelan didn't seem to find the humor in Alice's little joke. She continued rubbing her forehead for a moment before flicking her eyes up to the palace. They twitched to their black and white form for a bare instant just as they had when Alyssa had first seen them, eliciting a wince from the princess. Banners she said as if she had just remembered them being mentioned large purple ones hanging from the higher floors. Father has returned. The pharaoh. No. My other father Iorelan said in an irritable drawl. Sorry she said, letting out a sigh. I think I need to lie down for a time in a proper bed, rather than my travel bedroll. Alyssa nodded her head, feeling much the same way. Just sitting down on a modern couch had her longing for a proper bed too. Of course, her idea of a proper bed and Iorelan's probably differed, but the point was still there. Going from a taste of modern amenities to a sleeping bag on rocks was rough. They didn't even have a tent. She had left hers at Tzheitz's place, not wanting to lug around the extra weight when Aunt said that they could use the larger hide tent. But they had taken that with them. She was just glad that it hadn't actually rained while they were out there. The sky had been looking cloudy for the last day or so so, Oxart mentioned some things about your father not standing for me or my actions. That's, ah, uh, not going to be a problem, is it? You're a rank 6 arcanist. At risk of being laughed out of the observatory, I'd consider calling you rank 7. I'm not saying that I or my father couldn't do what you did with Annihilator, but we wouldn't have been able to do it with Annihilator. And it would have required preparation. Doesn't that just make me more dangerous? More valuable? If Lyria does fall under siege by a million ants, or a million anything, having one more person around who can cut out a significant portion of the opposing army in one fell swoop is vital. You could probably decimate a million ants alone with the strange oddities you have. My father, myself, and Administrator Devo would probably cut down a hundred thousand each, provided we had a small window of preparation beforehand. After that, we would need additional time to prepare another large-scale spell or we would have to join the rank and file with standard rank 6 spell cards. That's why you had Oxart tell your brother to prepare. HM. A force that large would require preparation no matter how we handled it, but yes. Thanks to us, we shouldn't have to worry too much about it anymore. Not for a time at least. If the guild succeeds in destroying most of the fairy commune, the survivors will relocate. Hopefully to a position out of the Juno Federation's immediate reach. Still, it would be best to increase military patrols throughout the desert. That the Society of the Burning Shadow was able to build a sizable outpost only a few days away is sure to shock even the nobles into action. I can't believe we missed it. I've been thinking about that Alyssa said. 
Archangel Ardra almost certainly had been feeding her followers information on the future, likely keeping their own patrols out of sight of anyone who might have been looking for them. And she was protecting the outpost herself. It's possible that she hid it when she foresaw people coming. And she didn't this time, because I seem to ruin the angels' plans just by existing. H.M. Iorilan fell silent for a moment, looking back down at Ardril's staff. Her eyes flickered black, resulting in another wince. She held out the staff toward Alyssa with her eyes closed. Take it she said. I feel like I'm going to go insane if I keep staring at it. Coming from someone who studied magic that supposedly made everyone who studied it insane, that was probably saying something. Aisha, beautifully understanding context, drifted a little closer to Muska and Iorulan, allowing Alyssa to take hold of the staff with both hands I'm not through looking at it Iorulan added once it was out of her hands. I just need a rest first. Well, let's get you that rest Alyssa said, resting the staff over her lap. What do you say we hurry back? Get the Draken just a bit of exercise before we reach the palace. Best to not approach the gates at high speed. We'll find arrows and spells flung in our direction before we're halfway through the fields. They'll panic no matter what, but a vigorous pace should give them time to recognize just who they're dealing with before anything unfortunate should occur. As soon as she finished speaking, both Muska and Aisha took off. They didn't fly across the terrain. Not like they had when first freed from the confines of the palace. But Alyssa wasn't sure she would call their speed merely vigorous. It was only because she had grown so used to Aisha that she managed to avoid being thrown out of the saddle. In fact, she was fairly confident that Aisha was doing far less to compensate for an unskilled rider now than she had been. Perhaps the Draken was trusting her to know at least roughly what she was doing now. It was almost a shame that they would be back so soon. She got the impression that the Draken didn't often get out of the palace. For creatures like the Draken, she felt that they needed a wide open area to run around in. Being confined to the palace stables had to be a nightmare. Was it their loyalty to Brack that kept them there? Or were they afraid that whatever he had saved them from would come back for them if they were out of his presence for any length of time, they could actually like it there. They probably didn't get much exercise, but they were undoubtedly well fed and cared for. Maybe that was something that she could change. She had been thinking of big grandiose problems. Free the slaves. Societal reforms. But those were really big. Even with half the royal family at least listening to her ideas, actually implementing anything might be impossible. But taking Aisha out for a run around the city every so often was a much smaller idea that would probably make the Draken happy. And, just maybe, if the people of Lyria saw monsters running around far more regularly, they could get over a few of their prejudices. That was a bit of a long shot, admittedly. They seemed pretty set in their ways. Speaking of people set in their ways, the wall was fast approaching and the guards were scrambling. There were a good ten up on the wall itself. Just over half of which were armed with bows, the rest had tomes out. Twice as many were down on the ground around the gate more of them than usual Iorulan mumbled. Something is up. Seeing all the armoured soldiers made Alyssa tense up. And Iorulan certainly wasn't helping. They weren't attacking. The archers didn't even have their bows raised. But she could picture Oxart marching out of the main gate and barking an order to arrest her. Aisha and Muska slowed down a great deal the closer they got until they were doing nothing more than walking. Iorulan sat atop Muska with her back straight and her face set in stone, betraying none of the exhaustion she had put on display just a short while ago. Attempting to mimic her. A job better left to Cassita, Alyssa sat up and even held the staff out just a bit in an attempt to appear a little more regal. She felt foolish doing so. It was almost embarrassing to pose herself. However it had happened, she wound up as part of the princess entourage. An entourage of one, unless one counted the Draken. Alyssa might, but she doubted the guards would. Still, because of her association. She felt like she needed to present herself appropriately. 
especially if it would help in not getting arrested. Now close enough to see the guards' faces beneath the wire face masks they wore on their helmets, Alisa glanced about. She wasn't sure if she hoped to recognize IPO among the crowd or if she hoped they were all fresh recruits. The latter definitely wasn't true. She had walked through a whole crowd of guards on her way to Oxart outside the palace. Even if she hadn't glanced at any one of them for any length of time, they all would probably recognize her. Just thinking about that made her wilt slightly. It took a force of effort to keep her feelings off her face. How did the princess manage? It was no wonder she was so terse with just about everyone if she had to keep up her princess fake it at all times. Alisa had lied a lot, or acted a lot, since arriving in Lyria. But never to Ireland's degree. Never so much. She let her guard down plenty around, pretty much everyone she had spoken with more than twice stand aside, guardsmen. Iorelan kept her tone polite yet stern. The guards did not follow her orders. There was a bit of hesitation before one of them stepped forward. It took Alyssa a moment, but she recognized him and his bushy mustache. Donovan of the North Gate Guard. He had been the one to lead her to Oxart and had been the one Iorelan told Alyssa to warn about Oxart being under a fairy's control. I'm sorry, Princess. With the recent infiltration, we have orders to search every incoming and outgoing party. Do you now, Iorelan said. Her eyebrow twitched. It was a subtle thing, but it was there. On whose orders? Captain Oxart. N no. Oxart has been temporarily relieved of her duties and is undergoing an investigation. I don't know when or if she will return to her post. That got Iorelan's impassive smile to crack. It twisted into a deep scowl. One that made some armor jangle as a few of the guards actually flinched. An investigation for what? Among several other things, including desertion and conspiracy, she is primarily accused of treason, your highness. Alyssa flinched this time. This was her fault. She just knew it. If not for her, Oxart never would have abandoned her post, never would have disappeared for a few days treason Iorelan repeated, voice having lost any semblance of a good mood. For being victim to a fairy during an emergency situation. Ridiculous. On whose authority is she accused? Not my father's, surely. The nobles wouldn't be quite so overt in removing one of their own guard captains. She might have been able to figure it out if left long enough, but she didn't need to. Donovan spoke up again. Captain Decorous has assumed control of the central garrison with Snotkin's death as well as the North Gate in Oxart's absence. He found letters written in Oxart's hand within her office implicating her in the attacks. Iorelan's skull reached its peak. She closed her eyes, wincing momentarily. A ploy, she mumbled barely audible. No. Too obvious. Planting them would be the first thing investigated. No. She's loyal. Not to me nor to the nobles, but to the people. From our brief encounter, I'm positive of that. I disagree. Decorous is definitely using the situation to his advantage, but he didn't place the papers. She reached up and started massaging her forehead with one hand. I'd need to see them. And speak with the cap, with Oxart. More information is required. Princess. Donovan said, taking a step closer. We need to search your equipment before you can enter. You will not Iorelan thundered, snapping her violet eyes open. I am the seventh princess, or maybe fifth princess, it's all a bit confusing at the moment. Regardless, you have no authority to search my belongings. I would not submit myself before even the royal guard, let alone decorous lackeys. Attack me if you dare or get out of my way. Muska. Aisha. That was all the warning Alyssa had to grab hold of Aisha's neck. She almost dropped the staff doing so. At being called out, the two draken started moving. Donovan and two others had to throw themselves to the side as the giant lizards flew through the air. In the blink of an eye, they were through the gate and charging through the city streets. She managed to glance over her shoulder. 
Despite still being in view of the arcanists and the bowmen on top of the wall, neither of them raised their weapons to attack. In short order, the draken had turned down a different street dot and the gate went out of sight to the palace Iorelan said. No stops. Seeing the Black Prince out of his armor was an interesting experience. It wasn't something Alyssa had really considered. She had other things on her mind most of the time and his armor rated low on the importance totem pole. And yet, seeing him without it was shocking. She had compared him to Darth Vader upon first seeing him and Vader was never seen without his armor. Bract stood in the middle of the stables, dressed in a fanciful robe similar to the dresses that Iorelan wore to the observatory. Although his had slightly less jewelry woven into it. He looked smaller. Less imposing. His violet eyes were half-lidded and he was stifling a yawn as Alyssa entered. It was almost disappointing how normal he looked. The Black Prince was an implacable man, an unstoppable force. Bract was an older brother, woken up by a message from his little sister. He did still carry that enchanted sword at his side. Even without the armor, she doubted that he would be a pushover. Luckily, she didn't need to attack him. Neither did she want to and how was your little journey, he, cooed. Did you have lots of fun? Muska and Aisha bounded over to him and started nuzzling him, getting head pats in return. Alyssa slid out of the saddle. She landed steadily on her feet. Finally, she was back where it all started. Or, where her latest journey had started. And she wasn't even under arrest. Thinking about it gave her a pang of guilt but she hoped Iorelan would help out Oxart. At the very least, the princess would ascertain the truth. From her brief conversation with Oxart the night of the latest attack, she didn't think that the captain was a traitor. Then again, a traitor would probably not blatantly advertise that fact. They wouldn't last long if they did. Iorelan landed on her feet as well, sighing slightly. Remind me, if I ever have a lapse in judgment and decide to seek revenge again, that I am rich and can afford to hire people to do it for me. It might not be as gratifying, but it's a lot less trouble. Things didn't go as planned. Bract said, voice much deeper and with a slight gravelly rumble to it. He turned his head away from the draken, looking to his sister. Iorelan wasn't paying attention, rubbing her forehead with her eyes closed again but Alyssa was. His eyes narrowed, looking almost confused at something HM. I suppose that depends. We found a sizable outpost three days out, give or take. Bract opened his mouth, but Iorelan held up a hand. Killed everyone inside and destroyed most of it. I'll give you more details later. But, Iorelan's hand drifted up to her chest. There were a lot of revelations. I have a great deal to tell you and father. A lot of which neither of you are going to believe. A moment of silence passed. Maybe Bract was waiting for something unbelievable, but Iorelan wasn't offering I take it the outpost is what the guard captain was talking about. You spoke with her. She is currently in a central garrison holding cell. Not too happy, but yes. She said she had important information from you. I listened. The exact message should have warned of a million ants possibly being mind controlled by the Society of the Burning Shadow. I don't believe that will happen any time soon now that I've destroyed the outpost, but it is a situation that still warrants consideration. Regardless, have Oxart transferred to a palace cell? I wish to review her situation personally. Though not tonight. I require rest, a bath, and some decent food. Iorelan glanced over to Alyssa. Your food is just a bit, much for my tastes. Though I am interested in sampling more, so don't consume it all. Alyssa just shrugged. If the princess didn't want any, that was more for her. And maybe she could offer some to Tzheitsa as a little apology for maybe being a little tiny bit responsible for destroying her story front. She deflated a bit. That was another thing she had to do. Iorelan had offered a room in the palace, they apparently had plenty, but Alyssa couldn't just up and leave without saying something to the potioner. 
Besides that, she had left a few things at the shop. Like her tent dot and she wasn't sure that she could live in a palace. Any palace. It was too big. Too crowded. Even if she had a whole floor to herself, there were just too many people living in the building. She wasn't sure how she felt about servants waiting on her either. Still, if Tsheitsa decided that she didn't want such a troublesome roommate anymore, Alisa might have to agree. At least for a time. But that could wait until morning. Tsheitsa tended to sleep early to wake up and get the shop going by the crack of dawn. Barging in now would just irritate her more. Realizing that another silence had fallen on the group, Alisa glanced about. Iorilan had a hand to her chin, keeping her eyes closed. Bract was the opposite. He was staring unblinkingly at his sister did something happen to you, he said more than you can know, her eyes snapped open again. But what are you referring to? I'm not sure. Something about you is different, but I can't quite place it. Alisa stiffened. She had thought she had seen something similar but had dismissed it over the past few days of travel as just a stress-induced delusion. But if her brother was saying something was odd as well, you noticed something too. Iorilan had apparently seen something on Alice's face because she looked over with narrowed eyes I thought it was my imagination. Iorilan had her eyes narrowed as she glanced from her brother to Alice and back. Your trinket. Hand it over. Alice complied, not bothering to argue. As if she had done it a hundred times, Iorilan switched it to the front-facing camera and stared at herself. She stared a moment, eyes flicking black and white. Then she started smiling and laughing she has left me with a gift. Her hand traced over the tattoos on her face. They're perfect. A gift. Alisa said, staring. Your tattoos. She fixed your tattoos. How did she manage that? Tenebrail whined all day about how she couldn't do anything, and then she does that. It wasn't like altering the tattoos went unnoticed. Maybe if it had only been Alisa, but Bract had noticed too. Was it just too small to matter in the grand scheme of things, that was probably it, though Iorilan had a wide grin on her face now, so it mattered to someone she has blessed me. Ah who has, sister. I'll tell you later. I'd rather not explain a hundred times to you and then have to go replain everything to our father. She looked over to the draken and ran a hand down the tiger-striped scales of Muska's neck. Your draken performed admirably. Praise them all you wish. Please remove their saddlebags for me and carry them to a room where Alisa may spend the night. They have food in them that belongs to her. I, she paused, clasping a hand over a yawn. I need to sleep soon. I imagine father will be calling for me at morning to hear my full report. Iorilan started walking toward the stairs only to pause. It took Alisa a moment to realize the cause of her hesitation. Half of her head was poking around the corner. Green eyes framed by blonde hair gazed around the room with no small amount of suspicion. Dark rings lined the one eye that Alisa could see Tess Iorilan said, stifling another yawn. I am pleased to see you on your feet. Draw a bath for me. The girl smiled, partially stepping around the stairwell's corner. Her hair draped down over half of her face, covering up all the tattoos that she had on the left side of her. The bright smile faltered as her eyes drifted away from Iorilan. She first looked at the draken, which made her her flinch. When she reached Alisa, she just narrowed her eyes into a glare before quickly turning back to the princess I'm happy to see you back safe, Princess Iorilan she said, gloved fingers nervously clutching the hem of her outfit. But there might not be time for a bath. Your father asked me to fetch you. What? Now. Tess long hair bobbed as she nodded her head. Iorilan groaned. What is the old man doing awake, she mumbled to herself. Fine. I'd better not keep him waiting. Turning, she looked to Alisa. You'll be fine on your own. With Tess here, she can find you a room to stay in if my brother is unable or unwilling. Emmy. Tess sputtered. But I should be attending, oh, you will be attending to me. 
As soon as Alyssa is settled in, I want you to draw me a bath. Lay out my most comfortable clothing and ensure my bed is prepared as well. Though the heavy bag under her one visible eye made Tess look like a zombie, her face did brighten at having a job to do. Shall I fetch you a meal as well? Yes. Please Iorulan said quickly. Almost too quickly. She glanced over to Alyssa and simply shrugged fair enough Alyssa said. On the way back, they had tried out a great number of foods. Iorulan hadn't found the Mexican to be tasty at all, but she hadn't appeared to mind a turkey sandwich. More for me, even if there isn't too much left. Two meals a day for three days split between herself, Iorulan, and a ravenous hellhound left her with a significant chunk of food missing. Alyssa might have been a little upset at having to share with the hellhound if she wasn't anticipating gathering more food when Tenebrail showed up in a few days. Iorulan took two steps toward the stairs before hesitating with a glance down at herself. Ah. Tess. There is one thing I require of you immediately. Anything, Princess Iorulan. Fetch a brush and remove as much dust as possible from my armor. I can't appear before father like this. Would you prefer a proper dress? Not unless I'm being afforded enough time to clean my face and my hair. Best to appear before him as a successful warrior rather than a filthy princess. Any brush will do. I imagine Bract has one here in the stables. The Black Prince, whose title really didn't fit him well without the armor on, nodded his head. The door just over there contains supplies. Tess glanced to the door then to the nearest draken, a larger one lying on its side amid a pile of hay not far from the stairwell's doorway. She closed her eyes, took a breath, then practically sprinted to the door and disappeared inside Alyssa, might I request your trinket? The phone. Explaining certain aspects of our adventure to my father will be far easier with that in hand. Sure Alyssa said with only a little hesitation. Having had the opportunity to test out Tenebrail's additional features, she was far less concerned about it going missing or winding up damaged. It only took a minute for Tess to come back with a horse brush. During the short time she was inside the room, Iorulan, phone now in hand, had crossed the stables to be right next to her. Without a word from either girl, Tess got right to scrubbing down the dark scales of the armor. Flakes of grime fell to the floor in droves even creating a small dust cloud around the princess. Iorulan held out her arms so that Tess might easier get to her sides. It actually made Alice a glance down at herself. Princess Iorulan wasn't even that dirty in comparison. Even after cleaning it on earth, her armor looked like she had been tied behind a horse and dragged through a pit of mud. As much as she enjoyed the feeling of protection, and maybe actual protection given the few times she had fallen from Aisha and the one time she had been hit by a spell, Alyssa could really do with a change of clothes. Especially modern clothes. Maybe Tenebrail could provide her some when she, a sudden thought had Alyssa scowling. She was doing just what Tenebrail wanted her to do. She was relying on Tenebrail. The food. The weapons. The possibility of clothing. Her prayers were being answered, even if they weren't literal prayers, and her dependence on Tenebrail was growing. Maybe she didn't need modern clothing. Asking Iorulan for a few sets of local attire, regular clothes and not battle armor, might be the better option. She would still be depending on someone else, but she wouldn't be giving the stupid angel the satisfaction of her plan working. Tenebrail was the better of the three angels she had encountered and probably the best of them all. Still, the thought of giving Tenebrail the gratification irked Alyssa. It was spite. It was petty. It was the least Alyssa could do. Turning away from Iorulan, Alyssa found Bract already removing the saddle from Muska. Deciding to make herself useful instead of standing around waiting to be waited on like a princess, Alyssa walked right up to Aisha and started working on the saddle she had ridden for the past week or so. I can handle it, Bract said hefting the heavy saddle from Musk without even a grunt of effort it's fine. Alyssa quickly unstrapped the saddle from Aisha and did the same. Fully loaded, the saddles were not light. Not for the first time, she wondered just how bad the weight was for the draken's backs. 
they weren't beasts of burden, bred for centuries for the task of carrying heavy weights for humans like horses and other farm animals. Then again, they weren't stupid animals either. They surely would have complained if the weight went beyond something they could carry. I learned from watching Iorel and Alyssa continued as she gently set the saddle on the ground. Though, between you and me, I'm a little surprised she managed without Tess there to do it for her. You are not as quiet as you think you are Iorel and called, voice slightly testy but I'm not hearing any objections Alyssa said with a smile HM. That's enough, Tess. I'd rather not garner ire by delaying so long that another servant gets sent to fetch me. Alyssa, I will see about greeting you in the morning. Yeah. Sounds good. Ah, uh, before you go, this meeting with your father isn't going to end up with me arrested, is it? Still concerned about what Oxart said? Don't be. After all, she is the one incarcerated at the moment. And I really don't want to join her. Tenebrail would free her in a few days regardless of what happened, unless, of course, they decided to jump immediately to execution. Better to avoid thinking about that. Although getting freed by Tenebrail would be yet another situation that forced her to rely on the angel. Compared to a get-out-of-jail-free card, accepting clothes was nothing put it out of your mind. Iorelan stepped into the stairwell entryway before pausing once again. Oh. Try not to wander around the palace much. Last time I invited a friend to stay, they wound up lost for weeks. She disappeared up the staircase before Alyssa could so much as open her mouth that, was a joke, right? Alyssa said, looking to Bract. There aren't people lost in this palace, are there? Of course it was a joke he said as he pulled a large rock from between Musker's scales, an action that earned a snap of its jaw in his direction. My sister doesn't have friends. Alyssa glared, not sure just how serious he was being at the moment shall I show you to a room. Tess said, stepping closer. Only one step though. Her eyes darted to the relaxing Draken once again before she took another step away. She sounded polite, but having heard the tone in her voice when she had been speaking to Iorelan, it probably wasn't anywhere near sincere one moment Alyssa said pulling out food from Aisha's saddle. There was still enough that she didn't want to leave it just lying about. As she worked, Bract started unloading the other saddle. Most of it was either Iorelan's belongings or their original supplies that Bract had sent with them. With an armful of packaged food and a golden staff pinned between her chest and her full arms, Alyssa stood and nodded to Tess. Ready. Very well. Tess turned and started walking without a single offer to help carry bags. She definitely wasn't getting a tip. Follow me, the dungeons are right this way. Ah, uh, I believe my sister meant the second floor guest accommodations, Tess. Ah. Uh, of course. Second floor guest accommodations. Those would be right this way. If you find yourself descending, smelling mold, or surrounded by metal bars, Send me a message and I'll ensure that Tess is suitably punished Bract said, stepping right up close to Tess. She shirked back, but he just held out his hand. The brush, Tess. I'd like to tidy up Muska and Aisha as long as I'm awake. Yes, Prince Bract. Tess held out the brush with both hands, offering it as if it were a fragile bit of glass artwork. He took it in one hand, returned to Muska and started scrubbing away at the top of her head. Shaking her head, Alyssa hurried to follow Tess. The servant girl was already halfway up the stairs and showed no signs of slowing. If she wound up left behind, she might be wandering the halls of the palace for weeks. Bract hadn't denied that part of Iorelan's comment. When she had first climbed the stairs of the palace to reach Iorelan's floor and later when she had descended down to the stables, the palace stairs hadn't felt like more than a single flight despite the princess having her room near the top of the pyramidal structure. Alyssa hadn't been counting, but she felt like she had been ascending far more stairs than a single flight would have. And they had passed doors as well, which Alyssa couldn't remember having done any of the other times. After passing three doors, Tess paused at the next. We are arriving through the servant quarters she said softly. 
Prince Bract's private stables do not connect to any proper location in the palace. I apologize sincerely for any untidiness you may witness. It's fine. I won't be, ah, uh, offended or whatever Alisa said. Tess didn't sound sincere in her apologies, but Alisa really didn't care. Not unless this led to the dungeons. The first thing Alisa noticed as Tess opened the door was the lighting. The parts of the palace that she had been inside were well lit to the point where she could easily have assumed they had access to modern lights had she not known better. Here, the jars were smaller, filled with less liquid. It was a kitchen, much like the one that Alisa had passed through on the way to Iorilan's room. Though she had been in a bit too much of a worry to really examine it at the time. An open flame boiled some kind of stew sitting in a pot. It smelled great compared to just about any other food she had tried in this world. Had she not eaten a little while ago, she might have found it quite appetizing a guest of Princess Iorilan Tess said, looking to a corner. Alisa jumped. She hadn't even noticed the man seated in the corner, garbed in decent but far from fancy clothing. He must have been the chef. Or maybe he was just watching the fire to ensure it didn't burn down anything. He nodded his head. The lavender room is occupied. Any of the others are free. I'll see to it that she is comfortable in the room of the vigil. He nodded again, face betraying no surprise despite the room of the vigil probably being the worst room they had. Either he expected it of Tess or she hadn't picked the worst. Either way, Tess said nothing more to him as she crossed the kitchen to the door opposite the stairs. The whole way beyond was pure lavish opulence. Even more so than Iorilan's floor of the palace. Which made a certain amount of sense when Alisa thought about it. Grand statues towered over each doorway. Beautiful tapestries adorned the otherwise blank spots in walls. The ceiling was covered in long strands of glass, all filled with the light potion creating flowing rivers of light along the ceiling. Every tile on the floor looked like it had received a modern waxing dot and all of it was simply to impress upon visitors just how rich the pharaoh and his family were. The room of the vigil was no less grand than the hallway. A bed, larger than any Alisa had slept in but not absurdly unreasonable, occupied the majority of the room. It was one of those fancy four-poster ones with curtains shielding it from the outside world. Not far away was a roaring fire set into the wall with an assortment of seats arranged around it. Wide windows opened up to a vista of the city. The southern side, it looked like by the mountains in the distance and distinct lack of yellowy desert if you require anything. The bell here will ring the servants' quarters Tess said, gesturing toward a rope dangling from the ceiling near the bed. Do you wish for a hot meal brought to you? No. That's fine. Thank you. Tess. HMPH hands clasped in front of her, Tess gave the curtest bow possible before backing out of the room and closing the door well, Cassitar Alisa said, moving to set the food down on a polished wood table, this place sure looks nice. Too nice for me, I think. She waited a moment for a response, but none came. No giggles. No commentary. No Cassitar dot frowning. Alisa looked down at her pack as she set it on the floor. Was the mimic really not here? Had something upset her, hopefully she wasn't getting into trouble around the palace. Actually, Alisa scowled now that she was thinking about it, that is probably exactly what she is doing. With any luck, she would be with Bract. He obviously didn't mind monsters with his fascination with the Draken. A mimic probably wouldn't bother him. If she had hitched a ride with Iorilan, she would be lucky if she wasn't found out. Through Oxart, Alisa had finally seen evidence of people being able to detect mimics. And the pharaoh would surely have guards that would be looking for just that sort of thing. Especially if that loophole palace guard had told people that Iorilan wasn't who she appeared to be. And Iorilan would probably figure out that Cassitar was around even without a magic spell. Alisa glanced to the bell rope wondering if she shouldn't tell Tess. Shaking her head, she decided against it. Cassitar knew what she was doing, probably. She had been the one worried about being detected. Alisa started stripping out of the armor, and almost rang the bell to see if she could get a bath before deciding against that as well. 
in the morning for sure. For now, she would try to get some sleep while it was still night, even if she wasn't all that tired just yet. Cassita would show up on her own time, as she usually did. Being back in Lyria was nice. Having a proper roof overhead while sleeping just made Alyssa feel secure, even if she knew in the back of her mind that the palace had just been attacked a week ago. At the very least, she didn't have to worry about the rain that had started up overnight. A small part of her had worried that she would wake up to find herself in chains and tossed to the dungeons, but that didn't seem to be the case. Rather, she woke up to a full meal of bread, meat-filled stew, and alcohol that didn't taste like it had been diluted with horse urine. After, she had been shown to an extravagant bath that had felt awkward to sit in. It was too rich. The servant, some younger boy, not Tess, didn't even blink an eye when she asked for some clothes. He simply nodded his head and popped back in a few minutes later bearing a few choices. They were well made but not nearly as extravagant as the things she had seen around the observatory. Cheap things designed to look expensive for guests. Or maybe Iorelan had specifically mentioned that they should prepare clothes for her. The latter choice seemed more likely as she couldn't imagine many guests showed up without anything to wear. Just her dot she wound up selecting a simple black dress that went all the way down to her ankles. It had no sleeves, though there were these things that attached to her upper arm and extended down to a ring that went around her middle finger. Almost more like gloves except not quite. It showed off the tattoos around her right shoulder and arm. She wasn't sure how she felt about that. Very few people she had seen had tattoos. Iorelan had facial tattoos and Tess had an entire half of her body covered in tattoos. That was about it and Tess went far out of her way to hide all her tattoos. A light knock on the door interrupted her attempts at tightening the bicep strap on the detached sleeves. Come in Alyssa said. Hopefully the servant boy wasn't bringing her more clothes. She wasn't sure that she could actually keep these and, honestly, wasn't sure that she wanted to. Dresses were not really her thing. They weren't practical enough. Alyssa preferred pants. Speak of the devil. Tess entered the room wearing that apron like outfit. Her face, the half Alyssa could see, was poised and betrayed no emotion. Though it probably wouldn't stay like that. The young girl seemed to get flustered and agitated easily. Princess Iorelan only returned from her meeting with the Pharaoh an hour ago, she said, stepping fully into the room. Her eyes flicked to Alyssa's shoulder, but she didn't say anything. I regret to inform you that she has decided to retire for a time and will not be able to meet with you soon. Translation, an already exhausted Iorelan stumbled to her bed and promptly passed out, Alyssa thought, glancing to the golden staff leaning against the wall next to the bed. No angel had stolen it back during her sleep, she was happy to note. Iorelan had been tired from all her examination of the staff even before reaching Lyria. Spending literally the entire rest of the night talking with her father couldn't have gone over well. And with how hard Alyssa had found it to wake her up, she would be lucky if they met today at all. Alyssa didn't like sitting around doing nothing. If she wound up staying in the palace, that would be exactly what she would end up doing. On top of her list of things to do now that she was back in the city was to go see Tsheitsa. She needed to apologize for being at least partially responsible for the destruction of the front of her shop and stealing the healing potion. Depending on how Tzheitsa reacted, she might have to pick up her gear and find a new place to stay. After Tzheitsa. Chris Altrak. She at least needed to meet with him and explain the situation. Beyond that, well, he was a grown man. He better not need her to babysit him I can leave, right? Leave the palace. Certainly. Shall I show you the way? Maybe in a minute Alyssa said, looking back down at her sleeve. Maybe all this wasn't worth it. The dress didn't even have pockets. Equipping her holsters would be a pain. It offered less protection than a denim jacket. Ah, uh, dresses like this Tess said with an audible sigh. She crossed the room grabbed the sleeve, and twisted a little thing with one hand that tightened it around Alice's arm. Too much. 
No I think it is fine Alyssa said, stretching and extending her arm. I can keep the dress, right? If she couldn't, then putting it on was pointless anyway. But she needed something to wear. The dragon hide armor probably wasn't a better alternative. Irelan probably wanted that back given its rarity and value. Tess confirmed Alice's earlier theory. Princess Irelan set them aside specifically for you. All of them. If so, that probably explained why they all fit. Irelan was observant enough that she would be able to pick out clothes that were just right. Tess head bobbed, revealing some of the extravagant tattoos underneath her hair. I can't carry them all. Or store them. Alice sighed. Maybe, regardless of Tz heights are kicking her out or not, she needed to find a place of her own. Did the medieval magical world have apartments? How much would a little house cost? Over the next week, she'd check into it. For now, Alyssa slipped into her underarm holster, pulled the belt of her hip holster on, grabbed her pack, satchel, and her shotgun, and took hold of her staff. She winced as she glanced in a large mirror set into one wall. The dress had looked nice enough on its own. Now she looked like some kind of a crazy hobo. And Tess was smirking at her. Daughter, you know I'm not alike, right? Princess Irulan may have clarified her earlier statements to me. But you still don't like me. Tess turned away with a harumph. Shall I lead you out of the palace now? Alyssa looked back around the room. Everything she owned, sung the clothes apparently, was now on her person with the exception of about two days' worth of modern food on the table. She had repacked her backpack before sleeping and was able to fit much more in it than before, but not everything. For a moment, she considered trying to carry it all with her. Climbing the stairs with it in hand and her staff had been painful enough. Traversing the city would be worse please make sure that Iorelan gets that Alyssa said waving the staff toward the table. If she doesn't want it, tell her to let her brother try some. Or you, if you want. I will see to it that your message will be delivered. Follow me, if there is nothing else delaying you. After a quick double check to ensure that she hadn't left anything but food and clothing, Alyssa followed after Tess. They went right past the door leading to the kitchen. The end of the hall led to a wide staircase covered in a violet rug and adorned with plenty of tapestries and statues. It was almost surreal just how much finery the palace tried to impress its guests with. Having seen a few of the less public areas, such as Ireland's floor, it wasn't just this area that was lavishly decorated while the rest of the palace was in squalor, but it still stood out as notable. The stairs didn't seem to take nearly as long to descend as the trip up from the stables had. The stables weren't underground, unless they were and magic just warped the geometry of the place. Still, the stairs opened up to a wide, octagonal chamber decorated to the same degree as the guest areas. It had to be the main entry hall. Alyssa had skipped over it on her last visit to the palace, having climbed into one of the side room windows. She barely even noticed the spinning chandelier overhead. It was beautiful but she was growing somewhat numb to it all. There were far more people in this main hall. Aside from servants, Alyssa hadn't seen anyone in the guest quarters. Here, there were guards set about at practically every corner of the room with extra at some of the doors. Alyssa could only hope that they wouldn't recognize her. There were others as well. People standing about in clothes far nicer than those she had seen on people outside the palace. Nobles. The way they stood around talking in three distinct groups of two to three people reminded her of high school. Every morning, little cliques would form up in the halls before the bell rang. Didn't they have proper meeting rooms that they could use? That one room she had climbed through to enter the palace seemed like a perfect place for a few people to talk. Maybe they were waiting for something to happen. A meeting with the pharaoh. If he only just got out of his meeting with Iorelan they might be waiting a while. But even that seemed like it could be done inside rooms. Shrugging, Alyssa quickly caught up to Tess near the wide open main doors of the palace. After a short walk through the gardens, she found herself at the main gate and the plaza where she had met with Oxart and Decorous. 
right back where she had started with killing that shadow assassin dot and it was pouring rain. Luckily, there was a spell for that. One, even, that she had among the stolen deck of cards. It was extremely low rank at only rank one. But that actually made Alyssa feel better about using it for the first time. Lower ranked spells, such as Flame and Light, worked exactly how Aziz's book said they should work. The higher the spell's rank, the more likely it would do something weird when Alyssa used it. At least, so far as she had noticed. Water repulsion covered her in an almost silty transparent membrane. It didn't feel particularly pleasant, but if it kept her dry, it would be worth it. Tess stopped three steps before the outside rain, hands rubbing together in a nervous fashion. I trust you can handle yourself from here. I have duties in the palace and no time to be escorting you around the city. Yeah. I'm fine. Just make sure Iorelan gets that food. And, let her know that my pet rock has gone missing. Pet, rock, she'll know what I mean. I'll try sending her a message later anyway. MHM. I'll let her know. Good. Take care of yourself. HMPH Tess turned on her heel. With her hands clasped behind her back, she marched right back into the palace, leaving Alyssa free to leave on her own dot which she did. She had been around Lyria enough to know her way around. At least, she knew her way to the observatory and to Tzheitz's potion shop. She might get lost if she wandered off in a random direction. Tzheitz's shop was not a random direction. It wasn't that far either. Though, with the palace being in the rough center of the city, nothing was too daunting of a jog. She made decent time, crossing the city. The torrential rain kept most of the streets clear from anyone too casual. A few market stalls were closed up entirely. Some were still open, but they didn't seem to have many customers at the moment. Many of the brick and mortar shops were open as well. A blacksmith not far from Tzheitz's shop actually had a number of people inside, though they might have just been using the heat of the forge to dry off a bit. Rounding the corner that led to Tzheitz's shop, Alyssa winced. One whole window had been replaced by a series of wooden boards. The door was made of several flat panels and lacked the little round window it once had. Alyssa took a deep breath before gently pushing it open. It wasn't locked. The store had to be open as the replacement door did have a lock on it. There wasn't any potion maker behind the counter though. She stepped inside, dismissing the rain shield with hardly a thought as she crossed the threshold. Tzheitza, she called out, shrugging off the backpack on the employee side of the counter. If she wasn't out here and the door was unlocked, Tzheitza was probably in the back room. The first thing she noticed as she squeezed open the door was a smell. Not a bad one. Definitely nothing like the smelly potion she had used to wake up Sid. It was more like a living room candle, but Alyssa couldn't quite place the scent. It was almost a cinnamony thing, but not quite. Tzheitza stood in front of a large jar of light at the workstation, holding a flask of ruby liquid at eye level. Her attire was unlike anything Alyssa had seen on her before. A pure white robe smooth on the front but clearly tied together in the back. Alyssa would have called it an apron except it had sleeves and a stiff collar that hid her face up to her eyes. More like that medical gown they made you wear in hospitals if one discounted the collar. A simple bandana covered her forehead and hair, white as well. Viewing her from the front, only a small strip around her eyes could be seen. Those eyes didn't even glance toward Alyssa. They were locked on the small dropper of black oil she held above the flask's opening. Alyssa watched a single tiny droplet fall from the dropper. It left a long trail, like a string of saliva, but eventually hit the ruby liquid. Alyssa winced as a light burned at her eyes. She could feel the brightness even with her eyes closed. Annihilator was worse, but this still caught her by surprise. And this, thankfully, lasted only a second or two. When she opened her eyes again, the red liquid in the flask had turned perfectly clear. Tzheitza stared at it, swirling out the liquid before finally setting it down on the counter. 
She pressed a cork into the top and placed it on a shelf alongside a dozen identical flasks. Or, oh, they weren't quite identical. They were all triangular flasks made from glass, but the contents varied. One of them was almost perfectly ruby colored, just as the latest flask had been before the drop of oil. Some were of a pinker hue. Some with just a hint of rosy tint your haber in squall box ridden me of your sight pamalike. Yeah got some got a mirror for me. Alisa blinked. Then blinked again. Pshitsa had spoken to her, right. I must have been gone longer than I thought because I used to be able to understand at least a little of what you say. Pshitsa reached back behind her head and carefully undid the bandana over her hair. She held it up in front of the light potion jar, inspecting the front and back before setting it off to the side. Underneath the white robe, she wore a far more normal tunic and pants. The robe took a bit longer to inspect, but she held it up and looked it over all the same. Only when she set it down on the workstation did she finally turn toward Alisa. Her hands went straight to her hips as she stared without a hint of a smile. The silence made Alisa shift uncomfortably. So, ah, uh, sorry for running off. And your shop. And the potions. And lots of things, I guess. Um. How was your week? Those black feathers, Tshitsa said slowly. Yeah, can get me more. Tenor Braille's feathers. Alisa nodded slowly. Possibly. In fact, probably. I might even be able to get a bunch in just a few days. Are they useful for something? I need as many as you can find. I got a supposin based on a few tests. She tapped the latest glass flask on the shelf. The feathers can cleanse the plague. Or put a hamper on it, anyhow. Plague Alisa repeated. The demonic plague that turns people into demons. That plague. Yeah. Short. Simple. And, made a lot of sense. Alisa didn't know how Tshitsa figured out that the feathers would do something against the plague, but to Alisa, it should have been obvious in retrospect. Tenebrail was an angel. If anything would put a stopper in a demonic plague, it would be an angel. Getting more of the feathers shouldn't be too hard. Tenebrail would probably offer up a bucket full if Alisa asked. There was one big problem, however where do they come from? Tshitsa asked. The clarity she was speaking with obviously highlighted how important this was to her. I need to secure a steady supply. And that was the problem. Alisa hesitated in answering. Could a single other person on this entire world acquire Tenebrail's feathers? She doubted it. Her unique situation made it possible, but angels couldn't be perceived by anyone else. Even those feathers had passed right in front of people without them blinking an eye until Alisa touched them. Tenebrail did have some control over the world. Otherwise, she wouldn't have a temple and festival in her name. So she had to be able to interact in some way though that might be limited to interacting with people on their deathbeds. They wouldn't be in any position to gather her feathers. Maybe Tenebrail could leave a dead drop of feathers periodically. That, unfortunately, would require convincing her. Given her casual disregard for people's lives, she probably wouldn't care enough unless Alisa could frame the argument as sticking it to the plan. There was also the possibility that she wanted the plague to run rampant on her world. Perhaps whatever demonic entity lived down in the underworld wasn't under the same restrictions that she had. Maybe she had managed to keep monsters around and build herself a temple thanks only to her, or whatever it was. But none of that presented an answer to Tshitsa's question. Where did the feathers come from? If Iorulan had asked, Alisa could have told the truth. Alisa furrowed her brow. And why can't I tell Tshitsa? She might laugh or shake her head in disbelief but she probably wasn't going to rush off to the guard shouting about the heretic in her shop. It wouldn't be easy to explain, but... Maybe she should only go as far as saying that the feathers came from an angel. Explain it like she had to ounce and the other two guild members are you hungry? Alisa said instead despite not being hungry herself. A quick meal would give her time to think. 
have you had breakfast yet? I managed to get back to my homeland while I was gone, though only temporarily, and brought back some food from there. I can tell you all about my adventure while we eat, including where those feathers come from. I guarantee that you've never had anything like food from where I'm from. Tzheitz crossed her arms, staring hard. Her eyes traveled up and down Alisa, to the staff, to the shotgun slung over her shoulder, and finally back to Alisa's face. Right. Got em are your happenings, huh? Huh. I could eat. You could have just said that. Let me grab my pack. Tzheitz seemed to enjoy a good cheeseburger a whole lot more than Iorulan. The princess just didn't have a palate for anything but the meaty side of things, it seemed. But the food was hardly the topic of conversation. In the end, Alisa went with the angel explanation. Powerful imperceivable monsters that no one had ever heard of before was a slight bit more believable than her having occasional casual chats with Tenebrail. And it wasn't even untrue, either. She might be lying by omission, but not outright lying. Besides that, if Tenebrail's feathers worked to stifle a demonic plague, it was highly likely that Iosphiel and Ardril's feathers would also work. And any other angel that appeared as well. So if someone could develop a magical method of seeing angels, they might be able to acquire feathers on their own. It was a long shot, true. For the time being, Alisa would try to get as many as she could. Alisa couldn't tell how much Tzheitsa actually believed. When Ounce got back, he could at least back her up a little. He obviously hadn't seen an angel with his own two eyes but he could attest to something having attacked him and his friends I'd show you what they look like. I have a trinket that lets me see the angels. Unfortunately, I've let Iorulan borrow my phone and I'm not sure that she is done using it. The princess was probably asleep assuming Tess had been telling the truth. Actually, actually, now that she was thinking about it, the phone had probably been buzzing the whole time Iorulan had it thanks to Chris and Alisa wouldn't be able to find him until she got the phone back. So, with a shrug of her shoulders, she called the phone back to her hand. 130 missed calls. Alisa couldn't help a wince. She really needed to go find that guy. And maybe tell Tenebrail to take away his phone privileges. The thought that there were two more people who would need refuge in Tenebrail's world had her shuddering. Maybe, after teaching Chris a little about the world, she could hand them off to him for not orientation. Maybe one of them would be a mathematical genius who could solve the magical issue of traversing between Earth and not. For the time being, Alisa turned her phone to the photo gallery and pulled up the image of Ardril. The wing color was different. It would have to do. Showing her tenebrail would just ruin all the effort Alisa had made to avoid that angel's name here. This is the one that attacked Ounce Alisa said, holding out the phone. You can think of it like a portable portrait painter she added quickly, remembering how tedious it had been to explain the phone's functions to Ounce, Lumen, and Catala Harpy with arms heights said yep. Basically. Except angels are capable of extremely high level magic. Iorulan was theorizing that this spell was rank 10 Alisa said as she switched to the image of Ardril casting. She didn't know what Tzheitsa's magical education included. Given the few spell cards around the potion shop, such as Flame for lighting the fire pit and the various Bunsen burner type devices, she had some education. But at mentioning rank 10, Tzheitsa only raised an eyebrow. A stark contrast from Lumen outright calling Iorulan insane. The phone buzzed in her hand. Tzheitsa jerked back, hand darting to her chest as if to grab one of her potion orbs, but she wasn't wearing the bundolier at the moment, sorry, Alisa said, dismissing the incoming call. It does that when someone is trying to contact me. Message. Tzheitsa said. How's it know when Somat messaging you? Alisa shook her head. It actually uses, electromagnetic waves in the air. A similar trinket will send them out like, ah, uh, ripples in a pond. And my phone detects those ripples, or, something. She really wasn't qualified to talk about this kind of stuff. 
Maybe one of the people she rescued from certain death on Earth would be an electrical engineer who could really kickstart an industrial revolution. A magi technological revolution anyway, I hate to leave you with what I'm sure are a million questions, but this guy has been trying to contact me non-stop for a good three days. I need to find him before he goes completely crazy. Will ya be back? Yeah. Of course. Before nightfall, if that's all right with you. Pshites across her arms, nodding. All your lug around is still in your room. Oh good. Well, I'll see you later tonight, then. Stay safe, the waterhole's been seized, but the gang's still about. Grimacing, Alison nodded. She had almost forgotten about them. What about the gaunt? Has anyone seen that around? It had been missing on her way out of the city, Iorilan and Alyssa had run by specifically to check. The slow speed that it moved at meant that it couldn't have gone far, but now it had had a good week to run around and do whatever Gaunts did when full of people not a sight of it has reached my ears. Could be that the guards ve been sneaking it off. Prevents panic. Probably a good idea. Alyssa certainly hoped that would be the case. The Gaunt was creepy. She really didn't want to meet it again. Speaking of meetings. All right. I'll be back later tonight. With that parting message, she grabbed her pistols, shotgun, and deck of cards. She decided to leave the staff behind. Letting it out of her sight wasn't necessarily a good idea, but it was large, cumbersome, gaudy, and attracted the eyes of everyone she passed. It hadn't been that big of a deal on her way to Tzheitz's shop with the rain keeping people off the street, but now that it had died down a bit, there would be plenty of people eating it, wondering if they could steal it. If Ardril did show up to take it away, she probably wouldn't hurt Tzheitz over it. She would just pop in, take it, and leave. It was a risk, but the only other option was carrying it literally everywhere. That just wasn't feasible. Magic didn't seem to affect it, meaning she couldn't use some physical magic to change some of its properties. Unless she figure out how to summon it like Ardril had done, she would need an easier way of carrying it. Her current plan was to commission some kind of sheath that would keep it attached to her back. Because, while cumbersome, it was valuable to carry around. It blocked magic. For now, it would stay dot outside the shop and around the corner, Alisa waited. It didn't take much waiting. Five minutes before her phone buzzed once again hello, Chris, I, Alyssa grimaced, pulling the phone away from her ear. He, did not sound too happy at the moment. And that was understating the situation by a lot. She just held the phone at arm's length, waiting for the blast of sound to die down. It took longer than she expected, her arm was getting tired, but he finally ran out of breath. After waiting an extra second to ensure that she wasn't going to get an immediate earful, she carefully brought the phone back are you done? Preemptively leaning away from the speaker made her miss whatever he said. He didn't even shout it. Feeling a little silly, she hurried to listen to what he was saying, the hell is all that? I thought it was a joke. Then he pulls out a knife and tries to stab me. I put him down but my reflexes aren't what they used to be. Did you get injured? Alyssa asked, suddenly feeling guilty for having ignored his calls for several days. She had managed to get through an entire week around people in this world before actually being in personal danger, but she had also been dropped off in the peaceful Teneville. Not even a whole day had passed from the time she got to Lyria to when she wound up needing to defend herself. She probably should have thought of that before having Tenebrail drop him off here just a scratch. You should see the other guy. Alyssa rolled her eyes. How long ago was this? Is the wound, all right? Some blades in this world are poisoned. This world. Just tell me if I need to bring medical supplies. She would rather know whether or not he had been poisoned before getting too far from Psyche's shop. She had her own emergency first aid kit in her satchel, but if he needed an immediate cure all, Psyche would be the only one who could help her I'm fine he said. I've gotten far worse before. 
Just tell me what the hell is going on, please. Are you going to listen? Or are you going to insist that this is some government conspiracy? He hesitated just long enough for Alisa to wonder if he was still seriously considering the possibility. Well guess what, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Ask anyone. They've never heard of the United States. Or China. Or Russia. Or any other country you might name. The American government doesn't exist here. As far as they're concerned back on Earth, you are dead. Not that it matters to you, seeing as you can't go back. You asked me if you were dead. I should have said yes. The silence continued for another few seconds before he finally grumbled out, This is the worst afterlife I've ever heard of. Yeah, well, it isn't over yet. If you die, a hot topic reject of an angel will show up and eat your soul. So you've got that to look forward to. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Me neither Alisa said with a sigh. What did you end up doing with the guy who attacked you? And why did you get attacked in the first place? Please don't tell me it was a city guard. Nor, don't think so. Some ruffian jumped me in an alley. I just knocked him out and left, but not before taking his dagger. Fancied my trash bag, I guess. That made a stupid amount of sense. To people who had never seen a trash bag before, it must look like some exotic attire. It was shiny to a slight degree and the wrinkling gave it an interesting pattern. Stupid, yes, but she could see how such a thought came about look, can you just tell me what I'm supposed to be doing? What you're supposed to do? Alisa hesitated, considering the question. Whatever you want she settled on. You've been granted a new lease on life. Without my intervention, you were undoubtedly going to die on Earth. A real death. This place might be a little different than what you're used to, but it is much the same as well. Find a job. Find a home. Or don't. Live on the streets if you want. I imagine that's both harder and easier than doing so back on Earth. People, you may have noticed don't exactly walk around unarmed. Yeah. Everyone has a sword or knife. There are other, more subtle weapons. If you see someone walking around with a book on their hip, avoid them at all costs. Magic is real here. A tome is a sure sign of an arcanist. Magic, he said with a clear scoff how do you think you got here? Point. If you'd like to meet up, I can go over a few options that I thought might be decent for you. Just a little direction in this strange world. If not, well, please stop calling my phone non-stop. It is highly irritating. His chuckle made Alice a frown, but she didn't say anything about it. She didn't know exactly what he had been shouting about, but as long as he was being reasonable now, she didn't much care. That said, she would need to be on her guard when meeting him. She didn't think that he would attack her based on their conversation so far, but there was always a possibility. He could easily be absolutely distraught with the situation and might view her as an outlet for his anger. Was this world making her overly paranoid or had she always been like this? Why not? Got nothing else to be doing here. It took a few minutes to figure out exactly where he was which turned out to be down in the southern section of the city that Alisa had hardly been in save for a pass through during her initial entrance to the city. Actually setting up a meeting spot wasn't much easier. He had been in this city for a week and knew practically nothing about it. A week after Alisa had arrived and she had basically the whole city mapped out. What had he been doing all this time? She wasn't certain that she wanted to know. No matter what it was, it felt like it would irritate her. Eventually, she managed to direct him to a little tavern that she had eaten at a few times while delivering potions for Psheitzer. It was a quaint shop. Much cleaner than the Insid had led her to on her first night in the city, but not nearly so cozy as Eugemel's tavern down in Teneville. Instead of glass jars of light potion, it had candles set on every single table though they weren't lit at the moment as more than enough light flooded in through the windows. It was a rarity among established businesses. 
most could afford the light potion. Being late afternoon already, plenty of people were around for a meal. Alyssa had been counting on that. Finding a sparsely populated tavern might seem like it would offer more privacy, but the opposite was true. With many people, it was harder to listen into one particular conversation. The low rumble of many voices drowned out individuals. Or at least, that was the theory. Chris stood out like a sore thumb. Half the tavern was glancing at him, making subtle pointing gestures, and speaking with their fellows. It was his trash bag. He still had it on. Compared to when she had seen him in the alley, it had turned to tattered strands of plastic. Underneath, he had on a clearly worn set of green, brown, and black camouflage. Forest camo. Probably picked up at, or maybe stolen from, a surplus store given its lack of use in the military in the past 20 odd years. Trying to keep her expression from showing too much distaste, Alyssa went to the counter and ordered two meat pies and a pair of ales. Meat, grains, onion, and garlic. Not particularly appetizing, but that was not food. The pies would be a while, but the ales were ready immediately. She went and took a seat at the table he had chosen and put one of the pints down in front of him. At least he had the good sense to pick one off on the side. If he was going to draw the attention of everyone in the tavern, they might as well keep the majority of the people as far away as possible. Not that they would really be talking about anything that would damn them if overheard so, Chris, how are you finding the grand city of Lyria? Everything you hoped for in a new life. He didn't respond save for a scoff, choosing instead to take a small swig of the ale. Although he swallowed it, he did make a face. How do you drink this stuff? How I drink anything else Alyssa said, taking a drink from her own mug. It was actually some of the better ale she had tried in the city. Much better than the swill in Teneville. But really, ale quality was not what she had come to waste her time talking about. You used to be in the military, correct? You know everything about me, he said, taking another drink despite his complaints. I don't even know your name. Alyssa blinked. Had she not introduced herself? Or maybe he hadn't been paying attention. Either way, there was no harm in introducing herself now. You can call me Alyssa. As for knowing everything about you, I don't. I do know you stole vital radio parts to sell on the black market and later deserted. You wound up in prison, got out, and promptly became homeless. He narrowed his eyes, fist tightening around the wooden mug. Like I had much choice. My parents disowned me. No one wants to hire convicted felons. Well, you are in luck. No one here knows what you've done. You have no past but I doubt anyone cares about that. Finding a job should be a simple matter. You're strong and, I assume, at least somewhat skilled. There are plenty of things to do, from carpentry to monster slaying. Hell, get a desk job. The majority of the population is illiterate so just being able to read and write is a valued skill. Monsters. Alyssa raised an eyebrow. You've seen them, haven't you? Pointed ears. Blue-gray skin. Elves. There are a huge variety of monsters, some more hostile to humans than others. He shook his head and drained a good half of his drink at once. Sure he said. Why not? Monsters. The tavern keeper, an older man with a rough mane of hair and the odd name of Gobtop, the same name as the tavern, brought around the two meat pies. They were called pies but they looked more like burritos than the circular pies that Alyssa was familiar with. She was a bit surprised with how voraciously Chris dug in. The pies weren't bad, but they weren't particularly tasty either what, he grumbled, mouth full. The ale might taste like piss, but good food is good food. I guess she said. Anyway, I thought up a few options you might consider in terms of a job. I can give you directions and... What do you get out of all this? Alyssa leaned back, considering. Nothing, I suppose she said after a moment. You are here because I didn't want to kill you. 
I'm only here to explain a few things to you because I felt responsible. This world is a far cry from what you're used to and I figured you could use a little help. If you want to leave, figure things out for yourself, Alisa waved a hand to the door. Otherwise, I'll let you know about a few job opportunities and tell you what I've learned of monsters, magic, local politics, and anything else I can think of. Magic. You mentioned that. It's, really real, then. Ah. I came prepared for that. Alisa opened up her satchel and pulled out two loose light spell cards. Take this she said, offering one. Hold it between your fingers and say light while thinking of a little ball of light floating around. Like this, light. As soon as she said the word, the card in her hand disappeared and the orb of light replaced it. She danced it around the table a few times before dismissing it, letting it expire into motes of magic. Several of the nearby patrons fell silent as she cast the spell, making her a little nervous that magic wasn't allowed in the place, but no one came around to tell her off so she did her best to ignore it. Instead, she focused on Chris. His eyes had gone wide when she cast the spell. Now, he was still staring at the spot where it had disappeared with a wide open mouth. Had she looked so dumb when she had first cast light? Hopefully not, though it didn't matter. No one had been around in the mountain pass aside from a harpy well. Go on. Chris looked down at his own card. He shook his head twice, scoffing as he did so. Still, he raised the card just as she had. Light. Nothing happened. He tried again. And again. The card remained right between his fingers. He looked at it, frowned, then looked to Alisa. Did I do something wrong? Not sure. Did you picture a ball of light? I was thinking about what you did. Easy to imagine when I saw it floating about in front of my face. Looking down at the card with a scowl, he stared at it like it had personally offended him. Light. Again, nothing well, you can keep that card and try again whenever you wish. Not everyone can use magic, though I don't know what the difference is between the people who can and those who cannot. She had honestly expected him to be able to get it right away, but that was mostly because she had been able to do it on the first try. It wasn't something she had thought to ask Iorulan, but Aziz had killed himself in part because he had been unable to cast magic. I'll see if I can't look up why you cannot use it. In the meantime, would you like to know what I know of monsters? Or shall we end it here? This is, unbelievable. Everything he added before Alisa could ask. But if I have to live here, I'd be a fool to ignore you. Excellent. Glad I'm not wasting my time. To get started, Alisa pulled out her phone and notebook. Hopefully this wouldn't take long. Looking at how thick the notebook was, she realized that she had gathered quite a bit of information about the place. Either way, she could probably skim over a few things. Her spell repository occupied the largest chunk of the book by far. If he couldn't cast spells, it might not be too useful except as a reference for what was possible for others to cast. If she wanted to keep her promise to Tzheitsa and get back before nightfall, it would be best to get started immediately. Most of Alice's initial anxiety with returning to Lyria had died down over the past three days. No one had come to arrest her. She hadn't woken up to find herself dragged out of Tzheitsa's potion shop in chains in the middle of the night. Best of all, she hadn't heard a single whisper of the Water Street gang. Decorous, in charge of the majority of the city guard at the moment, had apparently cracked down on them. The taker hadn't been found and neither had Octavia, but there had been several very loud raids on known or suspected Water Street hideouts, and a few public executions. Which was nice. Alisa hadn't worried in the slightest about Water Street since hearing that news. They had a lot more on their plate to deal with than one person who might have cost them a relatively insignificant amount of money by freeing a few slaves. For the majority of her time, Alisa occupied herself with working for Tzheitsa again. She wanted a holster or sheath or whatever for the staff. For that, she needed money. 
and Tsaitsa was perfectly happy to have her delivering potions again and even operating the front counter. The potion maker was almost solely concerned with Tenebrail's feathers and experimenting. She did the bare minimum to keep her shop running. Alyssa looked up from the angelic information that Tenebrail had finally sent as the door opened. It dragged along the ground, making a nasty scraping noise as it moved. Apparently, some people were coming to replace the door and the window in a few days. Something that couldn't come soon enough, in Alice's opinion. The man standing in the doorway was familiar, but it took Alice a few moments to remember just where she had seen him last. It finally clicked when he walked up, asking for Tsheitsa. Most of the walk in customers only got nonsense in return. Placebos. This one was no different. It was the man who had gotten the crushed earthworm balm for his bruises. Someone who came in every few weeks with a new life-threatening ailment. I'm sorry, Tsheitsa is a bit busy at the moment. Perhaps I can help you. Oh. He chuckled. Has she finally taken on an apprentice? Something like that. It was true that Tsheitsa had taught her a few things, but those few things were all placebo cures for people like this. Things that didn't matter, didn't do anything, and made people think that they did something, but took a decent amount of time to make. She had thought that the worst part of the job would end at having to crush up earthworms for bruises. She had been naive. The actual worst part was looking at festering wounds. She had seen some that actually required Tsheitsa to come out and provide real medical attention. In one case, she had to send some poor girl off to Menders, a prospect that had Alyssa shuddering. Potions tended to fix wounds, but magic and Menders were required for anything that involved surgery. A potion couldn't fix a malignant growth and it wouldn't pull a plate of metal out of someone's leg. So, Alyssa hardened her stomach as the man started rolling up his sleeve. I'm sure it isn't anything too bad he said with a nervous chuckle. I was working out in the fields when I found this big black dog. I tried to shoo it, but it nipped at me on its way. He finished rolling up his sleeve. Honestly, it wasn't as bad as Alyssa had feared. Alyssa would have described it as a cut more than a nip, but the little gash on his forearm wasn't even bleeding much. It was just a relatively straight thin line. The skin surrounding it was bright red. Almost to the point of luminosity. Inflammation, but she didn't know if that meant infection or natural body healing process. Even if it was the latter, the cut could still be infected. It probably was infected. And if something like rabies existed in this world, he might already be dead and just didn't know it yet. A vaccine could save a rabies victim if given immediately after infection, but such a thing likely didn't exist here. Best to get advice from an expert. It doesn't look too bad, but let me see if I can bother Tsheitsa before I give you anything for it. Oh. Sure. Don't mind me he said with another chuckle. I'll just try not to die before you get back. You don't have to worry about that at all Alyssa said as she stood. His pessimism made her a bit uncomfortable. Was he always like that? Stubbed his toe and thought the world might end. I'll be right back. Ducking into the back room, Alyssa found Tsheitsa right where she always was these days. She didn't have her white protective gear on today, but she also wasn't working with those red flasks. Those things made Alyssa a little nervous just being in their presence. They were heavily diluted samples of blood taken from plague victims. Having a demonic plague separated from her by only a thin bit of glass didn't seem safe at all. One of Tenebrail's feathers was in pieces on the workbench. Each about half an inch in length. Tsheitsa had a strange set of glasses on that looked like something a jewel appraiser might wear. Lots of little lenses could be flipped up and down over the main glass. Using a pair of forceps, she was combing through one feather piece's individual fibers busy. Alyssa asked, approaching attempting to discern which individual part of the feather contains the aspect that retards the plague. Given how rare these feathers are likely to be, I need to find the most efficient way of extracting said aspect. 
I am also planning on sending off a feather to a colleague of mine who specializes in duplicating magical aspects of rare materials with more common items. He has single-handedly driven down the cost of a great number of potions, though some things still elude him. Like the stuff for the rejuvenation potion, I assume. Indeed. Did you need something? Alyssa started to talk until she realized that she had forgotten to ask the man's name. Ah well. There's a man who says he was bitten by a dog. He's got a small wound that doesn't look too bad, but I thought I'd ask you first. I don't know what diseases you have that are transmitted by wild dogs. Does rabies mean anything to you? Or pasturella? Tsheitsa looked up from the feather without adjusting her glasses. Her one eye was tinted amber with all the lenses in the way. Sometimes, you yeah, open your mouth and strange noises come out. Oh, that's rich coming from you. Although she said that, Alyssa was extremely grateful whenever Tsheitsa chose to speak in a relatively normal way. What did I say that was strange? The diseases. MHM. Never heard of them. That's good. Rabies is particularly nasty. Unless they called rabies the madness disease or something else. But so far, everything had aligned properly with modern earth vernacular. Diseases probably would too. Dot probably. Tsheitsa carefully placed her glasses onto the worktop, making sure to avoid disturbing the feather pieces. I suppose I'll check him out she said, not sounding too happy about the prospect. How bad is it? Not bad. It looks more like a cut than a bite. Long and thin. It wasn't bleeding much when he showed it, but the skin was clearly broken earlier. There is a bit of inflammation. MHM's height so hummed, pulling two small flasks from a cupboard, not the red plagued ones, but one clear and one a translucent brown. With those and a wad of wool in hand, she headed for the front room. The patient. He stood near the broken window, looking at one of the carboys that had its top sliced off. He didn't have his hands anywhere near the glass edge, he was just leaning over to peer inside. The colored water had all been cleared out, though there was a slight stain on the glass where the water level had been. Dots heights so cleared her throat, startling him to the point where he almost lost his balance. All hodder she said upon seeing who he was. Whatcha wrong like now? Alyssa rolled her eyes. A part of her wondered if Tsheitsa only talked like that as part of a show. Ounce had said that potioneers spoke strangely because they could communicate more effectively in the event that something went wrong. Telling someone in the know to add a neutralizing agent to an unstable potion would surely be faster with codewords and profession-specific lingo, but extending that to essentially slurring their daily speech had to be a big joke the whole community was playing on the rest of the world. Tsheitsa could speak perfectly normally. Alyssa had heard her plenty of times. The patient quickly came over and started explaining everything that he had already said to Alyssa. Tsheitsa inspected his arm, turning it one way then the other. She was surprisingly gentle with him as she looked him over. Considering that she was irritated at having her research interrupted, Alyssa would have expected her to rush through what was likely a simple non-issue dot but she was spending far more time inspecting the wound than Alyssa would have expected this dog Tsheitsa said slowly. Twas a large urn, MHM. Oh yeah. Big, huge. He spread out his arms wide, or tried to. Tsheitsa still had a grip on his injured arm. Thick black fur. Alyssa narrowed her eyes, getting an odd feeling in the back of her mind did ye see its face? No. It was all curled up on the ground. Sleeping. Felt mighty bad about nudging it awake with my hoe. How'd can see its face but it bit ye? He put a hand to the back of his head, rubbing his hair. Well, I didn't see it bite me. Only noticed a few hours later. I didn't cut myself, so it must have been the dog. Alyssa stepped closer. Which field was this? Oh, it would have been North 3, maybe 4. One of the ones next to the path a bit far out. We're chopping down some of the destroyed crops to make way for new plantings. The seemingly continuous field was apparently split into sections. 
Alyssa had no clue where any part was, though north was a fairly obvious indicator. If it was near the damaged fields, that meant that it would have been along the route that Alyssa had taken to get back to the city let me get some at ready. Sit tight. She let go of his arm and moved back behind the front counter, casually waving to one of the small private rooms. Having been here plenty of times in the past, he apparently didn't need any further instructions and promptly went right to the one Alyssa had first seen him in. Alyssa walked over. He hadn't closed the door, so she spoke softly to Tsheitsa. Is it anything to be worried over? It definitely wasn't a tool cut. Magically inclined monsters will often leave a bit of residue behind in attacks. Sometimes harmful. Sometimes not. That red around the cut is a burn I'd associate with a hellhound, though don't know what one is doing that close to the city. Might itch a jummy, but probably not deadly. Grimacing, Alyssa shifted her weight from one foot to the other. She was pretty sure she knew what one was doing this close. Or, if she didn't know what it was doing, she knew who that hellhound was. At least Fela hadn't killed him. That probably would have had the guards burning down the fields to get to her. But. How did he mistake a hellhound for a dog? Tsheitsa eyed her for a moment. If she noticed the shifting of Alice's feet, she didn't say untying about it. Not surprising if he didn't look at its face. Not a lot of people outside the guild would recognize uncommon monsters anyhow. Still, you'd think he'd notice the muscles on the non-furry parts, or the non-furry parts, or the breasts, or the huge flames coming out of the eyes, or... What? Pausing mixing a few ingredients into a creamy paste, Tsheitsa raised her unscathed eyebrow. Yeah know something. Well, I mean, it could just be coincidence. But Iorulan and I met a hellhound while we were out. I might have mentioned that we freed a number of monsters while destroying the outpost. And it followed Yeah back. She followed us part of the way, but we weren't exactly waiting up for her. Tsheitsa let out a long sigh, crossing her arms as she stared at Alyssa. I thought Yeah learned after the Goddard fairy. Fela isn't anything like the fairy. She doesn't mind control people for one. And Iorulan was fine with it. The princess might not be thinking proper like. Don't think I didn't notice it when she came about for your mimic. Tsheitsa tapped the side of her temple with a finger. She's got dragon eyes. And the black prince is known for his monsters. Octavia is none better. That whole family is trouble, I tell you. Scoffing and shaking her head, she grumbled to herself, should have moved to Davenport ages ago. If only the palace wasn't my biggest customer. They aren't that bad Alyssa protested. And the Draken are actually pretty nice once you get to know them, if you can ignore the razor-sharp teeth. She still had vivid recollections of Aisha and Muska chomping people to pieces bah. This ointment is nearly done she said, stepping away. Add a dollop of this. She held up the flask of brown liquid. Keep stirring it for five minutes then cast a flame and hold it in the bowl just above the cream for a count of thirty. I'll be back shortly. Where are you going? Gotta go tell the guard that they have a hellhound problem in the fields. They can hunt it down themselves or, more likely, hire the guild to do it for them. Wait. You're going to have her hunted down. Course Tsheitsa said matter-of-factly but, but she hasn't hurt anyone. Tsheitsa raised an eyebrow again. Without saying a word, she glanced over to the partitioned room that their patient had taken up temporary residence within she hasn't seriously hurt anyone Alyssa corrected. Look, let me go talk to her. I'll tell her that she's got to leave. Then nobody has to get hurt. Human or monster? I've seen her fight. She's pretty scary. You're just gonna walk up to a Haberin hellhound and tell it to get out. Unless you've got a better idea. Tell the guards. A better idea that won't get her hunted down. Alyssa shook her head. It'll be fine. She knows me. Cassitar said that she imprinted on me, or something like it. What? 
That was my reaction exactly. Tsaitsa put a hand to her face and pressed in on her cheeks, as if she could massage away the frustration she undoubtedly felt anyway, I don't think I'll be in any danger, if that is what you're worried about. And I bet I can find her extremely easily if I bring out a hamburger. She'll smell it from the opposite side of the city, though maybe I should wait until after dark so that all the farmhands are out of the fields. You're gonna get yourself killed. At least get me those feathers first. That's tomorrow, unless I've gotten my days mixed up. All the more reason to stay safe. The hellhound isn't going to hurt me. The guards might. That's why I'm waiting until nightfall. Less people around means less gets reported to the guards. As long as you don't go to them. This height sighed. A long, heavy sigh. This, she said, picking up the flask of brownish liquid. It had a thick consistency as she poured a dab of it out into the cream, almost like honey. Is honey. Ah it has several unique and valuable properties. One of which is that it builds up a resistance to certain changes to its environment. By exposing it to flame, we can create an effective burn ointment. Instead of heading out, she picked up the wire whisk and started mixing it together does this mean you aren't going to the guards? Tshaitsa made a noise. It wasn't a yes or even an agreeable noise, but it wasn't a no either. It was a noise of exasperation. Alisa took it as a good sign. After a minute, far less time than she had told Alisa to mix for, she pulled out one of the spell cards from under the desk. In contrast to Lumen and Iorulan, both of whom didn't even look at their tomes as they selected spells, Tshaitsa had to shuffle through the disorganized drawer full of cards. She really needed a filing system if she wasn't going to put them away in a tome. Alisa was fairly sure that the only reason she found a flame card as fast as she did was because there were a lot of them relative to other cards in the drawer. Her hand remained completely steady as she held the flame a fraction of an inch above the amber colored cream. The color started to change, turning to a rich earthen brown. Using her free hand, she used the whisk to turn the cream, bringing amber to the surface to be heated. A step of the process she had neglected to mention before almost rushing off. She kept at it for a minute before flicking her fingers to put out the flame there. Burn ointment. Smear a thin layer over that old hodder's arm. Bottle the rest and tell him to do the same once every morning until the jar runs out. It'll cost him four meedy. I've got to get my gear. Gear. Ye ain't going off on this haber in idiocy on your own. Feeler. Alisa called as she trudged through the tall maze in one of the unharvested portions of the northern fields. Her voice was loud and quiet at the same time. A whispered shout. Or a shouted whisper. Hellhounds probably had good hearing. They were exactly the kind of creatures that Little Red Riding Hood might point at and say, My, what big ears you have. Even if the ears were just for show and hellhounds were deaf. Alisa didn't want to shout any louder. There were patrols out on the edges of the fields. Horseback riders outfitted with either lanterns or light spells. She hadn't noticed them on the way in the other day, but the city guard was clearly serious about their increased security. Drawing them closer would complicate things if Fila did show up. The gate guards hadn't made any trouble. Alisa hadn't recognized any of the ones stationed there tonight. If they had recognized her, they hadn't said a thing. They had, however, recognized Tsaitsa. She made up an excuse about why they were leaving so late. Gathering potion ingredients and teaching her apprentice what to look for. Tsaitsa was well known to the city guard and well respected. They hadn't even questioned her beyond that. Of course, they had said that they would need to inspect their belongings when returning to the city. Not even Tsaitsa's reputation could protect her from that. And Tsaitsa didn't have Draken that could just jump over the guards. It was probably for the best that Alisa had decided to travel light. All she had on her was the hamburger, her weapons, and a mostly empty satchel. Speaking of the hamburger, Alisa cracked open the cardboard container. Whatever Stasis spell kept the hamburger fresh broke, filling the air with the delicious scent of incredibly unhealthy food. 
Alice's mouth watered despite having just eaten before leaving. Ignoring her stomach, she started waving her spread deck of cards over the top of the burger, using them like a makeshift fan here feeler, come on girl. All the while, she tried to avoid looking at Psyitzer. Not only did she feel a bit embarrassed and a bit silly about calling for the hellhound like she was an actual dog, but Psyitzer did not look happy. The potioner hadn't said much since leaving, but she had maintained an abject look of utter disapproval. Her mouth was set in a thin line and her brow hadn't unfroed since leaving the city. Her eyes flicked about the fields, searching for danger. With her hand tight around one of the orbs on her bundolia, a blue freezing potion, Alyssa had no doubt that she would be ready for a hellhound to pop out of the shadows and attack her. In fact, even if Fila didn't attack, the hound might still get a potion to the face. Now that the hamburger container was open, it probably wouldn't be long. The smell just needed a chance to percolate. Thank you for agreeing to this, by the way, Alyssa said, using a much more natural tone of voice. The guards were plenty far away. I know you don't like monsters much. Psyitsa grunted in response. Where is your mimic anyhow? I can't imagine you finally got rid of it. Oh, she is at the palace with Iorulan. Alyssa had received a message from her just the morning before. Cassitar originally wanted to spy on the meeting between Iorulan and her father. Apparently. The pharaoh wasn't too pleased with his eldest daughter at the moment. Mostly because of Cassitar and the stunt she had pulled in front of the entirety of the city and palace guards. Bract had calmed down the guard who had wound up in a loophole, but not before he had managed to tell everyone and their dog that the princess wasn't the princess. Now, nobles were slinging accusations of all sorts of things. The most ridiculous of which seemed to be the suggestion that Iorulan had never existed and had always been a monstrous infiltrator. One person even put out the theory that all the royal family members were monsters. It sounded rough for Iorulan. That said, they really hadn't had that much of a choice. Iorulan's clones had even given Cassitar instructions on how to speak to the gods, so she had clearly agreed with the choice. But that didn't stop all the trouble. With all that going on, Alyssa had to wonder whether Iorulan was managing to help out Oxart. Alyssa would need to look into it herself before long. Maybe after sending a message to Iorulan to check. But that probably wouldn't be until after her trip to Earth. Cassitar had mentioned in her message wanting to be there for that, so she might be slipping out of the palace at this very moment. Hopefully, she would be careful. Alyssa wouldn't normally worry about the mimic, but with the city guard on high alert, the palace guard would probably be the same. And they probably had at least a few people looking out for mimics after Cassitar had disguised herself as the princess. A rustling in the maze made Alyssa tense up. The hand not holding the hamburger went straight for her pistol. She held no doubts that Fila wouldn't attack her, but Fila might not be the only thing drawn close by the smell of modern food. To her side, Tzheitsa tucked the icy potion from her bundolia, having much the same thoughts. Or maybe she didn't care if it was Fila or not. The rustling happened again. This time, Alyssa saw it. Two bright orange flames shining in the darkness. Fila. Alyssa whispered. That had to be her. If it was some other hellhound, she hoped they liked burgers more than people. She took a single step closer. The heavy weight of Tzheitsa's hand on her shoulder kept her from moving forward anymore it's fine Alyssa said, shrugging the hand off and holstering her pistol at the same time. If this wasn't her hellhound and she wound up dead, well, she would probably feel awfully foolish in the pit of Tenebrail's stomach. Fila. Is that you? You remember hamburgers, right? I brought you one so that we could talk for a bit. Do you mind coming out? My friend won't hurt you. Hopefully dot the rustling got closer as did those fiery lights dot a stalk of corn toppled to the side as a hellhound stepped forward, poking its mane draped head out of the shadows and into the small area lit by Alice's light spell. She had her eyes narrowed at Tzheitsa, but it was a strain, Alice could tell. Her gaze kept drifting over to Alice's outstretched hand. She kept licking her lips. 
Every few seconds, she would sniff at the air. Unable to take it anymore, she practically pounced on Alice's hand. The hamburger vanished in a blur of fur. Fila disappeared as well. Alice could hear her nearby, chomping down on the burger we should go to Heitza said, voice terse. Her knuckles were white as they gripped her potion orb. Hopefully the glass could stand up to the pressure. You're lucky to keep your arm. It's fine. She didn't even scratch me. Alisa waved her hand in front of Tzheitsa. Not even a tiny mark. But Fila. Alisa turned to where she thought she heard the noises coming from. There was a faint light in the darkness that might have been from Fila's eyes, though her back was turned. Or it might have just been Alisa's imagination. Come back. I just want to talk. Tzheitsa isn't going to hurt you. In fact, she's going to put her potion right back on her bundolier she said with a pointed look at the older woman. Tzheitsa grumbled something unintelligible under her breath. Or maybe she was just growling louder than the actual monster. Either way, it took an extra glare to get her to lower the potion. Frankly, Alisa was surprised that she hadn't tossed it the moment Fila leaped at the hamburger. It had happened quickly, true, but she had reacted to other things quickly. When they had been captured on the breach in Overlook, she had been the first one up and at them when Cassitar freed them. Of course, they had been captured in the first place, but that had been an ambush. Ah well. Alisa should just count herself and feel lucky that neither of them wound up an ice cube. However, even with the potion lowered, it still wasn't a way. Alisa probably wasn't going to get anything better. You have lots of scary friends. Turning back to the Forest of Maze, Alisa spotted the two red lights just barely beyond the radius of her spell's light. Oh. The Draken and Iorulan were pretty scary. Tzheitsa was muscular and armed with all sorts of esoteric potions, but Alisa would definitely say that she was the least scary of the bunch. Then again, she had never seen Tzheitsa go all out. And, thinking about it for longer than a second, that potion she had used to meld the troll was horrifying. But Fila didn't know about all that she smells like danger. Like she might explode if I got close. Alisa threw a quick look to Tzheitsa, wondering how literal Fila was being. Tzheitsa didn't strike her as the type to explode in anger in a situation like this. She might toss her potions if she felt threatened, but wouldn't shout. Which probably meant that those potions could explode. Maybe if exposed to the hellhound's flaming eyes. A light breeze picked up, lasting only a second or two. That was enough to tug on Alice's hair, pulling it out of place. A quick hand over her head had it back into position, but she couldn't help but frown. It had been a long while since she had been able to do any trimming. Alice didn't mind long hair, but it needed to be styled away from her face. It was starting to get unkempt, even being a bit much for a ponytail, though she wore it loose at the moment. Fila didn't seem to care much that her own hair got pulled around by the sudden breeze. Probably because it hadn't been anywhere near tidy before. With only the dim light from her spell, Alisa couldn't see perfectly, but Fila's mane of hair sure fit the description. Instead of trying to fix it, Fila narrowed her eyes, dimming the flames ever so slightly as she looked around. Sniffing at the air a few times why don't you stay there then? We can talk like this. With barely a thought, the light moved around to get closer to Fila. The hellhound shirked away, raising her furry arm to block out the light, but she didn't flee. What are you doing here, Fila? You know that the humans won't like it if they find you. Nowhere else to go. I thought I'd try to find you, but those humans keep patrolling the wall. One almost caught me today. Yeah, I, heard. Alice sighed. Having nowhere to go had been her reason for seeking out Alice's pack back at the outpost. Of course nothing had changed since then, but Alice had expected her to run off to find some place that wasn't infested with people who hated her. They're harvesting these crops, Fila. That means that your hiding spot isn't going to be around for much longer. You'll be caught if you stay here. The pointed ears poking off the top of her head drooped, 
flattening down against her head sorry. Alisa didn't know what else to say. It wasn't like they could sneak her into the city. Even if they could, she would have to be confined to a back room without windows or risk being spotted by passers-by. That wouldn't be a fun time for a hellhound. Even the Draken, who seemed to be accepted by the royal family at least, didn't seem to get out of their stables all that often. They, arguably, needed exercise and a field to run about in far more than a hellhound. Alyssa still wanted to speak with Bracht about that, and she probably should have when she first got back. Now she didn't know when she would next see him. Especially if the pharaoh had grounded Iorulan, as hilarious a thought as that might be. Maybe Iorulan would take the hellhound in. Her clones had wanted to domesticate a gaunt. Surely a hellhound was a better companion. Not only was Fila fluffy and not nightmare inducing, but she could actually understand and respond to words. And Fila wouldn't fall dormant for a decade between feedings hellhound. Alisa jumped, not having expected Tsheitsa to speak at all. She glanced back, slightly worried about the why Ye didn't kill the man who found Ye earlier. Why? Fila let out a low, guttural growl. I'm not stupid. Didn't say Ye were. Just asked a question is all. Then you must be stupid. If I had killed him, he'd go missing. Humans look for missing humans. They'd find him, and me. But Ye scratched him. Your wound leaves burns on the skin. An accident. Fila grabbed her busy tail, hugging it tightly to her chest. He startled me. I fled. My tail swiped him. Your tail. Alisa said, blinking. How did you scrape him with your tail? My fur is like little bits of metal. I've touched your tail. It's soft and fluffy. A bit smelly, but she wasn't about to say that to her face. A good bath would do Fila well. Tenebrail's feathers would make the best bed and pillow of all time, but Hellhound fur was a close second. She broke eye contact, looking around and sniffing the air. An action that Tsheitsa ignored. Nah. The hound is right she said. When the hound feels threatened, the hair stiffens. It is an extremely valuable reagent. Rare too. Alisa raised an eyebrow for two reasons. First, the thought that Fila might puff up like a cat made her smile a little. Although a cat didn't turn into a pincushion when scared. But the second part of what Tsheitsa said made her brow furrow. Did you come out here to see if you could get some potion materials? The thought crossed my mind. You're not hurting her. Turning to Fila, Alisa repeated herself. She's not hurting you. Don't need to hurt it. I've a decent store of hellhound fur and blood, but bottled flames are hard to come by. Can't be harvested from dead monsters. The fur was expected. Most of the monster-sourced reagents and catalysts in Tsheitsa's storerooms were parts of monsters. Eyes of a gazer. Fangs of a basilisk. Feathers of a harpy. Scales of an apophis. Tongue of a jabberwoke. So fur of a hellhound didn't stand out. Neither did blood, really. But. How do you bottle flames? With a flask Tsheitsa said producing an empty one from a bag she had slung over her shoulder. Would it? Would you mind holding this up to your eye? Even though she still had the frost bomb in one hand, she stepped forward, holding out the empty bottle. Fila shirked backward, moving the same number of steps away you know Alisa said as she took the flask from Tsheitsa, I bet a lot of your extremely rare ingredients wouldn't be quite so rare if humans and monsters got along a little better. Wouldn't it be nice to go get a clipping of bunny up hair with a simple question instead of sending people to fight one to the death? As she spoke, she slowly approached Fila, pleased to see that the hellhound didn't run away from her we do what we need. Not all of us live in your fantasy delusions. Fila. Could you hold this up to your eye? Alisa said, holding out the bottle. The hellhound accepted it with her large paws, looking down at it for a few moments before doing as requested. Orange flames licked the bottom of the upturned glass. 
They didn't dissipate or diminish as would be expected of fire without a fuel source, but they grew. The flask filled up completely until, left with nowhere to go, the fire spread out around Fela's hands. Height surpassed a thin glass stopper to Alisa, who promptly handed it to Fela. There was a bit of fumbling, Fela's large paws were clearly not designed to accomplish precise tasks, but she eventually got it in place. Only then did she finally turn the flask right side up. The flames stayed inside, swirling around with a tranquil fury can't you do something? Alisa said as she handed the bottled flames back to Tsheitsa. The glass was surprisingly cool to the touch. Either it was enchanted, insulated, or hellhound eye flame just wasn't all that hot. Like, get a permit for keeping Fila around. Say that her presence means easy access to rare ingredients. I'm not ingredients Fela said with a huff no, but you could trade some fur for a roof over your head. You wouldn't have to sleep in the fields. Maybe get some food too. Don't fill its head with bad ideas. I'm thankful for the flame, but it's got to get away afore someone spots it if it doesn't want to wake up with its head on a pike. Fela wrinkled her nose, sniffing twice at the air. Something smells she said, not disguising her disgust. Alisa didn't smell anything, but she glanced back to Tsheitsa, just to make sure that the resident potion master hadn't uncorked anything foul. But Tsheitsa wasn't even paying much attention. Her eyes were on the flask of flames. She swirled it about like she was trying to aerate a fine wine. The glass stopper was still firmly in place, so the smell wasn't coming from there. Unless the flames started smelling different after being separated from Fela, they probably didn't smell like much of anything regardless. Before she realized what was going on, Alisa found herself wrapped up in Fela's muscular arms. She didn't remain embraced for long. Alisa sailed through the air a short distance. The thick stalks of corn caught her, breaking her fall to the ground. Glass cracked. A cold rushed over Alisa turning her breath to mist and forming frost on the leaves of the maze. It took a moment to orient herself. Her orb of light was still up in the air, providing enough illumination to see by. The light was even brighter now, reflected off the ice. Where there once had been a forest of corn stalks, winter had fallen. The stalks had been flattened against the ground by the force of the frosty explosion. The explosion hadn't been anywhere near Alisa or Fila. Tsheitsa had tossed it off behind where Alisa had stood. Fila was glaring in the same direction, sniffing at the air. Alisa's eyes roved to Fila's paw. She held a knife. A smooth black blade designed to be a throwing dagger. Dot with a sick feeling welling in her stomach, Alisa unslung the shotgun from her shoulder as she got back to her feet. Dot she had seen that dagger before. Several times. It had even pierced her chest in an alternate reality. The taker was nearby. Fela launched herself into the frosty field before Alisa could stop her. The taker wouldn't have attacked if he hadn't thought he could have taken on a hellhound. He was probably counting on her being bloodthirsty. Splitting up was an extremely bad idea. Alisa scanned the forest of corn, looking for any hint of the taker or Fela. Fila had charged off toward where Tsheitsa had thrown her potion. She wasn't running away, but running to attack. That might give her a moment to cast a spell or two projectile reflection Alisa said aloud, less because she needed to speak to cast spells and more for Tsheitsa's benefit. She hadn't been completely idle during the few days of downtime. Drawing up a deck of spells hadn't even taken that long and projectile reflection was one of the spells she had wanted the most. Let the taker suck on his own bag of tricks. Alice learned from her failures. His spell could be used against his throwing weapons easily enough. This encounter would go far differently from the last. She had both chains and scythes ready and even had another fractal mirror. If he managed to kill her despite her preparedness, well, she would definitely ask Tenebrail if she could delay being eaten until she had a chance to torture the guy on his death. Alice knelt to pick up the knife. Fela had dropped it before darting off. But she hesitated. What if it was cursed in some way other than the frosty enchantment on the blade? 
Fila might have been able to ignore the curse thanks to some inherent magical resistance, but Alyssa wasn't even wearing the dragon hide armor. She was back in modern clothing. Realizing that Tsheitsa might not recognize the knife, Alyssa said, It's the taker. At the same time, Tsheitsa spoke with a hiss. Octavia. What? That knife. That idiot girl was tossing M at me and Ounce. When you captured her. Of course Octavia shops at the same blacksmith that the Taker does. That's identical to the ones the Taker was throwing at me when I fought him. You're sure? Alyssa winced as she felt a memory of the dagger pierce her chest. Long. Black. More like a nail than a proper knife. It was probably designed specifically for throwing. Yeah. Very sure. Otomic Tsheitsa said softly. I hope you're out there. I hope it's Octavia. As prepared as she felt, it was almost a relief to think that Octavia might be the one hunting them down instead. She seemed like far less of a threat. Though it wouldn't do to let her guard down just because of a suspicion. Best to treat it as the taker until proved otherwise. Or worse, both of them could be out there. Alice snuffed out her light spell, realizing that it was just painting a target on them. In its place, she activated night vision. Can you see in the dark? I got a potion, Tsheitsa said. The potions on the bundolier were something of an issue. A few of them glowed in the dark. It lit up Tsheitsa like a Christmas tree. Or, it did until Tsheitsa pulled on the bundolier. A heavy cloth fell over the potions. They could still be grabbed from the underside and a little light came out from there but it wasn't half as bad as before. Your monster might be in trouble if it is the taker. And Octavia will be in trouble if it's her. Bah. Serves the haber in full right. I'd rather hand her over to the pharaoh to deal with. Don't want to be accused of anything. We should find them regardless. MHM guards will have seen the ice globe. All the more reason to find Fila quickly. I have extra projectile reflection cards. Do you want one? Nah. Too high rank for me. I've got a hardened skin potion. Daggers can hurt me with it. Alright. How do you want to do this? Stick behind me. But I've got projectile reflection. If he flings any more daggers, better to reflect them completely rather than risk them being sharp enough for hardened skin to fail. Projectile reflection isn't gonna help against his sword. Alyssa flinched again, unconsciously rubbing at her lower stomach. That was a very good point. Did she have a spell that would block swords? Closing her eyes and thinking for a moment, Alyssa came up blank. She had a lot of offensive spells, but projectile reflection was the only defensive one she could think of off the top of her head. Clicking her tongue in annoyance. Alyssa fell in behind Tsheitsa as they started moving through the frosted portion of the fields. She didn't like putting Tsheitsa in danger just to be safe herself, but she fully acknowledged Tsheitsa's experience in things like this. That said, if Alyssa were the taker in this situation, she would be fleeing back to the city as fast as possible. He had an angry Tsheitsa after him, an angry hellhound after him, and an angry rank 6 arcanist after him. Plus the guards that would surely be swarming the area as soon as they noticed that the field had turned into an ice cube when they weren't looking. Continuing to fight in this situation was just asking to be caught. Which had Alyssa thinking that Tsheitsa was right. This really was Octavia. As Iorelan had said, her younger sister was an idiot. Who in their right mind would attack in a situation like this, Fila had left a trail of destruction in her wake. Following her path was as simple as following the corn stalks that had been broken off. A perfectly clear trail led from the ice explosion toward the city, though not directly. There was a path only three minutes of casual walking from where Alyssa had been standing. This was headed in almost the opposite direction, keeping far from any path that Alyssa knew of. Silence hung over them, eerie in how odd it would be that Fila or their assailant wasn't making any noise. However, it didn't last. Someone shouted. No words were spoken. The shout was just noises. 
It wasn't the higher-pitched nasal tones of the taker and it wasn't a young feminine voice that might belong to Octavia. A god. So soon. Even the horse riders would have had difficulty arriving so quickly, mostly because the horses probably couldn't pass through the corn all that easily dot unless it was a cohort. Sid. Alyssa hoped that she wouldn't ever meet him again, but if she did, he wouldn't have a fun time of it. Whoever it was, the heights are shifted directions, leaving the path Fela had made to head directly toward the sound. Alyssa followed close behind, spells at the ready. She wasn't about to draw her firearms against the taker. He knew about projectile reflection. Octavia would as well, though Alyssa didn't know if she could cast the spell. Better to be on the safe side and stick with spells. A clearing opened up before them. Corn had clearly been planted, but a wide area had been swept away. Far wider than Fela could have managed even had she been running with her arms extended. There was no sign of the hellhound in the clearing. Nor of the taker or Octavia. One man was curled up on the ground, wearing the armor of the Lyrian city guard. His face was down in the roughage but he wasn't dead. Both his hands were over his head in a protective pose. Alice's first thought was to run forward and check to see if he was all right, but she hesitated. Sheitzer held out a hand, blocking Alice's path anyway. Something was wrong then. A trap, there wasn't anything around that Alice could see. Having seen Iorulan set a trap on the Society of the Burning Shadows water rock, not being able to see something wasn't all that comforting guardsman Pshaitsa said without taking a step forward. He eeped a little and jerked upright, facing the wrong way. Pshaitsa didn't give him a chance to look around before continuing. I am a member of the Knights Solaris. State your status. Are you in need of aid? H help me. He stood up and practically sprinted over, all but confirming that there were no traps around him. I'm Lan Hume, a, a noble from House Davenport he said as he ran. There clearly weren't any traps around if he was running like that, though one of the fallen corn stalks tripped him up. He landed on his face just in front of Tzheitzer. Undeterred, he looked up. My serv, fellow guard disappeared when that mon monster attacked us. I order you to protect me in his place. Take me back to the city. Yeah got a humworm in your grey. You're a guardsman, yet yeah want me to protect yeah. What? I, he blinked twice, looking away from Pshaitsa to Alisa. He wasn't going to find any help from her corner. Maybe it was that she had a mother who had served in the military before going on to be a security guard, but Alisa had strong feelings about those with law enforcement positions. Using his status as a noble to cower and hide did not align with her ideals. Though it was true that her mother had never fought literal monsters. But Fela wasn't that scary what attacked you? Alyssa asked instead of saying anything else that was on her mind. She suspected that it was Fela, but if there was another monster running around in the cornfield, best to know what kind of horror movie she was in before it started stalking her. Oh it was horrid, he said, wrapping his arms around himself in a self-hug which looked odd on a man wearing bulky armor. One moment, I was walking alongside Seath. Then. Oh, I almost forgot. He reached into the folds of his beige surcoat and pulled out a small notebook. Spell cards. He fumbled through selecting one, held it up to the sky, and practically shouted out. Flare. A bright orange orb of fire launched off toward the clouds. Reaching its peak, it burst apart in a fiery explosion of light and sound. A magical firework, essentially. And probably either a warning or a call for help from the rest of the guards. Judging by the swear under her breath, Tshaitsa was worried about more hostile attention drawn their way. What was the monster? Alyssa asked again. When he just looked at her, she added on, This is vital information that we need to help keep you alive. He shuddered. Oh, it was horrible. Yes. You said that. Oxart had said that most of the city guard was made up of nobles. What she hadn't said was that nobles were literally babies. 
It was a wonder that the entire city hadn't fallen to the first attack if this Lan Hume was an example of that the guard had to offer. He wasn't, of course. Alison Uipo was far more disciplined than this guy, it was huge with midnight black skin. Furry. N no. Its skin was like leather. It gleamed in the light of our lantern, he said, glancing down at a little iron and frosted glass lamp that had fallen to the ground. The flame within flickered as he picked it up. It was on us before I knew what was happening. Didn't hear a thing. Its skin was shiny and black, and you didn't hear it coming, Alyssa said, suddenly feeling a bit nervous. Did you happen to see its face? He shook his head back and forth in a negative right. I wish Cassitar were here. Let's keep an eye out for Gaunts. 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 Both Tsheitsa and Lanhum spoke at once, the former in a concerned but curious tone while the latter in a high-pitched panic a gaunt injured Iorial and the night the palace was attacked. It later, assisted me in rooting the Society of the Burning Shadow from the water hole. That was you. Lanhum blurted out. Your. Captain Decorous has been wanting to uh, speak to you. We're supposed to alert him if we find you. Well isn't that just great? The man who had locked up Oxart upon her return wanted to meet with her. Sounded like something to avoid if at all possible. Luckily, this guy seemed like a self-centered fool. Hopefully he wouldn't remember Tsheitsa's name. They could just slip away and Alyssa could start avoiding the city guard for the rest of her life. Regardless, his description sounded like a gaunt and, as far as I know, the city guard haven't found the one I encountered. Though I thought they were supposed to go dormant for a decade after eating and it definitely ate that night. If that's true, we need to get out Tsheitsa said, speaking perfectly clearly. Guild standard procedure when dealing with gaunts is to lead them away from population centers and find them a cow to eat, or something similar. Fighting one isn't done. Encountering one in a cornfield is a death wish. Ignoring the few whimpers from Lan Hume, Alyssa nodded. That's why I wish Cassitar were here. But I can contain it as long as I see it before it grabs one of us. A small part of her wondered if the spectral axe spell could scythe out its soul. Iorelan's clones surely would have thought of that when they had discussed options for dealing with the gaunt, so most people couldn't do it. Alyssa wasn't most people, however. Still, she ensured that spectral chains were at the forefront of her deck of cards. It was a tried and true spell. No need to take risks. Though, if there was really a gaunt out in the field, had it wandered out on its own? Was the Taker or Octavia trying to weaponize it as the Society of the Burning Shadow had done? It couldn't be coincidence that it was out here at the same time as someone had thrown a dagger at her command, Psyche said. Stick close, guardsman. I'll not wait up for ya. Whereas before Psyche moved through the path with slow caution, she now charged forward just barely under a run. That didn't stop her cautious glancing about. If anything, she was even more alert of her surroundings than before. Alyssa couldn't blame her. The gaunt didn't make a sound. If it destroyed crops, they might be able to hear it when the stalks broke, but it could just as easily pass through them the same way that Alyssa and Tsheitsa were now dot and they did pass through the cornfield. The corn wasn't as densely planted as she had seen in modern corn mazes letting them walk mostly unhindered as they left the path of toppled plants. Alyssa wasn't slacking off either. Constant vigilance. That was the phrase. Tsheitsa spent most of her time looking forward and to their immediate sights, so Alyssa took over the backward glances. Gaunts were slow moving, so they probably didn't have to worry about being chased, but no sense ignoring a whole avenue of attack. Lanhum followed just behind her half crouched over as if to make himself look smaller. He looked everywhere around him, even up above despite the forest of corn not really extending much higher than their heads something is there Alyssa hissed, spotting stalks of corn moving unnaturally. It definitely wasn't just wind. Even with night vision, she couldn't actually see what might have caused the twitching stalks. Her fingers rubbed over her deck of cards. She wanted to just toss out a spectral chains, 
but without being able to see anything, it would probably just wrap around some corn dots Heitzer didn't share in her hesitation. She grabbed one of the potions from her covered bundolier and chucked it between the stalks. A golden liquid splashed out, right where Alisa had seen movement. Most of it stayed a bright golden color. All the plants were doused as was the ground. But a few spots on the ground darkened to a deep red dot it took her a moment to realize that they were footprints. Elongated footprints. Definitely not human unless the potion turned red in a wider area than normal feet we were being watched. Alisa said as she realized just how the footsteps aligned. They came in from somewhere off to the right, stopped at a point ten feet away, and vanished back in roughly the same direction they had come. The gaunt. Or something else. It moved quick for a gaunt. Feeler. Don't know. Don't care. It's gone, keep moving. This height so loud for no argument as she started walking again. She did change her angle, moving their group away from where the footprints had been heading. If Alice's sense of direction hadn't gone all screwy, being able to see the palace and city towers helped, they were now headed toward a path that cut through the fields. It took a few minutes that felt like forever, but the edge of the field finally came into view. Being able to see further than a few feet away was a blessing. Now she could actually see a gaunt coming. And she could see the guards. Four were on horseback. Another six were hovering about the edges of the field. The closest horse rider took notice almost immediately and, with a nudge of the reins, started trotting over. Lan Hume managed to get a quiet word in before the horse rider got too close. Just stay calm, I'll handle this. As he spoke, he moved to the head of the group, standing straight rather than half hunched over. Sir, he said with an arm over his chest in a salute. I rescued these civilians from an unknown monster, but Seath went missing. You rescued us. Alisa could hardly believe how quickly he had turned from a sniveling coward into, on first glance, a gallant knight. If she was a bystander and only just glanced over, she might have even believed him. His words carried a confidence and calm that she would never have expected from the man who had been in the maze. He clicked his tongue in annoyance and opened his mouth, but Tzheitsa spoke first quit your habarin bickerin. Capen. Yeah, not a captain, citizen, just a guardsman. He spoke with a tinge of annoyance in his voice. As if he were annoyed that he had to admit that he wasn't highly ranked. At the same time, he carried a tone of derision when he referred to Tzheitzer as a citizen like he was looking down at her. Which he was, literally, because of his high horse. I am guardsman oh, don't might care. Ye yeah, need to pull your guards out of the field haste-like. There is a might hand of a gaunt out there. Gaunt, he repeated, narrowing his eyes as he looked from Tzheitzer to Alisa and finally to Lanhum. What did you see, he asked, addressing the latter I, ah, uh, didn't right see, sir he said, rubbing the back of his helmet. It moved so fast, you see. Fast, ha, huh, he said, looking back to Tzheitzer not bothering to hide his suspicion. The woman clenched her fists, clearly irritated. Alisa couldn't disagree. Lanhum had probably not seen anything at all. She was tempted to say as such, to reveal just how large a coward he had been, but it would be her and Tzheitzer's word against his. With the way he had looked to Lanhum for confirmation, he probably wasn't inclined to believe the worst of his subordinate. And if Lanhum really was some noble, he probably had friends in high places. Places where this guardsman wanted to go yet yeah, can argue later. There's more than just the possibility of a gaunt out there. An assassin with Waters Street might be targeting us. Mayhaps the taker himself. And, she trailed off, glancing to Alisa for just a moment. A hellhound. Alisa winced at that little betrayal. But she could understand the reasons for it. Feeler very easily could be a danger to the guards walking around inside the fields. She had proved that at the society outpost. In light of the gaunt, it would be best to warn her via a message as soon as possible that she needed to flee. The guards would be combing the fields after this a hellhound, 
the horseback guardsman practically shouted, clearly not believing Psyche. In Lyria. Madness. One would never dare come this far north. The fortress of Padora would have sent warning that one slipped by. And the only gaunt that has been in the city was safely escorted to an isolated mountain far south. Whatever rumors you may have heard to the contrary are only that. Rumors. Escorted. That was the first Alyssa had heard of that. She had asked Bracht and he had said that the gaunt went missing. He would know more than a random guardsman, wouldn't he, ah, uh, sir? Lanhum said, stepping closer to the horse and its rider. With a gesture from his hand, he had the guardsman leaning over in the perfect spot to whisper quietly. Letting them have their moment, Alyssa walked a few steps away, pulling out a message card as she moved. Message. Feel as she spoke as quietly as she could. The guards are going to be looking for you in the fields. You need to get out as soon as possible. Good luck. I'm sorry I can't do more, guards. Take these two into custody. Alyssa whipped back around to find several of the guards now advancing toward her and Tsheitsa. None of them made it very far before they all stopped as one. One of them raised an arm, pointed, and shouted G-Gaunt. G-Gaunt. Alyssa spun around. The guard hadn't been joking. One gaunt was slowly creeping out of the field of corn. Metal clanked behind her as the men started moving. She didn't know if they were advancing or retreating, but a horse's whinny and the beating of hooves told her that at least one of the horses had decided that it wanted to be anywhere but here. But Alyssa paid them no mind. She was staring at the gaunt, watching it. The field of corn it was lethargically moving out of was the same one that she and Tsheitsa had just come from. It had been following them. An uncomfortable thought, but she was prepared for this. Raising her hand, she cast spectral chains. The ethral links of ghostly metal wrapped around the gaunt, hiding most of its skeletal body. It managed one more step before the chains tightened around its legs, sending it toppling to the ground. After a few meager struggles against its bindings, the gaunt fell still. If she hadn't known that they were invincible murder monsters from the worst nightmares, she might have thought it died. Only when she was sure that it wasn't about to jump to its feet did she glance over her shoulder. Tsheitsa had two potions out, one in either hand. A luminescent white orb and one so dark that it almost seemed to suck in light dimming the area around it even despite Alice's night vision spell being active. She held them but wasn't even in a pose to suggest that she might be considering throwing them. They were both especially notable potions, but Alyssa couldn't remember having seen them on the bundolier. Tsheitsa did have a small bag with her, so she could have pulled them from their daughters for what they might do, Alyssa couldn't begin to guess. Iorulan had insisted that Gaunts were basically immune to magic that directly targeted them. From what Alyssa had seen, potions were just magic in a bottle. But if they affected the area around it, that could work. Behind Tsheitsa, the guards were far less composed. Where there had been a dozen, only four remained. Lanhum was nowhere to be seen. A few of the guards were fleeing up the path toward the city but Alyssa couldn't pick Lanhum's back out from the other knights with their identical armor. None of the horses were around either. The guard whom Lanhum had been talking with was around, currently trying to get to his feet as fast as possible. The way his back had gained a coat of dirt was unfortunately all too familiar for Alyssa. He must have been bucked off the horse. One of the remaining guards had a spell tome out in one hand and a card in the other. Again, Alyssa had no idea what he was intending to do with the magic, but maybe he had a way of creating a barrier that the gaunt couldn't cross. The lead guardsman finally got back to his feet. Between his ashen face and the way he backed up, he had probably been on the verge of running. Looking between Alyssa, the chains connecting her to the gaunt, and the monster put a stop to that. He put a hand to his chest breathing a few times before throwing his own glance over his shoulder get those men back here he said, barking the order to one of the remaining guards, who needed no second tellings, maybe he was just that diligent, 
but Alyssa was putting money on wanting an excuse to put distance between himself and the gaunt. The lead guard glowered at him on his way out before turning to the man with the spell tome. And you, send up a yellow flame. Get them out of the fields at once. As the lead guard's man turned back to Alyssa and the gaunt with a scowl plastered on his face, the arcanist flipped through his tome and selected a new card. Just like Lanhum's firework spell, this one launched a ball of fire up into the sky. When it exploded, it burst into a dazzling golden glitter you two, just, just stay right there. Alyssa glanced over to the gaunt. It wasn't moving in the slightest. You're not going to arrest me, are you, she said, jangling the chains. I don't think that I can keep it locked up if my hands are in manacles. He ground his teeth together. Limping a few steps forward, and pausing with a flick of his eyes toward the gaunt a few feet behind her, he said, Captain Decorous has been looking for you. That's nice. I don't see why that requires me to be arrested. You're consorting with monsters. Consorting. I captured it. If that's illegal, I'll be happy to let it go. Giving the chains a lazy tug made the gaunt move again. It couldn't really move with the chains around it, but it tried. The effect was enough. The guard's man backed away once again, shooting a nervous glance at Psheitsa. Don't do that, he said eventually. Don't do anything. Stay right where you are until we can do something. Tilting his head to touch his chin to his shoulder without breaking eye contact with the gaunt, he barked out another order to the arcanist. Send a message to Decorous. Inform him of the situation. Get him down here if possible but, be respectful about it. Sure. Sure thing. The arcanist backed away, moving a bit aside to get some privacy just as Alyssa had done earlier. As he pulled out a card and started mumbling, a guard emerged from the cornfield. He had a sword out and was using the flat of it to knock stalks of corn out of his way, grumbling the entire time under his breath. He marched right up to his commander without even noticing the chained gaunt are we done here. Muck is leaking into my, he finally noticed. Robbed of words, he just stared. More guards started emerging from the fields. Both the one Alyssa had been inside and the one on the opposite side of the path. Most of them were more attentive than the first one out. Reactions varied, but as more gathered around the commander with their weapons at the ready, those more timid steadied themselves and joined ranks. Unfortunately, most of them were shooting glares in her direction. Tzheitsa as well I'm causing trouble for you again Alyssa said softly as Tzheitsa approached. Sorry. Don't might care. How long can you keep it? The chains. Iorulan, or her clones, had asked the same thing. Alyssa didn't even feel the slightest strain. Not like when she cast Fractal Mirror or other such spells. Forever, I guess. Tzheitsa let out an audible sigh, relaxing her tense muscles. She didn't put away the two potions. They were still just as ready as ever to be tossed at the gaunt. But she did finally break eye contact with it. The first time since it had appeared. She turned to Alyssa with a sliver of a frown on her face. T would be nice not to worry over monsters every time you show up. Or gangs. Or armies. I feel the same way. I've got enough going on without things like this popping up. Guess it's good we caught it before it could eat anyone. But, Alyssa dropped her voice. Is there a plan for this? Iorulan can probably get me out of any jail they throw me into. Or rather, Tenebrail was going to pop up and pull her out of the whole world in less than a day. Though coming back to Lyria might not be the best option if the guards started a manhunt for her. Not without getting Iorulan to smooth things over, if she even could. But he wanted to arrest you too. Iorulan might help out Tzheitsa if Alyssa asked nicely but she also might not. It was hard to tell with the princess sometimes I've got friends in the guild and guards Heitzer said, shrugging. And a reputation. Whatever they're trying to claim I did won't stick. 
My work this past week with Plague Menders almost guarantees that I'll be released to continue working on it unless they come up with some surprising claims. Good to know that having friends in high places didn't apply only to Alisa. Some things just don't change even a world away. Alisa's friends, both the mortal and immortal, were just a little higher than most people had access to. Dot and there I am thinking about Irulan as a tool again, Alisa thought with a mental wince. Tenor Braille, on the other hand, was a tool for all she cared. Roughly a dozen men had appeared from the corn in the short time Alisa had been talking with Tsheitsa. A few of the men had returned from up the path as well, but not the full numbers. Not yet at least. With nearly twenty people all standing around her, Alisa would be lying if she said she wasn't nervous. Tenor Braille could get her out of prison with a snap of her fingers. If one of these guards got a little twitchy and rammed a sword through her chest, it would be a different story. She did take solace in the fact that swords were a whole lot harder to be twitchy with than firearms better cooperate. Heitzer mumbled. Should have just let the guards handle it from the start. Then you wouldn't have your hellhound eye fire thing. And you saw Fila. She didn't even act like she thought about attacking you. Considering what she went through at the outpost, that's saying something. She's a nice girl. Alisa paused before considering the way Fila had disappeared from their little meeting. I hope she eats the taker. And I hope she's alright after fighting him, she thought, though she didn't verbalize it. She was already pushing for Tsheitsa to be more open with monsters as it was. No need to beat her with a metaphorical hammer. She did get a low chuckle from Tsheitsa though it died off quickly as the lead guardsman started walking toward them Captain Decorous is heading out on his fastest horse. You are not to leave. We need to, he put his hand to his forehead before speaking a little quieter. He said to deal with it. I don't know what he expects. I can hold it indefinitely. I don't want to. There are other things I need to be doing. But I'll keep it until you come up with a plan. As long as you're not planning to arrest me. That is up to Decorous. I will let him know that you are being cooperative. Alisa dipped her head in a slight nod. Appreciated. Here's your plan. Get a cow or some other luggard, shove it right up against its face, and close your eyes. Then load it up on a wagon and dump it in the pit. The pit. The hole in the ground straight to hell. Or the underworld, if there was a difference between the two. That did seem like a valid place to drop the gaunt. Maybe when it woke from its torpor, it could eat some demons. Still, she glanced at it with a slight frown, wondering just how aware it might be of what was going to happen to it. It definitely didn't think like a normal creature, not like Tsheitsa, Cassitar, or Fila. Or even the Draken. Alisa shook her head deciding not to think further on the topic. The creature might not be evil in the classical sense, but a rabid dog had to be put down before it became a hazard to people. If it could not be reasoned with, then it had to go that isn't a bad idea the guard said. Yes. That might work. You there, he said, pointing toward another of the men. Run to the Abernathy livestocks. Get them to hand over some animal and drag it back here. Alive Tsheitsa said yes. Alive. That made Alisa wince. Throwing the gaunt into the deepest pit they could find was one thing. Feeding it a poor cow to make it docile. She didn't care to stick around to watch it happen, but unless someone else could contain the monster, she wouldn't have much of a choice in the matter. Glancing back, she scowled. The chains held tight and the gaunt still hadn't moved. Why did something like it even exist in the first place? She could almost understand most of the rest of the monsters. Maybe it was some perverted type of confirmation bias because of myths and legends on Earth, but a harpy seemed far more natural than this thing. The men around, trained guards that had probably gone into battle not so long ago against trolls and goblins, were visibly nervous. They had their weapons drawn. Looking to each other had become an almost pathological need. Aside from the leader, who was currently having a rough time tallying up how many of his men were missing, 
none of them strayed closer than 20 feet. Even Psyche stood quite a way further away than Alyssa would have expected. Alyssa caught glimpses of her looking back, but never for long. Only to reassure herself that Alyssa hadn't been lying about being able to keep it chained up. Three horses rode down the path from the direction of the city before long. They did not have a cow in tow. Decorous had arrived first. Alyssa actually preferred it this way. It meant that Decorous wouldn't be able to drag her off to some cell without freeing the gaunt, giving her at least a chance to figure out why he wanted to talk to her. Like Oxart, Decorous did not wear the heavier armor that most of the city guard wore. His clothing was a red cloth, fastened up the middle with silver links. He wore a little half cape thing. A black cloth that really only covered his shoulders. It was the same length in the front as the back. He did have a spell tome chained to his hip, hanging next to a thick leather pouch, but it was far thinner than Oxart and Iorulan's. On his opposite side, he had a long sword with a rapier-like blade. To Alyssa, it looked far too fancy to be functional with the gems encrusted into the grip and handguard, but she did admit that she didn't have much of an eye for swords. He didn't approach right away though he definitely spent a moment staring between her and Tzheitza. His eyes followed the length of the chains until he reached the gaunt. He didn't avert his eyes or shift with shaken nerves as the rest of the guards did. All he did was let out a small sigh. Waving a hand to call over the lead guard, he proceeded to spend a few minutes conversing. Alyssa couldn't hear a word of it. They were definitely speaking about her. She kept meeting their eyes all through their conversation. It made Alyssa wonder just what kind of eavesdropping magic existed. Wonder all she might, she wouldn't magically get any right now. Sighing, she just waited until Decorous approached. Dot or tried to approach. Dot his horse, a well groomed white stallion, reared back the second he tried to approach closer than about 30 feet, just about throwing him from the saddle. His eyes went wide but he managed to avoid crashing to the ground like a few of the other guardsmen had done. Leaning forward, he spoke into its ear while rubbing at its neck. It took another moment or two, but the horse did calm. It was apparently far better trained than the ones the other guards had been riding. Rather than try again, he handed the reins off to his second in command and dismounted. Decorous strode across the path without a hint of concern for his own safety from the gaunt. The two mounted companions he had brought with him did not dismount, but they didn't approach either. One of them ran off after a quick direction from Decorous. The other started taking over from the previous commander, barking orders around to try to get the men organized properly. As he passed Psyitzer, Decorous nodded his head. Interesting to see you out here. I was under the impression that you had taken up seclusion in your laboratory. Got to collect mats some time. Habering Menelix interrupted as Yerk and Wright see. So I see. So I see. Your name was. Alyssa. Decorous walked right up to Alyssa, stopping a mere two feet away. Monster slaver, potion seller, he paused long enough to glance at Psyitzer. Medical expert, lumber hauler. Am I missing anything? Saboteur, perhaps. Saboteur. Alyssa blinked, trying to remember anything she had done in Lyria that might have been considered sabotage. Nothing was coming to mind except maybe dragging a fairy around the city. She had been planning on denying that. Claiming that the fairy had already been in the palace when Oxart wound up captured should work. Anything Oxart said to the contrary could simply be a product of uncertain circumstances that Oxart had misinterpreted. And if Oxart had a problem with her shirking responsibility for that in the name of getting out of jail, well, she would have to remind the captain that it was Alyssa and Iorulan who had come to her rescue. For now, deny, deny, deny. I haven't done anything. Did you not just return with Princess Iorulan? I read her report of the situation. Destroyed a large group of Society of the Burning Shadow. Worthy of commendation, if Princess Iorulan's story is to be believed. Several scouts have already been dispatched to confirm, but they haven't quite made it back yet. I haven't done anything except that Alyssa corrected, slightly relieved. 
If that's all, of course, some less than scrupulous questions have been raised concerning you. Like, what? Oh, certain accusations that you have been trying to usurp the throne. His tone remained conversational, but the words brought Alyssa up short I. I what? Insinuations have been made he said, still speaking casually. A palace guardsman insisted that the Princess Iorelan we all saw was an imposter. He was unable to inform us at the time because he had been placed under a spell, but he was quite adamant after the fact. Then you disappeared with the princess right after in, suspicious circumstances. One city guard, part of the North Gate guard, was left with instructions from Oxart to apprehend you should something happen to her. Unfortunately, you had left the city before we could investigate further, even claiming that Oxart had been controlled by a fairy to her second in command. That is absolutely ridiculous. Oh. First of all, if I was trying to usurp the throne, which I most certainly am not, I wouldn't do it by replacing the seventh person on the totem pole with an imposter. I would set my sights higher than that, on someone more likely to actually become the ruler. Secondly, Iorelan is back. Safe and sound. I'm sure a rank 6 arcanist as powerful as the pharaoh is purported to be would be able to tell the difference between his daughter and a fake. The entire suggestion is completely baseless. I didn't say I believed it Decorous said, covering his mouth as he chuckled. With Oxart's fall to disgrace, I don't know that her words carry much weight anymore. Nor do her orders to her subordinates. And, as you said, the pharaoh has made no mention of his daughter being anything but his daughter. Alyssa pressed her lips together as he mentioned Oxart, but she didn't say anything. Iorelan had said that she would look into that. It might be wise to send her a reminder, given her apparent problems with her father, but it wasn't something Alyssa could easily change. So I'm free to go, then. Well, Decorous, trailed off looking over her shoulder. I see you weren't lying about being able to wrangle a gaunt. I would prefer it if you stayed here for the time being. Yeah. I figured she said with a sigh. But you aren't going to arrest me immediately after. No, but I do have a few questions to clear up. If you would join me at the Northgate barracks following this. There are a number of inconsistencies that I would like to straighten out. Do I have a choice? There is nothing to fear. With everyone present as witnesses, I will treat you to a meal and send you on your way immediately after. My honor as a noble from House Yoa won't allow me to go back on such a promise. Alyssa scowled, definitely not missing the fact that he had not answered her question. She glanced to Tzheitsa only to get an uncertain shrug in return. How could I refuse after hearing that? She said with another sigh excellent he said, clapping her on the shoulder before tilting his head in apparent concentration. Is that a mooing I hear? It shouldn't be long now. Are you feeling quite all right? You're looking a little green in the face. Alyssa shuddered. A fairly juicy slab of steak that had been expertly grilled sat in front of her. It wasn't alone, having come with a side of potatoes and bread. Of all the food that Alyssa had seen in this world, it was by far the best looking. It might not have a slathering of steak sauce or an unhealthy dollop of butter and salt, but it should have looked delectable. It didn't. Staring at it, she felt queasy. Alyssa was not a vegetarian. She didn't think she was about to become one either. It wasn't that she didn't understand the reasonings behind the movement. Cows chickens, and other livestock, as long as they were treated humanely, were just not that big a concern of hers. Even now, that hadn't changed. What made her queasy was the memory of the gaunt. The guards had brought it a cow. It had eaten a cow. Watching it eat a person had been terrible, but she had been hopped up on adrenaline and had a thousand other things to worry about at the time. Watching it eat the cow had been, different. A cow was far larger than a person. Remembering how the animal had squeezed in on itself to fit through the small holes that covered the gaunt's face, just, Alyssa pressed a hand over her mouth and tried to think of other things. Of shoes and ships and sealing wax. Of cabbages and kings Alyssa. 
and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. I'm sorry. The sea is boiling hot. I'm afraid I do not understand. Humming to herself, Alisa picked up her fork and knife. She considered shoving the plate away, but feared it would offend Decorous. Instead, she pictured a psychedelic wonderland to distract herself. Sorry she said after eating the first bite. The steak was good. Couldn't really go wrong with a nice juicy barbecued slab of meat. I'm fine. If you're sure he said, gently piercing a dainty chunk of meat. Return to the part where you freed the monsters, if you would. There isn't much more to it. We freed them, pointed them at the enemy, and they took care of the rest, more or less. Iorelan and I hardly had to lift a finger after that. I see. That would explain the sharp decline in the quality of the princess report from that point on. It certainly had nothing to do with things getting angelic, Alisa hummed to herself as she took a small sip of the grape wine. It was, better than most of the ale she had tried, but it wasn't really her thing. Even if it was delicious, she couldn't afford to get drunk and spout who knew what in front of Decorous about the spell Princess Iorelan used to distract the occupants. Case in point. It was a bit of surprise to find out that Iorelan was claiming credit for the damage Annihilator had caused. Someone else might be upset by that. Not Alisa. She was perfectly happy with attention being taken off her. Slipping up and saying that Iorelan hadn't cast the spell would ruin all of Iorelan's efforts. So she simply asked, what about it? The name of the spell is conspicuously missing. In addition, she claims she used it to destroy the majority of a hillside and several buildings. An exaggeration, surely. My scouts will confirm in time, but I would not refuse an earlier clarification. I hate to disappoint you, but if Iorelan hasn't mentioned the name of the spell, I shouldn't either. But you know it. I, yeah, I guess. Decorous clasped his hands together, humming. He had hardly touched his meal either, though it probably wasn't out of horrifying memories in his case. And the destruction. I mean, I haven't read her report, but destroying a hillside sounds accurate. Indeed. Curious. Alisa didn't bother asking just what he found curious. She had been extremely vague in describing the events. The only things she said were things that she was sure he already knew generally because he would ask about them in specific, such as monsters being freed or the size of the Annihilator spell. It was, rough. Tzheitza wasn't around, she had gone back to the potion shop, so she had no one to help distract him. The room was empty. Well, empty of people. They were seated in Oxart's office. Her old office. It looked nothing like Alisa remembered. Oxart kept everything highly utilitarian. Her desk had been fancy, but covered in paperwork. The two chairs she had on the guest side of the desk had been simple wood and nothing more. No cushioning, no red velvet. The walls had been adorned with maps and the large scheduling of guards at various posts around the northern area. The current desk was the same, but all the paperwork had vanished. It had been given a polish, the wood practically gleamed in the bright lights set about the room. A marble bust sat on one corner. No one Alisa recognized. She was a little relieved to see that it wasn't decorous, that would have been just a little too gaudy. Speaking of gaudy, Alisa turned her head to the side. The maps were gone from the walls, replaced with long red tapestries emblazoned with a white symbol. Three swords pointing upward and five fanned out in an arc beneath, pointed down. The same iconography covered the backs of the chairs, which were far fancier than anything Oxart had kept. Even the silverware fork, which was probably real silver, felt like it would put Alisa into debt just because she had touched it. Are you through with your questions, Captain Decorous? Alisa said, drinking a drop of wine. I'm sure Tzheitza is, Alisa's breath caught in her throat. A single feather was sitting on the table between her and Decorous. A white feather. Eyes wide, Alisa lurched to her feet, whipping her head around fast enough that her neck cracked. Ardril had come back for her. The feather certainly would have indicated as much, but it was the only feather. 
the rest of the room was perfectly normal. Nothing had been molting inside. There were no angels, Ardril or otherwise, as far as Alyssa could see. Just her, a bewildered Decorous, and two hardly touched meals is something wrong. Decorous asked. He had stood up as well, clearly on alert, though he hadn't moved for his sword or his spell tome so far. His gaze followed hers as she kept looking around the room, but not nearly to the same extent. Out of the corner of her eyes, she kept noticing him look to her. If anything, he was more suspicious of Alyssa than the idea that something else might be in the room I... I think we were being watched. Watched. His back stiffened. Whatever calm demeanor he had put on for her vanished in an instant as he narrowed his eyes and looked around the room. Who? How do you know? Alyssa bit her lip, turning slowly, still waiting for Ardril to pop up and skewer her with a shield. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end. What if Ardril was right behind her, slowly floating around the room to keep just out of sight? That would be, ridiculous. She didn't have a reason to hide. Especially not after dropping a feather right on the table. The feather was still there. Normally, angel feathers disappeared a few seconds after hitting something that wasn't Alyssa. Had it brushed against her? That would explain why it was still here. Or, and she would feel awfully silly if this were the case, the feather could be a normal feather. There was nothing nearby that might have produced the feather. No pillows or the like. Maybe a chicken had been plucked in the kitchen and its feather wound up stuck to the plate. No. The feather was perfect, it was smooth, unbroken, and free of stains or grime. There was no doubt in Alice's mind. It was a feather of an angel. Putting her finger on the wood of the table, careful to avoid touching any part of the feather, Alyssa looked up to Decorous. Do you see anything here? A test. If she had touched it, he would be able to see it. Decorous turned his sharp eyes to the table and stared. And stared. And stared. His gaze roamed left and right, circling around Alice's finger. Test failed, Alice thought. He didn't even need to speak. If he could see the feather, he would have said something by now. I see nothing, he said after a moment, confirming Alice's thoughts. I'll fetch someone capable of performing unseen sight. He pulled out a spell card. Message, probably no need. Wouldn't help anyway Alyssa said before he could open his mouth. Sliding her finger forward, she nudged the white feather, barely disturbing it. Decorous eyes immediately focused in on the feather. He definitely could see it now, but he didn't look concerned. Only confused. A feather. I'm afraid I don't understand. Did Iorelan's report mention angels? The new monster species that hides from human perception. His face remained steady, but a slight note of disbelief entered his tone. She claimed they possessed destructive force on par with dragons. Did she describe them? He opened his mouth only to hesitate with a glance down. Feathered wings. Alyssa picked up the feather by the hollow shaft. This wasn't here when we started eating. After knowledge of our plans. No. It left it behind he said slowly. It wouldn't leave behind such deliberately placed evidence if it were merely spying. A warning. Or a message. An omen. Biting her lip, Alyssa considered the same problem. If it was a message or a warning, it was probably for her. She couldn't see why Ardril would have tried to warn Decorous. Had Alyssa not touched it, he never would have known. Then again, she didn't know why angels did anything. Especially not the one that was trying to fix the world adjutant Decorous said in a raised voice. It wasn't quite shouting, being far too elegant for that, but it was intended for an audience outside the room. And that audience swung open the door mere seconds after. Sir, a young man said as he popped in recall all guardsmen to the wall. Double the watch. I want men surrounding the city immediately, anything suspicious outside should be reported to me with all due haste. Spread the word to the East Gate and the others. The adjutant didn't need a dismissal. With a small widening of his eyes, he turned back into the adjacent room, 
presumably to set about with the given orders. Alisa didn't think it was likely that the city would be attacked. The message was clearly for her. She just didn't know what it meant. It couldn't be a warning, could it? Why not just take off her head before she knew that Ardril was there? Unless it was some stupid programming that the angels had to follow. Or, maybe it was just a simple notice. A letter dropped by to say that Ardril had been around. If Alyssa were Ardril, she would be wanting her staff back right now. A chill racked her spine. I need to leave she said, already halfway to the door. A spell card was in her hand. Things I need to check on. Alyssa, wait. You said I would be able to leave. I have people I need to warn. If I find out anything else, I'll send you a message, but I will be leaving. Her fingers brushed over the deck of spell cards she had. Would she kill him if he wouldn't let her leave? No. Of course not. But she might have gone overboard in drawing up spectral chains over the past few days. With the amount she had, she could probably chain up half the city guard before she ran out. And if he wouldn't let her leave, she might have to do just that. Decorous drew in a deep breath through his nose and held it. One question Princess Ireland's report lacked a way to detect the presence of these angels. You clearly possess the ability to do so. How? I wish I knew. But I do know a thing or two about angels. They don't like to get their hands dirty. She couldn't say that they didn't harm humans. Not anymore. But she was somewhat positive that even Ardril would have an aversion to it. Ardril could have stopped the destruction of the outpost well before it began if she didn't care at all. They'll manipulate others into doing their work for them. Look out for regular humans or monsters. Alyssa didn't give him the opportunity to ask another question. She turned and fled from the room. Decorous didn't try to stop her. He didn't shout out to the adjutant, who was in the middle of a message to some other garrison of guards judging by the small bit of what she heard as she ran to the stairs. He had kept his word. She probably shouldn't be so surprised, but something about him just made her suspect that he wasn't on the level. Part of that might have been the redecoration of Oxart's office. The moment Alyssa was outside, she held up a spell card. Message. Iorulan. There might be a hostile angel inside the city. A feather just popped into being in front of me while I was talking to Decorous. I'll fill you in later, just try not to get stabbed in the back again. While running back toward the potion shop, Alyssa sent a similar message to Cassitar. As far as she knew, Ardril didn't even know that Cassitar existed. She had spent the whole time in Alyssa's pocket during their previous encounter. Still, Alyssa wasn't going to let her friends wander around without being at least the slightest bit aware of the danger. With Cassitar's ability to detect angels, even as difficult as it was, she might mistake Ardril for Tenebrail and try to follow or contact her. Speaking of the Dark Angel, Alyssa pulled her phone out of her pocket as she ran. She probably should have called Tenebrail first, but her priority had been on her friends. Her thumb hovered over the call button, but she hesitated. Last time, Ardril had somehow blocked the calls. The blocking wound up fizzling out her phone for a minute or two, forcing it to reboot. Alyssa switched to texting. Could Tenebrail even receive texts? She didn't know. Maybe it wouldn't work because of that. Maybe it would still fizzle out the same way calling did. She could always try calling afterward. For now, she slowed to a power walk, using both hands to tap out characters on the screen. Head down, staring at the screen, Alyssa turned a corner around a building. Ardril is BA. She barely made it three words into her text before slamming into something. It was a hard hit. But she didn't so much as stumble. A little girl, half Alice's height, went sprawling across the ground. With how little force the little girl had hit Alice with, she almost suspected that Cassitar was rubbing her elbow on the ground. But it wasn't a form Alice had seen before on the mimic. Although light, the girl had been just a little too solid to really be a mimic. No. This was a human. Some kid she had just knocked to the ground. Alice groaned. 
She didn't have time for this. At the same time, she couldn't just sprint off and leave her lying there. Tapping the send button, if Tenebrail couldn't figure out the meaning of the text from what was already there, well, she would try calling later. Alisa extended her other hand out to the girl watch it you bumbling blockhead. The girl shoved Alisa's hand away, proving that she really wasn't a mimic in disguise. She got to her feet with the kind of enthusiasm only a child could muster, looking none the worse for the wear. Her clothes, a sort of apron-y thing, she must be a servant, weren't torn and, despite having landed on her elbow, didn't seem to have so much as a scratch on her dot excellent. Great. That meant that a quick, sorry about that should suffice. Stepping around the girl, Alisa tried to leave dot a hand around her wrist stopped her short dot she turned finding the girl staring at where her small hand grabbed onto Alisa how odd. Alisa felt a chill go down her spine. There was just something about the way the girl said that under her breath that unnerved her. The girl looking up with red eyes didn't help. On earth, hardly anyone had red eyes. Alisa had never met someone with them. But here, it probably wasn't all that strange. The entire royal family seemed to have violet eyes. In fact, now that she was looking a little closer, maybe the girl's eyes weren't red, but just a dark pink. Was she, related to Iorulan, great? Fantastic, Alisa suddenly found herself thinking all sorts of terrible things about the girl in front of her. She couldn't help it. The last younger relative of Iorulan that she had encountered turned out to be a psychopathic assassin worshipper. One that might have tried to kill her only an hour ago. This girl could have been the one who tried to kill her an hour ago, saved only by the intervention of a hellhound. Alisa tucked her hand back to herself. The girl didn't try to keep a hold of it. For a moment, Alisa thought to turn and run. She really didn't have time for this. The staff could be missing. Tsheitsa could have been caught up in Ardril's burglary. Tenebrail would hopefully be popping into being any second now. But leaving would mean turning her back on a little girl who suddenly felt far more dangerous than grown men with swords. Maybe it was her imagination. Her paranoia. She had just been attacked and there was evidence of Ardril being about, so her paranoia wasn't unjustified. You are human, right? Alisa blinked twice before shaking her head. What did I do now? Everyone asks that. Realizing that the shake of her head might be taken the wrong way, she quickly nodded. Yeah. Human. What about you? The question was out before she could stop herself. Alisa took a step back, worried what the physical response might be regardless of the answer. But the girl didn't get angry. She sighed, putting on a deep pout. Was it that obvious? What did I do wrong? Ah, uh, she was a monster. Alisa took another step back. It didn't seem like she was about to be attacked, but who really knew? The girl wasn't a mimic but she was a monster that looked human enough. Would she be strong? Weak? Would a gun work, was their meeting a coincidence or had she planned it out? That was the biggest question well. She shoved her hands to her hips. How did you know? Was it something I did? Or just something you do? Alice a bit her lip before deciding to answer honestly. Maybe if she played along, the little girl wouldn't turn into a giant cockroach from outer space. She did have a spectral axe that would probably work, but Alice wasn't about to attack without knowing that the girl really was an enemy. Alice might have killed people. A lot of them, even. But she wasn't a murderer. And that, she felt, was an important distinction to make human girls around your age don't talk like you do. The girl waited, but when it became apparent that Alisa wasn't going to say anything else, she huffed. That's it. I didn't talk right. If you want to blend in properly, you should go find some real human girls and just watch what they do. Especially when they interact with strangers. Alisa stepped back again just in time for a black feather to drift down from above, nearly brushing against her face as it wafted past. She glanced up, relief flooding her as she spotted Tenebrail's fully extended wings drifting down toward her. 
the angel came down, landing just in front of the little girl. Alisa was pretty sure the girl wasn't a mimic, but she must have been able to sense something. Stiffening slightly, the girl turned and ran off I searched around some. If Ardril is present in my world, she is eluding me. Not the best news that Alisa had heard, but it was close. Considering how she had been around your world for quite some time before I found her, I'd say she has some practice in dodging you. True. But I don't like it. The glowing white in Tenebrail's eyes shifted around a bit, looking over Alisa. She stole the staff back. I was just about to check on that. I had to leave it behind, it is too cumbersome to carry everywhere. All I saw of her was a single feather. Very well. I suppose I can stick about for the time being. Not too long from now, I was going to come pick you up anyway. Your presence is appreciated. Come on. The staff is at the potion shop. Unless you want to teleport me there. I could Tenebrail said, looking down at her black fingernails. Breaking time and space to save you only a few minutes of walking is kind of a pain. You stop time on a whim. True. She extended the hand she had been looking at, placing it on Alice's shoulder. For a moment, Alice thought a ring of magic lights would pop up and whisk her off. Instead, Tenebrail dragged Alice in close. She barely knew what was happening before she found herself whisked into the air with a beat of Tenebrail's wings. Alice's breath caught in her throat. She clenched her fists around Tenebrail's shoulders, hoping she wasn't getting in the way of the wings. The ground disappeared from under her feet and Alice pinched her eyes shut. Wind dragged at her hair, pulling it back. Her shirt, a regular cotton tee, whipped about in the sudden gust. It was all Alice could do to hold on for dear life. The logical part of her mind said that Tenebrail couldn't hurt her. Even if she could, she probably wouldn't. But the more primal fear in her mind welled up, screaming out that humans were not meant to be so high. Peeking an eye open just made Alisa want to punch the angel. Not while they were flying, of course. But when they landed. You flew past the potion shop you stupid angel. The wind tore her words away, but Tenebrail still heard them loud and clear sorry Tenebrail said, voice unaffected by the wind in the slightest, bit distracted. Hearing her admit that just about made Alice vomit. Don't be distracted while carrying me. Mmm mmm. Mmm. We're on the wrong side of the palace. What could you possibly be distracted with? Oh, nothing you need to worry your little mortal head over. As she spoke, Tenebrail banked sharply, turning to sweep wide around the palace. Alisa sucked in a breath and promptly slammed her eyes shut. She could feel their sharp descent. That was beyond enough. She didn't need to see it too. If she did throw up all over Tenebrail, it would serve the stupid angel right. Of course, it probably wouldn't do anything besides slide off and leave Tenebrail looking as pristine as ever. The wind, thankfully, died down. Her hair still felt like it was pushed sideways, but if it was, it wasn't the wind holding it up. It was hard to tell if they were moving or not, though. Her arms, tight with tension around Tenebrail, still managed to tremble. That small sensation made her feel like she was still moving. Like getting off a roller coaster and still feeling the vibrations up her legs you can let go now. Blinking her eyes open, Alisa found herself in front of Tzheitz's shop. On ground level. Tenebrail still held her aloft, but that was mostly because of how Alisa had a hold of her. Slowly, carefully, Alisa put her feet to the ground, making sure it was really there before actually putting her weight on the ground. What the hell did you do that for? Honestly. It was probably faster this way. Yeah, but, at least warn me next time Alisa said, leaning against the door frame. She took a moment to catch her breath. There was a reason she had never tried any flying magic on herself. Flying off uncontrollably into the sun was just one of many possible problems she could have. Tenebrail's quick tour certainly hadn't helped to encourage her. 
The fact that she had seen literally zero other people flying about gave her some reassurance that people just weren't meant to fly like that. Even though her heart still raced, Alisa turned away to peer into the shop. The backroom door was open and light was coming out. Tsheitsa must have returned. The place wasn't on fire. Even the jars weren't disturbed. It looked like Tsheitsa missed out on any danger imparted by an angel in the city. Lucky her, Alisa thought with a mild glare at the angel, who was phasing through the door. Alisa followed after her. The staff needed checking. And Tsheitsa too, even if it looked like nothing had gone wrong. Both Alisa and Tenebrail went right into the back room. Tsheitsa was in the same spot she tended to be in as of late. Once again, she was dressed up in the protective clothing and playing with bottles of red liquid that Alisa definitely wanted far away from her. Tsheitsa didn't even look up from the black droplet falling into the larger flask is that, mine. Tenebrail stopped just behind Tsheitsa. Her eyes were locked on the potion vials as well, staring even more intently than Tsheitsa was here Alisa said slowly before trying to shift the word into the start of a question for Tsheitsa. Did anything strange happen since you got back? Tsheitsa did not respond right away. She put a cap on the flask of red and started gently swirling it around. The liquid inside darkened, first turning a deeper red before becoming so dark that it might as well have been tar. Alisa wouldn't say that it sucked in light. Not like that potion she had pulled out upon seeing the gaunt. It did get pretty close. Apparently, finding something wrong with it, Tsheitsa scowled and placed it up on the shelf with all the other flasks. She penned a few words in a small notebook on the workbench. Only when she finished did she finally turn to face Alisa Strange, she asked. How strange? Strange like coming home and finding a Haberin hound sleeping at my fire pit. H hound. Alisa whipped her head over to the fireplace. How did I miss that? A ball of black fur sat curled up between the two chairs that she and Tsheitsa often sat in. Two empty taco wrappers, the last of Alisa's modern food, were scrunched up next to her. The food didn't matter to her so much. Not with Tenebrail hovering just to the side. The angel was staring at the flasks on the shelf, but that didn't concern Alisa either. Why is Fila here? Tsheitsa just raised her scarred eyebrow. Alisa flushed, feeling silly for even asking. Of course Fila had followed her scent. Just like she had done to find the cave. And she got into the room and into the food. What a menace. You're right Alisa said, shaking her head. But hold that thought. I need to check on something really quick. Crossing the room in only a few large steps. Alisa opened her already ajar door. She didn't need to go in any further. The staff was right where she had left it, leaning against the wall behind the bed. So Ardril hadn't come for it. And she hadn't come to attack Alisa. Unless she was out attacking Iorelan at the moment, what had she even come for? Why leave the feather? Alisa sighed as she turned back to the room. She wanted to ask Tenebrail but couldn't do so easily while Tsheitsa was watching. Or, maybe she could dot the angel had her back turned to Alisa, still focusing on the flasks on the shelf. She wasn't touching them, but she did have a hand out toward one. Glowing Enochian script floated around her hand. It looked familiar. The same sort of thing that she had done when Alisa had first used spectral chains to stop her and Iosfiel's fighting. Alisa didn't even ask. She walked up and buried her hands in Tenebrail's wings. For a moment, she almost forgot what she had been doing and just indulged in the sensations. The feathers were so soft. Like rubbing the belly fur on a particularly puffy cat. Or a bird, she supposed. But she didn't forget completely. With a firm tug, several of the feathers came loose. Tenebrail made a particularly undignified squeak, whipping around with an unhappy glare already on her face. What was that for? Not bothering to respond, she held out the feathers, maybe another dozen of them, to Tsheitsa. She didn't take them right away, staring between them and Tenebrail. Or rather, she stared through Tenebrail. 
her eyes didn't manage to focus on anything. It's here, isn't it, she said, barely above a whisper. Your monster. Yeah. She is. And she has graciously consented to giving you another sampling of her feathers. I what? Tzheitsa eyed the empty spot again, curling her lip. Tell it thanks, I guess. She can hear you. How many of them are you gonna bring around anyhow? Tzheitsa grumbled, removing her gloves before taking the feathers. She treated them far more carefully than Alyssa had. Her touch was tender, like the feathers were made from the most fragile glass. One by one, she laid them out on her workbench, inspecting each for a moment before moving on to the next. As she worked, she talked. At least this one is all nosy and the mimic can disappear. If some Hubbard comes and spots that hound, I am gonna be the one meeting with the captain. And it won't be as nice as your meeting. Yeah. Sorry about that. Turning to Tenor Braille, Alyssa put a hand to her hip. Can't you do something? I told ya back in the field, Tzheitsa started not you. Her Alyssa said, pointing to what Tzheitsa would see as empty space. Tenor Braille blinked twice. She didn't answer right away, looking astonished. After another set of blinks, she pointed back to Alyssa. You stole my feathers. It's for a good cause, or so I'm told. You didn't even keep them for yourself. You gave them to some random mortal. Is it just me or does she sound hurt about that? Tzheitsa isn't random. She's working on a cure for demon plague. Demon plague. What, her eyes widened as she looked back to the flasks. Oh. That demon plague. He isn't going to be happy about this. Alyssa just shook her head. Well he should have thought of that before he started all this nonsense. I care about helping humans. Glancing behind Tenor Braille to Fila, she quickly amended her statement. I care about helping mortals. If your elder sibling is going to run around committing biological warfare, it's obvious people are going to fight against it. Whatever happened to good old temptations? Shouldn't he be offering apples, not diseases? What do you think the plague is? It is one gigantic temptation. All the power a human could ever wish for if they just dismiss me and take him into their hearts. The only reason why this world isn't overrun by demons is because of how prolific my name is. That got a scoff from Alyssa. We didn't have the plague back home. I don't think anyway. I'm sure I would have noticed people turning into literal demons. So I'm betting that the fact this plague exists at all is somehow your fault. Tzheitsa stopped her inspection of the feathers, looking over her shoulder with narrowed eyes. What's that supposed to mean? Just baseless conjecture Alyssa said with a sigh. She didn't want Tzheitsa to stop working on her potions just because she thought Tenor Braille was a demon. That would be extremely counterproductive. Her brother, a uh, stepbrother is the leader of the underworld. Alyssa sounded far more uncertain than she would have liked. And it wasn't just because she was trying to hide Tenor Braille's name. She didn't know how the underworld worked. She didn't even know how angels and demons worked. She hadn't even seen the stupid plague aside from minor evidence that such a thing existed. Tenor Braille had sent over that dossier on angels and Alyssa was still trying to filter out the useful information. Said information had not included anything on demons. So she ended with a week, she's trying to stop him from causing more harm. Something she said must have worked because Tzheitsa's eyes softened. She simply nodded her head and went back to the feathers. It was strange, or was it? Tzheitsa had tried to stab Kassitar several times when she first showed up. But now she apparently left an entirely vulnerable feeler to enjoy the crackling fire in her sleep. Maybe she was getting used to monsters a bit. That would be nice your conjecture might not be wholly baseless Tenor Braille said, spoiling Alice's good mood. I may have gone to Brother Dearest in the earlier days when I was first attempting to break away from the book's predictions. She shifted back and forth, looking uncharacteristically nervous. 
It might be partially thanks to him that monsters continue to exist when they all should have been wiped out in the first city's downfall. He might have requested one tiny favor of me. I thought you said never to make a deal with... A favor. Wait Alyssa said as she folded her arms over her chest. Don't tell me. I can guess. Her. Who is her? Alyssa glanced between both Tenebrail and Tzheitzer. Tzheitzer had been the one to initially mention a creature by the name of her, but Tenebrail would probably know far better a monster lord Tzheitzer said. Dot at the same time, Tenebrail said something different. A representative. In his words. It was the favor my brother wanted. Between you and me, I think he is representing himself. You don't know. That seemed like something Alyssa would find out as soon as possible I keep far away unless I absolutely cannot help it. And I've never been unable to help it. Alyssa put a hand to her brow and shook her head. How, irresponsible. But that was just Tenebrail's natural state of being, she supposed. Being responsible would probably mean following the plan and the will of the books. If Tenebrail did that, Alyssa would surely have died already. Could you go check on Iorulan? Alyssa eventually asked. She hasn't messaged me back after I warned her that Ardril might be around. You know, I have people praying to me hourly who make less requests than you do. Answering prayers breeds dependency, Alyssa thought with a grimace. She didn't get a chance to respond. Tenebrail exploded into feathers, hopefully off to check on Iorulan. Spotting a few of the feathers near her, Alyssa plucked them out of the air and added them to Tzheitzer's small pile. She hopes they help Alyssa lied without remorse as Tzheitzer started inspecting the new additions. These'll tide me over for a while. Helpful these may be, I'd wish ye d stop bringing monsters into my shop. Yeah, Fila was going to be a problem for Tzheitzer. Especially if Decorous decided to send guards over to search her potion laboratory for Alyssa. I wonder if I could get her to the palace. Let Iorulan keep her there for a while. And I bet if Fila were living in the palace, it wouldn't be much trouble to get more, ah, uh, fire tear potion things. Guards will attack here on sight. I figured. But if I can get Iorulan to escort me, maybe it won't be so bad. Tzheitzer paused her feather inspection to look over at Alyssa. Yeah we're riding around the Black Prince's Draken, home. Bringing them here and scaring off all my customers. Ah. Sorry. Is that why we haven't had many customers as of late? The Black Prince has a history with monsters. Get him to take your pet to the palace. Less chance of Bonza Bodin come. For a while there, Alyssa thought Tzheitzer was fine with speaking plain English. Now she just had to shake her head and ask, less chance of what? Tzheitzer didn't respond immediately. At least not with words. She did grunt, frowning at one of the feathers before setting it aside. Alyssa leaned in a little closer but couldn't spot anything that might set it apart from the others. It was black and feathery. Just like the rest there are rumors that the princess isn't who she says she is. Better to get the black prince to escort your pet than risk accidental aeration. That, would be Cassitar's fault. Partially. The other part is probably me. Though Iorulan's clones helped out. Alyssa well knew that people like Decorous would probably be wary of Iorulan for the time being. But Tzheitzer had heard rumors too. How did you hear that rumor? Does the entire city know? Or did you ask some contacts of yours in the city guard? Gildan no. Wakamar see. Pruly Evany with the way those jammer jaws. Is it me, or is she getting worse? Maybe she was just that into the feathers that she couldn't spare the brain power for proper speech. She set a second one to the side. Again, Alyssa couldn't spot a difference between it and the others. Maybe it was slightly longer. That could easily be a trick of the light. Dot shaking her head, Alyssa left Tzheitzer to her work. If she couldn't understand her, there wasn't much point in carrying on a conversation. She could always ask later, after Tzheitzer had some time to calm down. Still, she was right. 
the gate guards had definitely not been all that friendly toward Iorulan when she and Iorulan approached them the other night. They had an outright attacked, not even after Iorulan threatened them, but they might decide to do so easily enough if they saw her walking around with a hellhound dot dropping into what had become her seat by the fire pit, Alyssa frowned down at Fila. The hellhound was splayed out without a care in the world, absolutely unconcerned with being in the middle of a human city, in the middle of a human potion shop. She must have slipped by the guards on the wall during all the confusion. Had she found the taker? Or Octavia? Or that other little girl, for a moment, Alyssa considered taking off her boots and using Fila as a footrest. Despite being able to block blades, Fila's fur was soft. But, she had work to do message. Bracked. Hello, it's Alyssa. I'm at Ps Heights's potion shop and we have a bit of a furry problem. Nothing dangerous, to us, at least. But I was wondering if you might help escort a hellhound to the palace. I'm sure Iorulan would care for her after that. I also wanted to ask you a few things about your Draken, but I honestly don't know how long messages can be. For all I know, this is all being cut off. So I'd prefer to talk in person, if possible. If you aren't too busy, that is. Alyssa stopped, not quite sure what else to say. She didn't know Bracked all that well. If Message hadn't been cutting off her words, it probably would have stopped when she stopped. Even if she thought up another question to ask or something to tell him, she would have to use another spell card. She had drawn up a lot of message cards as it was a very useful spell, so she could always send a second one. A light pressure in the back of her mind told her that she had a response. Or maybe it was Iorulan. Either way, relaxing slightly let it through. Tilda understood Tilda she heard Bract's voice say in the back of her mind. Tilda will it become a problem if I wait for the morning after tomorrow? I will confer with my sister during the day. She is asleep at the moment and I do not wish to make an attempt at waking her. After, I have some business to take care of and won't be free until after the following day. Tilda message. Bracked. I don't think it will be a problem if you wait a day. And I completely understand about not wanting to wake Iorulan. The girl was a nightmare to rouse. And, if she was truly asleep, that might explain her lack of response to Alice's earlier message. As long as she was safe, it was fine, but it did make Alyssa wonder if there wasn't some long-range alarm spell that might be able to wake someone like Iorulan if there was an emergency. A few moments passed without response. Since he had clearly gotten her first message, she assumed that he got her second and simply didn't wish to waste his own spell cards with what would probably be a one-word acknowledgement. Boots still on, Alyssa started nudging Fila. In complete contrast to Iorulan. The hound's eyes snapped open almost instantly. Fire poured from the corners of her red eyes as they darted around. Even through the thick soles of her boots, she could feel Fila's muscles tense up. This whole world was really putting Alice's exercise routines to shame. Fila calmed down after a moment of observing. She rolled over on her stomach in order to face Alyssa, crushing some taco wrappers but didn't bother to actually get up so you decided to come here, huh? I was still hungry. And now what is your plan? The guards are on full alert, watching the walls. Slipping by is going to be tough. Then, she interrupted herself with a long yawn. Then I'll stay here she said, stretching out. Alice across her arms. Despite being called a hound, she reminded Alice more of a cat than a dog. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe for a day, but you're going to cause too much trouble for Psyche if you stay here. How about the palace? I bet they have lots of good food there. And Iorulan, might want you as a pet. Would be happy to see you again. Where are the Draken you were riding? At the palace. Fila hummed. Or purred. Growled. It was hard to tell. It was a pleased noise, so not an angry growl. Maybe I will go there. Iorulan's brother will probably come here to escort you so that the guards don't attack. Stay here for a day or two, please. 
and don't get yourself seen by any humans who aren't me or Tzheitzer. The flames at the corners of Fila's eyes were small. Larger than a candle's flame, but nothing like the foot-long trails of orange that they normally were. Was she about to fall asleep again, before she could, Alisa asked, did you find whoever threw the knife? Her fire grew a bit, not quite to its usual length, but enough to be noticeable. I smelled them and chased, but then the smell just disappeared. I was going to try to follow the other end of their smell, but you stopped me with your spell in my head. I decided to come here instead. Recall. Alisa thought. It was the only real teleportation spell that she knew of. There could be others, or it could have been something else entirely. Disguise scent. That could be a spell for all she knew. But the only things that she knew existed that would make a smell disappear were teleportation spells would you remember the smell if you smelled it again, even after a long while. Of course she said, mildly affronted that Alisa had doubted her abilities I might ask you to help me with that. Alisa didn't want to seek out trouble, but if assassins were seeking her out, it stood to reason that a proactive approach was for the best. In other words, she was going to tear out their souls with spectral axe and feed them to a dark angel. And she wasn't going to lose sleep over it speak of the devil she mumbled as black feathers started popping into existence around the room speak of the angel. Tenebrail corrected. She was seated in her narrow-backed throne. Both Tenebrail and the throne had materialized between the two far more regular chairs next to the fireplace. I found Iorelan. She was sleeping. No sign of an angel and no word of her upcoming demise in the book, so you can relax for a while. Good. Bract had already mentioned that to her, but she was going to be thankful that Tenebrail would help her out with little things like that so. You ready to go? Go. To Earth. It is a bit early for our little, event. But I did promise lessons. An angel cannot lie. Deciding not to comment on impossibilities that may or may not be possible in reality, Alisa jumped to her feet. Fela's candle-sized flames flared with the sudden movement. Alisa didn't care. The hellhound could, and probably would, sleep whenever she wanted. Lessons. The only thing holding Alisa back from instantly agreeing was the fact that Cassitar still wasn't here. She had wanted to go to Earth again. But. Alisa didn't know how long that would be. And Cassitar did not have any message cards to the best of Alisa's knowledge. Give me, five minutes Alisa said. She was going to send a quick message to Cassitar. And if the mimic didn't appear before then. Well. She didn't want to keep Tenebrail waiting. My head is going to explode. Cassitar hadn't made it in time. A terrible misfortune. Maybe she could have made sense of something. Alisa sure wasn't getting anywhere. She had a notebook out in front of her, but the page was blank. It was supposed to be notes of her lesson with Tenebrail. Tenebrail was teaching her, something. Alisa just didn't know how to write it down. If she had her phone, maybe that would have helped. But Tenebrail had taken that upon their arrival. They had appeared on Earth in a classroom. Middle school or high school, Alisa wasn't sure which. It had all the usual classroom items desks, both many for the students and one for the teacher, a projector, a whiteboard, a television hung in one corner decorations on the walls related to numbers and mathematics, and a flag indicated that this classroom was indeed in America. There were no children or teachers to be seen. At least not inside the class. People were around. It was daytime, roughly noon. Bells rang periodically and the stampede of feet could be heard through the door. But nobody came into this room. Either this classroom was so unused that nobody had noticed her presence in the hour she had been frustrated by Tenebrail's teaching or Tenebrail had done something to make everyone ignore the room. It wasn't the only thing the stupid angel had done to the room. When Tenebrail had first picked up a black marker from the assortment of colored pens on the whiteboard's tray, Alisa had been ready with her own pen on her notepad. Her plan had been to copy everything. If she couldn't pass it. 
then perhaps Iorulan could make heads or tails of the information. That plan had died before Tenebrail had lifted the marker's tip from the board. Alyssa chanced another glance at the board. Immediately, she felt dizzy. Nauseous. A swell of vertigo forced her to turn away. She didn't know where to begin copying down what Tenebrail had drawn. Or maybe when to begin, because if that flat and perfectly normal board had only three dimensions, it might have been possible to pause now pay attention, this is the important bit Tenebrail said, lifting the marker. She swiped her arm from left to right. The line she drew split off in six or fifteen different directions. Trying to count exactly how many made the number change every time she looked at it. One of those splits had already been there before she drew her line. Except it hadn't. Alyssa was quite sure of that, mostly. She couldn't actually remember a time when the mark on the board hadn't existed, except it had to have not existed at some point in time because the board had been completely blank when she had first arrived. Unless it hadn't been blank, Alyssa picked up her pen and flung it at Tenebrail. It bounced harmlessly off the back of the angel's head, though it did get her to turn around. If you're not going to take this seriously, I do have other things I could be doing. Take it seriously. Alyssa slammed her hands onto her desk. She had selected one of the ones right up at the front of the classroom so it wasn't far to march right up next to Tenebrail. The board stayed right where it was, but the, she hesitated to call it text, but, whatever it was, it shifted and moved as if she were looking at it through a kaleidoscope. How the hell am I supposed to take this seriously? Alyssa slapped her hand against the board as she reached it. The board wasn't where she expected it to be. Her hand carried on into the space. Mid stride and lacking the expected resistance of a wall, Alyssa lost her balance. She teetered and started falling into the board. It would have swallowed her had Tenebrail not put a hand on her shoulder. All of a sudden, she was back to standing right in front of the angel. Her hand was pressed flat against the smooth surface of the whiteboard this, Alyssa paused, sucking in a breath. It felt like it had been a while since she last breathed. This is the kind of thing Lovecraft had nightmares about. What? Math homework. Alyssa shuddered. Is this really the simplest thing you could start with? No no. Then what, to give you a taste Tenebrail said, picking up the eraser and maybe to warn you off a bit. As I said before, what we're getting into requires mathematics beyond what Earth's most brilliant geniuses could dream of. She swiped off half the board in a single stroke despite its size as a regular eraser. A few quick flurries of her hand cleared out the remainder of marks. Alyssa gave the smooth face an experimental tap of her finger and found it to be perfectly normal. The eraser had left the surface clean enough to be used as a mirror. No trace of the reality-bending geometries remained. Had that really only been a simple marker on a whiteboard? Tenebrail hadn't cast any spells, Alyssa had been watching intently, but it still seemed, impossible. With a shudder at the memory, Alyssa turned to the angel. So, I assume you're actually going to start with something else. Indeed. We are going to start with drawing out your soul to cast the simplest spell in existence. Light. Though I don't know if we'll actually get to the casting today. Depends on how things go. Nodding before Tenebrail's words were fully processed made Alice a jerk. Draw out my soul. That sounds a bit dangerous. Considering Spectral Axe latched onto the soul and tore it from a body, drawing out a soul seemed an awful lot like it would be deadly no one said this would be easy but you're going to need something a little more than a simple piece of paper and a prayer to yours truly if you want to try your hand at true miracles. Maybe she was trying to procrastinate a smidgen, but Alyssa had to ask. Yours truly. I haven't heard anyone pray to you when casting a spell. And I bet that the Society of the Burning Shadow would rather kill themselves before they pray to you. Tenebrail didn't answer. She swapped the eraser for the black marker and put the felt tip to the board. Alyssa turned away immediately. The last thing Tenebrail had drawn had been bad enough. 
risking insanity by watching her draw wouldn't help anyone. But she did chance a look after a few moments of tenebrae drawing. Just a quick glance. Enough to tell if she was going to get a headache. To her surprise, she didn't. In fact, the marks on the board were perfectly normal. Well, mostly normal. There weren't any dimensional shenanigans, but it wasn't in English. It was Eno Kyan. A familiar symbol. As with literally every other bit of Eno Kyan that Alisa had seen, she didn't know what it meant, but she had drawn it at least a hundred times in the past week. It was a very common component of spell cards. Two stars, one smaller than the other and set inside it, shared a corner. But they were half hidden by a crescent moon. Three five pronged W esque symbols jutted out on long spines. Three symbols floated between spines. One looked like a stylized number three, one almost an infinity symbol, and the last, like a tree branch and fish mated and had their baby nursed by a lightning bolt. Eno Kyan Tenebrail said. The building blocks of creation. Essentially, if you can describe it perfectly, you can create it. Eno Kyan does that, if you're learned enough in how to use it. We angels, don't. Not fully, anyway. It has been something I've been studying, but, to me, Eno Kyan's depths look roughly how I imagine my little mathematics tutorial looked to you. Alisa shuddered, but nodded, hesitantly. If this is so complicated that not even you can understand it, why does it look, ah, uh, normal? I mean, I'd never seen the shape before coming to Nod, but there isn't anything too complex about it. People on Earth might have accidentally drawn it over the course of human history. It certainly doesn't warp the whiteboard into a twisted mockery of Euclidean space. Excellent observation, Alisa. I knew you could be a good student if you put your mind to it. You don't need to pat me on my head, Alisa said, swiping the angel's hand away with a roll of her eyes. I told you before that a single character of Eno Kyan contains enough information to fill a few textbooks worth of pages were it written in English. Well, how am I supposed to fit even one book into that little character? She shook her head, shrugging with her palms facing upward. The fact is, I can't. This is... Think of it like simplified Chinese. There is significant detail loss in the character, but it is a version of Eno Kyan that can be written by mortals like you. Alisa did not miss the emphasis. Written. But not read. It still conveys a significant amount of information. The back of the book blurb for this one is that this particular symbol beseeches me. It requests my intervention on behalf of the arcanist. That our wills be one, enacting my wrath upon any who dare stand against my subjects. They borrow from my authority, using me as a link to the throne to do whatever the rest of their spell card requests. I have a sort of carte blanche to everyone on my world so that I don't have to manage it much. Irresponsible, was Alice's first thought. Letting people have unrestricted access to do whatever magic they wanted was just asking for trouble. It was too strong. Too powerful. Some of it was fine. Lower-ranked spells might even be necessary to life on the planet since the people hadn't discovered how to create fire without magical assistance. But higher spells. Fractal magic. Time magic. Like letting everyone in the world have access to a big red nuke launching button. It just wasn't something that should be done. But irresponsible might as well be Tenebrail's middle name. She really didn't care about the people on her world. The only reason she cared about Alisa was because of that strange ability she had to break rules. If Alisa hadn't seen Tenebrail the night of her supposed murder, she might have ended up invisible, inconsequential, Miss Cellophane to the angel. As she thought about it a bit more, she couldn't help but chuckle. So you're saying that? Every time someone casts a spell, they're basically praying to you to come save them. More or less. I wonder how the Society of the Burning Shadow would feel about that one she said with a laugh. Though her laugh died down as she considered what Tenebrail said just a little further. Can't you just revoke their spell casting privileges? 
Taylor Braille shifted, looking a little less pleased with the question than Alyssa would have expected. Technically, nobody is supposed to be able to cast magic, as I'm sure you're aware. Magic should have ended along with the Age of Legends. That anyone can cast it is a result of the agreement with my brother. The devil Alyssa said, voice flat I wouldn't call him that, but he has many names. We worked together to create the current system and changing it is not really all that easy. Or possible. Not without his help and no thank you to that. You know. For warning me off interacting with demons, you sure didn't follow your own advice. Call it, speaking from experience. Aha. Uh -huh. Despite her dismissal, Alyssa didn't have any desire to meet a demon. Perhaps that warning feeling in the back of her mind was from growing up in a predominantly Christian country. She wasn't that religious. Or, she hadn't been before meeting Tenna Braille. After meeting her, it was a bit difficult to consider the angel worthy of worship or exaltation. Still, the aversion to the idea of demons probably came from cultural osmosis before we finish for the day, as I said, I want to try drawing out your soul in an attempt to have you access the throne through me. I'd rather take my time with something like that, if that's all right with you Alyssa said with only a hint of nervousness. Tenna Braille probably knew what she was doing. And, without Alyssa, Tenna Braille wouldn't be able to kill the people that needed to die on Earth. So she wouldn't do anything that might risk that at least until the last guy had died. Alyssa hadn't given them too much thought. She was somewhat hoping that Chris might be able to better acclimatize them to the new world, at least a little. Dumping them on him might not be entirely fair, though she was hoping that their shared experience of being on Earth might give them some commonalities that they could use to become acquaintances. From her brief conversation with him, Chris hadn't really seen her as a proper earthling, though that phrase made her sound like they were aliens, but as someone who, well, had left him in a strange place and abandoned him. She needed to check in with him when she got back. Just to make sure that he had found something he could do. For that matter, she hadn't even asked Tenebrail about either of the other victims of her would be murderer. What skills did they have? Were they also homeless, down on their luck? What if one was a child? Even if it was a fake body with the soul of a society member shoved inside, shooting it would be difficult. Opening her mouth to ask about the upcoming targets, Alyssa looked to Tenna Braille and met the angel's eyes. But she hesitated. There was something there. A shadow of a frown on the angel's face. Do you trust me? Tenna Braille asked, hands on the hips of her black dress. I, Alyssa blinked. What? The shadow vanished, replaced by what had cast it, a mournful pout. Your hesitation does not do you credit, Alyssa Meadows. I don't know what you want me to say to that. A yes would be the ideal answer, I think. That's probably not going to be the answer you get. Tenor Braille certainly wasn't going to kill her or harm her. Not now. Maybe not ever. But Alyssa just couldn't shake the feeling that, if it served Tenor Braille's purposes of destroying the books and their system, she would find herself left to rot in the deepest pit imaginable. If not killed outright. Tenor Braille had said that she wanted to find out how Ardril had harmed Iorulan. Alyssa wasn't sure she wanted to know what the status of that project was. Tenor Braille didn't look happy with Alyssa's response. Like she had expected Alyssa to answer in the affirmative without question. This might be a bit difficult to ask of you, in that case, but please comply. Hold out your arm. Is that it? With all that talk of trust, you had me nervous. Though she tried to play it off as a joke, Alyssa's arm remained firmly at her side. Obviously, Tenor Braille wasn't just going to have her hold out her hand. She was going to do something. Probably to Alyssa I'm going to draw out your soul Tenor Braille said again, confirming Alyssa's suspicions. Then, if that is successful, I'm going to try connecting with your soul. Alyssa stepped away, crossing her arms as she moved to lean on the desk she had been using. The action didn't seem to please Tenor Braille much. Alyssa found it hard to care. I think I'd like to know more before we commit to anything. 
Explaining fully would take time and knowledge that we don't have. But. Most miracles that you might have heard of were cast by angels in lieu of a human doing the work. Sometimes, that just isn't possible. The book would require that the human cast the spell on their own. Which is obviously impossible on a world like Earth where magic hasn't been delineated to the degree that it has on my world so in those cases where a human might need to, say, heal someone, the human needed the ability to cast the spell on their own without an angel doing it for them. These humans would be connected to a guardian. They did that by having their soul drawn out and attached to their angel. They were few and far between. Very rare. Several people died unexpectedly, requiring the throne to alter the plan a bit. You are not reassuring me in the slightest. I am telling you the truth, as you asked for it Tenebrail said with a shrug. I am not telling lies, even by omission. However, if anyone can do it, it would be you, Alyssa Meadows. None of those people could see angels naturally. If they saw an angel at all, it would have been because the angel had been directed to create an illusion that the mortals could see. Many mortals didn't even realize what had been done. And this will let me cast spells like you do. Not precisely, no. For as much as angels know of Eno Kion, we are but ants in comparison to the throne. We connect to the throne and lean on it heavily while casting spells in much the same way that a mortal will connect to an angel. One day, if this all succeeds, I'd like to try connecting you directly to the throne. But no mortal has ever done that before. Which is why we're starting with this. Something mortals have done in the past, even if it has been relatively rare. Alyssa fell silent in thought. Her first instinct was to deny the opportunity. In the whole history of humans on Earth, she was to embark on something only a few had ever done. Probably less than ten by the sound of things. And several people had apparently died in the attempt. That felt far too risky. At the same time, she had a niggling sensation that, if she didn't agree, she might never be able to return home again. Maybe Iorelan could find a way. Alyssa wouldn't even give her bad odds of finding a spell to get to Earth. The real problem was Tenebrail. As long as that angel was standing vigil over the barrier between worlds, to use a metaphorical term, Iorulan would likely be blocked completely. Even if Iorulan's spell worked, Tenebrail would pop up to take everyone back to not instantly. And if she didn't, then they ran the risk of attracting other angelic attention. Although she had survived it, her encounter with Ardril had been unpleasant to say the least. And Ardril was only an archangel. If Seraphim did show up, she wasn't sure that human magic would help at all. Not to mention the fact that no one else would be able to help her. No one else could see angels. Just Alyssa. While she relied on others for day-to-day -day matters, Alyssa would always have to rely on herself and only herself when it came to angels. With that in mind, how could she possibly shoot this opportunity down? Hesitantly, Alyssa held out her hand. She took a deep breath and locked eyes with Tenebrail. Do it. Alyssa, wasn't quite certain what was going on. She could remember her last thoughts well enough. She had held out her hand for Tenebrail, accepting the angel's offer of more power. Which sounded terrible when phrased like that. Like she was some kind of children's supervillain. But it was all for a good reason. Which was also a super villainy thing to say focus on what you're feeling. Try to seek me out. It will help. Tenebrail had said that. Alyssa distinctly remembered her melodious voice turning deadly serious. But, what am I feeling, the classroom was gone. Along with it went the desks, the posters, the whiteboard, and the rest of the school. The physical objects weren't all that had gone. As far as Alyssa could tell, everything else had disappeared as well. Even that slight crick in her neck from sleeping on Ps Heights's clean yet lumpy bedding wasn't bothering her at the moment. Nothing bothered her. All her woes and thoughts just seemed so insignificant. Worries that kept her up at nights fleeted into the ether. The Taker. Meh. Octavia. A. Cassita. Iorulan. Plagues. 
Why bother? Alisa drifted aimlessly. Or, maybe she didn't. Her thoughts drifted. She had those for sure. But her body. Something told her that she should be alarmed that it appeared to be missing at the moment. Body, she called out without a mouth. Where did you go? Focus, Alisa Meadows her body answered. This is harder than I thought it would be. Because I'm a Dominion. Hum. The voice resounded everywhere and nowhere all at once. The last bit was quieter. Almost like her body was talking to herself. A silly thought, but it was true. Alisa looked around for the source, but it was hard to look around without a head. Not to mention her lack of eyes. Still, she felt a slight pull to her, left. Directions were hard with no point of reference. For a few minutes, Alisa did nothing but stare in the direction of the pool. For as much as she could stare, anyway. It really wasn't any of her business. If her body wanted to be all the way over, wherever she was, that was her body's business. But wasn't her body's business also hers, even if it was, Alisa just about let it slide. What did she need a body for anyway? but there was an irritating scratch buried deep beneath all the apathy. Tenebrail had said to focus on her feelings and irritation was definitely a feeling. But what was she irritated about? Alisa had to sit and ponder. It wasn't her body. Even now, she couldn't bring herself to care about her. It was her. The real her. Alisa. How she was acting. Alisa hated sitting still. In a metaphorical way. She didn't mind sitting. It was a lack of progress that she loathed. She needed to be doing something. To accomplish something. To set goals for herself and enact steps that would lead to those goals coming ever closer into her grasp. Here and now, listlessly drifting through a sea of vacant void, she was accomplishing nothing. She started drifting toward her body. Her body did not matter in and of herself. She was just the impetus required to get her moving. The complete lack of anything else in her surroundings to focus on didn't help. Her body was the only thing she thought she could reach in this place. Whatever this place was, it was hard to tell if she was actually moving. There were no landmarks, no frames of reference. She had no feelings or sensations. She couldn't even tell if she was getting closer to her body. Maybe if she called out again. It had worked the first time body, she said. I'm coming for you. Alisa waited, listening for a response. The first time, a response had come almost instantly. Now. Like everything else, time didn't exist, but it still took time for her to hear anything I don't think I've ever been unnerved before her body said with no small tone of trepidation in her voice. But I guess there is a first time for everything. The voice was closer. So close she could almost reach it. If only she had hands. Undeterred, Alisa stretched herself. All she had to do was touch her body. Then she would have accomplished her goal. After that, maybe a break was in order. A long rest before she found something else to do. But until she touched her body, she couldn't go back to her aimless drifting. So she stretched up. Good. You've got it. Just a little, it was so close. Alisa could almost touch it. Just a little, there. Reconfiguring soul matrices. Granting access to throne miracle engine class saint through proxy dominion tenor braille. Credentials authenticated and confirmed. Welcome to sainthood, Alisa Meadows. Alisa jerked back, knocking over the desk. She would have fallen right on top of it, probably injuring herself in the process, had Tenebrail not still had a firm grasp of her hand. She followed her arm, noting as the darker skin met with Tenebrail's grey. She continued up the arm until she reached Tenebrail's luminous white eyes. Her heart burst into flames. She tore her hand out of Tenebrail's grasp, clutching it to her chest like the angel had been a hot stove. The classroom had returned. The vapid drift had ended. Her body, her real body, not whatever she had been chasing after in the, had it been a dream, it felt like it was on fire. 
Sometimes, when Tenebrail touched her, she felt similar. A sensation she could only describe as glory radiated off angels. But right now, that feeling was coming from inside glowing eyes. Did not expect that. Tenebrail leaned in a little closer, staring unerringly with such intensity that Alyssa wanted to run and hide. You mentioned glowing eyes before, did you not? I believe I forgot to follow up on that. What, what the hell was that? Alyssa breathed. What is, this? Her voice was labelled, like she wasn't getting enough air to speak full sentences at once yes. You do seem to be having an odd reaction. I'm not sure if it is because I am a dominion or if you, are just being you. How do you feel? How do I feel? If she had more air, she might have shouted, but she couldn't. Her words came in breathy gasps. It's, rather rapturous she settled on. How else to describe it? I hate it. She took a few moments to simply breathe. Tenebrail stared all the while, but Alyssa slowly stood fully, dropping her shirked posture. When she finally felt like she could talk without gasping every third word, she shot the angel a death glare. You said that people didn't even know it was happening to them. I call bullshit on that. Normally, this sort of thing is done by guardians. There are a lot more. How to put it? She tapped a black fingernail to the black paint on her lips. They're more human than most angels. That feeling you're experiencing is probably because I'm a dominion. I imagine it is far less of a shock to connect through something that shares similarities. Alyssa let out a shuddering sigh. Is it going to stop? Is it painful? Tenebrail shot back, looking far more worried than she had been. I will terminate the connection immediately. No. It's not painful. Just, very uncomfortable. A visible calm took over Tenebrail. Very real worry bled out of the angel. Seeing her with actual panic in her eyes was a strange experience. Had Alyssa not known about Angel's aversion to harming mortals, she might have thought something terribly wrong had happened good. Good. Excellent. See. I told you it would work. Yeah right Alyssa said with a minor scoff. She still wasn't entirely sure what it was. And, from the sound of it, she wasn't entirely sure that Tenebrail knew either. Considering the angel had just asked for unconditional trust, it seemed like she should have a better grasp of the process, if not actual experience in the matter. That floaty place. It had to have been her soul being drawn out. Some limbo like state where she wasn't fully attached to her body. The sensation of the place was fading like a dream might, but she remembered enough to know that it had been a deeply unsettling place and she hadn't even realized until she got out. Not a very comfortable thought. She almost asked Tenebrail to confirm her likely self-evident suspicion when a more interesting thought popped into her head so, can I cast miracles now? Just raise my hand and, Tenebrail grabbed Alice's arm and lowered it back down to her side. Why don't we hold off on that for now? Let your body get acclimatized to our connection. That sounds sensible, Alyssa thought. As much as she wanted magic circles appearing at her fingertips, she still wasn't feeling normal. Her breathing had steadied out, but that heat in her chest was as intense as ever. Was it ever going to die down, thinking about it reminded Alyssa of something else Tenebrail had said. She stepped away, moving toward the teacher's desk. It had a small mirror hanging on the wall. Just a little thing that the teacher might use to adjust their hair or makeup in the middle of the day. Alyssa leaned down and stared at herself. Or rather, she stared at her eyes. Tenebrail was right. They were glowing. Bright white with darker lines right around where the edges of her irises should have been, just like Tenebrail's eyes. If this was the first time her eyes had glowed, Alyssa would have suspected that she was stealing Tenebrail's look because of whatever connection they shared at the moment. Her soul was attached to Tenebrail, somehow, and there was definitely feedback from Tenebrail to her. 
The feeling in her chest confirmed that and it made sense from an outside perspective if she was supposed to be channeling magic, or whatever, from Tenebrail. But it wasn't the first time. Her eyes had glowed bright white just as they were now back when she had torn apart Ardril's spells. Tenebrail hadn't been involved. If every angel had the same glowing eyes, she could still have dismissed it as simply being filled with angelic magic. But that wasn't the case at all. Iosfiel's eyes were green with little cross-shaped pupils and didn't glow all that much. Ardril had nearly uniform red eyes without pupils to speak of. The glow itself didn't bother her too much. Perhaps it should have, but she saw it as having absorbed a significant amount of magic. There was a phrase, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And if the soul was at all involved with magic, which everything so far had pointed toward, then this was just some excess magic leaking from her eyes. As long as it wasn't harmful, Alyssa didn't care. And if it was harmful, Tenebrail would have done something already. The real problem was the look of the glow. Turning from the mirror, Alyssa faced Tenebrail. Why do my eyes look like yours do? They were glowing like this a week ago after I absorbed Ardril's spells. It is strange, isn't it? Of course, Alyssa grumbled with a sigh. Why bother asking you? All I get in response is an I don't know every time. I didn't say that I didn't know just that it is strange. Then, Tenebrail swept closer, leaning a bit inside Alice's personal space. Do me a favor and close your eyes. Ah, right. Alice gave Tenebrail a bit of a wary stare, but she complied now, what do you see? My eyes are closed. I didn't ask if your eyes were opened or closed, I asked what you see. Still with her eyes closed, Alice raised an eyebrow. What kind of an answer did the stupid angel expect? There must be something that she was missing. What was she supposed to see? Darkness. Her eyes were closed. There were lights on in the room and the sun was coming in through the window, so it wasn't complete darkness but that slightly red of the inside of her eyelids. Still, it wasn't anything strange am I looking for anything in particular? Because I don't, see there was something about having her eyes closed. A familiar floaty sensation, not unlike how she had felt while having her soul drawn out. It was different. She felt far more normal. Her sensations were all there and she didn't have that overwhelmingly calm apathy bogging her down. But there was more than just nothing, this time. Alyssa turned her head, following a form as it moved about. Putting words to the form was difficult. It wasn't like she was seeing at all. It wasn't a blob or another shape, it didn't have colors. But there was something there. And another one. Lots of them. They danced about, staying mostly to themselves. But every once in a while, the forms would touch each other. Parts of the forms would be left behind as they interacted, sharing bits and pieces with each other. The bits would become part of whatever larger form they had attached to. A larger form stood off from the others. Its interactions were slightly different. Instead of merely interacting with those closest, many pieces would launch themselves away from the main form to the many smaller ones. Little pieces of them would dart back, but not to the same degree. Still, it never seemed to shrink despite giving away far more than it was taking children in the neighboring classrooms, Tenebrail said and the teacher. Alice's eyes snapped open. Just like that, the forms were gone. The math class came back, flooding her senses with the normality of regular reality. She didn't say a word as she looked into Tenebrail's glowing eyes angels and the magics we use are extremely intertwined with souls, as you might expect. By absorbing Ardril's miracles and by being connected to me, you've become infused with angelic magic. Ah. Apparently Alyssa had been wrong. It wasn't excess magic leaking from her eyes as she had expected but rather angelic magic itself. I wonder if you were only able to manipulate the souls of those society members you crystallized because you were infused with angelic glory at the time. It is a difficult thing to test without going and killing several people, and I know you've got an aversion to such things. I'll try to be around when you go on another murderous rampage. 
We can test both with and without your eyes glowing. Alison narrowed her eyes. Gee. Thanks. Tenor Braille gave a mocking bow. Or maybe it was genuine. It was hard to tell but Alyssa said, that doesn't answer the question of why they are glowing like your eyes instead of Adril or Iosphiel or any other angel. Tell me, do you ever hear a phrase or, maybe a song? You listen and you like it. But then, later on, you hear a different version. Maybe the different version is actually the original version, but you still like the one you first heard. I. I guess. I know I was the first angel you ever saw, but even with those others, it is touching that you would model yourself after me. Alyssa crossed her arms. If her eyes weren't already narrowed, she would have shot ten braille a glare. You're saying that they're white and glowing because I saw you first. If I had seen Io's file, they would have been green. Possibly she said with a smile. Her tone did turn a little more serious as she shrugged. I'm also far more, involved with souls than many angels. My eyes weren't always like this. Once upon a time, they were almost solidly black. They became like this shortly after I started consuming souls. I wouldn't have expected yours to glow with quite the intensity of mine given your lack of experience in dealing with souls, but you also seem to break a lot of rules when magic is concerned. Still working on figuring that one out she added as an aside any preliminary theories. You must have an inherent connection to the endless expanse. Whether through an accident at birth or a fault in the plan, I'm unsure. It is the only thing that makes sense to me, though. And, it is the main reason why I think drawing out your soul to connect with the throne will work. Is that more or less dangerous than what we just did? In terms of your soul. Roughly the same, I think. The real problem is just connecting. The throne encompasses all. I can feel it now as if I were seated on its crystalline surface. But the problem, for you, is that you might have trouble connecting. I was here and calling to you. The throne will be silent. Alyssa shuddered a little. She had been lost, floating in nothingness during her connection to Tenor Braille. What would have happened had she not heard Tenor Braille's voice calling out to her? Would she have just been lost forever? Surely not. If it had gone on too long, Tenor Braille would have shoved her soul back into her body, probably don't worry. We know that this is possible Tenor Braille said, gesturing between herself and Alyssa. We'll let you get used to this, then we'll sever the connection and spend some time practicing drawing out your soul. I'll keep helping you until you get a little more confident. After that, we'll see how well you deal with silence. If you get that down with regularity, we'll move on to the throne. So you'll be severing it soon. Alyssa asked, unable to keep a slight hope from her voice. It really was uncomfortable. But Tenor Braille just chuckled. Not yet. We'll leave you like this until we're done here. Speaking of... She made a show of glancing up to the clock despite almost certainly not needing mortal timekeeping implements. It is almost time. It's still day out. If only the evils of man stayed only in the dark, the world would be a softer place. Alyssa rolled her eyes at the tabloid tagline, but decided not to comment. Who is the victim? Not another conspiracy theorist. Well, I didn't take the time to get to know him. He wasn't in the military, if that is what you are asking. He is a man who has been working as a programmer for the same company for several years. His position in the company has no prospects, but he feels some loyalty to his boss and doesn't seek new employment. Part of that is because of his sloth and reluctance to engage with new people. Not a secret serial killer or something, is he? Not that I know of. Good. Good. Maybe I'll actually get a chance to speak with him before we head off to Nod. Dropping you into the world with no knowledge worked well enough. I don't know why you see a need to mess with what isn't broken. Alyssa shrugged. If Tenor Braille couldn't understand why someone might want the courtesy of a quick word or two before being thrown into a whole new place, no amount of explaining would help. Where are we headed to? 
a small bar on the outskirts of the city she said, walking closer. Her wings spread wide around Alyssa before pulling her into a tight embrace. The last of the classroom's light vanished behind her feathers and Alyssa felt that familiar sensation of being transported to a new location. Alyssa had expected another dingy alley. Shady bars were always supposed to be adjacent to alleys with flickering lights and eerie atmospheres. There obviously wouldn't be any flickering lights in the middle of the day, but there should still be a spot for the alley once darkness fell. This bar had apparently missed the memo. The building looked relatively nice. A wood exterior, stained a rich amber, had an almost welcoming tone to it. The only thing Alyssa would identify as creepy would be the partitioned off area for the large trash bin. It had a locked fence to keep scavengers out and some leafless vines had been working their way up the metal links. But that was it. Maybe that was good business. Alyssa really didn't know the standard. Not being a socialite, she really hadn't visited many bars, even after turning 21. All of her high school friends had moved away or simply drifted apart by that point, so she hadn't had anyone to go with. And she certainly hadn't been about to go on her own. Thinking about it now, she was having trouble coming up with the name of a single bar. They just weren't a major part of her lifestyle. In fact, she had probably visited more taverns on not than she had bars on earth. Or maybe her impressions of reality were just a bit too colored by Hollywood to be accurate to real life. The bar was not the only building around, but it was pretty close. The other side of the road was nothing but overgrown grass. It might have been a field at one point, but it had clearly fallen into disuse. There was a restaurant a short parking lot away. A little mom and pop style diner. It looked quaint enough. Maybe Tenebrail could do something to let Alyssa eat there while talking things over with, the victim. Tenebrail's description of the person had left out the name, something Alyssa only just realized. She peeked in the window, just under the lit near an open sign. Was he already inside? There were a few people despite the relatively early hour. A trio of women maybe only a few years younger than Alyssa, looked like they were celebrating something. A birthday maybe, whatever it was, none of them were the victims. The bartender. He was pouring a drink for another customer, but it couldn't be him. Tenebrail had said that the victim was a programmer. Unless he worked multiple jobs, it wouldn't be him. The man he was serving, on the other hand, looked the very picture of a programmer. At least, what Alyssa imagined when she heard the profession's name. He was slouched forward with an extremely unhealthy arch in his back. But then his neck went straight up from that slumped posture. How did his spine even work? He had a set of thin framed glasses on his head of the rectangular variety. Those, might be a problem for him depending on how blind he was without them. He would have to be careful. Getting new glasses in not would not be a simple task. One other person sat alone at a table, eating a larger meal than Alyssa imagined they served at bars. He wore a leather jacket and had a gruff beard covering his rugged face. He probably owned the motorcycle that was parked in front of the window Alyssa was peering through. Not exactly programmer material, in Alyssa's opinion. If he was, Alyssa would buy a hat and eat that for dinner. She couldn't see anyone else from the window but a decent amount of the room was simply out of sight. Not to mention the kitchens and other back rooms. Although, blinking, Alyssa scowled. Right in the very center, at one of the empty tables, Tenebrail had taken a seat for herself. She smiled and waved as Alyssa caught sight of her. That wave turned to a beckoning gesture which then pointed to the chair next to her. Alyssa glanced to the door. Wouldn't the people inside notice it opening and closing? She might be invisible, but it definitely wasn't. Then again, Tenebrail wouldn't have waved her inside if it would have disrupted everything. Sighing, Alyssa opened the door. The bell hung over the door didn't make a sound. Nobody looked up or stared. The women laughed about a joke one of them had made. The biker had another buffalo wing up to his mouth. The bartender and the man seated across from him spoke softly as the former passed a glass to the latter. Sighing, Alyssa walked up to the angel and dragged the chair across the ground. 
even with the scraping noise it made, nobody offered her so much as a glance. Whatever perception filter Tenebrail had put on them clearly worked on anything they interacted with as well. She opened her mouth, about to ask just what they needed to do, Tenebrail hadn't handed her a gun or anything so far, when she spotted him. Her voice caught in her throat. He sat in a corner of the room. A blind spot of the window. The man, whose name she didn't even know, who had tried to kill her was staring right at her. His eyes were dead. Void of life. Even though it had only been a week, he looked far worse than he had the last time she had seen him. His cheeks were gaunt, drawn tight around his skull. The scraggly scruff of greying beard made him look worse than Chris had the night she pulled him out of that alley. Alyssa tore her eyes away, glaring at Tenebrail. You could have warned me she grumbled. I almost had a heart attack. Ah. Try to avoid that if possible the angel said. When Alyssa didn't respond, she just shrugged. I've already made the false body. A much more convincing one, in my opinion. With more than a few minutes of notice, I had the opportunity to be a little more artistic in my work. As for the soul, holding out her hand, a diamond of a gemstone floated in the air. Would you like to know his history, she asked, letting the soul bob up and down. Make sure he fits your criteria of who deserves a second death. Teeth ground together, Alyssa glared. Just. He was evil, right? A slaver, rapist, and murderer. If that's what you mean. Good. Then I don't need to know anything else. I don't want to know anything else. If it helps Tenebrail said, sliding the gemstone back between her feathers. The main event will happen in roughly 15 minutes. We're slightly early, but this will be a bit more complicated if we want to do it your way. There are other people around which means that I cannot just pull out the body and plop it down as I did last time. You can't stop time and do it then. There are other angels on earth. They will take note of something like that. What about this perception filter you've got that keeps them from noticing us? That is in the plan. But it must be a seamless transition. We don't want people to notice the position of the body jumping six feet to the side before it gets shot. And you cannot hesitate like you did last time. If our fake starts clawing at his face or talking in strange languages, it is going to cause problems. I trust you will be handling that. The transition part. She could. No. She would pull the trigger when necessary. No hesitation. But Alyssa couldn't imagine herself trying to shove a body into a position in the blink of an eye, so the question was probably unnecessary. Still, it wouldn't be the first time that Tenebrail had suddenly sprung something on her indeed. However, you'll need to be standing next to our deceased friend over there. Bullets travel fast enough and there is enough of a flash that nobody will notice you shooting from a few inches to one side, but the bullets do need to be traveling in the right direction. So I am shooting again. That was good. Relatively. She did not want to have to stab someone over and over again you'll need to strike in the neck Tenebrail said, tapping her throat just under her chin. And one bullet should miss. Hit that television in the corner of the room. Why do I need to hit the TV if you can harm non-human things? Bits of plastic wind up embedded in the bartender's skin. Not lethal but not something I can do. Alyssa glanced over to find a flat screen television showing a game of curling. United States versus Canada, it looked like. Nobody in the bar seemed to be paying much attention to it, though the bartender did glance up every few moments. The person who Alyssa assumed was the programmer did look at it as well, but every time he did, his gaze drifted over to the man in the corner of the room. He would stare for a moment before averting his eyes. Was it recognition? Alice's would be murderer probably had his face in the news at this point. Despite her phone and its connection to the internet, she hadn't been keeping up with current events on Earth. Still, if she remembered right, his son's body had been found alongside hers. 
it wouldn't be difficult for law enforcement to figure out who he was and find some photographs of him for public dissemination. Looking around, Alisa tried to figure out how everything went down. Surely the programmer didn't go up to confront a known murderer. That would be, she wanted to say crazy, but, she had done something extremely similar with the taker. Of course, the taker had been after her. Here. The programmer surely wasn't being actively hunted. Still, with the way he looked over, he had to know something. Whatever he was planning would have gotten him killed in another reality. Now, it would just get him sent to Nod. Which, based on his lanky stature, might be a death sentence for the man regardless. Poor guy. Maybe he could find a job as a scrivener. Or, if he could use magic like Alisa could, maybe he could find a profession as a respectable arcanist. He might even be able to help work on getting back to Earth on a more permanent basis if he could use magic, though Alisa doubted it. Having seen the nightmare that was angelic math, she doubted anyone could help Dot with the possible exception of Iorulan. Alisa needed to find a way to bring Tenebrail's lessons to Iorulan. Unfortunately, Tenebrail had stolen her phone again. Memorizing that board would have been impossible. Drawing out the soul would be difficult to replicate without Tenebrail's help. Tenebrail had said that Alisa would have to try it on her own at some point in the future, but it would still be difficult. And would probably end up killing Iorulan. Something to think on later. You haven't handed me a gun this time, Alisa said, turning back to Tenebrail. Last time, she had the gun in hand before they had ventured to the scene of the crime. In response, Tenebrail reached back to her feathers again. This time, she withdrew a familiar pistol. A duplicate, she said, nodding toward the murderer. He needs to be seen with one at the same time as you firing it. And you're sure nobody will notice. There aren't security cameras in the room. As she asked, Alisa glanced around. She didn't see any but that didn't necessarily mean that there weren't any around it should be fine. Tenebrail slid the pistol across the table. Already loaded and ready to go. I suggest heading over to that table. Things will be starting soon. I've got my own preparations to make. Alisa couldn't help the slight shudder as she glanced to the corner of the room. He was a murderer. A thief who had broken into a home and would have killed her had it not been for divine intervention, ironically enough. He would have killed another few people without her dot would have. In reality, the guy was dead. Actually dead. There was no killing intent behind those eyes. Nothing at all. A puppet of Tenebrail. Little else. That honestly didn't make her feel better at all. She wasn't sure which she would have preferred sitting next to, the murderer or the puppet. Neither, really. But, despite her misgivings, Alisa complied with Tenebrail. She didn't want the Astral Authority destroying any worlds in the near future. Or the far future. Alisa moved up just behind him, wrinkling her nose at the smell. It had probably been a month since he had a shower. She took a step back fingering the safety of the pistol as she tried to get a little fresh air. Looking over to Tenebrail again, Alisa started. Another person was in the room now. Or rather. One person was in the room twice. Alisa had guessed correctly. The glasses-wearing slouching man was indeed the programmer. She probably should have confirmed with Tenebrail, but seeing the limp body floating in front of the angel was confirmation enough. Poor guy. With Chris, she had felt fairly confident in his ability to survive after being dropped into a strange world. He had a military background and had lived on the streets. Both of which would lead to survivalist tendencies. He had called her phone a hundred times after a few hours, but that was likely due to how alien everything was rather than an emergency need for food and shelter. In fact, since meeting with him, her phone hadn't rung once. Thinking about it that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Once she got back to Nod, she would check in with him first thing. On the other hand, this programmer was probably one of those people who needed modern society as much as it needed him. Just call me a prophet, Alisa thought to herself as she watched the man stare at the corner again, 
because I foresee a significant increase in phone calls in my future. Alice's would be murder a tensed up. It took her a moment to realize why. None of the people around the room had changed all that much. Certainly nobody was looking at him more now than they had before. But, listening, Alisa could hear the faint sounds of a siren in the distance. The programmer, who had been looking increasingly sweaty and nervous over the past few minutes, let out a sigh of relief as he pocketed his phone. He must have called the police. Or texted them. Was that standard protocol? To cruise to a known armed and dangerous murderer with sirens blaring. It seemed like it would, do exactly what it was doing. Maybe the sirens were for something else entirely, but neither of the men who heard them knew that. The murderer abruptly stood. Seeing that, the programmer stood as well. Alisa wanted to head over and shout at him. What the hell did he think he was doing? He was going to get himself killed if he acted like that. In fact, it was the whole reason Alisa was here. Because he did get himself killed in only a few minutes. Didn't the news advise against approaching armed murderers, if it did, it didn't stop the programmer from putting himself right between the door and the murderer you can't leave. I I can't let you leave. Despite putting himself in the path of the exit, the programmer refused to look up and meet anyone's eyes. His eyes were glued to the murderer's hand. UK killed that little girl. Little girl. I'm 25. He, obviously, didn't hear Alisa. Tenna Braille did, if her little giggle was any indication get ready for my signal, Alisa Meadows. Right. Heart hammering, she flicked off the safety and rested her finger on the trigger guard. It would be soon. Her heart was hammering in her chest. Probably not as hard as anyone else's chests, but still. She could feel the sweat on her palms despite already knowing how everything was supposed to play out. What if she messed something up? What if she fired too early and hit the real programmer? Or what if the bullet ricocheted off the wall behind the television and hit someone else? This wasn't just a dark alley with a single target and no chance of failure. There were people around. People who had taken notice of the situation. The trio of girls had fallen silent and Buffalo Wing Biker had lowered a half-eaten wing to his plate. Even the bartender had stopped his work, moving to stand at a different part of the bar. A part directly beneath the television. The only real sound in the room came from the curling match, where the United States just scored get out of the way. Alisa glanced back. The murderer's voice sounded almost pleading. But it didn't get through. The programmer shook his head, planting his feet firmly in place. A chair scraped across the floor. The biker stood up. The murderer whipped his head over, spotted the movement. As he turned back to the programmer, he pulled his pistol. Get down, he said, voice less pleading and more firm. Instead of complying like any sensible man should have done, the programmer reached out. It was almost like he was trying to grab the gun, but he missed his mark. His wrist smacked into the gun and knocked it to the side. The gun went off, startling Alisa. But it missed, sending a cloud of building dust falling from the ceiling. One of the girls started screaming. The biker grabbed hold of the back of his chair, maybe to throw it or maybe to charge over and smash him over the head. Alisa. Aim. She couldn't watch the biker anymore. Holding the pistol with both hands, she aimed right over the murderer's shoulder at the programmer's neck ready tenor braille said. As the angel spoke, Alisa watched almost in slow motion how the other pistol lowered from where it hit the ceiling to be aimed right alongside Alisa's line of fire armed. Now. Alisa could see it the moment tenor braille spoke. The fear and worry behind the programmer's glasses shifted to confusion. It was a nearly identical expression to what Chris Duplicate had put on immediately before he started trying to tear off his face. He opened his mouth. Alisa could see the scream on his lips. She pulled the trigger. Blood splattered around the room as a chunk of his neck vanished. He collapsed to the ground, rolling back and forth as he screamed. To anyone else, it might look like he was screaming because of the widening pool of blood spreading out behind his twisted form. 
All Alyssa could see was a man who had died once now suffering through a second death in a body not his own. In her momentary shock, she almost missed the murderer shove past. He sprinted toward the door. Just before he reached it, he swung his gun arm back behind him the television. Tenebrail shouted. Heart still hammering, Alyssa pivoted where she stood. She took a moment to aim. And she pulled the trigger. As soon as she felt the recoil in her hands, black feathers encompassed her. The smoky scent of the bar vanished as the feathers obscured her vision. What did you think you were doing? Are you insane? The programmer sat across from Alyssa, looking around with a bleary expression. Three thick slices of French toast sat on the table in front of him, swimming in maple syrup. A dollop of whipped cream had been plopped on top, cradling a single strawberry. To its side, a glass of orange juice stood tall. Condensation on the side of the glass dripped down to a cork coaster protecting the wooden table. Maybe it was a bit late for breakfast foods, but Alyssa, who had an identical plate in front of her, hadn't had French toast in forever and Tenebrail's assortment of meals had not included this particular delicacy. But the programmer didn't seem to care. He just blinked his eyes as he looked around the little diner. It was a strange scene. Nobody was eating, though there were a few partially touched meals. Everyone was up at the windows, watching police and ambulances. Most had their phones out, recording the situation. Some people were out giving statements, having apparently witnessed the murderer running away. Flashing red and blue lights washed over the room every second. Dot in a surreal twist, Alyssa was just sitting right in the middle of the diner with a bite of French toast skewered on her fork. She wasn't paying attention to all the commotion. To her and the programmer, the rest of the world no longer mattered. Though he seemed to be having a bit of trouble comprehending anything. She waved the chunk of toast at him, taking care not to splatter syrup everywhere. Well, congratulations. You didn't stop the murderer and now he has killed you. With Chris, she had been taken by surprise and tried to soften the blow. Her approach this time was to be blunt. Less chance of misunderstanding that way, hopefully. He reacted to that. Blinking his eyes again, he turned back to Alyssa. He only met her eyes for a moment before he averted his gaze, staring down at his plate. Kay killed me. Killed you. Alyssa chomped down on the bite of food. She waved her now empty fork at the window. That right there. That's your body being wheeled away. It's headed to the morgue. That might not have been a perfectly true statement. Alyssa didn't know where they took bodies right after a murder. Maybe an autopsy laboratory. But for the two of them. Who cared? Using his middle finger on the corner of his rectangular glasses, he bumped them up on his face as he looked over to the window. Standing, he staggered over to join the other gawkers. The body was zipped up in a black bag, so he wouldn't be able to see anything, but that there was a body at all might come as a shock. Alyssa kept an eye on him, but didn't join him. Instead, she focused on eating while watching him press his nose to the glass dot as the medical staff wheeled the body back to the ambulance, a few feathers popped into the air. Blue feathers. An angel quickly followed. This one had long purple hair, with a slight pink tint to parts of it, and wore striped stockings. For a moment, Alyssa tensed. Tenebrail was standing just behind her. Would they be spotted, but, no. The angel brushed her feathered wings over the body bag without even glancing at it. She disappeared almost before the whole soul had crystallized in her hands. Alyssa shot a glance back to Tenebrail, who just shrugged, before shrugging herself. Given Iosfiel's dedication to her job, she would have expected more angels to be a little more, well, dedicated. But the two she had seen on Earth so far seemed to carry about their duties with all the apathy of a postal worker. The programmer didn't react to the angel appearing. He hadn't reacted to Tenebrail either, but she hadn't popped out of nothing. That basically confirmed that he couldn't see them. For a long few minutes, he didn't even move. He just stared. Alyssa finished one full slice of toast before he finally twitched. A phone rang out with a high-pitched warble, 
coming from a waitress to his side. She immediately answered and started talking a mile a minute. From the half a conversation that Alyssa could hear, her mother had heard about the incident and was calling to make sure her daughter was all right. It was around the time the daughter started talking about some dude in a body bag that it seemed to dawn on the programmer that he really was dead. He reached out a hand and started waving it in front of one of the customers who was recording. Not only did the person not respond to his movements, but his hand didn't appear on the camera as it passed. That gave him a little start, but not quite as big of one as Alyssa had been expecting. By the time Alyssa ate through her second slice of French toast, the programmer had turned back to her. Sort of. He still only looked at her briefly before looking down to the plate of food dead, huh? He shook his head back and forth. Maybe his lack of a real reaction was just shock. I had it all planned out. I thought about it over and over again. Played it over in my mind. How I would approach him. How I would stop him. I thought about everything that he could possibly do and what I would do in response. I had it all planned out he said again with a long sigh. Leaning back in the chair, he looked up at the ceiling. Should have figured my plan would fail. They always do. Ah, uh, ha Alyssa hummed, quirking an eyebrow. This guy, might be insane. Just her luck so who are you then, the Grim Reaper? D-Death. He finally made eye contact. This time, it lasted a few moments before he turned away. I always knew that if the Grim Reaper wasn't all bones and scythes, it would be a cute girl. D do you have a scythe? Ah, uh, yes. But I'm not the Grim Reaper. An elbow rested on Alice's shoulder. Just my little Reaper Tenebrail said as she poked Alyssa in the cheek. Unless the programmer was unflappable to the point of ignoring an angel speaking, it could be safely said that he could not see Tenebrail. Not wanting to explain her talking to something that wasn't really there from his perspective, Alyssa did her best to ignore the stupid angel -o. He sounded so disappointed. You have a scythe but you're not the Grim Reaper. Does that really matter? I'm here to talk about you Alyssa said, pointing her empty fork at him. He winced and looked up at her again. This time, he narrowed his eyes after a moment. You look familiar. Familiar. It was Alyssa's turn to blink. A different her might have said it was a coincidence, but... Was my face all over the news? Snapping his fingers, he pointed at her. The news. You're her. The glowing eyes threw me off, but I recognize you. The little girl, that, man, killed. His voice grew quieter with every word. Breaking eye contact, he stared around the room. What is going on? Why would you meet me after my death? Shouldn't it be like my grandparents or something if it isn't the Grim Reaper? First of all, I'm not a little girl. I'm 25. But, secondly, as far as Earth is concerned, you are dead Alyssa said. Technically, you aren't dead. That might explain the lack of grandparents or whatever. Or Angel's Tenebrail added. I would like to report that our soul was taken without apparent notice by the angel in charge of this man's soul. Yeah, I noticed, Alyssa thought not dead. It might be best to think of it as if you were. You won't be able to interact with anyone on Earth ever again. In fact, you might never see Earth ever again. Something Alyssa said made him perk up. She wasn't quite sure what, but his back suddenly straightened and he smiled for the first time since, well, since Alyssa first saw him in the bar I'm going to another world, he asked with no small amount of eagerness in his voice how, did you know? She had just been thinking that he was excited about being alive. Apparently that was not the case oh, I bet it has all kinds of tropes. What? Magic. Yes, but not everyone can use it, so don't get too excited. That's fine. That's fine. I'm the intellectual type he said, adjusting his glasses again. Intellectuals are always casters. Is it a medieval society? Sort of, how do you, that might be inconvenient but I can deal with it. 
What about monster girls? Ah, there are monsters. Some of them are female, I knew it. He pumped his fist. This is just like one of my Japanese animes, I always wanted to say that. I mean, I say it all the time, but in a sort of ironic way. Now it is literal. When do we get to go? Now. Ah, uh, what the hell am I supposed to say to that? Maybe she was being unfair, but this guy was more insane than the conspiracy theorist. He was going to get himself killed inside of a day. Just to warn you, this world isn't a vacation. Many monsters are probably going to try to kill you on sight. Gangs regularly rob and enslave people. The main city gets attacked by warring nations regularly, he was nodding his head, making humming noises as if everything she was saying fit into his view of this new world. And if you die, an angel will show up and she'll eat your soul. That got him to stop nodding along. What does that mean, he asked after a moment no more second chances. You die again, you die for good. But eating my soul. I mean, is she at least a cute angel? Alice aside, shooting a glance to a preening tenebrae will go on the stupid angel said, completely full of herself. You can tell him the truth. Fine. She's a right bitch Alyssa said, making tenebrae I'll put on a powder. Look. You're going to get yourself killed with that attitude. You want my advice? Find a nice simple job and keep your head down. In other words, don't do what I did is there an adventurer's guild? Yes. And I'm sure they're looking for a scribe. Literacy rates in this world are poor. He started nodding his head again. Alyssa had to wonder if he heard anything beyond the first word. Look. What's your name? You don't know it. I might have been in the news, but you weren't. She paused a moment as she glanced over his shoulder. There were still lights flashing like crazy, but most of the restaurant's staff had moved away from the window. The excitement must have started to die down. Not until today, at least. Right. Sorry. I'm Jason. Jason Styles. Jason. Please take my advice. Get a job as a scribe. A nice easy desk job. It might be similar to what you're used to, but that familiarity will be crucial to start with. Don't rush off looking for adventure. At least not until you've been in the world for some time and have had a chance to get acclimatized to the new environment. I won't be able to pop out of nowhere to save you again if you get yourself into trouble like you did today. Taking a deep breath, he held it, and slowly let it back out. All of a sudden, he seemed to realize that he was staring. He quickly dropped his eyes down to the table between them. Right. You're right. I'll probably just screw something up. I was getting too excited, but you're right. I'm still me. Still same old Jason Styles. I'll put you in touch with someone else from Earth. He's been there for a little over a week now and probably knows how to explain things to someone just jumping in better than I can. Having had a gradual introduction to the world, Alice's perspective was a bit different. And that wasn't including her association with Tenebrail and the other angels. Or her interactions with Iorulan. She made a mental note to keep Cassitar and Fila away from this guy, however what about you? Me. Aren't you going to be on this world too? Won't I see you? I'll be around. It's just, I've wound up causing too many big waves. Just last night, I wound up having daggers thrown at my head. Just after that, I found myself having to run for my life from a monster right out of your worst nightmares. If I associate with you too much, you might wind up facing danger daily. Before you say something stupid, no, it isn't fun. Isn't that all the more reason to stick together? You're from Earth too, right? Someone showed up when you died, offering this chance to visit a new world. Something like that Alyssa said after swallowing another quarter slice of French toast so you don't have many people to relate to there, right? I've been on not for, how long has it been since I, since I died? A full two months. 
If you get a handle on the world after a few weeks and think you can handle facing death on a daily basis, we'll see about meeting up more often. For now, Alisa pulled out a phone that Tenor Braille had prepared for her and slid it across the table. Like Chris' phone, it wasn't anything special. A brick of a flip phone. This has my phone number in it, listed as Alisa, and the number of the other. I don't like saying Earthling because it sounds like we're aliens, but his name is Chris. He looked down at it, staring like a princess might stare at a stain on her dress. It took a few moments before he even reached out a hand to pick it up. When he did, he used only the tips of two fingers to turn it around. I've got my own phone, but I thought you said this was a medieval society. Do they have cell towers? No. It's magic. Your phone won't work. Can't I just pull the SIM card, if you break it trying to get it to work, getting another one will be extremely difficult. It is the only bit of modern technology you'll have and there are only two other phones in the whole world that it can call. No internet. Afraid not. Yikes. Alisa shrugged, staring down to her empty plate. Maybe she could grab a bottle of syrup before they went back. Which, would have to be soon. Jason still had yet to touch his food, but he understandably had other things on his mind. She was about to point out that he probably wouldn't be having French toast ever again, but he spoke first so, if you're a regular earthling, why are your eyes glowing? Blinking twice, Alisa stumbled for a moment. Magic she settled on. Not because she was trying to hide Tenor Braille's existence from him as she might do to someone from Nod, he likely wouldn't accuse her of heresy or blasphemy but simply because everything was bound to be overwhelming before trying to explain absolutely everything. He didn't seem to like that answer. But how? And why? Does it give you enhanced vision or something? The whys and hows of magic are not my specialty. If you want to try to unravel the mysteries of the world, be my guest. I just use it to survive. Speaking of, Alisa reached into her satchel and pulled out a light spell card. Take this. Say light. Try to picture a little orb of light floating about. Light he mumbled, clearly not intending to cast the spell. He flipped the card over in his hands. A spell. You're giving me a spell. Disappointment about the phone forgotten, he stared at the design. What does it all mean? These symbols, are they part of a written language? Do I have to learn a new language on this world? I've tried learning Japanese, but I only know about 300 kanji. Not nearly enough to be fluent. Nobody seems to know what the symbols mean. They're used in spell creation and are stamped onto some other items, such as money. As she spoke, she pulled out a few bars of coins. She had been intending to hand them over sooner or later anyway. People speak and write in English, for some reason. Really? Weird. I thought so too, but wasn't going to question the convenience. So I just hold the card. Like this. He gripped it tight, wrinkling the card between his thumb and the curve of his forefinger. He didn't need to hold it to the point where it warped, but Alisa had cast spells caked with dirt and grime before, so it would probably be fine. At her nod, he grinned. Light. The card disappeared, warping into a ball of light. But it was, weak. Maybe it was all the light in the room from the sun and the fluorescent tubes, but Alisa could hardly see it. The first time she cast a spell, it had flared bright and brilliant. But it was more than Chris had managed. Despite being just a poor example of magic, Jason seemed pleased. He grinned wide as it whipped about back and forth to match the motion from his finger. She would have to come up with some tests to find out what rank he could cast at. Based on the weakness of the simplest spell, she was pretty sure he wouldn't get higher than rank 3. Still, she would try testing everything. Tenor Braille fluttered forward, waving a hand through the spell. The little orb of light vanished in the wake of her hand. Sorry to ruin your fun. If it went on for much longer, other angels might notice. In fact, we should probably leave, 
just to be on the safe side. Unaware of the angel's presence at his side, Jason's smile dropped. Doesn't last long, does it? It normally lasts longer. That's just a sign that it is time. Time. Time for what? Prepare yourself, Jason Styles, for this world is not long for you. Tenna Braille put her hands to her hips. Would you stop that? You can't just. Oh, never mind. Prepare your. Whatever. World transit using prepared statements. Her pointed fingernail lit up with a dark light as the triangular mystic circle appeared above their table. She didn't say another word before the earth vanished out from under Alice's feet. Chris Altrak was a surprisingly diligent man considering his former homeless status. He had jumped into the world feet first and, after getting a few pointers from Alisa, wound up doing well for himself. As well as someone could do in less than a week, that was dot he had moved into the inn Alisa had invited him to during their little discussion. It was one of the places Alisa had sought out for herself in case she ever had to leave Tzheitz's potion shop. Not the nicest place around, but he had a private room and a lock on the door. The larger tavern area on the floor below served food and wines. Tasteless stuff, but everything was in this world. Having only recently eaten a bounty of earth food, that fact was all the more apparent to Alisa. It was in that tavern that Alisa found Chris, seated in a corner and surrounded by a small group of people. It had her momentarily worried. But the reason for the gathering quickly became apparent. Plucky notes from a stringed instrument, a lute, filled the air. It sounded a bit, distorted at first. Bards didn't seem as common as Hollywood might suggest, but she had heard a few. It didn't sound bad, it just didn't sound like how a lute was supposed to sound. The first few notes sounded familiar, but it wasn't until he started singing that she realized just where she had heard the song She Keeps Her Moetit Chandon in Her Pretty Cabinet Let the Meat Cake She Says Just Like Marie Antoinette, shaking her head, Alisa waved Jason toward an empty table while she went up to the bar to order two small drinks. Having just had French toast, she wasn't in need of food. Jason hadn't eaten anything, but with how he was staring at everything, he likely wouldn't be hungry for a while. It also gave her a moment to speak with Gobtop, the proprietor of the tavern he's not disrupting your business, is he? Disrupting. Gobtop chuckled, sliding two pewter mugs across the smooth counter. That's my lute. Alisa raised an eyebrow. Her first thought was that Chris had stolen it, but... That didn't seem to be the case. Gobtop wouldn't be laughing about it if so. Chris probably wouldn't stick around in the tavern either. Musical instruments were probably a bit expensive. Far more than what Chris could afford. Before coming over, Alisa had called him to make sure that he was here. In that brief call, he had mentioned that he got an apprenticeship with a carpenter. Which had not been one of the jobs that Alisa had pointed out to him but it worked enough to afford him a room here. But not a Luta Bard came in the other day. Your friend convinced him to let him try. Almost threw him out immediately after, the noise was unbearable. But he seemed to learn quick enough with a few tips from the Bard. Now. More people in here tonight than I've had all week. Glancing around the room again, Alisa slowly nodded. There were several empty tables. Maybe even more than when she brought Chris over here for their little meeting. But around him. It wasn't quite a concert, but there was a definite crowd. If he kept this up, Gobtop might just end up the most profitable tavern around. The only thing missing was a piano accompaniment. But that might just be because Alisa was familiar with the real song. None of the people sitting and chatting around him knew what it was supposed to sound like. They probably didn't get half the lyrics either. Marie Antoinette. Krusk and Kennedy. Laser beams. They only knew that the music was strange and different from what the bards usually played. Dot without the exposure of television or radio, Alisa doubted that he could become a true medieval rock star, but he could definitely get some fans if he kept it up. Dot the song wound down to a much slower end than Alisa knew. 
While most of the others in the room probably hoped he would play another one, Alisa hoped for the opposite. Grabbing the two mugs, she dropped a few coins on the counter and made her way back to Jason. He didn't say a word as she slid one mug in front of him. His eyes were locked onto the crowd in the corner of the room. Chris stood and, much to the dismay of the crowd, announced that there wouldn't be any more songs for tonight. After a short trip to Gobtop to drop off the lute with him, he took the seat opposite Alisa. I didn't know you could play the lute. Me neither. But I played guitar in high school. Me and a few buddies were in a band. Played lots of covers, Queen, Pink Floyd. Lots of 80s stuff. The strings feel weird he said, rubbing his fingers on his surprisingly local tunic. I think they're parts of animals. Jason adjusted his glasses, pushing them up slightly even though they fell right back to where they had been the moment he moved his finger away. That would be accurate. Historically, lute strings were made from sheep intestine. Alisa grimaced a bit, but Chris just shrugged figured it was something like that. Who is scrawny here? J. Jason. Jason Styles. He held out a hand to shake, but knocked into the mug Alisa had slid in front of him. Her hands darted forward, steadying it before too much of the ale could spill all over sorry he said, pulling his hand back before Chris even had the opportunity to shake. I can't believe it, but this really isn't Earth, is it? I'm a little overwhelmed. I bet. This bitch dumped me in the middle of the city without saying a word and ignored me for a week. Overwhelmed was an understatement. Alisa raised an eyebrow, giving Chris a pointed look. Jason just stared with an open mouth, actually meeting their eyes as he looked between the two. But Alisa shrugged. I suppose I deserve that. But call me a bitch again and you'll see just how bitch-like I can be. Something in her gaze made Chris shift back and forth uncomfortably. It couldn't be glowing eyes as Tenebrail had ended their connection, a mildly unpleasant experience but far less of an ordeal than making it in the first place. After drinking a bit of ale to give her words time to settle in, Alison nodded toward Jason. He's been here for barely more than a half hour at this point. I was hoping you might be so kind as to show him the ropes. Tell him the things I told you the other day. Maybe take him out tomorrow and give him a brief tour of the city if you can make time around your carpentry job and rocking out on the lute. Chris looked back to Jason, eyeing him up and down. I barely remember half the monsters you named let alone all that other stuff you told me about. Wouldn't it be better if you did it? I would, but someone threw a dagger at my head yesterday. It quickly became apparent just how many people around were listening in on their conversation. In the time since Chris had finished his ballad of the Killer Queen, the crowd had disseminated, gravitating to the various empty tables. Several had left outright, but plenty stayed to get their nightly dose of food and ale. And the nearest three tables all went silent. It only lasted a moment, but Alyssa noticed a few of them looking right at her table until they noticed her noticing them at which point they turned away a dagger. Chris said, pulling her attentions back to the table MHM home. It probably didn't matter that people were listening in. Not unless they were part of Waters Street. And if they were, they very well could know who she was even without mentioning something like that. It was a sleek one made of dark metal. Pretty nice. I would have picked it up but I was a little worried it might be cursed. It did have an enchantment on it to freeze things the blade cut, so something more dangerous didn't seem so far-fetched. But why? I accidentally made a few enemies. It is one of the main reasons I don't want to hang around with you guys too much. I don't want to rub my enemies off on you too. I can appreciate that. Been here a week and I'm still learning my way around. Sometimes I wake up expecting to find myself staring at a brick wall in an alley. Getting my head around it all is going to take some work and I could do without daggers in my head while I work it out. My thoughts exactly. B but what are you going to do? Jason said. He looked back and forth, maybe having noticed the extra ears listening to their conversation. In a far quieter voice, 
he continued, are there police in this world? The city guard act like the police of this city, for the most part. I feel like they're more concerned with external threats than internal ones, however. Though maybe she should go to them for help instead of trying to deal with the Taker or Octavia on her own. If only she hadn't both alienated Oxart and got her locked up for treason. Decorous rubbed her the wrong way. Then again, the fact that Zheitzer hadn't suggested going to the city guard when Sid first informed them that the Taker was after her probably said something about how effective they would be as for what I'm going to do. Well, I already have a few ideas about who threw the dagger. I just need to find them and encourage them to not throw another one. Permanently, if necessary. Alyssa had increased her repertoire of spells since the last time she faced the Taker. A projectile reflection would stop his daggers. She wouldn't hesitate to use rigor mortis again. And a spectral axe would rend his soul from his body. She just needed to watch out for his sword. Maybe she could get Iorulan to loan her that dragon armor again. And maybe she had been a bit too intense in her roundabout way of speaking. Neither Chris nor Jason had said a word for a full minute now. Both were staring at her, though Jason averted his gaze as soon as she turned her head to him. She wanted to send a message to those people who were listening in, just in case they were spies or accomplices of the Taker and Octavia. A message that said that she was not afraid and that her enemies should be. But now she scared off her fellow earthlings. Covering a small sigh by standing up, Alyssa stretched. I'll be in touch. Call me if there is an emergency, but try not to call me hundreds of times if at all possible. She turned toward the door, hesitated, and turned back. There will be one more person coming from Earth. He should be arriving in roughly a day. I'm not sure what he is like or who he is just yet, but I'd appreciate if you two, especially you, Chris, would watch out for him until he learns his way around the city. Just over one day was the timeline Tenor Braille had given her. It seemed her murderer was getting panicky. But, after killing this person, her murderer apparently killed himself via hanging. Something Tenor Braille should not require assistance with because the body was just a puppet. Hopefully, anyway. One day out was also the date of their next lesson. Alyssa was looking forward to it, but in an apprehensive sort of way. Flailing through the void to connect to Tenor Braille would be unpleasant, but the prospect of being able to cast magic the way angels did might make up for it just one. Jason said, breaking her out of her thoughts what? Maybe because she had been thinking of something else, Alyssa wasn't quite sure what he was talking about you save people who were going to die, right? Why only one? Ah. That's, not quite accurate. I am, saving the people who my murderer would have killed. I can't save anyone else and, after this one, he kills himself. Wait Chris said, furrowing his brow. Wait, what? You're saving people who get killed. Specifically by the person who the news reported as my murderer. Did I not mention that earlier? You said that I should consider myself dead, but... I got killed. Obviously not. You were sort of sleeping through everything. Then you spouted off a bunch of conspiracy theories that I didn't really have the time to entertain. Sorry, forgot to clarify it. And I guess I didn't really go into it last time we met. Alyssa waved a hand at Jason. He probably knows more than I do at this point. I hardly watched the news even back before all this happened. And I haven't been in much of a position to keep up with current events over the past months. Jason, maybe because he had seen the full aftermath of his own poorly thought out actions, seemed to take the information better than the now gaping Chris. But how are you saving them? Does this sort of thing happen often? As far as I know, we're the only ones who have ever been saved in such a manner. How? That would require a lot of complicated explanations. To distill it, I'd say that I've got an angel helping me. The angel that eats souls. Well, yes. I figure I'll worry about that later. Aha. Uh -huh. Look, would you rather be dead? No. Me neither. 
Alyssa glanced back and forth between the two of them, then did a quick sweep of the room. They weren't speaking quietly. The people who were trying to listen in wouldn't have a hard time of it and even some who weren't might have heard. It made her wonder a bit about what they might think about all the talk of saving people from death and souls and such. Probably not much, actually. They might be confused, but arcanists in this world could do some pretty crazy things. This being the big city with the observatory front and center, they might have a more or less accurate view on just what arcanists were capable of. From her travels, Alison knew that people in smaller villages didn't put much stock into magic. Being able to turn a card into a flame was as natural as striking a match on a box, but viewing every possible outcome of decisions made in the next few seconds. They would stare as if Alyssa had grown three heads. To be fair, most people who weren't the princess of a medieval country would probably stare at the prospect. But random people from tiny villages would just stare more anyway, I'm out she said when neither of her two earthling companions said anything back to her. Try not to start too many musical revolutions while I'm gone. That broke Chris out of his stupor, at least. He still seemed a bit out of it, but he did wave a farewell as Alyssa left the tavern. Was finding out that he had been saved from the brink of death that much of a shock. Relative to finding out about a whole different world, one filled with magic and monsters, Alyssa didn't think so. But maybe her perspective was a bit warped with her angel vision. Tenebrail's presence certainly had distracted her from the gravity of the situation back when she first discovered a new world. And she had initially thought herself to be lost in some far-off corner of Earth. Stopping just outside the tavern door, Alyssa glanced around. Night had fallen. Alyssa did not like to think of herself as being paranoid, but, as the saying went, it wasn't paranoia when people were really trying to kill her. Fishing out two cards, she held them in front of her. Empty mirror cloaked her in shards of glass, preventing anyone from seeing her presence. It was a spell she had used before and one that she had painstakingly copied from Irelan's tome. She had scrapped a dozen cards while trying to draw it out, such was its complexity, but she had succeeded. And, if she dared to say so herself, she had gotten fairly good at it too. Her gradually thickening deck of cards now sported five empty mirrors. Well, for now. The other card she had drawn was not one she had used before. Tiny came from one of the books she had taken pictures of during her very first visit to the observatory. She wasn't sure where its name came from, but the brief description she had written when she took the picture implied that it was a sensory enhancement spell. And boy is it ever. The card disappeared, feeling like burning metal in her hands. She hadn't thought it was windy out before casting the spell. Now, a chill breeze felt like pins and needles against the bare skin of her face and hands. And the view, it wasn't like a spell dedicated to seeing at night. Night vision basically completely negated the darkness, making it look like everything was washed in daylight. This must be how cats see. Everything had this crisp sharpness to it. Even in the dark shadows, hidden from even the moonlight, she could see the well-defined edges of a water barrel next to the tavern wall. A fleck of movement made her snap her head to the side, only to find a rat scrubbing at its face. Her hearing was a mess. Two dozen voices all talking at once was a lot more than she could decipher at once. Most of the voices were coming from inside the tavern, but there were a few from the surrounding buildings. Footsteps, heartbeats, the unpleasant gurgling of human insides, and plenty more noises that she couldn't begin to identify all helped muddle everything. Someone like Iorulan, who had a literal dragon to help process the information, might have been able to dissect and listen to all the conversations at once. For Alyssa, it was just noise. Though she heard some familiar voices in all that noise. That gave her something to concentrate on. Focusing, Alyssa found it vaguely possible to listen to some of the conversation, trying to not think about it much. I might need another few drinks. Just try not to worry too much and take things as they come. That's my method of dealing. Worry. Worry. I'm in a whole new world. There are monster girls here. 
and magic. Yeah. It's rough, but not so different. I've been here a few, how could I worry at a time like this? This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Ah, uh, I don't know how I'm going to sleep tonight. I'm just so excited. Oh. Do I need to get a room? She handed me all this, Alisa winced as some high-pitched clanking of metal against wood gouged out her ears. But she didn't really tell me much more. Alisa shook her head, she was almost positive that she could hear her brain jostle around and vowed never to do that again with Tiny Active, and tried to focus on the surrounding conversations. She was slightly more interested in eavesdropping on the eavesdroppers, but she couldn't make anything out. Lacking familiarity, one voice was just too hard to pick out from the rest. Resisting the subconscious desire to shake her head again, she decided to just leave. Tiny would help her spot anyone who might try to follow her and empty mirror would keep them from finding her. The first footstep felt like an earthquake. The second didn't get any better. By the third, she dismissed Tiny. Relief flooded in as the relative silence filled the vacancy left by all the noise. What a waste. She had drawn up a dozen tiny cards. They were relatively simple, but drawing up any cards at all was time consuming. After that brief usage, she was considering burning them all. Activating a simple night vision, Alisa looked around the street again. Nothing particularly stuck out to her. Just how she liked it. She would just have to watch for potential pursuers the old fashioned way. There was a flaw in Alisa's plan. No one was following her. In fact, nobody could follow her. She spent all that time looking over her shoulder. Obviously nobody was going to follow her when she was invisible. If they were even going to follow her in the first place. Nobody had known that she was going to be at the Gobtop Tavern tonight. Tenor Braille had dropped her and Jason off only a short distance away. The only people who might have tried to follow her would have been people already in the tavern when she left. And she would probably have noticed them while sitting outside the bar with Tiny Active. Luckily. There was nobody around to notice her foolish actions. No Ireland to stare with a knowing eye. No giggles from a mimic. Tenor Braille wasn't even around, having to go collect souls before returning to Earth to pilot around Alice's murderer a bit more. Just herself and the stars. That did raise a question. Tenor Braille's obligations on Earth would effectively come to an end the moment the murderer hung himself. From what Alice understood, the angel hadn't really spent much time on Earth prior to their meeting. And she had only gone there in the first place because she grew tired of Nod. So with her earthly puppeteering out of the way, would she be spending more time on Nod? Would she be spending more time around Alisa? A few weeks ago, Alisa might have been annoyed at the prospect. Angels were nothing but trouble. Now, however, things might be different. Angels were still nothing but trouble. However, having Tenor Braille hanging around her far more frequently would be a great deterrent to anyone like Ardril. And their miracle lessons might be more frequent as well. That alone was something to look forward to. Of course, Tenor Braille would probably make herself as annoying as possible. Cassitar would freak out about having the angel around. Iorulan would too, though in a different way. And if the situation ever presented itself for Alisa to hold up her phone so that Iorulan could converse with Tenor Braille, the pharaoh might lose another princess, this time to a heart attack. Alisa picked up the pace, wanting to get back soonish. Unless she ran off again, Cassitar would probably be annoying Ts Heitsa right about now. Alisa would be lying if she said that she wasn't looking forward to seeing whatever the mimic looked like again. She also needed to get to sleep soon. The Black Prince was due to show up sometime after sunrise. Alisa didn't want to be shambling about like a sleep-deprived zombie in front of him. Five steps into her increased pace, Alisa felt a chill run up her spine. Maybe it was paranoia, maybe it was a sixth sense that she had developed. Whatever it was, she turned and glanced over her shoulder. Darkness there, and nothing more. Though the darkness didn't matter much to her enhanced vision. That wasn't unusual. It was night time. Most people tended to avoid going out at night. 
Most people wasn't all people, but it still wouldn't be strange to walk down a street void of other pedestrians after dark. Still, there was something wrong. A warmth filled her chest, not unlike the feeling she got after tearing apart Ardril's nets or the sensation that flooded her while connected to Tenebrail. Had she trodden on some angelic trap or crossed a bounded field? There was nothing around, but, Alisa drew her pistol as she hurried along. If there was some angelic presence out there, it probably wouldn't do much. It was still a bit of a comfort to her dot sprinting, she ran all the way to Tzheitz's shop. Not once did she encounter another person out on the streets. It wasn't unusual for most people to stay off the streets at night, but all people. Seeing the slightly reduced number of carboys in the windows of Tzheitz's shop was a relief. Alisa rushed inside, slammed the door shut, and locked it, for all that would help against an angel. Given the late hour, Tzheitz was probably asleep. At this point, Alisa didn't care. She just wanted to see another person to confirm that she hadn't crossed over into the twilight zone. Throwing open the backroom door, Alisa breathed a content sigh and dismissed her invisibility. Fela was curled up by the fire. Two Felas, in fact, but one was probably Cassita. Tsheitsa was still awake and sitting at a chair in front of her workbench. She stared at one of Tenebrail's feathers through the lenses of a jewel crafter's glasses you see, if you use the feather's shaft in your corruptions, it diminishes the effect. It's just a hollow piece of trash. The vein is where the true magic lies. Alisa blinked twice, staring at the little girl in front of Tzheitsa. She was perhaps younger than Tess, sporting curly pink hair with bright red eyes. Her blue dress and white apron made her look like a servant of the palace but the expression on her face didn't fit the rest of her body. It was a haughty sneer. A kind of look that said she knew far better than anyone else. The tone of her voice was the same. It took a moment, but the voice was unique enough that Alisa remembered. She had met this little girl. The night they had gone out to meet Fila, on her way back from eating with Decorous. This girl had bumped into her. And now, she was standing right in the middle of Tzheitz's potion shop. There was some girl, talking like an adult, right in the middle of the room. Fila and Cassitar weren't concerned with her in the slightest. Tzheitz might have let Fila stay, but she knew Fila wasn't going to murder her, probably. This girl could be a monster. Tzheitz looked to Alisa, turning her head away from the feather in her hands. Though her gaze crossed right over the girl, her eye didn't linger in the slightest. She just nodded a greeting before turning back to the feather, rubbing a finger along the soft bristles. It hit Alisa like a hammer. They couldn't see the little girl. Maybe Cassitar could if she tried, but she had said that it was a strain just trying to detect Tenebrail's presence. The girl turned with a shark like grin on her sharp face. You're back, she said. Her tone carried so much more meaning than the two words she had spoken. Alisa could feel the accusation and annoyance directed her way at the impudence of having made the angel wait. Please tell this fool that she is going about her corruptions all wrong. I don't think my divine inspiration is getting through to her. If there had been any doubt, that right there eliminated it. This girl was an angel. She hadn't attacked anyone so far. That was, a good sign. Did Tenebrail know about her? Doubtful. Tenebrail would have mentioned something. Her first instinct was to pull out her phone and give Tenebrail a quick call. Just a nice social call to ask how she had been in the past half hour, maybe ask if she wanted to come over for tea, and check to see if she knew that she had another angel running around her world. Calling Tenebrail had worked with Ardril standing in front of her but Ardril had been distracted with Iorelan and Iorelan's two souls. And all subsequent attempts at calling Tenebrail had wound up jammed. With this angel's full attentions on Alisa, she would probably stop any calls before they could begin. The girl put her hands on her hips and harumphed. There is no point in pretending you can't see me. I already confirmed that you can talk to me earlier. Remember. You gave me advice on how to be a little girl. That was me, in case you've forgotten. It must suck to be immortal and forget things all the time. 
Alyssa flicked her eyes around the room. Tsaitsa was thoroughly absorbed in the feather. Fila was asleep. Kasatar wasn't. The latter two looked identical at the moment, but it had to be Kasatar that was staring at her with wide eyes. She must have noticed something. Maybe she had noticed well in advance of Alyssa arriving, maybe she hadn't until she saw Alyssa standing frozen in the doorway. If Alyssa dropped her phone, would Kasatar know to call Tena Braille? It might be a chance she would have to take. Calling for Tena Braille right in front of this angel was bound to go poorly. She might even decide to attack. Alyssa only had two fractal locks. And those two might not even work. They were useful but impossibly difficult to copy. She had scrapped so many attempts at drawing them. Deciding it would be best if Tsaitsa, Kasatar, and Fila were not around while talking with an angel who might attack them without them even knowing what was going on, Alyssa walked further into the room. There was another table between the entrance and her room in the back. As she passed, she hovered her hand over the surface, called her phone to her hand, and let it drop all without breaking stride. Angels were not omniscient. Maybe she would notice, maybe she wouldn't. But Cassita, with her innate awareness of everything around her, would definitely notice it. Hopefully she would get the hint. Opening the door to her room, Alyssa beckoned the angel with a wave of her hand before entering. The angel did not walk across the room. With a shrug of her wingless shoulders, she glided from Tsaitsa's workbench and into Alyssa's room. Alyssa gave a pointed look to the mimicked hound before closing the door. Crossing her arms, Alyssa looked down at the short angel. She really looked like she belonged in the palace working alongside Tess. Remembering that this was someone as dangerous as Ardril might not be the easiest thing. The way her red eyes gleamed would certainly help well. Alyssa said after a moment of silence had passed well. Well what? I assume you didn't come here to give Tsaitsa cooking tips. What do you want? Why would I say something I don't mean? I genuinely want you to tell that mortal that she is going about corrupting miracles all wrong. She's not going to get the result she wants as long as she's crushing the stem along with the vein. That might work for harpy feathers, but harpies aren't the most magical relics around. Alyssa blinked twice. That was not what she had expected. Could this be another angel that wasn't insane? That would be a relief. Even if she were just like Io's file, Alyssa would prefer an almost complete passivity to Ardril's outright hostility. It was your feather. Wasn't it? Seeing the angel almost preen at the question, Alyssa just shook her head. Why don't we start at the start? Who are you? Archangel Kenziel she said with more pride than Alyssa thought possible. And you are, human. Alyssa's heart skipped a beat at hearing Kenziel's title. Whatever calm she had felt at potentially coming across a friendly angel vanished in three syllables. She didn't even have the presence of mind to groan at another suspicion of inhuman nature being directed her way. The staff was still leaning up against the wall in the corner of the room. Maybe she could grab that and start swinging it around. But not with the archangel in the way. Alice's hand drifted to her satchel. A spectral chains should contain the angel long enough to get Tenebrail here. Even if the phone was being jammed, Tenebrail would be showing up soon to take Alice back to Earth for their last rescue attempt. She had wanted to sleep before then, but if she had to stay awake to keep spectral chains active... She could do it I've heard your name is Alyssa. Little Addie was whining about you, you know. And the world. And, well, she whines about everything. Kenziel laughed just how Alyssa imagined a snake would laugh if they could. Actually, on Nod, there probably was a humanoid snake monster that laughed just like this angel. Pathetic, really. Unbecoming of an archangel. That got Alyssa to click her tongue in annoyance. Whining was unbecoming. What about attacking people? Setting nations on some crusade to destroy Tenebrail's presence on this world? Yes. Not very intelligent either, is she? Kenziel said with an aloof attitude. 
She turned away from Alyssa to inspect the rest of the room and quickly focused on one of the last remaining sealed meals that Alyssa had. Tenebrail had not provided a fridge full of food this time, much to Alyssa's annoyance. Just what is her plan? Even assuming she accomplished the impossible task of destroying all the people in this land, it wouldn't eliminate Tenebrail's influence or name. Cults would spring up. All the people she used to cleanse this land would be aware of Tenebrail's name. Some might even worship her in secret. Kenziel's hand stretched out, making to touch the flatbread wrap. Alyssa swooped in and snatched it away before the angel reached it, setting it on one of the many shelves in the room then she would need to find another willing group to wipe out the first group Kenziel continued with only a small glare in Alyssa's direction. As she spoke, she continued looking around the room for a new object of interest. Then another yet again to decimate them. And none of that would do anything to diminish Tenebrail's power. An angel does not gain strength from having worshippers. If she knows all that Alyssa said, grabbing her shotgun from out of the angel's hands, then what was she hoping for? Deliverance. I assume. She goes and prays to the Seraphim every day for a flood or a fire or whatever. Something to take the problem out of her hands. She put on the nastiest grin Alyssa had ever seen on a child. See, total whiner. Kenziel looked like a child. But she sounded like a middle schooler as she prays to the Seraphim. About this world. Every time she visits the throne, or so I hear. I'm not always around to see her make a fool of herself Kenziel said. This time, she seemed to focus in on one of the potion reagents in the room. Liver of a green fairy, if Alyssa remembered correctly. Useful for alcohol poisonings and hangovers. Little Addie gets talked about though. She's always doing something that makes people wonder just what goes on in that glory of hers. Especially lately. She broke a bunch of virtues and we're still not sure what to do about it. Virtues. Tenebrail's angelic notes had mentioned them. Information specialists tasked with chronicling all of existence. A bit of a tedious sounding job, in Alice's opinion. If talking to a seraphim was like talking to a wall, talking to a virtue was like talking to a wall that could talk back. According to Tenebrail's dossier, anyway. But Alyssa wasn't sure what breaking them was supposed to mean. Ardril attacking Tenebrail wouldn't seem all that far fetched. Given their difference in power, it made sense why Ardril hadn't done so. That difference was likely why she had tried to skulk about in the shadows, puppeting people like they puppeted fairies. But attacking other angels, Alyssa was about to ask but Kenziel's eyes had drifted to the corner of the room. Right onto the staff that leaned against the wall just behind Alice's bed. Before she even realized what was happening, Alice found herself interposed between the angel and the staff. She would have suspected teleportation, except she didn't have any cards that were supposed to teleport the caster. Maybe one had teleportation as a side effect, like Fractal Mirror but it was far more likely that she had just dashed over why are you here? Alyssa asked, crossing her arms. You know Tenebrail will be here soon. I doubt she'll be pleased to find another Archangel mucking things up in her world. Archangels were effectively Tenebrail's antithesis. For an angel who so desperately wanted to escape from her, fate, the class of angels whose jobs it was to return things to normal would be her worst enemies. Even if this one, so far, hadn't actually done anything. Or rather, she hadn't done nothing. That was a thought that made Alyssa frown. Assuming she had been telling the truth about using divine inspiration to influence Tzheitsa toward more effective potions, could she have been helping? Angels weren't supposed to lie, but they weren't supposed to harm people either well. Even after the extra prompting, Kenziel did not respond right away. She just stared with a slowly growing smile on her face. Alyssa might as well have been a transparent pane of glass for all she felt she was doing to block the angel's sight of the staff I was bored. I've finished my assignment, perfectly, I might add, and I doubt that I'll get a new one with the throne in the state it is in. So I decided to see what has little Addie all worked up. 
thought I might meet with the Dominion after forming a proper plan. Which I have done. She paused and her vaguely luminescent red eyes focused on Alyssa. No wonder Addy was whining so much. You stole her stuff. A little mortal has her stuff. How did you manage that? She threw it at some friends of mine. I got to it before she did. And it's staying right here, so don't even think about touching it. Threw it. She let it out of her hands of her own will. Again, Kenziel put a hand over her mouth as she hissed out something that resembled laughter. Wait until the others get a load of this. Skewed my friends, perhaps I should say. Her laughter died down as her face lost the wrinkles of laughter. When you said attacked earlier, I was being literal. That's, interesting. Alyssa flicked her eyes upward as a slight movement drew her attention. A black feather. By the time she looked back down, a pale hand with black painted fingernails was resting on Kenziel's shoulder. Cassitar had pulled through I find it rather interesting as well Tenebrail said. I don't suppose you have any ideas, Archangel. Kenziel didn't turn back. Her face betrayed no surprise at Tenebrail's presence. If the throne granted her authorization, I think we can safely rule out that possibility. She hasn't traded in her halo for a set of horns. I saw her in the expanse only a short time ago. After she was whining about your little pet human. Kenziel turned slipping out of Tenebrail's grasp. Hello, Dominion. I was hoping to speak with you. I have gone on a brief walk about of your world. It is quite the mess. But, I am pleased to inform you that it is not unsalvageable. How would you like to be brought up to a fully compliant status? It won't be easy, but I think we can get you back to schedule in as little as 1,300 years. Working with a competent archangel, you'll hardly have to lift a finger. Kenziel's tone had shifted to that of a used car salesman. Except, instead of slapping the roof of a car, she was slapping the roof of a world dot and she clearly had not done research on her potential customer base. The very last thing Tenebrail wanted was to have her world make any kind of sense. That was the whole reason Ardril had been trying to hide her presence rather than come out in the open and work with Tenebrail as was the norm, according to Tenebrail's angelic notes I think Tenebrail said slowly, I'm going to put you in a tiny box where you'll never feel the radiance of the throne again. What? That wiped the smirking smile off Kenziel's face. You can't do that. Oh but I can. I already tested on poor Io's. She found the experience, disturbing, to say the least. Kenziel tried to back away, but Tenebrail still had her black fingernails digging into the angel's shoulder. A pair of wings sprouted from the diminutive angel's back. White ones, though a bit off-white. Maybe the color of eggshell or a pale nimbus dot with Kenziel's two wings and Tenebrail's four, Alice's small room was getting a little cramped dot worse. They looked like they were about to start slinging magic around dot in the flash of an eye, Alyssa had her cards in hand. Ethral chains lashed out from the deck. Two sets. One wrapped around Kenziel, the other around Tenebrail. Tenebrail's arm snapped to her side as the ghostly lynx bound her tight dot a glowing white eye, eyebrow raised above it, shot Alyssa a look. Tenebrail was otherwise the picture of calm. She just stood and stared wh what? What is this? In contrast, Kenziel was in a full panic. Her wings, pinned against her back just as her arms were, strained against the chain. And failed to break free if you two fight here Alyssa said in the sternest voice she could manage, you're going to destroy this building. Tenebrail opened her mouth, but stalled when Alyssa pointed a finger at the angel. I've seen you and Io's file fight. Don't even try to deny it. Tsheitsa has been beyond patient with me. But if you guys destroy her potion shop, that patience will surely end. I'm going to be the one in trouble. Analysis Kenziel said, momentarily ceasing her struggling. Enochian text scrolled through the air in front of her. Relic class miracle. A shadow of the chains designed to hold back the wolf that will devour a god. 
but how are they holding me? Curious, isn't it? The Enochian vanished as Kenziel glared at Tenebrail. Dominion, do something. You can't let a mortal do this to us. To us. Is she doing something to me? Tenebrail shifted ever so slightly. Just a subtle jostling of her wings. The chains binding her broke apart. Link snapped and pieces fell. The spell vanished into motes of light before any part hit the ground, but that didn't stop Kenziel from following their trajectory all the way down to the floor. After a moment, Kenziel tried the same thing. She shifted and jostled her wings. But her chains didn't move. If anything, they just constricted tighter around the angel, pressing her wings right up against her back. I'd appreciate if you would quit doing that to me, Tenebrail said with a pout in Alice's direction. You know it doesn't work on me. Thought I'd test it again, make sure the first time wasn't a fluke. Alice tried to inject some humor in her tone. At the same time, she was at least partially serious. Tenebrail was not her enemy. She understood that. That did not mean she liked someone of the angel's power and whimsy having so much control over her life. If Tenebrail did have a change of heart or found herself compelled to follow some esoteric programming that negatively impacted Alisa, there would be nothing that Alisa could do about it. Her current hope was that connecting to Tenebrail, or to the throne itself, if such a thing was possible, would give her a hint towards some vulnerability in the angel. She wouldn't use it unless it became necessary. Despite her conflicted and often changing opinions about Tenebrail, Alisa would be more than happy to leave the angel to her own devices so long as said devices minimally affected anyone else. Shaking her head, Alisa stared at Kenziel. Gone was the haughty demeanor. She looked like the scared preteen that she pretended to be. Worried eyes looked from Alisa to Tenebrail then back again. What about her? Oh I was quite serious about depositing her in a tiny lockbox. I watched Io's file try to escape for the better part of a day and I'm confident that I can contain her. An archangel's duties are solitary, for the most part. And if she is here, she clearly doesn't have anywhere more important to be. Not like principalities, who interact with many others and souls. No one will miss her for some time, I'd imagine. Wait. Wait. I'm not even supposed to be here. I just wanted to know what Ardril was whining about. I didn't think she was serious about the Dominion being, being, what? Being so polite, and, ah, uh, understanding of others. Alisa raised an eyebrow. You can't seriously think that is going to work. Look. I don't care about this world. It isn't my assignment. I just saw an opportunity to show up Addy. All of her whining over the past few hundred years. It is enough to drive an angel insane. But I can see when I'm not wanted. I'm not a fool. Let me go and you'll never hear from me again. I understand. Whining is quite unbecoming. Your offer is tempting but let me hit you with a counter-offer, no. A mystic circle exploded out from Tenebrail's outstretched hands. Although, it was more triangular in shape. A lot like the teleportation design that Tenebrail used when taking Alisa to and from Earth, but not quite the same. Given that this circle was apparently designed to take its target and place them into a tiny box cut off from the rest of the universe, Alisa wasn't sure that she would have taken a picture of it even if she had her phone up and ready. She could already picture herself showing it to Iorel and only to later perish in a place that couldn't support human life. Kenziel's eyes widened as she stared at it. Her eyes whipped back and forth like she was reading a book. Every line seemed to make her more nervous than the last, further reinforcing Alice's desire to never show the circle to Iorelan. Before she reached the halfway point, just as Tenebrail started to speak again, Kenziel blurted out a stop. To Alice's surprise, Tenebrail did. The black inside white lines of the magic circle still hung in the air, but she closed her mouth and waited. For a moment, Alice worried that Kenziel had done something mind control or whatever the equivalent was for angels. 
Given the lack of internals beneath Ardril's skin when her arm had been chopped off, Alyssa wasn't actually sure that angels had physical brains. But if Kenziel had done something, she would have probably calmed down. She didn't breathe heavily or sweat at all, but the fear on her face was plain to see. It was a bit odd to see. Tenebrail was always so composed, even when things weren't going her way. Maybe because she knew she would get her way in the end or maybe because her programming wouldn't allow her the emotions required to fling a javelin at some mortals. The most panicked Alyssa had seen her had been the night Alyssa wound up in Nod. And that had hardly been panic. Disbelief, sure. But not panic. Alyssa would have laughed, but she honestly felt a little bad. Maybe it was the childlike face. Kenziel had shown up in what Alyssa suspected was good faith. Never did it cross the little angel's mind that a meeting with the world's dominion would have turned out so poorly. And if Tenebrail was serious about locking Kenziel up for eternity, feeling a little bad would be a drastic understatement well. Archangel. Did you ask me to stop for a reason? If not, what do you want? To let you go. In general. Maybe I can help. I don't think you can. It goes against your nature. Careful Alyssa said, breaking into their conversation. Monologuing is how half of all cartoon villains wind up losing. As bad as she felt for Kenziel, Alyssa really did not want to wake up to the world being destroyed. Are you calling me a villain? You certainly dress the part. Tenebrail looked hurt. An act, surely. I would love to sit about monologuing until the throne is occupied, but people are dying. People are always dying and I've got to go collect their souls. Where are your principalities? Addy mentioned one annoying her. Shouldn't they be in charge of that? Kenziel was talking as fast as possible. Probably just trying to stave off Tenebrail activating her teleportation circle just a little longer. But Tenebrail played right into her questions by answering instead of sending her off and just being done with it. Iosfiel was just helping me out momentarily. I normally take care of everything myself. Principalities are an irritating bunch. They're too particular about their duties. I could help you. Kenziel saw her opportunity and she shoved her foot in the door like the over-eager salesman she was. I always wanted to try my hand at principality work. I thought, after my previous assignment, that maybe I would try getting my role shifted upward. That isn't going to happen officially now, but I don't see a reason why I can't act the part. I can collect souls and deliver them to the throne just as well as any principality. And that is where we would have a problem. I do not heed nor pay tribute to an empty chair. See chair. Kenziel looked like she had been slapped despite Tenebrail not having moved a muscle. You. What are you talking about? The souls I collect do not go to the throne. They never go near the expanse. The souls of my world stop at me. I doubt you could even imagine such a thing. And that is why we cannot work together. That is why I have no principalities running around doing whatever it is they do between deaths. Unfortunately, the bodies are growing cold. You know what happens to souls when they are left in a rotting husk. Prolonging our conversation will only prolong their suffering. The mystic circle, which had stilled during their brief conversation, launched into motion. Again, Tenebrail opened her mouth. Again, Kenziel interrupted I'll do it. And again, the circle slowly still do it. I-I-L-L bring the souls to you. Alyssa blinked. Tenebrail did as well. The angel had to be thinking the same thing as Alyssa. Kenziel couldn't be serious. Could she? Angels couldn't lie. But they couldn't attack people either. Tenebrail had to be considering that little tidbit as she stared that's interesting Tenebrail said, lowering her arm. The stalled teleportation circle flickered before fading away into nothingness you're believing her. I believe she can bring souls somewhere other than the throne. She is not a principality. I told you before that the lower the station of the angel, the less restrictions they would have. As an angel, she could collect souls just as I do. 
but, as she isn't supposed to, she might not have anything stopping her from getting rid of the souls before reaching the throne. All right. Sure. But can she isn't the question. Will she? She said she would. And I am not heartless. I'll give her one chance. Tenebrail leaned in close to Kenziel, staring for a moment before smiling. Two people died during the course of our discussion. Their bodies are already rotting. The souls are corroding. Bring them to me. Kenziel nodded her head up and down just about as fast as she could. It made Alyssa sigh. Tenebrail looked to Alyssa, making her sigh a second time. But she lowered her hand, dismissing the spectral chains as she moved. Kenziel's wings practically exploded behind her. The angel must have been straining against the chains as hard as possible. Alyssa flinched back, closing her eyes for just a moment. When she opened them, all that was left of the archangel was a handful of floating feathers wafting to the floor. Alyssa plucked one out of the air before it hit anything else, figuring that she could hand it off to Tzheitzer for a quick examination. It probably had the same properties as Tenebrail's feathers, but it might be interesting to know for sure. As she stared at the feather, she sighed again. We're going to regret this. I've temporarily closed off my world as best I can. I did so before even appearing here. She won't be able to flee back to the expanse. Not easily, anyway. Given some time and effort, she should be able to break through. I'll be able to hunt her down if she tries to betray us before she makes it, which will be annoying, but it won't be an insurmountable issue. However, I don't think she will. You trust her that much? She said she would. Angels can't lie. We can bend and twist the truth, but she was fairly clear in her words. Not a lot of room for reinterpretation to I'll bring the souls to you now is there. And if she does decide to betray us. Like Ardril decided to attack humans. Believe it or not, I'm almost hoping that she will. It might provide more insight into just how Ardril was able to ignore what should be hardwired into her being. Is it something to do with being an archangel? Or is Ardril somehow special? Alyssa shrugged. She didn't have an answer and Tenebrail didn't expect one. I guess we'll find out soon enough. It shouldn't take her long, should it? Although, you didn't give her your book or tell her where those deaths occurred, she's an angel. We know these things. The book just helps us avoid surprise. Aha. Uh -huh. And, supposing she does return. She didn't say anything to the effect of working with you on a permanent basis. What is stopping her from running back to the throne the moment you're not looking? I might still lock her up. Perhaps not permanently. Once we've finished with our business on Earth, I can devote much more time to not and monitoring what goes on here. We can let her run around then, watching her. She came to offer Tzheitz a tips on potion making, apparently. Really? Tenebrail looked to Alyssa with genuine surprise. Potions are a corruption of miracles, magic given physical form. I would have thought an archangel would be vehemently against such things. Again, Alyssa could only shrug. If Kenziel could lie, maybe she was trying to trigger an explosion. Melted cauldron bottoms, or something. Maybe Tenebrail's feathers needed the stem to keep their stability. But if she couldn't lie? Well... Alyssa would offer the advice to Tzheitzer with a warning to take care. Finding out whether the concoctions became more effective or not would be a good way to test Kenziel's ability to lie. Or she could just ask Tenebrail. Kenziel said that all the magic in your feathers is in the vein and that the stems of your feathers are trash. The potions would be better if the stem were thrown out entirely. Tenebrail gasped, staring with longing over her shoulder. She called my beautiful feathers, trash. Focus, please Alyssa said without a single hint of emotion in her voice though I disagree with the terminology, it sounds correct. How she knows how to make potions out of my feathers is a question I'm not sure I can answer. It doesn't seem like something an angel would have much experience in. I don't have any experience in creating potions. Ha. Huh. 
maybe natural intuition. I'm not sure that angels have intuition. Alisa, didn't have anything to say about that. Just another oddity of angels being angels, she supposed. But if Kenziel and Tenebrail were right about the feathers, she should definitely tell Tsheitsa. Probably soon, before Tsheitsa started mashing them up. How long was Kenziel supposed to be gone for? Alisa started tapping her foot on the ground. She did throw a glance over her shoulder. The staff was still there. Kenziel hadn't managed some trickery to get a hold of it. Bracht was supposed to be dropping by in the morning. Perhaps he knew someone who might make a back holster for the staff. It seemed like an important thing to get done soon if angels were going to be running around. Tenebrail looked to be in thought. Her brow was furrowed and her eyes weren't focused on anything in particular. Maybe she was monitoring Kenziel. Iosfiel had mentioned that it was possible to keep track of other angels, so it seemed likely. Alisa just about asked, but had a better idea as soon as she opened her mouth. As long as Tenebrail was around, why not get some insight? I don't suppose you know who threw a dagger at me yesterday. Someone threw a dagger at you. You really can't stay out of trouble, can you? Not as much as I would like, no. Tenebrail reached back to her wings and withdrew her little black book. She opened it to the ribbon bookmark and started reading for a moment. The book doesn't care about you, so it is a bit difficult to tell. But you were in the field with that relic. Fila. The hellhound. That's the one. Yeah. Me, her, Tsheitsa, a gaunt, and several city guardsmen. You know an Octavia. I knew it. Well, she had suspected the taker, so Tsheitsa was actually the correct one. But Tenebrail probably didn't know that. I don't suppose your little book shows whatever hole she's hiding in. Alice awoke, feeling slightly nauseous. She kept her eyes closed because of the sensation. It was that unpleasant lead arms and swimming headache that came with a severe lack of sleep. Which was entirely her fault. She had returned late, first of all. Then there was the debacle with Kenziel, who had returned with two crystals in hand, Tenebrail hadn't eaten them in front of her. But Alisa didn't doubt that she would later on. She had gone on and told Tsheitsa about the angel's recommendation for the feathers as well. Her alarm was buzzing over and over again. Although she wanted nothing more than to silence it, roll over, and sleep longer, Bracht was supposed to be around sometime this morning. He was coming for Fila and Alisa wanted to ask about the Draken as well, and she now had a location where Octavia was spending her nights. Alisa had learned from last time. She wasn't about to rush in like she had back then. She would take her time, consult with people far more experienced than her. Like Bracht. Octavia was his sister. With his armor, sword, and experience, he might be able to handle everything entirely on his own. That would be ideal. Alisa had wound up dragged into far too many incidents. And going to capture a princess, even if she was a disgraced one, would probably not be a very bright thing to do without royal oversight and permission. But something had to be done. Alisa hadn't even seen the girl and she had thrown a dagger. It was probably a grudge, an attack of opportunity. Her hovel was right near the exit to the city, so she could have been simply watching out the window and seen Alisa pass by with Tsheitsa. Pure coincidence. But Alisa couldn't risk having the girl following her around the city, throwing daggers whenever it suited her. Alisa tried to sit up. Her arms were just too heavy. Lead arms was an understatement. It felt like, like, like a hellhound lying half on her. Alisa snapped her eyes open with a scowl already on her face. Fila wasn't completely on top of her. She was kneeling at the side of the bed, but her upper body was draped over the middle of the bed. Right across Alice's midsection, pinning her arms to her side dot and that buzzing of her phone, it was making her headache worse. She couldn't even reach it to turn off that incessant noise get off me you stupid mutt Alice grumbled, trying to shove Fila aside. Maybe it was the angle she was lying at, but Alice was having trouble getting leverage. 
The hellhound felt a lot heavier than she looked. It wasn't like the hound was fat, but wasn't muscle supposed to be heavier than fat anyway? Ah dot she didn't budge you Fu tilde though her arms were pinned to her side, Alisa could easily turn her head. Cassita stood, leaning against the wall. She had shed her fur and donned her guise as Alisa's sister once again. And she had a wide grin on her face stop smiling and get her off me. I'm not sure what you think I can do to move her if you can't. At least turn off my alarm. It's going to drive me insane. Please? Thankfully, the mimic complied. As Cassitar shoved off the wall and walked over to where the phone sat on a shelf, Alisa took a breath and tried to twist her entire body.